The War on Drugs, A History Edited by David Farber Introduction David Farber Over the past 50 years, the United States government has spent over a trillion dollars fighting a war on drugs. This massive budgetary expenditure and concomitant commitment to a fiercely punitive treatment of illegal drug users and sellers represents a major inflection point in Americans' much longer campaign against the distribution and use of cocaine, cannabis, heroin, and a number of other targeted intoxicants. As this collection demonstrates, the scope, strategy, and tactics of that extraordinarily costly and punitive war have changed over time. One near constant, however, has been drug warriors' relentless effort to criminalize people who sell or use illegal drugs. In recent years, about 1.5 million people have been arrested annually on drug charges, and most of these arrests involve cannabis. Nearly 500,000 Americans are currently incarcerated for drug offenses. Exactly which Americans authorities have chosen to imprison on drug charges is another piece of the story this collection offers. Suffice it to say here that black Americans are almost six times more likely than white Americans to have been incarcerated on drug charges, even as white and black Americans use drugs at about the same rate. Currently, the federal government expends well over $9 million every day, or well over $3 billion a year, to lock up drug offenders. States and localities combined pay far more. Today, in part as a response to those human and financial costs, Americans are fast losing their faith that a war on drugs is fair, moral, or sensible, let alone winnable. Recent surveys show that only about 1 in 10 Americans believe that anyone should go to jail for possessing a small amount of marijuana. During the 2020 election campaign, erstwhile drug warrior extraordinaire President Joe Biden went further, arguing, No one should be incarcerated for drug use of any kind. He insisted that education, prevention, and redemption, not incarceration, should govern American drug policy. At least one recent survey of American public opinion indicates that Biden's position has become a majoritarian one in the U.S. Fifty-five percent of those surveyed said that all drug offenses should be treated not as felonies, but simply as civil offenses. In the words of the survey, such offenses would be treated like minor traffic violations rather than crimes. That newfound perspective, as this collection indicates, has been hard won and it has yet to change fundamental aspects of the punitive drug regime that has long reigned in the U.S. Even though the war on drugs has lost a great deal of popular support, the sunk costs of the war continue to drive it forward. People increasingly worry about the financial and human cost of prisons larded with convicted nonviolent drug offenders, but prison guard unions, police unions, and fraternal organizations private contractors, and other economic interests fight to keep the drug offender to prison pipeline flowing. And after 50 years of successful drug dependent state building, fiefdoms of drug fighting agencies and organizations at every level of government insist on the continued need to maintain their institutional prerogatives, power, and funding. Pharmaceutical industries, as well as political careers, have been built on the logic of a punitive war on drugs. A great many voters, while increasingly uncomfortable with this 50-year-long war, are rightfully anxious about what could and should replace it. These factors and more have made fundamental, let alone equitable, change in American drug policy an extraordinary political challenge. In this collection, we examine how and why so many fought so hard to criminalize the use and sale of such a great variety of drugs. We also draw attention to those who fought both the logic and punitive practices of the war on drugs. Writing in this seemingly transformational moment, we also ponder what might replace this war. Should the model Americans use to regulate white market drugs expand to include currently illegal black market drugs? Could public health approaches further ameliorate drug addiction? 
Should legalization extend beyond cannabis to other drugs, such as cocaine and hallucinogenics? Ending the punitive war on drugs, almost all reformers would agree, demands more than simply saying yes to all currently illegal drugs. When President Richard Nixon launched the modern war on drugs in 1979, few Americans believed that cannabis, let alone so-called hard drugs, should be legal or even decriminalized in the U.S. In 1969, 84% of Americans said they believed anyone caught with even the smallest amount of marijuana should go to jail. Users and dealers of hard drugs, Americans believed, demanded even greater punishment. Just 30 years ago, in the midst of the crack cocaine scourge, then-Senator Joe Biden followed the public's conventional wisdom. He was one of America's most outspoken drug war hawks, calling for more arrests, more convictions, and more prison time for drug dealers. For decades, a broad political consensus that included liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans championed a mercilessly punitive war on drugs. President Bill Clinton, just like President Ronald Reagan, signed legislation giving law enforcement authorities at all levels of government more resources and more incentives to lock up ever more Americans caught up in the distribution and possession of illegal drugs. The African-American congressional representative Charles Rangel, whose district included Harlem, was as fierce an advocate of harsh treatment of drug offenders as any of his conservative white fellow members of Congress. For nearly half a century, tens of millions of Americans across social, economic, and political divides agreed that the war on drugs was one of the U.S.'s good wars. Of course, this conventional wisdom functioned in the breach. Americans continued to use illegal drugs and to raise their voices against repression. In the mid-1970s, in the shadow of President Nixon's declaration of an all-out offensive against drugs, a pro-cannabis coalition of mostly white middle-class users, supported by makers of drug paraphernalia and not a few cannabis dealers, sought to decriminalize the possession of marijuana. They had some success in a few states and locales, before a swelling wave of fearful parents supported by a range of public health experts turned the tide against them during the Reagan years. The federal effort to decriminalize cannabis was stopped in its tracks. Similarly, in the late 1970s, as cocaine use soared among a segment of the professional managerial class, yuppies, some politicians began to rethink the logic of the absolute criminal prohibition of that drug. The rise of crack cocaine in the mid-1980s often distributed by so-called inner-city crews, put a stop to that reformist campaign. More recently, cannabis reformers have successfully pushed for legalization. Following a flurry of 17 successful state medical marijuana legalization campaigns between 1996 and 2011, Colorado and Washington made cannabis legal for recreational users in 2012. Now, many other states have followed, though many of them still only allow for medical use. Even so, the federal government has refused to budge on its absolute statutory prohibition, creating a legal conundrum that has yet to be resolved. Similarly, for the past 20 years or so, the opioid epidemic has pushed politicians, medical professionals, and myriad citizens groups to rethink how drug addicts should be treated. That so many people who become addicted to opioids received their first doses not from back alley dealers, but at their local Walgreens or CBS pharmacies after their physicians prescribed them legal, big pharma, white market, brand name products, explains part of Americans' more sympathetic approach to these addicts' travails. That so many of the addicts were, especially in the epidemic's early days, white, rural, or small town folks, perceived by many as respectable members of their communities, also shaped this particular rethinking of how drug abusers should be judged. The war on drugs has never been static. Reformers and enforcers have fought pitched battles over drug policy throughout its history, with multiple inflection points. And like so many aspects of American life, 
The war on drugs has been shaped by issues of racial politics as well as by fundamental questions about how Americans legally determine their consumer choices in the face of myriad contested cultural beliefs and unequal access to political and economic power. Obviously, over the past half century, millions of Americans have refused to abide by the logic of the war on drugs. In recent years, Nearly a million Americans, according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, have been dependent on or have abused cocaine. Almost 50% of 12th graders in 2018 told pollsters that they had already used one or more illicit drugs at least once in their lives. At the end of the 1970s, peak years for illegal marijuana use in the U.S., almost 40% of high school seniors reported that they had smoked marijuana at least once in the prior month, and nearly 12% of all Americans over the age of 12 reported that they had done likewise. Illegal drugs have been nearly ubiquitous in modern America, despite the war on drugs and the opprobrium a range of authorities have rained down on drug users. As this collection demonstrates, America's state-sponsored drug warriors have always battled a guerrilla army of insurgent users, dealers, and traffickers. Anti-drug forces have won many battles in this war, but they have yet to defeat their targeted enemy, which includes tens of millions of Americans. Despite the many risks associated with obtaining and using illegal toxicants, Throughout the war on drugs, Americans forged a mass market that rivaled almost any other consumer sector of the American economy. Whether they were yuppie cokeheads or poor heroin addicts, prescription pill-abusing teenagers, or the millions upon millions of people from all walks of life who enjoyed getting high on whatever illegal substance was on offer among their set, tie stick, ecstasy, crank, lean, oxy, the list is long, drug buyers have been everywhere. Illegal drug users in the U.S. created a massive consumer demand that drug traffickers and their retail distributors have been more than pleased to service. The war on drugs made supplying that demand dangerous in multiple ways, but it also made it extremely lucrative. It created an underground economy with its own global supply chain. As this collection explains, the drug war has created business opportunities in some of the world's most economically challenged nations and has provided employment and entrepreneurial enterprises in poverty-stricken neighborhoods and communities throughout the U.S. Overall, in this analysis of the so-called war on drugs, some of America's leading drug war scholars examine the hows and whys of America's long and devastating campaign to punish people who want to get high and those who attend to that market demand. As a group, we seek to explain why the war on drugs received so much broad public support for so long. What we ask was its political utility. As we examine how the war was fought both domestically and internationally, we also ask, who benefited from it? We analyze as well how forces have aligned to permit some drugs to be legally enmeshed in a willfully impotent regulatory regime, OxyContin, for example, while other drugs, even when championed by a range of credentialed experts, are ruled too dangerous to be legal in any circumstance, LSD, for example. Finally. We consider why so many people were so willing to battle the mighty and punishing force of the war on drugs, maintaining, despite its force, a vibrant, dynamic, and expansive market for the illegal substances Americans desired. Aimed at fellow drug war scholars, university students, and anyone who wishes to better understand the role the 50-year-long war on drugs has played in national and international affairs, this collection serves several purposes. Fundamentally, we want one to understand how profoundly the war on drugs has figured the history of the United States. We argue that the war on drugs, while generally seen by Americans as an internal affair, has also played a fundamental role in shaping U.S. international relations. The U.S. government's attempts to expand its war on drugs to other nations has been, not surprisingly, and in keeping with other aspects of America's role in the world, an exercise in hegemonic power. 
But America's international drug war efforts has also provided governments in targeted countries with opportunities to use American resources to fulfill their own political projects. Thus, the war on drugs is not and never has been just an American story. As with other economic development and security aid programs, governments across the world have used drug war policies and programs in their struggles over questions of political legitimacy, the role of state power, and the freedoms to which their citizens are entitled. Within the U.S. as well, Americans have seen the war on drugs as a political weapon, one that has been used both to enforce and to challenge America's social order. Since the Nixon era, politicians have generally used drug war rhetoric to demonstrate their willingness to get tough on people they deem to be marginal and thus expendable, and have been willing to turn that rhetoric into policy. As a result, the war on drugs has had a particularly devastating impact on poor communities. Economically disadvantaged African Americans, doubly marginalized by their race and class, have taken the brunt of that attack. Racial injustice and impoverishment have many causes in the U.S. As this collection demonstrates, the war on drugs has produced one of the most devastating columns in that hard accounting. At the same time, we aim to make clear that the war on drugs is not just a story of repression and suppression. Illegal drug users and suppliers have helped to forge an enduring alternative culture and economy in the U.S. and indeed around the world. Inside the U.S., Americans have used the illegal drug underground to accumulate capital, often providing opportunities where few others exist. That illegal underground also has fostered some of the nation's most compelling cultural forms, from acid rock to hip-hop. Drug advocates insist that getting high is, for the great majority of users, not a pathology, but a purposeful pursuit of an alternative, generative state of mind and body. While drug addiction and abuse have been catastrophic for many, drug users and their suppliers have built their own social and cultural landscape. This illegal drug infrastructure is an open secret, an interconnected aspect of everyday life in the U.S., even as it is officially attacked. Despite the war on drugs, the illegal drug underground and the above-board legal economy and socially sanctioned culture have, we contend, long been intertwined. Finally, we argue that the war on drugs demonstrates how issues of public health, equitable distribution of medical care, and science-based regulation of drugs are shaped by ideological disputes, interest group politics, and politically and economically motivated moral panics. More broadly, the war on drugs, as presented in this collection, is a window into some of the most enduring historical challenges Americans face, including racial inequality, economic inequities, and political demagoguery. The essays here tackle a range of aspects of the war on drugs. While this is by no means a comprehensive survey of the modern war on drugs, we do attempt to examine some of the most enduring, complicated, and noteworthy pieces of the drug war puzzle. Each essay is intended to work as a standalone piece, but the essays are also in conversation with one another as they speak to the collection's common themes. Collectively, these essays analyze how the war on drugs has served powerful economic and political interests both inside and outside the U.S. At the same time, the collection explores how the war on drugs produced a deviant form of globalization that offered economically marginalized people an economic lifeline as players in a remunerative transnational supply and distribution network. In a related vein, a number of the essays demonstrate how government enforcement of the war on drugs has disproportionately punished these same marginalized suppliers as well as their disadvantaged customers. And in a different vein, some of the essays also assess how drug warriors traduced science and medical expertise by encouraging moral panics that contributed to the blanket criminalization of certain drugs, including cannabis and LSD. Finally, the concluding essays speak directly to alternatives to the war on drugs, even as they also remind us of the powerful, sometimes predatory interests that seek to profit off of the common human desire to get high. 
While not every essay takes on all of these issues and themes, as a group, they deliver a shared indictment of the war on drugs and a common hope that the ongoing search for a more humane and realistic approach to Americans' massive illegal drug marketplace can be achieved. The first essay in this collection, The Advent of the War on Drugs, provides historical background for the essays that follow. It reminds one that the war on drugs has its roots in the prohibitionist impulses of the 19th century and that Americans have long held an ambivalent attitude toward the perils and pleasures of intoxication. This ambivalence has resulted in episodic campaigns to shut down or at least constrain the market for targeted intoxicants, most commonly in the early 20th century through regulation then increasingly through selective enforcement against users and suppliers and most recently through draconian punishments for local dealers and large-scale traffickers. The essay also foregrounds the racial and ethnic prejudices that contributed to the first legal campaigns against opiates, cocaine, and cannabis at the cusp of the 19th and 20th centuries, a trope that never disappears from the war on drugs. The second essay, Drug Dealers, foregrounds the primary target of the domestic war on drugs. In this essay... I explore why large majorities of Americans during the height of the war on drugs in the 1980s and 1990s supported harsh punishment for convicted drug dealers, even including the death penalty. I also argue that historically, within the communities in which dealers worked, a surprising number of people, and not just customers, supported their local drug pushers and distributors, seeing them as Robin Hoods or, in historian Eric Hobsbawm's phrase, social bandits. Even at the height of the war on drugs, a sizable, if shifting, number of Americans never bought into the demonization of drug pushers, complicating drug warriors' attempts at eradication. The war on drugs has always also been a civil war. The next essay, The Mexico-Chicago Heroin Connection, is by Elaine Carey. It stems from her prodigious research on transnational Mexican-originating drug trafficking organizations, DTOs. Her work explains how and why DTOs have often won key battles in the war on drugs, or at least fought them to a stalemate. Carrie counters popular culture stereotypes of Mexican cartels with a revealing look at the corporate-like, flexible, and sophisticated management skills of the Herrera DTO which successfully evaded law enforcement efforts for decades on both sides of the border. Carey argues, too, that U.S. efforts to stop the Herrera DTO and similar operations were hindered by racist and culturally ignorant assumptions about Mexican drug traffickers. Michael Polson, in Cultivating Cannabis, Accepting Cannabis, situates the domestic cultivation of illegal cannabis in the U.S.-led global war on drugs. He argues that in the midst of the movement to legalize cannabis state by state in the U.S., we would do well to understand how U.S.-led efforts to destroy non-U.S. cannabis cultivation and export from the global south figured in the rise of domestic growers. These domestic growers, operating in an illegal but often locally accepting environment, transformed the U.S. marijuana market and played a vital role in accepting cannabis from the war on drugs in the 21st century. Even as the war on drugs criminalized tens of millions of cannabis users, growers, and sellers, cannabis cultivation became an economic lifeline for marginalized, often rural populations in the U.S. Peter Pihos, in The Local War on Drugs, recasts the familiar accounting of the war on drugs. Instead of narrating the drug policies of the federal government, he zooms in on local drug enforcement, the site of the overwhelming number of arrests and subsequent incarcerations. Using Chicago as a case study, he argues that city officials used different drug enforcement regimes over time to police black residents, especially those concentrated in poor, segregated neighborhoods. Chicago's political leaders, he argues, used drug enforcement not simply as a tool to fight vice, but as a more general mode of governing the economically segmented, racialized city. His case study, in relation to other essays in this collection, speaks to the class-based and race-based nature of the war on drugs.
Emily Dufton in Cannabis Culture Wars also analyzes the class and race aspects of the war on drugs, but from a very different angle. She explains how white middle class activist parent citizen groups fought against cannabis legalization or decriminalization in the first 20 years after President Nixon declared his war on drugs. The anti marijuana activists she has researched were less interested in locking up young users or even their suppliers than they were in protecting their children from what they perceived to be a dangerous pro marijuana culture. Ignoring expert-based evidence on the relatively low risks of cannabis use in comparison with the use of alcohol or tobacco, their efforts, she concludes, set back the cannabis legalization or decriminalization movement by decades and inadvertently opened the door to the arrest of millions of cannabis users who were disproportionately non-white and non-middle class. Her essay aligns with others in the collection that highlight how drug war enforcement has consistently impacted poor people of color, despite the widespread use of illegal drugs across broad swaths of the American people. Erica Dick, Lucas Rickert, and Alexis Turner in Psychedelic Wars turn to another critical issue in the war on drugs. Who decides the legal status of drugs, and on what basis are those decisions made? Focusing primarily on LSD... They analyzed the debate within the medico-scientific community over the suitability of the use of psychedelics in diverse settings, including both the therapeutic and the recreational. Pro-psychedelic experts were quickly put on the defensive by scientists who doubted the legitimacy of the advocates' more holistic, spiritual, and non-commercial claims about the utility of psychedelic research and use. Hallucinogenics, the authors argue, did not fit into the market-based parameters of the pharmaceutical marketplace. A range of authorities, inside and outside the scientific community, deemed them irredeemable, dangerous drugs. The war on drugs had another criminalized target. The two essays on international anti-drug campaigns, Eileen Teague's The War on Drugs in Mexico and James Bradford's The War on Drugs in Afghanistan, share a common feature. Teague and Bradford both argue that the U.S.-led war on drugs never successfully achieved its goal of supply-side eradication because U.S. policymakers failed to understand how foreign governments used the war on drugs to their own ends. In addition, non-U.S. government's eradication efforts were constrained by those governments' need to maintain domestic legitimacy and to refrain from undertaking anti-drug activities that threaten their political and economic interests. Teague's deeply researched case study of Mexico's role in the war on drugs documents how American drug war funds in the early years of the campaign often supported the Mexican government's effort to quash internal political enemies. Bradford, in his eye-opening history of U.S.-led efforts to crush Afghanistan's opium production, also stresses how useful U.S.-funded drug eradication efforts were to the expansion of central state power in Afghanistan. He reveals how American aid funds, more generally, have served to increase the productivity and expertise of Afghan opium producers, especially as U.S. drug interdiction efforts progressed in other opium-producing nations. Both essays reveal how difficult it is for American drug agents to destroy international supply, given the enormous economic incentives produced by the massive black market demand for illegal drugs that exists in the U.S., as well as in other wealthy nations. The final two essays in the collection examine the politically and economically fraught relationship between legal white market drugs and illegal black market drugs. David Hertzberg, in Between the Free Market and the Drug War, draws on his path-breaking scholarship on prescription drug addiction and pharmaceutical regulatory regimes to offer an alternative history of the war on drugs. He argues that drug reformers' efforts to rein in prescription drug abuse, while flawed, provide an example of a path not taken in overseeing the abuse of such drugs as cocaine and heroin. Hertzberg reveals that the punitive, prohibitionist, criminalization approach to the war on drugs was and is not the only way to protect consumers from harmful drug abuse and addiction. Kathleen Friedel, a leading historian of the American state, 
makes a similar, if less sanguine, argument about government oversight of prescription drugs in the collection's final essay. In The Pharma Cartel, she argues that in recent decades, government officials and politicians have allowed a neoliberal, market-first, profits-before-people approach to drug regulation to unleash the worst addiction crisis in modern American history. Zeroing in on the extraordinarily loose government regulation and oversight of OxyContin, she explains how and why millions of Americans could be preyed on by major pharmaceutical companies. Rather than simply blame Big Pharma for the opioid crisis, she provides a nuts-and-bolts accounting of government complicity in the failure to keep Americans safe in the name of free market supremacy. While the federal, government-led war on drugs targeted the poor and the marginal, politicians and government regulators deliberately supported the efforts of Big Pharma to unleash highly addictive prescription opioids on other Americans, whose communities were unraveling economically. Friedel warns that drug reformers need take great care not to unleash a new profit-driven drug crisis, powered by a neoliberal alliance of politicians and corporate executives, even as they battle the inequities and cruelties of the punitive war on drugs. This collection's overarching goal is to provide a historical framework for the war on drugs. By analyzing that war's key issues, debates, events, and actors, we hope to help one ask their own questions based on the resulting deeper understandings of the role the war on drugs has played in the making of our current political predicament. Part 1. Background 1. The Advent of the War on Drugs David Farber This brief history of drug policy in the United States lays the groundwork for understanding President Richard Nixon's 1971 declaration of a war on drugs. It reveals Americans' centuries-long love-hate relationship with intoxicants. From that conflicted relationship emerged abolitionist movements that led to the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, which generally prohibited the sale of alcoholic beverages from 1920 to 1933, as well as a series of local, state, and national laws that first regulated and then punished both the sellers and the consumers of a variety of substances, including opium, cocaine, heroin, and cannabis. 1. As declarations of war go, it was pretty low-key. On June 17, 1971, President Richard Nixon held a press briefing in the West Wing of the White House. In his usual dark suit and striped tie, speaking comfortably from notes, the President branded Americans' rising tide of drug abuse public enemy number one. He continued, In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new, all-out offensive. This will be a worldwide offensive. It will be government-wide, and it will be nationwide. To fund this war, Nixon declared that he would ask Congress to appropriate a minimum of $350 million. In 1969, when Richard Nixon became president, the entire federal drug budget had totaled just $81 million. Today, some 50 years later, the United States has expended approximately $1 trillion waging war on illegal drugs. President Nixon was not the first American political leader to mount a campaign against drugs, or against intoxicants more generally, nor was his call to arms politically partisan. In 1966, with New York City reeling from a tidal wave of heroin addiction, the moderate Republican governor of New York, Nelson Rockefeller, had called for a war on narcotics and asked the state legislature to appropriate $81 million to wage it. Even earlier in 1962, the liberal Democratic governor of California, Pat Brown, had responded to middle-class white parents' fears that Mexican drug pushers were luring their children into depravity by declaring that he would end the scourge of narcotics trafficking. In this war, we can never declare a truce. 
and earlier still in 1954, President Eisenhower's Attorney General Herbert Brownell Jr. spoke to voters' concerns over the concurrent rise of juvenile delinquency and an uptick in heroin and marijuana use by calling for a massive increase in prison time for drug pushers in what he too dubbed a war on narcotics. President Nixon's rhetoric was, even then, nothing new. Neither were Americans' politically fraught and febrile fascinations with all manner of intoxicants. Still, at the cusp of the 1960s and 1970s, President Nixon was responding directly to the political and social exigencies of his time. By 1971, the American public, the electorate, was being torn apart by a polarizing debate about the reach and meaning of a seemingly ever more permissive youth culture. Countercultural young people's embrace of illegal drug use was at the heart of that raging debate. Most immediately, Nixon was responding not to young people's use of drugs in general, but to a very specific scourge, a two-front heroin epidemic. One front was America's inner cities. In New York, Detroit, Washington, D.C., and other major American cities, record numbers of heroin addicts were stealing, robbing, and mugging in their desperate search for the money they needed to fuel their drug purchases, contributing to a surging wave of criminality. While these addicts were overwhelmingly drawn from poor black and Puerto Rican communities, White Americans feared not only the breakdown in law and order, but also that the epidemic would spread to their communities. The cover of Time magazine from March 16, 1970 played to those fears. It featured a middle-class-looking white teenager and the ominous warning, heroin hits the young. At the same time, thousands of miles away, Young American soldiers in Vietnam were getting high on almost pure China white heroin that cost just a dollar a vial. In spring 1971, the Nixon White House heard a report from a Republican congressman just back from Vietnam that as many as 15 percent of servicemen had become addicted. These men obviously would be coming home to the U.S. The New York Times and other mass media outlets amplified the story. G.I. heroin addiction epidemic in Vietnam. Something President Nixon believed had to be done to curtail the scourge. Heroin addiction, both at home and in Vietnam, most directly fueled Nixon's decision to launch his administration's drug offensive. But it was not the only cause. Nixon, like a great many of his silent majority supporters, detested and feared the rapid rise of casual drug use among 60s generation middle class white youths. Those feelings were put on somewhat bizarre display during an extraordinary Oval Office meeting between Nixon and the legendary Elvis Presley. Elvis showed up without an appointment at the White House in December 1970. He was there, he said, to volunteer his services as a federal agent in the fight against the rising tide of illegal drug use. A bemused President Nixon took the meeting. Wearing purple velvet pants and a matching cape, a largely unbuttoned white shirt, as well as oversized amber sunglasses, Elvis, not Nixon, Presley explained to the president that the Beatles were a major factor in young people's anti-American spirit. Nixon, proudly square, replied, Those who use drugs are also those in the vanguard of anti-American protest. I'm on your side, Elvis then said. He explained to the president that he had been studying drug culture and communist brainwashing, which appeared to be linked in his mind. President Nixon made sure that Elvis received an official badge from the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. Probably for the best, Elvis never deployed his badge in service to the war on drugs. He died of a heart attack in 1977 after years of abusing massive doses of doctor-prescribed sedatives and amphetamines. Nixon, like a great many Americans, including Elvis, was not interested in targeting people abusing prescription drugs. He was repulsed by young people's embrace of marijuana, LSD, and other mind-altering recreational substances. And while his 1971 all-out offensive was not specifically aimed at such drugs and such users, America's war on drugs would soon enough expand to include them.
Richard Nixon did not, it's only fair to state, envision the massively punitive war on drugs that was to come at the hands of the elected officials that followed him. As drug historian Emily Dufton has pointed out, Nixon's was one of the last administrations to spend more on prevention and treatment than law enforcement. Still, by 1974, the soon-to-resign Nixon had begun to shift the balance of his drug war policies, drastically cutting the federal drug treatment budget while escalating enforcement efforts. The die had been largely cast, and beginning in the mid-1970s and lasting until the early 21st century, with only a few critical interruptions at the federal and local levels, the war on drugs would become ever more gargantuan and fiercely punitive. Even as a majority of Americans sought the comfort, relief, and pleasures of an array of intoxicants, legal and illegal, a broad anti-drug coalition chose to let slip the dogs of war. The drug warriors waged an unprecedented campaign to crush drug traffickers, imprison neighborhood drug dealers, and punish drug users. Well, at least some drug traffickers, and some drug dealers, and some drug users. Over time, exactly who would pay the price and bear the burdens of America's war on drugs depended on shifting political pressure and changing economic forces. Over the past half century, America's drug warriors supposedly targeted anyone involved with illegal drugs. In practice, on the domestic front, drug warriors mostly targeted overlapping groups of people they perceived to be on society's margins. Poor addicts people of color, and others outside the cultural mainstream. Especially in the 1980s and thereafter, those illegal drug users and a good many drug dealers who were not on the perceived margins faced a different kind of drug war. The historian Matthew Lassiter has called mainstream primarily young, white, middle-class Americans who were swept up in the war on drugs impossible criminals. Despite their large numbers, they would not be the war's primary target, and indeed, influential reformers would begin in the 1970s to protect such drug users, most of whom indulged in cannabis and even their neighborhood dealers by providing a separate and often much more discretionary set of punishments for those caught with relatively small amounts of marijuana. The war on drugs was never an all-out war. Some protested such limits. The most zealous drug warriors often demanded a far broader and fiercer offensive on an ever larger number of targets. We need another D-Day. Instead, you're giving us another Vietnam. A limited war, fought on the cheap, financed on the sly, with no clear objectives, and ultimately destined for stalemate and human tragedy. That was Joe Biden in 1989, when he was still a senator complaining about the Bush administration's policy. Biden, in a perverse way, was right. A great majority of those who used and even sold illegal drugs never faced the war on drugs as punishing power. Others, however, did feel its wrath. Those targeted domestically by drug warriors at all levels of government were, especially in the post-1970s period, disproportionately African American and Hispanic. The modern war on drugs, first declared at the national level by President Nixon, quickly became a juggernaut, outpacing anything that had preceded it. Even as Americans by the tens of millions created the largest illegal drug market in the world, government authorities, supported by a majority of American voters, began to prosecute and imprison an ever-increasing number of drug users and drug sellers. Within the U.S., the war on drugs, certainly by the 1980s, had become a second American civil war. Illegal drug users, tens of millions strong, and their many suppliers, both domestic and international, fought a guerrilla insurgency against the armed and extraordinarily well-funded might of the state. It has been a war as destructive as any Americans have fought. 2. Americans have always had a love-hate relationship with intoxicants. The historian William Rohrabaugh concluded that early America was essentially an alcoholic republic, or in the words of contemporary critics, a nation of drunkards. The numbers bear witness. By 1830, the per capita intake of absolute alcohol in the U.S. reached 7.1 gallons, 
Today it is around 2.3 gallons. George Washington, who had his own whiskey still at Mount Vernon, feared that hard drinking would lead to the ruin of half the working men in this country. The first war on intoxicants arose in response to such intemperate drinking. It was led by pietistic Christians, who decried the moral laxity and general immoderate behavior produced, they believe, by excessive drinking. They were joined by nascent medical authorities, who observed the deleterious effects of alcoholism, employers, who understood that drunks tended to be unproductive workers, and moral stewards of various stripes, who feared that widespread alcohol abuse endangered the American ideal of rational self-determination. Then, too, and well before they could vote, women, notably the notorious Carrie Nation, who used a sturdy hatchet to bust up saloons, played a major role in the fight against alcohol. Women saw firsthand the physical abuse and economic havoc drunken men too often inflicted on their families. The first temperance society formed in New York in 1808. By the 1830s, temperance advocates had forged a national movement. By January 1919, 46 of the nation's 48 state legislatures had endorsed the cause of prohibition. Joined by Congress, these states successfully voted to pass the 18th Amendment, which banned the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within the U.S. Prohibition was in some ways a success. It considerably lowered alcohol consumption in the U.S., demonstrating the ability of the federal government to create sufficient law enforcement authority to reduce supply and drive down demand. Alas, prohibition also stimulated the rise of organized crime, fueled by bootlegging. Like later generations of cannabis users, tens of millions of Americans became scofflaws. They turned to criminals to supply them with the liquor they continued to desire. This particular war on intoxication lasted for just 14 years. It ended when the legions of pro-alcohol Americans, wets, convinced enough Americans that prohibiting alcoholic beverages had created more problems than it had solved. They pressured their political representatives to overturn the ban with the 21st Amendment, 1933, which repealed the 18th. While some states and many counties chose to remain dry for decades, Kansas completely banned public bars until 1987 and hundreds of localities remain dry to this day, no serious effort to ban alcoholic consumption at the national level has risen since. Alcohol was by no means the only intoxicating substance Americans chose to use with abandon and then in great numbers turn against, at least for a while. Opioids are another. Americans have used opioids for as long as the U.S. has existed. By the late 19th century, almost one in every 200 Americans was addicted to opium or morphine. Most addicts then were white women from the middle and upper classes, often suffering in the contemporary parlance from uterine and ovarian complications. Their pusher tended to be their family doctor. Americans at first turned against opium only selectively. Rather than direct their attention to physician-supplied white women addicts, authorities at the local and then state levels first began to regulate and punish recreational opium smokers. In large part, authorities turned against opium smoking when young white men and women began to frequent commercial opium dens, often run by Chinese immigrants. These immigrants had brought the practice of recreational opium smoking with them from China. The San Francisco city government was the first to outlaw opium smoking in 1875. By 1915, 27 states had banned opium dens. Enforcement, however, remained sporadic. Goaded by such local regulatory and punitive efforts, but even more by the American government's increasing interest in influencing events in East Asia, where opium trafficking by imperial powers was long a resonant issue, notably in the Opium Wars, Congress passed a law in 1909 banning the importation and use of opium for other than medicinal purposes. Here was the first supply-side attack on narcotics.
Americans' cross-racial recreational use of opium, greatly intensified by the American government's increasing global interests, had produced national anti-drug legislation. This pattern would be repeated. Opioid use, however, began to attract a broader set of critics. According to distinguished drug historian David Courtright, as increasing numbers of better-trained doctors and other health professionals recognized the dangers and disadvantages of opioids, especially their addictive properties, they began to prescribe them with far greater care. As a result, respectable opioid users began to decline in number. In Courtright's words, addicts were increasingly... Lower-class urban males, often neophyte members of the underworld. These sorts of addicts, unlike grandma, were widely pilloried by common citizens as the dregs of society. These reprobate addicts, in the eyes of many, deserved not sympathy or medical support, but instead punishment. Courtright with appropriate caveats about the need to admit a range of other factors in explaining this punitive turn, argues, what we think about addiction very much depends on who is addicted. This argument can be neatly extended to the broader subject of drug abuse in general. Who is using which drugs for what purposes under whose authority often explains a great deal about how government officials, endorsed by great swaths of the citizenry, identify and define illegitimate drug use and the sorts of penalties applied to those who use such socially defined illicit substances. Here, too, is a pattern that will be repeated. Still, at the turn of the 19th century, Americans did not intend to wage any kind of general war on drugs. Drug reformers in the progressive era were much more focused on drug regulation than on punishing and incarcerating drug abusers and drug sellers. In response to reformers' demand for greater regulation of drugs and other consumer products, Congress passed the 1906 Food and Drug Act. This act, as implemented within the federal bureaucracy, primarily focused on keeping spoiled and disgusting food products out of the consumer marketplace motivated in part by The Jungle, Upton Sinclair's widely popular muckraking account of the meatpacking industry. Still, the act did for the first time force drug and food producers to list on their products' labels the presence of 11 ingredients considered by reformers to be dangerous, including alcohol, heroin, morphine, opium, cannabis, and cocaine. The need for such labeling was clear to reformers, at the time, many products, including many marketed to children, contained such substances. For example, dozens of peppy soft drinks, not just Coca-Cola, packed a dash or more of cocaine. Cures for teething infants and colicky babies commonly contained morphine, resulting in a rash of overdose deaths. Progressive-era reformers did not demand greater drug regulation just to protect children or other vulnerable consumers of soft drinks and commonly sold health remedies, which included the all-purpose pain reliever Bear Heroin. Bear Aspirin came just a bit later. The Anti-Drug Coalition was an unlikely appearing alliance of concerned medical and health professionals, white supremacists, and religious and secular prohibitionists. While most scholars focus on how these various progressive-era reformers lobbied for greater federal involvement in the drug trade, they were more effective at the state and local levels. State legislatures all over the U.S. passed laws regulating the distribution of cocaine, alcohol, cannabis, opium, and heroin. How and why those reformers targeted cocaine is instructive. Unlike opium, Cocaine was a relative newcomer to the American consumer. Only in 1860 did German chemists isolate the alkaloid that gave coca leaves, long used as a stimulant by people in the South American Andes, their potency. Commercial interests quickly thereafter monetized the processed coca leaves, cocaine, by incorporating them into a variety of elixirs and tonics, all of which were readily purchased by any consumer at a multitude of retail establishments. The U.S., by the late 19th century, the world's most prosperous nation, dominated the retail cocaine trade. Here, too, is another pattern that will be repeated over the following decades.
Avid cocaine users drew the attention of doctors and other health professionals. They warned that some users were becoming addicted to the substance. Driven by such public health concerns, as well as the desire to sell papers, progressive-era muckraking newspapers headlined stories about dissolute cocaine fiends running amok. Such anti-cocaine warnings were strengthened by a campaign by white supremacists against black cocaine users. In the burgeoning era of Jim Crow, white upholders of America's strict racial hierarchy indignantly reported that cocaine use prompted African Americans to act uppity and refuse to accept their purported social inferiority. Cocaine, they also asserted, increased blacks' criminal propensities. In a similar vein, police and other law enforcement authorities noted that denizens of the demimonde, including prostitutes and gamblers, had embraced the cocaine kick. Reformers of many stripes, across the political spectrum and for different reasons, had come to see cocaine use as dangerous and cocaine users as the kind of people in need of policing. Following the lead of state and local authorities, the federal government began outlawing a range of narcotics. Congress passed the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act in 1914. This act, on its face, simply charged the Treasury Department with registering and imposing a tax on all people involved in the production and sale of opiates and cocaine. In practice, Treasury Department agents, working with local police and supported by the courts, began to prosecute doctors who prescribed narcotics and pharmacists who sold the drugs in order to restrict legal access to opiates and cocaine. In 1922, Congress passed the Narcotic Drugs Import and Export Act, which banned in almost every instance the legal supply of these drugs, though critically accepting opium intended for carefully prescribed medical purposes. The result of these federal acts, as well as a multitude of state and local drug laws, was the rise of underground criminal trafficking organizations. While authorities' efforts to suppress the supply of opiates and cocaine did diminish the number of users, it by no means stopped demand altogether. Organized criminal networks arose to meet that demand. Notorious gangsters quickly took up the challenge of supplying addicts as well as recreational users. These gangsters, in the 1920s and early 1930s, often ran drug distribution operations alongside their more profitable bootlegging operations. New Yorker Arnold Rothstein, best known for his involvement in fixing the 1919 World Series, had his hand in most every illegal enterprise. He ran a well-organized drug smuggling business, bringing in heroin, morphine, and cocaine from European suppliers on cargo ships. He eventually allied with Lucky Luciano, and soon the Mafia, working with international producers, became a mainstay of the illegal drug business in the U.S., specializing in the importation and distribution of heroin. The end of Prohibition in 1933 meant that gangsters who had made millions bootlegging alcoholic beverages focused their talents on the illegal drug trade. Generations of oft-times warring organized criminal enterprises maintained and developed the illegal drug business. The federal government, in partial response to these international trafficking operations, began laying the foundations for the modern punitive war on drugs in 1930. That year, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, FBN, was born as a spin-off enterprise from the soon-to-be obsolete Bureau of Prohibition. The FBN was charged by Congress with stamping out drug trafficking, which the Bureau's champion, Pennsylvania Representative Stephen G. Porter, called a greater evil than human slavery. Led for the next 32 years by the politically savvy Harry J. Anslinger, the FBN pursued two major missions. First of all, it targeted international drug traffickers. Cutting supply, Anslinger believed, was the best means for ending drug abuse in the U.S. Working with nations around the world and bolstered by a series of international anti-narcotics agreements, the FBN targeted foreign suppliers, albeit with limited success. International interdiction, then and thereafter, became the centerpiece of federal drug enforcement efforts. Secondly, 
Anslinger personally and with great energy led a massive public relations campaign to demonize illegal drug use in the U.S. in order to suppress demand. The FBN continued to focus in particular on the perils of heroin, but in the 1930s Anslinger expanded the federal anti-drug campaign to include marijuana. Up until that time, Cannabis had been largely ignored at the national level, and only half of all states had laws prohibiting or controlling its sale. Marijuana users in the U.S. were few and far between. Anti-cannabis legislation took off first in California as a progressive-era reform and spread somewhat haphazardly around the country. While popular accounts of cannabis criminalization have long insisted that racist state legislators passed such laws to punish Mexican Americans and Mexican sojourners, the historical record suggests a more complicated story. While newspaper stories in the early 20th century do report the involvement of people with Mexican surnames in the marijuana trade, they also reveal that a diverse, if relatively small, number of other people distributed and consumed cannabis. At the turn of the century, for example, African-American jazz musicians in New Orleans enthusiastically smoked marijuana and helped popularize marijuana throughout the nation in youthful, cross-racial bohemian circles. By the early 1930s, FBN chief Anslinger observed the growing concern over marijuana spread and deployed long-standing anti-cannabis rhetoric, which had first been used widely in Mexico, to rally Americans against its use. He described marijuana as the assassin of youth. In 1937, he wrote a widely distributed article that detailed the deadly perils of marijuana use. With an axe he had killed his father, mother, two brothers, and a sister. Ordinarily a sane, rather quiet young man, he had become crazed from smoking marijuana. Anslinger was a master inciter of anti-drug moral panics. By the end of 1937, the same year the federal government passed the Marijuana Tax Act, as it was often spelled M-A-R-I-H-U-A-N-A, -A -A, all states had made marijuana illegal and 35 states had signed on to the Uniform Narcotic Drug Act, which criminalized the sale and use of cannabis as well as opioids and cocaine. The war on drugs, while poorly funded at the national level and still far from a priority at the state or local enforcement level, was taking form at the threshold of the Second World War. By 1940, the U.S. had embraced a federal government-sponsored effort to suppress and criminalize the distribution of certain narcotics, most specifically opiates, cocaine, and, as of 1937, cannabis. This effort marked a complete reversal of the 19th century market-based approach to managing drug demand and supply. Until the late 19th century, generally speaking, consumers, not government regulators or law enforcement officials, decided what drugs they wanted to purchase from an array of suppliers, who included doctors, pharmacists, local merchants, and major corporations. No black market existed. Only an unregulated and sometimes quite dangerous white market. By the mid 1920s, government authorities had begun to craft a strict anti narcotics regime. Federal policymakers, along with a great many state and local officials, had decided that the narcotics trade was a dangerous business, generally harmful to the public. It needed to be strictly regulated and, in most instances, banned. This effort, even at the time of the Second World War, was far from what President Nixon would call an all-out offensive. Enforcement budgets were scant, and few law enforcement personnel at any level of government were dedicated to stamping out the drug trade. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics remained a relatively small operation, and even Anslinger recognized that the American people were not ready for a major, intrusive national policing of drugs. Our staff, in order to avoid accusations of being like the Gestapo, has remained the same size as it was when the Bureau was established. While state and local officials did arrest and imprison narcotics traffickers, street dealers, and users, the number of imprisoned drug criminals was minuscule compared to what came later. 3. 
Between the mid-1940s and President Nixon's 1971 declaration, the federal government, joined by state and local officials, began to craft a more punitive approach to the illegal drug trade. Historian Kathleen Friedel argues that it was during these years that the modern state-sponsored war on drugs came into being, even if it was still relatively under-resourced and laxly enforced. A coterie of historians, including Friedel, point to a number of overlapping causes for Americans' increasingly punitive turn. Friedel and Peter Pihos in this collection argue that militant counter-narcotics policy proved increasingly useful in temporarily resolving other dilemmas of governance, like how to police African American inner-city neighborhoods. Then, too, another major reason was the increasing availability and use of illegal drugs. At the broadest level, Americans in the post-Second World War era took to illegal drugs for reasons of both supply and demand. The supply side was stimulated by the overall booming American economy. American international tourism and, more importantly, international trade exploded in the 1950s and 1960s. Giving enormous opportunities to drug traffickers, both large and small, to smuggle product into the U.S., young Americans discovered how easy it was to drive into Mexico, play the part of tourists, find a connection, load the side panels of their cars with cheap moda, fifteen dollars a brick, drive back across the busy border into the U.S. and sell the weed for more than ten times what they had paid for it. By the mid 1960s. Young countercultural enthusiasts taking advantage of inexpensive international flights and the high value of the American dollar discover the drug-producing regions of the hippie trail, and soon Afghan hash and Thai stick were on the menu. At the heavy end of the smuggling business, the French connection, the mafia worked with Sicilian and Corsican gangsters to smuggle tons of heroin annually into New York City's bustling ports. The Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia became a ready source for heroin, especially for American soldiers stationed in Vietnam, some of whom figured out how to get it into the U.S. The demand side too was figured by America's burgeoning post-Second World War consumer cornucopia. Legally prescribed big pharma drugs such as amphetamines and barbiturates were heavily marketed. Housewives, truck drivers, salesmen, and most anyone else in need of either a pick-me-up or a good calming down flocked to these easily available prescription medicines. Valium, the most popular of these brand-name legal drugs, was introduced in 1963. In 1966, the Rolling Stones, unamused by the seemingly arbitrary line dividing legal and illegal drugs, mocked the yellow pill in their hit song "Mother's Little Helper." In 1978 alone, even after some regulatory reform, some 2.3 billion Valium pills were legally sold in the U.S. Drugs were everywhere in post-Second World War America. The question was, what made some legal and others illegal? In the 60s era, as the Rolling Stones song suggests. A number of young people were in open rebellion against the cultural conventions, social authority, and hypocritical behavior of their elders. The social change movements of the era fueled those young people's disdain for the racist and sexist status quo. The increasingly unpopular and stalemated Vietnam War intensified young Americans' disregard for the moral claims and conventional proprieties of their elite elders. In response to these massive social and political pressures, a countercultural lifestyle flowered. As the youth rebellion spread, so did many young people's rejection of the line between legal intoxicants such as alcoholic beverages, legally prescribed medicines such as Valium, and underground illegal highs such as marijuana and LSD. By 1970. Cannabis use was endemic on college campuses and was fast spreading to the nation's high schools. One of the nation's most popular films, Easy Rider, featured two dope dealing protagonists and scenes of beatific stoned hippies. Illegal drugs, at least in the eyes of many parents, were suddenly everywhere. Authorities at the state level began to respond. 
California, at the epicenter of the youth counterculture, helped lead the way. Between 1962 and 1972, law enforcement personnel around the state increased marijuana arrests some 20-fold, with most of those arrested charged with felony possession. Governor Ronald Reagan warned of the increasing problem of drug abuse in his January 6, 1970, State of the State Address. The physical and mental destruction of youth is far greater than the public is led to believe, he explained. Just as alarming is the growth of the drug culture, which is tolerated, even touted, by many who influence our youth. He then proclaimed that he would take legislative and administrative steps to wage a war against the peddler and the pusher. Other state governors followed, with New York's Nelson Rockefeller moving the most aggressively. The U.S. Congress, too, was jumping on the punitive anti-drug bandwagon, though not yet with its full weight. A few months before President Nixon's public declaration of an all-out offensive against illegal drugs, Congress passed the Federal Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970, commonly known as the Controlled Substances Act, CSA. This 60-page bill consolidated U.S. federal drug policy and demonstrated American commitment to a U.S.-led 1961 United Nations Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs, which committed member nations to a coordinated attack on international drug trafficking. The CSA was, significantly, more than just a law-and-order measure. The entire first section of the law spelled out a rehabilitation regime aimed at helping drug addicts, particularly those dependent on heroin. The new law also spelled out a series of measures that better regulated white market but often abused prescription drugs, such as Valium. But much of the rest of the bill set the stage for a harsh war on drugs. In particular, the CSA set up a series of schedules that determined the medical utility and thus legal status of drugs. Heroin was determined to have no acceptable medical use and was thus completely banned as a Schedule I drug, the highest level of prohibition. Its sale and use in all regards was criminal and punishable by imprisonment. So, too, did Congress declare that LSD and marijuana were Schedule I drugs without any medical use and were therefore also criminalized in every regard. Cocaine, opium, methamphetamine, pentobarbital were all deemed to have some medical uses and thus, when properly prescribed, were still legal, though not when they were sold on the black market. A whole series of other prescriptible drugs were sorted into three additional relatively low-risk categories. These drug schedules became the basis for much of the criminalization of drug use that followed over the next several decades. Friedel explains, While lawmakers viewed their labors as an effort to impose logic and coherence upon the sprawling and inconsistent world of drug laws, in completely severing drug regulation from taxes and the world of trade, they put forward crime and rejected trade as the appropriate framework within which to consider and regulate illicit drugs. This process had been developing incrementally since the early 20th century. By the end of 1970, the federal government had comprehensively overturned its earlier regulatory approach to all drugs and created instead an often blurry, even arbitrary line between how government authorities would approach white market drugs as medicines to be prescribed and regulated and black market drugs as dangerous substances to be banned and criminalized. Richard Nixon's June 17, 1971 declaration of a war on drugs was the last step in this long and not always linear process in which users and sellers of hard drugs would come to be treated as dangerous criminals deserving of punishment. Between 1971 and the present, the war on drugs would be waged with varying degrees of intensity, always inequitably, often ineptly, on a range of battlefields. The chapters that follow explore some of the most treacherous and telling encounters on that deadly and dangerous terrain. Part 2. Supply and Demand 2. Drug Dealers David Farber 
The war on drugs has above all targeted drug traffickers. For decades, drug dealers have been vilified, arrested, and imprisoned. Yet their numbers remain relatively stable. While authorities wage their wars on crack cocaine, heroin, and marijuana, at least some people, and not just drug users, support their neighborhood dealers. The drug dealer is a complicated figure in American society, envisioned through the prism of race, class, and conflicting cultural beliefs. One. For decades, drug dealers have been part of the American social fabric. For many, they are not shadowy, anonymous figures. People know drug dealers, have neighbors who are drug dealers, have friends who are drug dealers, have done deals with drug dealers. Nobody has hard-nosed figures on how many people, full-time, part-time, or once in a great while, have sold illegal drugs over the past half century or so. A wily writer at the popular political number-crunching site 538 used a Fermi estimation. Don't ask to deduce that in 2011, at a minimum, 121,600 people dealt illegal cannabis full time at the retail level in the United States. That number did not include growers, smugglers, distributors, wholesalers, or the elderly couple that grew a few pot plants for home consumption but sold the occasional bud on the side. In the late 1980s, about 35 percent of adult Americans surveyed said that drug dealing was widespread or somewhat widespread in their neighborhoods. That survey included people who lived in big cities, suburbs, and rural areas. In 1975, the survey data used by the federal government stated that 87.8 percent of 12th graders claimed that it would be fairly easy or very easy to get marijuana. That percentage stayed almost unchanged over the next several decades. In the 1970s and indeed thereafter, marijuana dealers predominated in the illegal drug dealing business. Certainly, in the 1970s, other illegal drugs were harder to find for the average 17 or 18 year old. But a significant number of older high school students then and later, no matter what the substance, reported that an illegal purveyor could be readily found if the need arose. Personally, between 1971, when President Nixon announced the war on drugs, and now, I have lived all over the U.S., from the north side of Chicago to the north shore of Oahu, from the Upper West Side of Manhattan to rural Kansas. In all that time, I've never resided more than a few hundred yards from someone I know who is in the illegal drug business. Drug dealers have been and are everywhere in the U.S. Even as America's drug warriors, backed by a majority of the citizenry, have tried to eradicate them, in keeping with the war on drugs metaphor, at least some leaders of the anti-drug movement during the fiercest decades of the war have insisted that dealers are not simply neighbors who have crossed into criminality, but are murderous combatants of the worst kind, deserving of no mercy. President George H. W. Bush, in a campaign speech in 1988, declared, "Drug dealers are domestic terrorists, killing kids and cops, and they should be treated as such. I won't bargain with terrorists, and I won't bargain with drug dealers either." In 1987, at the height of the crack cocaine crisis, some 38 percent of Americans surveyed told pollsters that convicted drug dealers. Guilty of no other crime and with the quantity and kind of drug being dealt unspecified, should be executed. Over the past 50 years, Americans accused of drug dealing have been arrested millions of times. Those arrests have led to mass imprisonment at the state and local levels. Between 1980 and 2000, in New York, over 125,000 people went to state prison for drug trafficking. Most of them low-level dealers. In many jurisdictions, imprisonment on drug felony charges only increased in the first decade of the 21st century. In the Chicago area, between 2000 and 2011, nearly 100,000 people, 88 percent of them African American, were jailed or imprisoned for drug dealing or possession with intent to distribute. Nationally, during the second decade of the 21st century. 
Roughly a quarter of a million people every year have been arrested for distributing or manufacturing illegal drugs. At least until very recently, American politicians could almost always successfully court voters by demanding ever tougher punishments for drug dealers. And yet, despite the opprobrium and risk of arrest and imprisonment, the dealers just keep on keeping on, supplying a massive demand. Most dealers ply their trade to make money. Some are in the business to feed their own habits. A few are in it for the thrills. And some think LSD, peyote, mescaline, DMT, and related entheogens are missionaries for an alternative consciousness. All dealers in illegal drugs are, by definition, criminals, operating in a lawless realm in which rip-offs, extortion, and violence are commonplace. During the long decades of the drug war, dealers have fed Americans demands for the illegal substances that have kept tens of millions of people high. For their sins, venal and mortal, they have been damned by most, celebrated by some, protected by others, and left always to wonder if the business they chose was worth the risks they had taken and the lives they had changed, often for the worse. Drug dealers do have their supporters, obviously. In a variety of subcultures and countercultures, as well as in suburban basements, outside convenience stores, and on inner-city street corners, at least some drug users have perceived drug dealers as a necessary, and even in some special cases, heroic presence in their communities. They have been, in certain instances and circumstances, accorded a kind of respect. The historian E.J. Hobsbawm has called such criminals social bandits. While the authorities persecuted such men, people in a host of diverse marginal communities, though by no means everyone in those communities, saw dealers as figures of resistance in a corrupt society, suppliers of commonly used and prized commodities, and in some cases, tricksters who had figured out how to put one over on the hypocritical society that treated them with disdain and attempted to keep them poor and powerless. For at least some citizens of the intoxicated state, in which getting high has been both common and illegal, drug dealers have been the resistance, guerrilla fighters waging an asymmetric battle against America's heavily armed, merciless drug warriors. 2. In 1971, the year President Nixon declared his war on drugs, as the U.S. was racked with anger and discontent, the singer-songwriter Chris Christopherson laid down an elegy, The Pilgrim, Chapter 33. See him wasted on the sidewalk in his jacket and his jeans, Christopherson sang, wearing yesterday's misfortunes like a smile. It's a song about artistry, outlaw life, sorry times, and illegal drugs. A year later, Christopherson starred in a small Hollywood film, Cisco Pike, Christopherson plays a just-out-of-prison, guitar-playing drug dealer who's forced by a crooked cop, the irrepressible Gene Hackman, whose much bigger drug movie The French Connection came out the year before, to distribute one more load of weed or go to prison for the rest of his life. In the film, the pilgrim plays as Cisco lays off a pound here and a brick there to a Hollywood director, a bell-bottomed boat builder, a pimp, and a variety of right-on long hairs. While Pike wanders the mean streets dealing his dope, Christopherson, in a voiceover, sings, He's a poet, he's a picker, he's a prophet, he's a pusher. He's a walkin' contradiction. The drug dealer in this movie and in this song in 1972 is a tragic hero, forced to break the law by a corrupt society. The cannabis he sells hurts no one, the only one at risk is the dealer. Dope-dealing heroes, tragic or otherwise, were not just a Hollywood conceit, especially in the late 1960s and early 1970s. In 1968, acid luminary Timothy Leary paid homage to America's countercultural dope dealers. Dealing drugs, he said, is an ancient and honorable profession. The New York City underground newspaper The East Village Other, publisher of the story in which Leary praised drug dealers, titled the article, Deal for Real, 
the dealer as Robin Hood. Leary, though a self-interested party, was not alone in seeing weed dealers and psychedelic distributors in the 1960s and 1970s as paladins of the ascending counterculture. In white America's long 1960s, drug dealers were essential contributors to the countercultural scene. Some became celebrities in their own right, at least among the cognoscenti. Acid dealers in particular became living legends. Augustus Ousley Stanley III, nicknamed Bear, was the first and foremost of the acid dealer visionaries. He, an autodidact of uncanny abilities, along with the academically trained chemist Melissa Cargill, became the first large-scale producers of LSD in the United States. Ousley was not in it for the money. He believed in the spiritual, life-altering power of LSD. He gave away at least half of the acid he made. None of the money that came from acid I felt was my money. I was like the custodian of it. What I was doing was something for the community, he told a High Times journalist. Stanley used his acid money to subsidize the early Grateful Dead and to help fund San Francisco's psychedelic paper of record, The Oracle. At the 1967 Human Bee Inn at San Francisco's Golden Gate Park, Ousley gave away thousands of hits of White Lightning. Rock Scully, the manager of the Grateful Dead, looking back some 40 years later, described Ousley as revered because he was a bit of a guru and an alchemist. He was our good wizard, an extreme Robin Hood-like outlaw wizard. His acid was everywhere in those early years. Other chemists of like mind joined in. An acid distribution network led by Ousley took form. Dealers, Ousley instructs, can sell a dose for no more than two dollars. Putting it out through a sales trip, he believed, allowed a wide distribution that wouldn't have happened if there had been no money in it. Among those who first moved Ousley's acid, and then the acid produced by like-minded acolytes, was the Brotherhood of Eternal Love. Bell. The Brotherhood grew out of a hard-knuckled crew of working-class surfer dudes and petty criminals who first operated in Southern California. Their leader, John Griggs, had stolen his first doses of LSD from a Hollywood producer at gunpoint. The acid, as the saying went, put him through some changes, and he decided to use his outlaw talents to bring acid and hashish and high-quality cannabis to the masses. Surfer legend Mike Hinson describes his friend. Griggs had gold flashing out of his eyes and tongue, and those words. He was just a magical guy. Under Griggs's loose leadership, the bell connected with countercultural acid makers. Quickly, and for the next several years, they distributed massive quantities of LSD, tens of millions of doses throughout Southern California, the Bay Area, and then nationally. They also gave away hundreds of thousands of doses at B-ins, music festivals, and everywhere the burgeoning counterculture gathered. The Bell set up an above-board headquarters in Laguna Beach. The Mystic Arts World was a combination head shop, art gallery, health food store, and community hangout. For all to see, it represented and disseminated the psychedelic culture the Bell aimed to foster through the emergent acid consciousness they helped make possible by dealing drugs. John Griggs died from a massive overdose of psilocybin in 1969. Timothy Leary, who had spent time with Griggs and the Brotherhood, was devastated. He was the holiest man ever to live in this country. The Bell pushed onward though some say that without Griggs, the scene changed. For some of the dealers, the lure of big money became ever more paramount. In the late 1960s and the early 1970s, the Bell, a loosely coordinated crew that included as many as a couple of hundred people, distributed millions of hits of Orange Sunshine LSD and tons of hash and cannabis. The Bell, at least in its drug dealers as countercultural spiritual apostles iteration, took a massive blow in 1972, when a task force comprised of 21 law enforcement agencies from up and down the West Coast targeted the Brotherhood's vast drug distribution network. 
on August 5, 1972, a little more than a year into the Nixon administration's war on drugs, the task force simultaneously raided some two dozen bell houses in Hawaii, California, and Oregon. Fifty-three members were arrested and massive quantities of illegal drugs were seized, including two and a half tons of hashish and 1.5 million doses of orange sunshine. In the aftermath of the bust, Rolling Stone magazine mourned the takedown of the hippie mafia. Joe Esterhaas, the 27-year-old sympathetic author of the magazine's lengthy two-part series on the bell, mocked how legal authorities portrayed the crew. They are all members of an underground counterculture syndicate, the Brotherhood of Eternal Love. Corrupted flower children who once preached the teachings of Jesus Christ, now a cold-blooded family of criminal materialists, a denim cosa nostra. Jimi Hendrix was one of their soldiers. Timothy Leary is their godfather. In Counterpoint, Esther Haas quoted a Bell sympathizer. There was no real organization... The Brotherhood was more a vibe than a group. It symbolized love, understanding, and dope, and it symbolized freak power in Laguna Beach. Decades later, Esther Haas, who had become a successful screenwriter, succinctly summarized how divided Americans were over the sale and use of cannabis and hallucinogenics in the early 1970s. The country was completely polarized and the Brotherhood became an example of that polarization in front-line terms. In those years in Laguna Beach, there was a kind of war between the straight residents and the people with long hair, and it was deadly and occasionally lethally serious. The Bell was never just a bunch of peaceful, drug-dealing hippies with spiritual inclinations, just as it was never quite a cold-blooded family of criminal materialists. Some of the Bell crew, most infamously Johnny Gale, did follow the money and became stupendously wealthy coke dealers, reveling in life in the fast lane, to quote the great cocaine-fueled band of the 1970s, the Eagles. Others never gave up on their countercultural virtues. They stayed connected to the less mercenary, more spiritual side of the dope scene, even as they kept running their drug scams. We weren't gangsters insists one of the Bell originals, Michael Randall. We didn't carry guns, rob banks, or hurt people. We were doing this for all the right reasons, and we truly didn't benefit economically. We were living in teepees and driving old pickup trucks. When Randall was finally tracked down in the early 1980s, charged and found guilty of breaking numerous drug laws, the sentencing judge commended the drug dealer for staying true to his beliefs. I admire that. And by the way, I was at your store, Mystic Arts, in Laguna Beach when I was a law student, and I thought it was beautiful. I hate to sentence you to prison right now. Nonetheless, he did. The Brotherhood of Eternal Love was notorious, and at least in some regards, unique. No other dope crew could claim acid avatar Timothy Leary as its patron saint. No other would be eulogized in Rolling Stone magazine. Still, Bell Associates were far from the only semi-organized, semi-public countercultural dealers of cannabis and psychedelics, especially in the 1970s. Countercultural dope scammers, smugglers, offloaders, distributors, and major dealers, often specializing in exotic and high-quality cannabis, proliferated in the 1970s. Many tried to stick to a code of behavior eschewing the brutality and cutthroat behavior they associated with the heroin trade and other heavy drugs. They were self-styled hippie outlaws. There was the Coronado Company, another ragged group of Southern California surfers and watermen who helped introduce Americans to Thai Stick, arguably the most potent cannabis available in the U.S. in the early 1970s. They dealt in multi-ton loads. On the beaches around San Diego, they operated a DUKW, a duck, a Second World War-era vintage amphibious landing craft they used to bring in loads from offshore boats. Their daring do was less than covert. Everyone around their base of operation in Coronado knew who they were and what they did. But at least for a while, that visibility opened them up to only limited risk. 
Not only were they a part of the community of surfers and countercultural stoners, they were also major benefactors of it. To get their loads off the beaches and on their way to the marketplace, they paid friends and acquaintances a week's worth of wages and more for a few hours of intense work. If we take care of them, one of the core crew members insisted, they'll take care of us. As the writer Joshua Bierman observes, the partners could afford to be generous. Still in their twenties, they were walking around with fifty thousand dollars in their pockets, then one hundred thousand dollars, then a quarter of a million dollars. The Coronado Company drug dealers were, in their countercultural community, figures of renown. Most countercultural dope operations were far more low key and less remunerative. Yet they too had their circle of admirers. Most every college town had its own crews, whose illegal activities were often an open secret. In Lawrence, Kansas, home of the University of Kansas, the Caw Valley hemp pickers mixed local ditch weed with high-quality Mexican cannabis and sent loads east and west on Interstate 70 and up and down the heartland on a ribbon of state highways, like the Bell. The main figures in the loosely confederated drug operation tended to be working-class men with the skills and emotional register to carry off a dangerous and criminal business, but they reveled too in the anti-authoritarian hippie ethos of the times. The broader countercultural community, which both relished the profligate quantities of low-cost weed they supplied and appreciated the money they pumped into local hip and artisanal enterprises, embraced them. Some of these communities supported and community supporting countercultural illegal drug operations continued on for years in places like northern New Mexico, Humboldt County, and upcountry Maui, where countercultural communities took deep roots. Some cannabis businesses, which were built on broad networks of retail and wholesale customers, were handed off from one generation to the next. The domestic artisanal weed business, at least in some often secluded parts of the U.S., maintained its countercultural ethos right up to contemporary times. Local mores and social solidarity kept the illegal operations viable and protected, at least until outside authorities stepped in. More often, however, countercultural drug operations evolved into more mercenary businesses. Sometimes, as was the case with some of the Bell members who evaded the early 1970s busts, more profitable cocaine dealing replaced cannabis and hallucinogenics, and no one could make a compelling case that running cocaine was some kind of spiritual endeavor. Robert Stubby Tierney, one of Bell's honchos, insists, "Cocaine destroyed our scene. Brothers started taking opium and doing cocaine and amphetamines." That took all the spirituality out and made people selfish. The coke would make everyone paranoid. When I started really dealing cocaine, it made my life miserable. Whether it was the coke, changing times, or both, the countercultural ethos, with its spiritual trappings and communitarian dreams, had lost its allure for most by the late 1970s. Some hippie dealers, including a few who had run LSD at the highest levels, chose to become deviant yuppie millionaires. Seemingly without remorse or any sense of cultural betrayal, they became gold chain wearing, champagne drinking, materialist obsessives with a propensity for violence. A young associate of the Bell's, Johnny Gale, who would become one of California's biggest coke dealers by the late 1970s. Got arrested in Orange County. He was offered a deal to inform on Gale, but he refused. He would have killed me. He had bodyguards and Ferraris and all this crazy shit. A brand new Mercedes, and you know what? The weird thing was that he was not a nice guy anymore. Customers noticed the difference. Peter McGuire. Co-author of the definitive book on the dope smugglers and distributors who created the Thai stick market in the U.S. sums it up: To us pot-smoking teenagers, scammers were heroic Robin Hood characters, but by the 1990s, those days were over. The Robin Hood era of dope dealing, in which customers and suppliers had understood themselves to be invested in more than just a financial transaction. 
ended not just as a result of cocaine greed and yuppie disillusionment. Throughout the 1970s and especially into the 1980s, as illegal drug markets became even more lucrative in the U.S., even the weed and LSD trade became a much harder, more violent business. Men who had no concerns about using extreme violence to control lucrative, illegal businesses were taking over. While dedicated followers of the Grateful Dead and related countercultural associates continued to play a significant role in retailing LSD, increasingly, heavy underworld gangsters and international criminals became invested in the business, too. In 1978, Frank Ragusa, a major LSD dealer with shady European connections, was murdered in his ritzy Oakland Hills home. He had been stabbed 29 times. His wife and sister were killed as well. More than a million dollars worth of ergotamine tartrate, ET, the key ingredient in the making of LSD, was found in his residence. Ragusa was no hippie. As LSD historian Jesse Jarno notes, Ragusa flies first class and shaves with a $500 gold-rimmed razor. The Oakland detectives investigating the murder filled in some of the blanks. Ragusa, they told reporter, had bought his E.T. from a recently busted European criminal network known as the Judo Gang. Martial arts enthusiasts, they smuggled drugs around the world in judo mats. Ragusa, the police continued, worked closely as well with the Mafia on the East Coast. Maybe the recent bust and the Mafia connections explained his murder, but they admitted maybe it did not. Ragusa, just 30 when he was killed, was no stranger to the California youth scene. He had gone to the University of California, Berkeley, but he came from a long line of hard men. Both his father and grandfather had been violently murdered. The hippie mafia had been replaced, at least in this case, by the real thing. Countercultural Robin Hoods were no match for the mafia. Biker gangs, Mexican cartels, Colombian drug lords, Hawaiian gangsters, and myriad other brutal men. 3. In recent decades, the drug dealer's mercurial contested status as criminal slash social bandit Chris Christofferson's walking contradiction has been perhaps most apparent in poor inner-city communities, where underground economies have long been a way of life. In such places, in which the means for achieving social status and economic self-determination are too often in short supply, the successful drug dealer can be both an exemplar and a warning, a sign of desperation and a signal of accomplishment. In Oakland, California, in 1986, those cultural contradictions surrounding the status and meaning of drug dealing were put on public display when thousands of people gathered to send off one of the city's biggest heroin distributors, Felix the Cat Mitchell. Mourners filled the sidewalks and streets outside his East Oakland home. They watched in silence as a group of solemn men in black tuxedos carried his bronze casket out of the house to a horse-drawn carriage. Four Rolls Royces, ten white limousines, and a long procession of Cadillacs and Lincolns lined up behind the carriage and rolled slowly from East Oakland through the downtown area and then alongside Lake Merritt, snarling traffic for hours as they made their way to the burial site. At the funeral service at Star Bethel Baptist Church, some 1,500 people squeezed inside. Another thousand stood outside. Reverend Ivy Rideau, at the pulpit alongside a massive floral arrangement in the shape of a dollar sign, preached the gospel, God is merciful. Mitchell, age 32, had been murdered August 21, 1986 at Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary some 1,700 miles from Oakland. An inmate had stabbed Mitchell ten times over a petty drug debt. Mitchell had been in prison for just over a year. For nearly a decade before he was incarcerated, Mitchell, the undisputed leader of the 69 mob, had been Oakland's heroin kingpin. His crew had been bringing in some $5 million a year before he was taken out. Oakland police officers watched Mitchell's funeral procession with disgust. 
Two of them, plain as day, sat in a bright red Ferrari convertible with the top down, taking photographs of known associates of Mitchell as they drove by. The car had been Mitchell's, seized after his arrest. One of the detectives told a reporter, They're trying to martyr him, this scumbag, this murderer, this convicted heroin dealer. As far as I'm concerned, justice was served. Oakland City Councilman Leo Brazil, standing outside Mitchell's house, worried that the lavish spectacle sent exactly the wrong message to the city's young people, calling it hero worship of a murdering thug. Another councilman, Carter Gilmore, also in attendance, speaking to the throng of reporters, echoed this concern. I'm very upset by this. He used young kids to deal with drugs. I don't think any of us here want our kids to be brought up this way, and I think this is a good example of what happens when you're brought up with drugs. Several people in the crowd, gathered in a scrum around the television cameras and reporters, took offense at Gilmore's comments. A young man shouted, You put some jobs here, maybe we won't have this on the streets of Oakland. A young woman agreed. I know what he's done. He was a good man and we need to tell the city officials that if they get the jobs out here, maybe it wouldn't be so many drugs in Oakland. An eleven-year-old boy, sporting a Yankees cap, was asked what he thought. It's great. The whole thing is great. He was kind of cool. He wore cool clothes. He would give my mother money sometimes. I feel sorry for him that he was stabbed like that. Another boy, feeling no need to explain, compared Mitchell to Martin Luther King, Jr. A middle-aged woman listening in added, You know, he taught the young kids that you don't have to live poor and you don't have to die poor. A 31-year-old man concurred. He made this out of nothing. He just made it happen. The man was a realist. He worked with what he had. Being a black man in this world, nothing comes easy. He did what he had to do. Felix Mitchell, in life, had been a tall, slim, charismatic man. He never made it out of high school, but, among other signs of his stupendous success, he had sported a necklace with a small hourglass filled with dozens of shiny diamonds. Daryl Lil D. Reed, a teenage Mitchell protege who would in turn become an Oakland drug kingpin before he turned 21, running crack, not heroin, worshipped the man. The way he dressed up, I never seen anybody so fly. You caught up in the visual. As Reed knew, Mitchell was far more than a charismatic bon vivant, sporting the latest fashions and high-end jewelry. Because Mitchell's business was illegal and immensely profitable, he also had to be a hard man. As Mitchell's teenage protege, Reed had watched and learned how the Mob 69 crew operated on Oakland's streets. They jumped out of their cars with machine guns. You couldn't be soft around these guys because they were what you called real gangsters in the streets. Them explaining to me what the rules were in the streets, I knew what the consequences were. If you jumped in the streets, you had to be prepared for some of the violence what came from the streets. Killing and terrorizing rivals was a necessary aspect of the work. In August 1980, Mitchell's people went to war with a rival crew, the family, over drug-selling territory. In just three days, six people were shot dead. Such murderous internecine struggles were a part of the price of doing business. As Martin Chango Mejias, the leader of the Yellow Top Crack Crew on New York City's Upper West Side in the late 1980s put it, we did what we had to do to survive. In our case, it took killing to survive. Killing and deploying violence was far from the whole story for any large-scale drug crew. Felix Mitchell brought much more to the game. To run his sprawling business, he developed extraordinary organizational skills. Some of what he needed to know he learned from drug-dealing legend Thomas C. Tootie Reese, who began his operation in south-central Los Angeles in 1965. Reese informally mentored Mitchell, teaching him how to manage relationships with his suppliers and distributors without the benefit of contracts or legal protection of any kind. Mostly, though, Mitchell learned on the job. Mitchell was inventive. 
to keep his unschooled and often dangerous associates in line and productive, he regularly gathered his lieutenants together to watch The Godfather, using the movie to provide his men with lessons about the benefits of loyalty and discipline. Mitchell was also an inveterate fan of TV crime shows, especially The Untouchables. He was much taken by The Untouchables' portrait of Prohibition-era gangster Al Capone, and at least according to his protege Lil D., he modeled himself after the infamous public enemy number one. Then, too, to minimize deleterious scrutiny of his affairs, he worked hard to maintain beneficial community relations. He developed a relationship with Huey Newton, the leader of the Oakland-headquartered Black Panther Party. Though the Panthers were, by the late 1970s, no longer a national organization, their power rapidly fading even in Oakland, Mitchell recognized that Newton and the few remaining Panthers remained a force to be reckoned with. Mitchell treated Newton, by this time a prodigious user of cocaine, with respect, though he did refuse Newton's extortionate demands that Mob 69 provide him with donations. Though Mitchell refused to pay off the Panthers, he was by all accounts a generous local benefactor. He spread around cash, slipping boys' money for new sneakers and Fila sportswear. He put on lavish parties that supported the local community. More practically, to make sure that his business's many revenue streams were accounted for and distributed wisely, Mitchell worked hard to develop the kind of financial acumen for which he had no formal training. Mitchell somehow succeeded. Even his law enforcement enemies were impressed by Mitchell's abilities to run his massive enterprise. Felix could have been a CEO, Oakland FBI agent Steiner told a journalist. He had a knack for business. Unfortunately, that business was heroin. Taking a page unwittingly from Hopsbaum, Lil D. Reed emotionally recalled that Felix the Cat Mitchell was like Robin Hood to us. Looking back both at his own years as a drug dealer and at the glory years of his mentor, Reed spoke for many of that era's Oakland street corner boys. I know that Felix did what he did, but at the end of the day, I got love for Felix. Reed understood firsthand as well the love and renown an inner-city drug kingpin could earn in his community. Before Reed was 18, having learned at the feet of his master, he was making more than $15,000 daily selling crack cocaine in his Oakland neighborhood. Before he was 20, his massive crack ring was grossing millions a year. The big money, he knew, brought him respect, at least among his drug-dealing peers, and admiration, at least from those in his community who benefited from his willingness to spread the wealth. Reed's operation, which employed dozens of corner sellers, stash house attendants, cooks, soldiers, runners, and various part-timers, put good money into people's formerly empty pockets. Such money, Lil D's friend, Stanley Kirk Burrell, better known as rapper-slash-dancer MC Hammer, wrote, was not easily attained in Oakland's ghetto in any other way. Young men choose the game because they see no hope of the American dream being lived around them without the hustle and grind of the streets. Reed self-consciously worked to foster his image as a good drug dealer. Not unlike the countercultural drug dealers who preceded him, he saw himself as part of the community in which he operated. He wanted his dealers to understand that they needed to be decent to their customers, who were often their neighbors. I stressed to the guys that work for me that was hustling in the streets, he explained to an interviewer, to not be mistreating the people who come and buy drugs. I stressed to the guy that I was dealing with, don't mistreat people. They could be your auntie or your uncle. I demanded to the guys that was dealing with them, don't take advantage of them in the situation. Reed, at least at the time, believed that he did his best to supply his community with a highly desired product at a fair price under favorable conditions. In retrospect, Reed insists, he just wasn't aware that selling crack to desperate neighbors could and should be construed as less than meritorious service. As he saw it, I just thought I was doing what everybody else was doing, trying to find a better way to change my life and change my family life and I didn't realize I was doing more harm to my community 
A lot of young guys at the time, they wasn't thinking about that, man. We were just trying to get some money. And Reed definitely was getting money. That money, as was made plain by those who mourned the loss of Felix Mitchell, was at the core of what earned Reed his peers' respect and admiration. That and the fact, too, that he was neither arrogant about his achievements nor selfish with his wealth. Indeed, Reed's public largesse led directly to his downfall. In 1988, Reed threw himself a spectacular 20th birthday party. He wanted to show off, for sure, but he also wanted to give his community a night no one would ever forget. It was a black tie only event. More than 3,000 young black men and women celebrated Reed's big day at the Golden Gate Fields Turf Club across the bay from Oakland. There was champagne on ice for everyone. Reed, leaving his teenage years behind, was dressed in an oversized white tuxedo with a jet black button down shirt. He flashed a massive gold and diamond medallion. MC Hammer and Too Short, the biggest rappers to have come out of Oakland, performed. Too Short brought down the house. Everybody's got that same old dream to have big money and fancy things. In the words of Hammer, it was legendary. Cats from all over Northern California came to the party, and everybody was dressed to the nines. You had cats that came in with all white tuxes. You had cats who came in black and white. And you had cats in turquoise tuxes. It was a celebration of our little partner. Everybody had a ball. Daryl Reed, the biggest crack dealer in Oakland, was the man for all to see. The event did not go unnoticed by law enforcement. They already had their eyes and ears on Reed. The brazen party was too much. Just days after Darrell Reed's extravaganza, Oakland narcotics officers raided his Adams Point apartment in Oakland. They caught him in the act of cooking some 30 pounds of powder cocaine into crack in a massive soup pot on his stovetop. His hands were covered in cocaine. Another 16 or so kilos were lined up, readied for the next batch. Reed had always been meticulous in taking personal care of his product, and that commitment led to his downfall. Darrell Reed was charged federally under the Anti Drug Abuse Act of 1986. This is the notorious law that mandated that crack cocaine dealers, who were overwhelmingly African American, caught with just 1% as much weight as powder cocaine dealers, who overwhelmingly were not African American, received the same lengthy prison sentences. Reed, by both measures, met that standard. Just 20 years old, he received a federal sentence of 35 years, even though he had committed no violent crimes. President Barack Obama commuted Reed's sentence in 2016 after he had served 26 years in prison. Reed's story is far from unique. In the 1980s and 1990s, crack crews, overwhelmingly dominated by young black men willing to deploy whatever means were necessary to control drug selling territories, sprang up all over the U.S., taking advantage of hard times in inner city communities to supply a cheap, potent high that had customers lined up nearly 24 7. In New York City, The Supreme Team, the Yellow Top Crew, Sex Money Murder, the Gully Men, and others got rich fast before being taken down by law enforcement. The same held true in Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., and every other big city, as well as many a smaller community that had the necessary consumer base. Crack rings all over the U.S. made millions of dollars, and that crazy money, Made by unschooled young black men operating in their own poor neighborhoods, raised a heated conversation within the African American community. For some, the drug money and the power and respect that drug money earned was all that needed to be understood. A whole hip hop genre, gangsta rap, emerged to lavish praise on the Gucci wearing, Gold chained, luxury automobile owning, murderous crack entrepreneurs who were reinventing the Horatio Alger self made man myth for young inner city men on the make. NWA, a group of artists who came straight out of Compton, explained the lure of the trade. Young brother getting over by slanging cane, 
gold around his neck 14K he has it. Bitches on his dick 24-7. Scarface, a Houston rapper who hustled drugs before making it as an artist, insisted that dealing crack wasn't much different from what some of America's better-known wealthy men did to make their pile. Nigga rolling hard, stacking paper like Trump. Nas, a rap lyricist with few peers, who gave up on school after the eighth grade, linked together what he saw as the only two ways a young black man could get ahead. Hey yo, the rap game reminds me of the crack game. The crack hustler, whether the street corner boy with a tech and his Air Jordans, or the kingpin rolling down the street in a mint white Cadillac, was a hood celebrity. Strangest of all, perhaps, was that the gangster rapper, who often emulated the ostentatious flossing and menacing attitude of their gangster peers, became style icons for a not insubstantial segment of white middle-class youths. Hip-hop verses celebrating the slinging of crack and the gunning down of rival drug crews became locker room chants and drunken frat boy choruses. A Washington Post article in 1992 was one of many that had a journalist reporting back from a fancy suburban high school about the phenomenon. Asian American boys grab their crotches rap style, and white boys splutter, Yo, what's up, man? For others, whose contact with blacks is limited to the two dimensions of an MTV video, hip-hop's allure runs as shallow as the gangsta swagger, the exotic otherness the aggressive, strong, simple beats. The crack dealer, channeled through the gangsta rapper, became a suburban icon. Some of the fiercest and most successful hip-hop artists did push back against the vainglorious portraits of the gun-toting, hoe-bashing, money-stacking crack dealer. Tupac Shakur yo-yoed back and forth between celebrating and living the life of the drug-slinging gangster and recognizing the walking contradictions of the neighborhood-destroying crack dealer. In a track that perhaps only he could have pulled off, titled Dear Mama, he began, You are appreciated. And then, loving son to worried mother, he explained, I ain't guilty, because even though I sell rocks, it feels good putting money in your mailbox. Todd Anthony Shaw, better known as Too Short, who gave that boffo performance at Oakland crack kingpin Daryl Reed's birthday party, was one of several rappers who knew better. A year after Reed got sent away on a 35-year bid, Too Short released his song, The Ghetto. Sitting in the jailhouse running your mouth while me and my peoples try to get out. Dealing crack. Even sympathetic hip-hop artists knew, was at best a devil's bargain. Within poor communities, most people did not countenance crack and heroin dealers. They despised them, even as they often feared them. In the 1960s and 1970s, black residents of Harlem watched heroin rip through their neighborhood. Dealers sold out in the open. A high school addict told a reporter, I could walk down 122nd Street between 7th and 8th Avenues and pick up anything I wanted any time, like a bazaar or something. Junkies robbed and stole and mugged. Some sections of the so-called Harlem business section after nightfall look like a ghost town, the Amsterdam News reported to its African-American readership. People continue to be afraid to walk the streets at night. Harlem Congressman Charles Rangel was furious with the dealers, but equally with the police who allowed drug dealers to operate in his district with near impunity. Drugs affected every part of every life in my town. Senior citizens were assaulted by addicts, while addicts were fighting and killing one another and had taken over whole streets and neighborhoods. Congressman Rangel, alongside a great many other black elected officials and community leaders, vowed to bring the dealers down. For the next 25 years, Wrangell would be one of the fiercest of America's drug warriors. African Americans, especially in poor neighborhoods, were even more torn apart by the scourge of crack cocaine in the 1980s and 1990s. After the young basketball star Len Bias died of a cocaine overdose in 1986, though many believed he died from crack, he had actually been snorting powder cocaine, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, 
then America's best-known civil rights leader, launched a searing Jeremiah at the people who supplied young black men and women with drugs. Speaking to a large crowd of mourners at the University of Maryland's Memorial Chapel, Jackson was deadly serious. Ropes never killed as many of our young people as the pushers of drugs. Lenny was vulnerable, but all of us are. We must make his death the turning point. Soon after Bias's overdose death, Congressman Charles Rangel, a liberal, worked closely with the conservative Reagan administration to pass the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, the single most punitive law ever passed during the war on drugs. At the federal level, it massively increased prison sentences for drug dealers, targeting above all the young black men who sold crack cocaine. It also began a massive increase in the amount of money and resources the federal government would expend on arresting, convicting, and imprisoning drug dealers. In general, people cheered this more aggressive, more merciless war on drugs. A June 1989 Gallup poll revealed that, by a three-to-one ratio, Americans believed that drugs were Americans' number one problem. President George H.W. Bush's political advisors told the newly elected president that, in the minds of most voters, no measure could go too far in punishing drug dealers. In response, the Bush administration floated the idea of making certain kinds of drug dealing offenses capital crimes, something Bush had first raised on the campaign trail. Letters of support flooded into the White House. The penalty should be death! Put the automatic death penalty to the vote of the people of the USA. I believe that capital punishment is a better solution rather than spending millions of dollars to build more jails and overcrowd them again. Many, in hopes of bringing the war to a successful conclusion, wanted the military to join the fray. Why are our armed forces on the ready to serve in a foreign country while our home front is ignored? Just asking. And let's make a war of it. Use our entire armed forces as a big war game exercise. Crank up the propaganda machine to offset the screams of inhuman treatment that are sure to follow. And I would very much appreciate an answer telling me why the military cannot eradicate these armed marijuana growers. Others insisted that if the U.S. was going to wage a war on drugs, then it should pull out all the stops. When drug pushers are caught, send them to the POW camp. Don't tie up the courts with these people. We didn't in World War I or II. Let's win the war first and worry about civil rights after the war is over. The Bush White House received thousands of letters demanding an escalation of the drug war. The administration backed off on the death penalty talk, in part because the Democratic majority in the Senate led by Joe Biden on this issue wasn't having it, but it did dramatically increase the federal prosecution of drug dealers and the financial support the federal government provided states and localities in locking them up. 4. Given the strength of popular support for the war on drugs, at least until recently, it is remarkable how hard it has been to put a stop to drug dealing. Part of the answer, of course, is built into the business equation. Government authorities for a very long time have made a number of extremely in-demand drugs illegal and have attached very high risks, basically imprisonment, to selling those drugs. As a result, to accommodate those sales risks in accord with the hungry demand, profit margins are quite good, even extraordinary. Such profit margins, risks be damned, incentivize the supply chain, from kingpin to street corner dealer. In addition, as the tales I have recounted should make abundantly clear, drug dealers are often enough dangerous people. So even if neighbors, parents, teachers, and ministers want drug dealers to stop peddling in their communities, making them stop is often far from easy. When I was interviewing knowledgeable insiders about the history of the crack cocaine industry in the 1980s and 1990s, admittedly among the most murderous of drug businesses, I was repeatedly told, 20 and more years after the fact, that talking with me about specific dealers and their networks was not a smart play. One man, who shall remain anonymous, explained the situation to me as simply as he could. I do know that one thing is for certain with the XXXXXX organization, 
You can be 100% for certain that if I get caught telling, that is the end of it. Community leaders and neighbors sometimes did take on the dealers. In some places, in some cases, those campaigns worked. In the Mantua neighborhood of West Philadelphia, Herman Rice became a local hero in the 1980s and 1990s by standing up to the crack dealers that operated openly in his community. He and a stalwart group of his neighbors boarded up abandoned crack houses, posted flyers showcasing the dealer of the week, and directly confronted street corner sellers. Stand up to them and they'll leave, Rice told his neighbors. Though the dealers threatened Rice's life, at least some of them eschewed the public shaming and did leave, though many simply opened up shop elsewhere. Sometimes, horrifically, such community efforts did not work. In East Baltimore in 2002, Angela Dawson, her husband, and their five children were burned to death by their drug-dealing neighbor after she contacted the police about his business. In part, Ms. Dawson had acted in response to Baltimore Mayor Martin O'Malley's Believe campaign, which had urged the city's residents to take their city back from the murderous drug crews that ran the streets. In 2000, in the Venice neighborhood of Los Angeles, the community's most vocal anti-drug dealer activist, James Richards, was gunned down right outside his modest home. They took his life to show that they are the winner, his domestic partner told reporters. Even as Mr. Richards' body still lay on the ground, an onlooker sneered, I'm glad he's dead. Others agreed, condemning the 55-year-old man as a snitch who had gotten what he deserved. Such tragic stories can be multiplied. Within the hip-hop community, there is an entire genre of anti-snitching rap songs. Some of the most celebrated artists, including Snoop Dogg, Lil Wayne, Scarface, Mob Deep, Pusha T, and many more, have spit out verses condemning any and all who would cooperate with the police against neighborhood drug dealers. Few of these rappers openly encourage the murder of local people who speak out against drug dealing in their neighborhoods, saving most of their bile for arrested dealers who roll over on their own networks. Still, they make the case repeatedly in their verses that cooperating with the police, whom they condemn as a racist occupying force in inner-city neighborhoods, is a greater offense than selling drugs in the street. So, while the fear of physical, even murderous retaliation is very real for those who would stand up to drug dealers in poor communities, so too is homegrown cultural opprobrium. In 2018, Philadelphia's African-American newspaper headlined a story, No Snitching Culture Cripples Community, recounting numerous unsolved crimes by drug crews. Drug dealers, for some, are less domestic terrorists than local people caught up in a tough business doing their best to survive and even prosper in a society that has given them too few ways to craft an upright life of dignity. The inner-city drug dealers who figured so prominently in the crack cocaine business of the 1980s and 1990s seemingly had little in common with the hippie weed and acid dealers of the early 1970s except for the social reality that all were criminals by law, and except for the shared cultural perception, among at least some of their peers and compatriots, that such outlawry was not without cause and reasonable intention. Robin Hoods, said Darrell Lil D. Reed. Robin Hoods, Timothy Leary, agreed. A majority of Americans then and now would have none of it. Then, too, once past the overly capacious label, drug dealer, people have perceived purveyors of illegal substances through a prism of all the usual social categories, race, class, ethnicity, age. Even in the fiercest days of the war on drugs, few white Americans wanted to see white teenage neighborhood weed dealers spend decades in prison. Many had fewer qualms about destroying the lives of inner-city black crack dealers. In the abstract, large majorities of Americans have directed an extraordinary animus toward drug dealers. In practice, unsurprisingly, that rage has largely targeted poor black dealers who have filled our prisons for decades. 
Daryl Reed asks why he got 35 years and the big pharma executives and investors who deluged America with opioids got nothing but rich. They ruined in more people's lives than cocaine or heroin. Those pharmaceutical companies, they drug dealers. So let us question what their drugs are doing to society, too. Sure, it's a self-serving observation, and yet... Chris Christopherson back in 1971 sang about the drug dealer as a walking contradiction. That contradiction, a man needed, even respected, but often reviled, a man who without judgment simply sells what people seek, is at the heart of American society's conflicted and confounding war on drugs. The American people, with their unparalleled hunger for intoxicating substances, a demand that extends across the social map, created a criminal class to feed that need and then declared war on it. That battle spread internecine violence throughout the land. Millions cumulatively became prisoners of that war. And still the dealers keep on keeping on in a war without end. 3. The Mexico-Chicago Heroin Connection Elaine Carey With the heightened war on drugs beginning in the 1970s, drug trafficking organizations embraced new technologies and transportation modalities while constructing cross-class and cross-ethnic alliances that reflected shifting power dynamics. The Herrera family organization was a nexus between old and new United States-Mexico organizations. Operating from Mexico's Golden Triangle and Chicago, it evaded the attention of law enforcement due to its complex structures and flexible business practices. Even when the enforcement agencies focused on taking down the Herreras, the family remained one step ahead by adapting certain practices, diversifying markets, shifting locations, expanding territories, and modernizing money laundering. The policing of the Herreras had a significant impact on the 1984 Comprehensive Criminal Control Act. 1. During the 1970s, the downsizing, closure, or relocation of local steel and heavy industries economically shattered the old industrial communities of Roseland and Pullman on the far south side of Chicago. These once vibrant working-class neighborhoods, whose residents had worked for generations in well-paid union jobs, saw their employment disappear, housing prices plummet, and commercial establishments close their doors. In the midst of the economic downturn, one major business did thrive in Roseland and Pullman, belying the many shuttered stores and factories. In the mid-1970s, these two economically depressed Chicago neighborhoods had become major distribution stations in the United States' Mexican transnational drug trade. Some of the highest-ranking members of the Herrera Drug Trafficking Organization, DTO, one of the most lucrative illegal drug operations originating in Mexico, made their home in the down-on-its-luck working-class communities of Roseland and Pullman. While the Herrera organization was based in Durango, Mexico, its U.S.-based distribution ring operated commercially out of Roseland, Pullman, and other scattered neighborhoods in southwest Chicago. They also set up shop in the far west Chicago suburb of Aurora, farther north in Milwaukee, and east in economically depressed communities in neighboring northwest Indiana. From the 1950s onward, the organization smuggled, distributed, and wholesaled thousands of kilos of heroin that originated in Durango and other parts of Mexico, and that flowed to the Chicago area through the U.S.-Mexican border towns such as El Paso, Ciudad Juarez. The Herreras had begun to use Chicago as their primary U.S. distribution base for heroin in the late 1950s. The city had drawn Herrera family members because they recognized the utility of Chicago, nationally known then as the city that works as a well-developed transportation and distribution hub. They took the heroin that arrived in Chicago, cut it, and after reserving a large amount for the local market, distributed it to other major Midwestern cities, such as St. Louis, Milwaukee, Gary, and Detroit, as well as into numerous towns and cities throughout the Northeast. 
While the Herrera DTO's origins were Mexican, its workforce resembled that of a modern transnational corporation, comprising Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, African Americans, and European Americans, men and women alike, all of whom became trusted members of the organization. The organization readily diversified its offerings when demand shifted, and it strategically expanded its market share over years. The Herrera DTO ran for decades like a well-oiled money-making machine. Journalists have often glorified and celebrated the spectacular rise and fall of notorious Mexican cartels, regaling readers with tales of violence, gun battles, wild parties, and finally the gaudy, lavish narco mausoleums that hold the remains of murdered drug lords. Common sights across Mexico nowadays. Such accounts are not inaccurate, but they hide another aspect of the drug trade. Some of the more enduring DTOs are sophisticated operations that shun public notoriety. The Herrera DTO operated for decades while avoiding the limelight and insisting that its members keep a low profile. The Herrera organization was always innovating to stay one step ahead of law enforcement. It embraced new technologies and transportation modalities. They constructed cross-class and cross-ethnic alliances that reflected shifting power dynamics in the global drug trade. Like many other major corporations, the Herrera DTO used complex management structures to run its business. To evade unwanted attention, its leaders insisted that its members maintain modest lifestyles. The Herrera DTO looked and acted little like the glorified narco dramas that circulate in telenovelas, films, and other forms of popular culture. The Chicago Police Department (CPD) and later the Drug Enforcement Administration (DEA) for decades failed to recognize that the Herrera DTO was the model many future drug traffickers in the U.S. would embrace. This family-based organization was a narco pioneer. The Herrera family successfully created a DTO that was transnational, bilingual, bicultural, and immensely profitable. While they remained rooted in a working-class Mexican-American environment in the U.S., the Herreras readily adapted to transnational business opportunities and law enforcement threats. They constantly diversified their markets and productions. They steadily forged new alliances. And they relocated to new locations when threats or opportunities arose. All the while, they maintained a free-flowing heroin pipeline that fed the massive demand of their U.S. consumers, who rejected the strict drug prohibition and fierce punishment strategies their elected representatives sought to enforce. Two, the Herrera DTO in the 1970s and America's war on drugs. After his inauguration in 1969, President Richard Nixon sought to fulfill his campaign promise to undermine illegal drug use and crush the criminal drug trade. That promise led the federal government to expand and reorganize the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. Its much beefed-up successor organization, the DEA, was formed in 1973. It understood that one of its primary responsibilities in waging a war on drugs was to take on the massive flow of contraband that was being brought into the U.S. by Mexican drug traffickers. As a result, by 1974, the DEA had six offices in Mexico and 157 agents on the U.S.-Mexico border. Based in Mexico, 54 agents worked with Mexican authorities and trained 250 of the 350 members of the Mexican Federal Judicial Police, Policía Judicial Federal (PJF), colloquially known as the Federales, in drug enforcement procedures. The PJF disbanded in 2002 after its agents' ties to DTOs became impossible to ignore. Abraham L. Azam, the deputy regional director of the DEA for the Chicago area, testified in 1977 that the DEA had a strong working relationship with the PJF in Mexico. Azam seemed not to know, or perhaps didn't care, that the Federales had long been despised by many Mexicans for their history of corrupt and violent practices. It is clear that the DEA worked with PJF officers on drug interdiction and policing without regard for or understanding of how Mexicans viewed the PJF. 
In the early 1970s, the DEA rediscovered an open secret that had been common knowledge among U.S. drug agents in the 1950s, that a large percentage of all heroin in the U.S. came from or through Mexico, and virtually all marijuana seized in the U.S. came from Mexico and Central America. In 1974, the DEA concluded that cocaine was also being moved through Mexico into the U.S. While the Colombian Medellin DTO based its U.S. operations initially in the borough of Queens in New York City, where its members received shipments of cocaine by sea and by air from multiple non-Mexican smugglers, the Medellin DTO also supplied the U.S. cocaine market with products smuggled across the U.S.-Mexico border crossings. By the mid-1970s, the Medellin organization moved its U.S. operations from New York to Miami, Florida, and worked even more closely with several cocaine-smuggling Mexican DTOs, including the Herreras. By 1974, the DEA knew that its earlier reports had underestimated the amount of heroin being supplied by Mexican traffickers. In 1971, the DEA had claimed that only 2% of the heroin consumed in the U.S. came from Mexico. But by 1974, they estimated that 50 to 70% of all heroin consumed in the U.S. came from Mexico. Any capitalist titan would be envious of such market growth. The DEA actually took credit for the tremendous success of Mexican DTOs, arguing that the increase was due to successful action against heroin entering the U.S. from Turkey and Western Europe. In 1974, a DEA report argued that Mexican chemists followed a less sophisticated opium process formula than the European chemists, which gives their heroin a brown color as opposed to a white color. Allegedly, Mexican chemists processed 70% of the heroin consumed in the U.S. in cocinas, or kitchens. The DEA's erroneous and racist assumption about the primitive nature of Mexican heroin production ignored Mexico's robust pharmaceutical industry and vibrant and sophisticated university programs in chemistry. The DEA based its assumptions on a growing body of evidence that repeated the stereotype of the primitive nature of the Mexican drug trade. In 1975, the Illinois General Assembly's report on Mexican heroin, commonly referred to as the Heroin Highway, crowed about the perfectionism of French chemists in processing heroin compared to Mexican cooks. The report juxtaposed descriptions of French and Mexican labs. The French chemists, perfectionists, proud of their work, would set up in an empty farmhouse, take several suitcases full of raw materials with them, tape the window shut, Don surgical masks so as not to inhale fumes, which in itself can create addiction, and then stay with the process for as many days as it took to produce 100% pure heroin. Then they would untape the windows, clean everything up, and not return for several weeks or months. The Mexicans, with good reasons, are satisfied with something less than perfection. Their heroin is brown rather than white, and is only 60 to 90% pure rather than 100%. On the other hand, their simplified refining procedures take much less time and can be done by people other than professional chemists. The impurity prevents too many middlemen from cutting the product further. And most important, the product sells. There is simply no need to market a pure heroin. The report referred to Mexican drug processing taking place in kitchen labs, in houses, cellars, and barns not dramatically different from a French farmhouse. The report reflects Illinois policymakers' inability to recognize that Mexican drug traffickers operated the same way as their European counterparts. Moreover, French and Corsican crime organizations had operated in Mexico and had partnered with Mexican DTOs since the 1920s. Lastly, the report ignores that much of the pharmaceutical industry in Mexico had ties to European and American methods and training. Since the 1950s, policing agents on the U.S.-Mexico border had argued that the purity of brown Mexican heroin surpassed that of European heroin. Yet concepts of whiteness and purity in the racialized U.S. imagination became a basis for chemical analysis. Brown heroin equaled impurity and hence a lower quality product than European-produced white heroin. 
In its official reports to Congress in the mid-1970s, the DEA seemed to have ignored decades of work and research on Mexican drug traffickers conducted by its predecessors, as well as by the U.S. State Department and the Mexican government. All of these entities had long documented illegal drugs flowing out of Mexico and into the U.S., whether Mexican-grown poppy and processed heroin or non-Mexican-originated drugs that were transshipped through Mexico by a broad array of international DTOs. Regardless of this institutional failure to build on other efforts to understand the role of Mexican traffickers, by the mid-1970s, the DEA was building on investigations conducted by the CPD and knew that it had to do more to stop the Mexican drug supply pipeline. The Herrera family, they quickly came to understand, had to be one of their major targets. Understanding the organization took years of investigative work. In the late 1950s, the Herrera organization had begun trafficking to Chicago and Los Angeles through the land ports of El Paso, Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, Del Rio, Texas, Ciudad Acuña, Mexico, Eagle Pass, Texas, Piedra Negras, Mexico, and Laredo, Texas, Nuevo Laredo, Mexico. Mexican bootleggers and smugglers had pioneered the use of these ports during Prohibition. These border towns had also long hosted Americans in search of fun, whether alcohol, drugs, or sex, and thus had vibrant black and gray marketplaces. Law enforcement in these towns on both sides of the border tended to be lax and or corrupt. When Prohibition ended in 1933, Mexican smugglers, in search of new customers, refocused their efforts on bringing marijuana and heroin to the lucrative American market. The Herrera family returned to those old and established smuggling ports of entry when they began their operations. They also relied on the other technological and economic changes, especially American and Mexican emerging interstate and highway systems, which allowed the Herrera DTOs to efficiently move their commodities north to major U.S. cities. In Mexico, the Herrera family extended from cities and towns across Mexican's own Golden Triangle, the northwestern states of Sinaloa, Durango, and Chihuahua. While the Herrera family has been identified by journalists with the small Mexican town of Los Herrera in Durango, the family was not bound to a single small town. It was a large extended family that spread across Mexican states that facilitated drug production, distribution, and transborder trafficking. In the U.S., the organization spread from California to Texas to Chicago and later further east. By the late 1970s, the DEA had hired a few bilingual researchers who were able to better understand the complexity and sophistication of the Herrera DTO, despite the savvy operators' cover as modest immigrants living in working-class towns and communities in and around Chicago. By the time the DEA began focusing on the Herrera heroin operation, the family had been in the drug business for over 20 years. In 1973, 25 members of the Herrera family were arrested by the Chicago Police Department's gang unit after a two-month undercover investigation. In a Chicago Tribune article that year, journalist Bob Weedrick argued that high-grade brown heroin had started to appear on the streets a year prior to the raid. In an interview with Weedrick, CPD Captain Verdoliak argued that the ring based in Roseland and Pullman, had started on a small scale four to five years earlier and was led by 59-year-old Reyes Herrera. The police raided Herrera's home and his tavern, arresting family members and associates. At the tavern, the police discovered cars that had recently arrived from Mexico with heroin. They also uncovered bank books indicating large deposits that were out of scale for a small neighborhood tavern. Verdoliak told reporters that drug mules were paid $4,000, worth $23,000 in 2020, to drive drug-laden vehicles to Chicago. Overall, the police raid yielded a million dollars in drugs, $10,000 in cash, worth $57,700 in 2020, six 38 caliber handguns, and a rifle. More significantly, that investigation and the raid ensure the Herreras were no longer anonymous and that their businesses, both licit and illicit, were being monitored by law enforcement. In attempting to understand the structure of this drug enterprise, the CPD reported that Reyes Herrera headed the organization with his sons, 
who in turn coordinated with four lieutenants, which the report referred to as coyotes. The CPD had misunderstood the word. A coyote is not a lieutenant, but rather a person who coordinates the movement of drugs or people. The CPD and other law enforcement agencies had a lot more to learn about the Herrera's operations. The arrest of Reyes, his wife Maria, their children, and their coyotes and mules was a blow to the organization, and the raid would trigger more research by the Chicago police into the DTO and its members. At the time, however, the Chicago police were operating under a veil of ignorance. The CPD believed that the Herrera DTO was a small-time gang, with only a few years in the drug business. Reyes and Maria Herrera took advantage of such ignorance. Bail was set at a relatively modest sum, and the couple immediately posted it and fled to Mexico. Their sons got off with a relative slap on the wrist. By 1977, Reyes and Maria were rumored to be working in Guadalajara, Mexico, the growing hub of the Mexican drug trade in the 1970s, while their sons were still living and working in Chicago, where they owned a growing array of businesses in working-class neighborhoods, even as they continued their drug operations. Nonetheless, the Herrera's exposure in Chicago led to growing surveillance and analysis of the organization and its operations. It also drew the attention of policymakers in Washington, D.C. and Chicago. Representative Cardis Collins, a vital and vibrant presence in Chicago, was serving on the U.S. House of Representatives' Select Committee on Narcotics Abuse and Control. In her 24-year career in the U.S. House, Collins was recognized for her advocacy for African Americans, people of color, and women. The growth of heroin in Chicago became an ongoing focus of her work on the committee. She focused committee hearings in 1977 on the Herrera's operations, and in 1985, she invited the select committee to return to Chicago for further hearings on the Herrera DTO. Cardis played a key role in the hearings that brought greater attention to the crime organization, and ultimately led to further investigations by showcasing the DTO's control over the Midwest. Journalists reported on the hearings, and police departments across the Midwest learned about how Chicago was the base for Midwest heroin distribution. The politicians came to realize, moreover, that the Herreras were not a mere gang, but a vast operation with thousands of employees. In the mid-1970s, building on information obtained in the 1973 raid, the DEA and CPD began researching the Herreras in earnest. In 1977, DEA analyst Mary Holler informed the House Select Committee on Narcotics Abuse and Control that the Herrera DTO had over a thousand members. She compared it to General Motors. The Herreras, she made clear, were far more than a neophyte gang. To demonstrate their organization's complexity, she included a copy of Forbes magazine's list of the 50 largest retailing companies and placed the Herrera DTO's wealth between Safeway stores and May department stores, estimating that the DTO yielded an annual profit of approximately $100 million. In 1977, the DEA, Customs, and the IRS agents who also testified before the committee noted that over the prior 20 years, the Herrera DTO had made billions of dollars selling heroin in Chicago and around the Midwest. 3. The Herrera's wealth and the sophistication of their business model ensured their success for many years. Leading family members strategically occupied the upper echelons of the drug business and were far removed from direct interaction with the organization's illegal product, keeping them well insulated from arrest and prosecution. In their role proliferation analysis of New York City crack dealers in the 1990s, Bruce Johnson, Eloise Dunlap, and Sylvia Tourine documented this pattern. They noted that those on the lower levels of the drug business endured the highest risk for arrests, except for those who served in positions such as lookouts or counters. Because street vendors worked at the most visible point of the drug supply line, they were far more likely to be arrested than high-ranking members of the organizations who avoided direct and especially public involvement with illegal drugs. The Herrera's leaders understood this dynamic and avoided direct involvement with the selling of their wares. They went even further in their efforts to evade law enforcement attention by avoiding the public spotlight. 
In addition, the Herrera DTO leadership skillfully crafted and manipulated a series of advantages that supported the longevity of their business. For example, the DTO employed certain Mexican cultural practices to their advantage. The DEA, its organizational predecessors, and other U.S.-based policing agents had a limited number of Spanish-speaking employees and even fewer experts on Mexico. Like other organized crime figures, the Herrera family routinely used nicknames as first names. For example, the notorious Joaquin Archivaldo Guzman Loera, known as El Chapo, was not the first Chapo that DEA agents tracked. Moreover, policing and government agents had long embraced stereotypical and racist tropes regarding Mexican and Mexican-Americans. These prejudices clouded their ability to recognize that the Herrera DTO was a sophisticated transnational criminal organization that rivaled the Italian mafia or Jewish organized crime. In this case, American officials' racism resulted not in more arrests of people of color, but rather in helping the Herrera DTO to operate for years free from serious surveillance or intervention. Even their very name, Herrera, served the organization because it confused Anglo law enforcement agents and allowed the family to hide in plain sight among other Mexicans and Mexican-Americans living in the Midwest. Herrera is a common family name in Mexico. Mexicans use their paternal and maternal surnames, but in the U.S., members of the family commonly just used Herrera. In Chicago alone in 1974, some 659 legal residents and an unknown number of undocumented residents shared the Herrera surname. By the mid-1970s, the DEA struggled to track the Herrera DTO by tracing the full names of suspected members in order to create U.S.-based family trees. In Chicago, in fact, the DTO included six extended families, Herrera Diaz, Herrera Herrera, Herrera Medina, Herrera Navarez, and Herrera Venegas. These six families included siblings, cousins, and their children, and were also all extended to include 26 different family-run operations in different sections of Chicago with different configurations of families and surnames. Members of the Herrera Venegas family lived and operated in Aurora, while members of the Herrera Navarez family lived in Roseland. Another Herrera-affiliated family, which did not share the paternal or maternal surname Herrera, controlled the trade in Milwaukee. The Chicago police, as well as the DEA, with little knowledge of Spanish or Mexican culture, had an extremely difficult time just figuring out who was who in the DTO and which Herreras they needed to surveil and investigate. By 1975, the Illinois Legislative Investigating Committee understood that the inability to understand nomenclature within the network of Herrera families was hindering the investigation. Misreporting names or using nicknames provided by someone in custody also hindered the ability of investigators to understand the family network. For example, Navarez, the family maternal name, was frequently written with a Z in the U.S., in Mexico, the family name ended with an S rather than a Z. These slight differences made careful record-keeping, and thus investigations and prosecutions, difficult because both spellings exist in Mexico and the U.S. The family's origin and well-established place in the state of Durango also helped the Herrera DTO to thrive and succeed. Poppy was introduced to the state in the 1800s, and it flourished due to the climate. Despite attempts at eradication by the Mexican government that began in the 1920s, the ruggedness of the landscape in the Sierra Madres, the climate, and the favorable support from local politicians allowed gomeros, poppy growers, to flourish. Most senior Herrera family members lived in Durango, while their children lived in the U.S. or split their time in between the two countries. Jaime Herrera Navares, the patriarch of the family, was a well-respected former police officer who had also served as a mayor of the small town of Los Herrera. Born in 1927 to a farming family, he and his seven siblings grew corn, beans, and other products. Like many Gomeros, the family first grew marijuana and then diversified to the more lucrative poppy. Thus, they climbed the narco-hierarchy through a strategic decision to shift to poppy.
which was far more profitable than marijuana. Don Jaime, as he was known, collaborated with his brothers Elias and Manuel. His cousins also entered the business. His brother Reyes had set off to Chicago years before and started the Chicago-based operations for the family with various other cousins. Reyes was the one who was arrested in 1973. Other family members served in state and local government positions, such as mayors or police chiefs of cities and towns in Durango. The growing family expanded their ranchos and businesses into other cities, Culiacan, Sinaloa, Victoria de Durango, Durango, Ciudad Obregón, Sonora, Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, and El Paso, Texas. Thus, the well-entrenched extended family lived and worked in the richest poppy-producing Mexican states, while the family was also located on the U.S.-Mexico border at one of the largest land ports, and members lived in a key distribution city in the U.S. The Herrera family quickly became one of the modern pioneers and innovators of the modern U.S.-Mexico drug trade. Of course, it did not work in isolation. Herrera Navarres closely coordinated his family's DTO with Pedro Aviles Perez, known as El León de la Sierra, mountain lion in the narco corridos. Aviles is, arguably, the most important architect of the modern drug trade because he, like Herrera Navarres, controlled the trade from production to distribution. Aviles has returned to the popular imagination through Netflix's Narcos Mexico and the growing number of accounts of his career by Mexican journalists. Aviles coordinated the Mexican drug trade through the 1960s with his clicas, comprised of Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo in Sinaloa, Miguel Urias Uriarte in Sonora, and Herrera Navares in Durango. Aviles grew and trafficked marijuana and heroin, and he is recognized by Mexican journalists as the first Mexican trafficker to work with the Colombians to move cocaine through Mexico. Urias Uriarte was a nexus between ex-Mexican revolutionary generals involved in the drug trade and the modern drug trade in Sonora. Fonseca Carrillo founded and led the Guadalajara DTO with Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo and Rafael Caro Quintero who were tied to the murder of DEA agent Enrique Camarena. Herrera Navares was thus working closely with many of the most significant Mexican drug barons. These connections and cooperative structures contributed significantly to the Herrera's success and their ability to build their organization in Chicago. They made Chicago one of the most powerful bases of the contemporary Mexican drug trade a major heroin distribution hub for much of the U.S. A final factor in the longevity of the Herrera family. In Mexico, as in Chicago, the Herrera family held a multitude of legitimate businesses. The family owned ranches where they raised cattle. They farmed extensively and sold a wide range of agricultural products. They also owned and leased land and owned properties, including a great many apartment buildings. Moreover, members worked in politics, policing, and other official and legitimate enterprises. All of these above-board activities whitewashed the family name and integrated their affairs into the economy and government of the states in which they operated, as well as in Mexican society more generally. While successful, their legitimate businesses were not nearly as lucrative as the heroin industry. Their drug operations always came first. On their farms and ranches in Durango, Sinaloa, and Chihuahua, the family not only raised cattle and harvested corn, they grew poppy. On the land and properties they controlled, they built an industrial narco enterprise. Their paid workers harvested and extracted the poppy gum, and their chemists processed the heroin in their modern laboratories. Herrera family members owned laboratories in different cities in the Mexican Golden Triangle and brought chemists from major cities to their labs for weeks at a time to process heroin. Mixing their legitimate and illicit businesses in a synergistic fashion, the Herrera DTO built a highly lucrative, multifaceted, vertically and horizontally integrated business. 4. 
By the 1970s, major Mexican DTOs used a shifting array of boats, airplanes, cars, and all methods of transportation in their trafficking operations, making it difficult for law enforcement agencies to shut them down. The Mexican government reported that from February 1973 to February 1974, it had arrested 467 farmers for growing poppy and marijuana. In the same period, however, the government confiscated two launches, 41 airplanes, and 735 cars. The confiscation, especially of airplanes, caused major concern in the U.S. because the number of private airplanes that traveled across the U.S.-Mexico border exceeded 500 a month. This air-based smuggling between the U.S. and Mexico led the DEA to create a dedicated air intelligence program and the El Paso Intelligence Center. Herrera Navarres and his colleagues, beginning with Aviles Perez and Francisca Carrillo of Sinaloa, had pioneered the use of airplanes to smuggle large amounts of drugs. Later, the Ciudad Juarez DTO became known for the use of planes to smuggle heroin, marijuana, and cocaine. It was led by Amado Carrillo Fuentes, the Lord of the Skies, who was the nephew and protege of Francisca Carrillo. Carrillo Fuentes became more recognized for his use of planes after Aviles Perez was killed during Operation Condor in Mexico in 1978. While planes had long been used by traffickers, including during the Prohibition era, the Herrera family mostly relied on cars and trucks to get their drugs into the U.S. market. They hired drivers or mules who transported the heroin from Durango on direct 49-hour car trips to Chicago. According to DEA analyst Holer, the Herrera DTO compensated their mules well. She reported that in 1977, mules received $800 to $1,000, 2020, $4,611 per kilo that they moved from Mexico to Chicago. They drove large American cars and trucks to Chicago. The heroin packages were hidden in gas tanks, drive shafts, seats, and side panels. Illinois enforcement agents joked about the heroin-concealing Durango drive shaft. Mules often returned to Mexico with large amounts of American dollars concealed in their car's hiding places. Because the car, with its relatively small load capacity, was the Herrera's preferred mode of transportation, the DTO had to use many mules. These mules regularly drove across major border crossings in Texas and on to distribution points in the Midwest, Northeast, California, and Arizona. Once in Chicago, Los Angeles, or elsewhere, the heroin was distributed to different family-run safe houses to be cut, repackaged, and sold wholesale to other organizations. The Herrera organization resembled other modern companies. It readily expanded when necessary to include highly skilled workers, regardless of race, gender, or national origin. The DTO employed both male and female members of the Herrera family. It also recruited and worked with trusted non-Mexican lieutenants. By the late 1960s, the Herreras were working closely with Puerto Rican organized crime in Chicago and in the Northeast. In Indiana, they collaborated with both African American and white gangs. They sold directly to heroin dealers of all races and ethnicities. In Chicago, the Herrera-connected Puerto Rican gang the Latin Kings followed the Herrera model and soon recruited Mexican street gangs to help manage their territorial expansion. Women in the Herrera DTO usually had higher levels of education than the men in the organization and tended to do money laundering and accounting work. This gender inclusivity, too, became a regular feature of the organizations that sprang from the Clicas and the Guadalajara cartel. One of these offspring, the Arellano Felix DTO, developed equal partnerships among the siblings, including an Indina Arellano Felix, an accountant who became essential to the DTO and ultimately led it. Despite the immense profitability of the Herrera DTO, the men and women in the organization appeared to outside observers to be modest, working-class people. They lived in bungalows or clapboard houses in working-class neighborhoods in the Chicagoland area. They drove older model American cars and dressed modestly. Journalist John O'Brien, using a racially charged analysis, described the Herreras as follows. 
While some Chicago dope dealers flaunt their immense wealth with luxury cars, diamonds, and flashy gals in ankle-length furs, the Mexicans who actually control the heroin traffic here are as inconspicuous as peons. Quite deliberately, the Herrera family's modest lives served as a cover for their organization. Like in Mexico, the U.S.-based family had an executive board that represented the different distribution hubs. Boston, Massachusetts, Los Angeles, California, New York, New York, Springfield, Massachusetts, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and Washington, D.C. This board was charged with responding to changing opportunities as well as to threats. The Herreras were good at what they did, and their ability to respond quickly to their business environment percolated down the organizational chart. The DTO member cell's ability to respond rapidly to law enforcement threats by moving safe houses and distribution sites helped ensure their continued success. After the arrest of Reyes, his wife, and family members, for example, the DTO moved parts of its operation into quiet, respectable-appearing suburbs and to nearby states where law enforcement officials had no idea who they were. The members communicated using coded language via telephone. This tactic complicated police surveillance because speakers of Mexican Spanish can often use indigenous words that are not commonly understood, even by other Spanish speakers. Such indigenous-derived words and phrases, combined with their use of northern Mexican colloquialisms that are not taught in Spanish classes or used in Castilian and Caribbean Spanish, also helped the DTO to evade surveillance. The Herrera family successfully deployed a great many tactics in their battle against U.S. law enforcement agencies. As a result of their ability to evade prosecution, they made a lot of money for a long period of time. In 1977, hearings held by the House Select Committee on Narcotics Abuse and Control focused on the ability of the Herrera DTO to bring that massive amount of money back to Mexico and to launder it. Here, too, the Herrera family had long outwitted law enforcement. The Herrera DTO in Chicago, like the Medellin DTO in New York City, primarily used currency exchanges to send their money back to their native country. Currency exchanges were common in U.S. working-class immigrant neighborhoods where few banks existed, and these continue to be commonly used in Mexico and Colombia. Working-class people use them to pay their utility bills and cash checks. In the U.S., they also receive food stamps there. And in Mexico and Colombia, currency exchanges are used to convert dollars to pesos or pesos to dollars. A money order issued at a local currency exchange moved with no regulatory oversight through banks in Chicago or New York and then arrived safely in Mexican banks. These exchanges moved money orders circulated through the National Lincoln Bank in Chicago to branches of major Mexican banks such as Banamex, Citibank, and Banco Nacional de México, among others. Hundreds of thousands of dollars moved through these currency exchanges from Mexican immigrants living in the Midwest, who helped their families at home through their monthly remittances. Working people sending small sums comprised the majority of money orders and transfers, which helped to hide the large sums being laundered by the Herreras. In testimony taken in 1977, Congressional leaders seemed confused as to why the Herrera DTO used currency exchange wholesalers. Russ McDougall, a DEA analyst and former IRS special agent, then explained that the Herreras needed to launder anywhere between $300 million to a $1 billion per year back to Mexico. That meant that the DTO also had a great many people on the payroll whose job was simply to purchase a multitude of money orders in an array of amounts that were ultimately deposited in Mexican banks. 5. The Chicago police raid in 1973 and the U.S. congressional hearings in 1977 introduced the Herrera DTO to a growing number of people. The organization lost much of the anonymity that its members had cultivated over the prior 20 years in the heroin business. Over the next two decades, the Herrera DTO became a poster child for drug warriors' efforts to strengthen and expand federal drug laws. In 1986, the Herrera family again re-emerged as a central focus of the DEA for heroin, marijuana, and cocaine distribution in the Midwest. 
By the mid-1980s, the DEA had been in existence for more than a decade and had been able to recruit bilingual and bicultural agents who allowed it to develop conspiracy cases against the Herrera operation using the resources of the CPD, the Indiana State Police, and local law enforcement. Moreover, the DEA found another champion and additional resources following the election of Ronald Reagan, who had campaigned on the promise to control the flow of drugs into the U.S. Working the ranch in Gary, Indiana, the Herrera DTO in the 1980s and 1990s. The 1980s gave birth to a far more aggressive and better resourced war on drugs. In part, the accelerated drug war was precipitated by the hyper-violent battles over cocaine that were raging in the streets of Miami. While far less violent, the Herrera DTO-2, by then known widely in law enforcement circles as the architects of the heroin highway, came under greatly increased pressure. In 1978, the House Select Committee on Narcotics Abuse and Control had published a report detailing just how the Herrera family had made Chicago a national hub for Mexican heroin and marijuana distribution. Investigators systemically ripped away the cloak of anonymity that the Herrera DTO had worn to cover up its American operations. The report stated that the Herrera family is similar to traditional organized crime families, as evidenced by the magnitude and complexity of its criminal activity. It also shares the common trait of having many of its members related by blood and by marriage. The 1978 report recommended a number of measures that would impact not only the Herrera DTO, but also Colombian and other Mexican DTOs. The report recommended that the DEA and the CPD increase their efforts to infiltrate the organization. It also recommended that law enforcement agents and officers strengthen relationships within the Mexican-American community in Chicago so as to gain local cooperation. It encouraged the DEA and the State Department to pressure the Mexican government to cooperate more closely with the U.S. and to increase its independent drug interdiction efforts. The committee also called for stronger banking regulations and laws to hinder drug money laundering operations, including greater oversight of currency exchange transactions. In addition, the committee proposed that Congress amend the Bail Reform Act to make it easier for judges to deny bail to defendants involved in narcotics. This recommendation was in direct response to the Herrera family's prior abuse of the bond system. All told, this series of recommendations, many of which emerged from investigations of the Herrera DTO, built the infrastructure for the 1984 Comprehensive Criminal Control Act. With the election of Reagan and a renewed focus on drug trafficking and the increasing violence associated with the drug trade, the Comprehensive Criminal Control Act created civil and criminal sanctions related to drug trafficking and established determinate sentencing for drug offenses. The 1985 murder of DEA agent Enrique Camarena also led to far greater scrutiny of Mexican traffickers in general. Moreover, the Mexican drug trade's diversification into the cocaine market further intensified American law enforcement agencies' efforts to crack down on the Mexican DTOs. This intensified pressure affected the Herrera's operations. Despite the raids and investigations of the 1970s, by the mid-1980s, the Herrera DTO had well over 3,000 members with 50 different family names. Building on the work of Aviles Perez, the younger members of the Herrera DTO had successfully expanded into cocaine trafficking. Chicago served as their wholesale hub for cocaine, along with heroin and marijuana. By this time, Don Jaime's numerous children and those of his brothers and sisters had developed phenomenal wealth. A 1984 expose by journalist Bob Weedrick revealed that, in Mexico, Don Jaime owned two hotels, a pharmacy, a truck stop and restaurant, a construction firm, a bowling alley, disco, taco restaurant complex, and several bars, one of which was favored by local police. His article was part of a series that year exposing the Chicago-Mexican heroin connection and trade. The Chicago police were well aware of the heroin problem and the overwhelmingly dominant role the Herrera family played in fostering it. They were not pleased by the newspaper expose, as they were hard at work building a case against the Herreras. 
Through the 1980s, the Chicago Police Department and DEA had gathered evidence about the organization from wiretaps that had been planted in Herrera DTO properties in Gary, Indiana. Those wires included calls between members in Indiana and Illinois and other locations in the U.S., Puerto Rico, and Mexico. The DEA and the CPD had focused on Jesus Herrera Diaz, who lived in Calumet City, a working-class southeast Chicago suburb that borders on the state of Indiana. The case focused on Herrera Diaz, but it also extended to couriers, mules, safe house operators, and dealers. Allegedly, the case was triggered by a disgruntled gambler who lost money at a rigged cockfight in Gary, Indiana, at one of two warehouses that the Herrera family used and operated. Indiana State Police had raided the locations for illegal gambling. Operated by the Herrera DTO and run by a Puerto Rican member, Jesus Zambrana, the two locations in Gary were referred to as La Finca and El Rancho by members of the organization. The sites were and are industrialized warehouse areas that are close to Interstate 80 and 94, the Chicago Skyway, and I-65. Thus, deliveries from Durango directly to El Rancho and La Finca could be easily cut, repackaged, and moved north to Chicago and Milwaukee, east to Cleveland and New York City, and south to Indianapolis and Nashville. Two months after the raid, federal and local police raided over 40 locations connected to the Herrera DTO, arrested and indicted 132 suspects, and confiscated properties and businesses in Illinois, Indiana, California, Colorado, Florida, Texas, Mexico, and Puerto Rico. The two-year investigation, called Operation Durango, brought together the DEA, the FBI, the U.S. Marshals Service, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the U.S. Customs Immigration and Naturalization Service, the CPD, and the Lake County, Indiana Police Department. This collaboration between different enforcement agencies stemmed from recommendations made during the 1977 House Select Committee hearings. The bill that emerged from those hearings, sponsored by the fiercely conservative Senator Strom Thurmond of South Carolina, called for the creation of a National Drug Policy Board to coordinate international and criminal justice issues related to drugs and the drug trade. Differing from the Herrera DTO arrests in the 1970s, the 1982-84 investigations, raids, and indictments were facilitated by changes in U.S. federal laws, especially the 1984 Comprehensive Criminal Control Act. This act allowed for expansive federal and civil asset forfeiture penalties. These penalties have become a major weapon against DTOs. Because a percentage of the confiscated assets go directly to enforcement agencies, thus incentivizing their deployment, they have become a controversial tool in the war on drugs. The 1984 Act also toughened up bail procedures for high-level drug traffickers, making it far more difficult for defendants to be released at any price before they go to trial. While lawmakers claim the 1984 Act would target high-level traffickers, in practice it hit lower-level drug dealers the hardest, a majority of whom were African-American and Hispanic. Many of the policies enacted in the 1984 Act were made even more punitive in the 1994 Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, which included the infamous Three Strikes provision imposing mandatory life sentences for repeat drug offenders. Shortly after the raid on the Herrera organization, Anton Balukas, U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois, Philip Fisher, Special Agent in Charge of the Chicago Field Office of the DEA, and Edward Hegarty, Special Agent in Charge of the Chicago Division of the FBI, announced the indictments of 99 people in Illinois, 33 in Gary and Dyer, Indiana, and others in California, Mexico, and Puerto Rico. The 132 people arrested comprised six different networks within the Herrera DTO. All of the indictments referenced the use of court-authorized listening devices that had recorded hundreds of telephone conversations related to drug trafficking. The wiretaps demonstrated that Herrera Diaz of Calumet City collaborated with his brothers Ruben and Pancito, Cubby, along with nephews, sons, wives, and in-laws. All 34 were charged with using the telephone to commit and facilitate the commission of narcotics offenses, 
particularly with family members in El Paso, Texas. In Chicago, Miguel Medina, another member of the Herrera DTO, the indictment stated, used his multiple businesses to distribute cocaine and heroin in concert with 18 co-defendants. Luis Armando Villela and 11 co-defendants, the indictment further declared, coordinated with members in El Paso to distribute heroin. Rodolfo Herrera Medina and 13 co-defendants were indicted on similar charges. David Ercoli of Dyer, Indiana, was also indicted with 10 co-defendants. Gino Zanin, Peter Soto, and Gilberto Gonzalez were all charged, along with all the other co-defendants, with using a telephone to commit and facilitate the commission of a narcotics offense. The 1984 Comprehensive Criminal Control Act allowed local and federal police to seize 47 properties as well as hundreds of cars. The seized properties included the homes of members of the Herrera DTO and their businesses, including two gas stations, five bars, two restaurants, two jewelry stores, a flower shop, and multiple apartment buildings. The arrests in Chicago had a domino effect. The evidence they collected allowed the DEA and U.S. law enforcement to place more pressure on Mexican officials to go after the Herrera DTO in their jurisdictions. The pressure worked. In 1987, Don Jaime and his son Jaime Herrera Herrera were arrested by the commander of the PJF, Guillermo Gonzalez Calderoni. The arrest and subsequent prosecutions in Durango, Chicago, and other cities gave the public the sense that the Herrera drug operation, after a 30-year reign, had been vanquished. It had not been. Law enforcement had arrested just over 130 people associated with the DTO, it had over 3,000 members. After the busts, the Herrera DTO, though weakened, continued to distribute heroin and other drugs from the Chicago metropolitan area, Los Angeles, Durango, and towns and cities along the U.S.-Mexico border. By 2001, the DTO has expanded, growing to 12 family cell-slash-networks in Chicago that trafficked marijuana, heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine. 6. Many of the current Mexican DTOs are branches of the earlier CLICAS that emerged in the 1950s and 1960s. The Herrera DTO's transnational network became the model for many that have followed or continue to work alongside the Herreras, such as the Ciudad Juarez Cartel, the Tijuana Cartel, and the Sinaloa Cartel. Their farm-to-arm business model remains intact but is ever-evolving. The DTO was and continues to function as a large-scale distributor with an uncanny ability to work with other organizations while running its own operation. Don Jaime, his brothers, and their families created much of the business plan for transnational drug trafficking with their Mexico-Chicago connection. Raids, arrests, indictments, hearings, recommendations, and numerous national and state crime acts and legislation, despite a $27.8 billion annual price tag, have done little to disrupt that business model. Given the massive drug demand in the U.S. and the immense profits that are made servicing it, this aspect of the war on drugs has at least so far been doomed to failure. Drug traffickers, such as the Herrera Organization, adapt, reorganize, relocate, and respond to whatever law enforcement throws at them. And so far, at least for the past 60-plus years, even when it has been laid low, it has risen up again to work alongside other DTOs or distribute a new product to meet evolving consumer demand, whether in Mexico or the neighborhoods of Chicago. 4. Cultivating Cannabis, Accepting Cannabis Michael Polson Cannabis is often framed as an exception to the war on drugs. Legalization would simply remove soft drugs from prohibition while leaving the rest of the drug war apparatus in place. This cannabis exceptionalism, however, elides the centrality of cannabis in the global drug war. This chapter outlines the pivotal role of cannabis in global prohibition and how its supply-side tactics produced a modern, global, and illegalized peasantry. Relying on ethnographic data from California, this chapter illuminates the exceptional factors that shaped cultivation in the United States, 
leading toward the surprising advancement of legalization at the heart of the drug war empire. Despite its benefits, U.S. legalization now marks U.S. cannabis as an exception in a still global drug war perpetrated by the U.S. with consequences for illegalized farmers and market actors worldwide. A holistic perspective on U.S. legalization thus requires a deprohibition politics at a scale equal to that of the sweeping global war on drugs. Cannabis Exceptionalism the global war on drugs could not exist in its broad scale and granular intensity without cannabis. The 2019 UN World Drug Report estimates that 188 million people, 3.8% of the world's population, used cannabis in the previous year. That's 50% more than consume the four other most frequently used drugs combined. Cannabis is the most widely grown illegalized plant covering 159 countries and 97% of the global population, unlike opium, which is grown in 50 countries, and coca, grown in a handful of Latin American countries. Even in 2017, when states and countries around the world were liberalizing cannabis, the plant accounted for approximately 50% of seizure cases globally and 60% of seized tonnage, that is 60% more seized tonnage than 1998. In the United States, where most states have liberalized cannabis, one person is still arrested for cannabis-related charges every 48 seconds, 92% of them for simple possession, as late as 2018. That's more than twice as many arrests as 1991. On the southwest U.S. border, the amount of cannabis seized is drastically larger than heroin, cocaine, and meth combined and continues to be the most common drug found in border stops. With global cultivation increasing between 2014 and 2017, these trends will likely continue. Cannabis remains the workhorse powering the global war on drugs. And yet, one would hardly know the power behind this seemingly innocuous soft drug, and for good reason. President Bill Clinton winked, nudged, and never inhaled, but cannabis arrests under his presidency more than doubled, partly a product of his epic expansion of policing and mass incarceration in the 1994 Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, commonly known as the 1994 Crime Bill. President George W. Bush admitted he smoked cannabis, even as he vigorously blocked cannabis's medicalization, escalated the militarization of police, and resuscitated anti-drug operations in the Andean region. Meanwhile, President Barack Obama inhaled and promised to not intervene in state cannabis laws. But then, federal prosecutors did just that sending the emerging medical sector into disarray and prompting Congress to bar the use of federal funds to impede state medical laws in 2014. As an anthropologist doing fieldwork at that time, I narrowly missed a federal raid on Oaksterdam University, an early starter in cannabis education, where I was taking a course, and I watched as California medical dispensaries, particularly those with vocal activist leaders, were shut down directly or indirectly through threats to landlords, local officials, or operators. Cannabis, it seems, is not a big deal until it is. As the U.S. led the global war on cannabis and drugs more generally, its residents were taught to make light of cannabis in movies from Dazed and Confused and The Big Lebowski to Up in Smoke, Friday, and Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle. These cult favorites articulated a kind of subcultural resistance to the insidious pervasiveness of drug war culture. But something shifted in 2005 when Nancy Botwin, the single white mother and sympathetic widow of the award-winning, highly-watched TV series Weeds, 2005 to 2012, accompanied the U.S. through a period of transformation of public opinion, culminating in two legal weed states. What was so bad about people in the cannabis economy anyhow, when the legal economy, from Enron and Bear Stearns to Cambridge Analytica and the roster of banks involved in embezzling drug money, examples Wachovia, HSBC, U.S. Bank, Wells Fargo, seemed to be just as criminal. 
Our collective fascination with the cannabis outlaw has been reflected back to us in documentaries, news specials, and confessional reality TV. In the circular fashion of the Synopticon 2.0, where the many watch the many, citizens watch criminals and criminals watch back, a viewing process that peers across legal lines, uniting viewers through a binding neoliberal common sense of entrepreneurialism and risk. Representation and reality intermingled when my study participants were recruited by reality shows, law enforcement officials became mini-celebrities, and cultivators, caught between fame and enforcement, stopped talking. The fascination with cannabis realms continues in shows like Murder Mountain, which re-injected moralizing concerns about criminality and poor rural white dysfunction in California right at the moment when cannabis liberalization proffered an opportunity for substantive rural development and destigmatization. From crime thriller to quirky comedy, cannabis was there to entertain. Cannabis was the U.S.'s open secret, its favorite primetime criminal indulgence. For academics, those arbiters of the serious, cannabis has merited relatively little attention. In 2001, an anthropological review noted a surprising dearth of research on cannabis. In 2019, geographer Pierre Arnaud Chouvy could still note that opium and coca byproducts received the lion's share of academic attention. Outside of a significant wave of recent historical and ethnographic accounts, existing studies mostly focus on consumption, often termed a priori, abuse, a priority of the U.S.'s National Institute on Drug Abuse, which self-reportedly funds 85% of global research on drugs of abuse. This research explicitly focuses on negative effects, a focus clarified after the Institute funded three ethnographic natural experiments in the 1970s in Jamaica, Costa Rica, and Greece that found cannabis use to be neutral in effect, if not beneficial. Given the relative neglect of cannabis research and the primary focus on abusive consumption within the cannabis research that does exist, it is unsurprising that research on cannabis production in recent times is a rare endeavor, especially to the degree it retains an openness to understanding its importance, even benefit, to society. So here we have a drug that is either laughed at or left understudied, yet has tacitly fueled the devastation of a global war on drugs for the past 50 years. As cannabis liberalizes, we might think the plant is an exception to rather than formative of the war on drugs. No need to stop that war when we can simply remove cannabis from the battle plans. After all, isn't cannabis the good, soft drug, bringing mirth, relaxation, even elevated consciousness to its users? This argument is similar to one made in the U.S. in the 1970s. As white youth began using and getting arrested for cannabis use, concerned voices rose to decriminalize the plant. For well-intended user victims, but not dangerous dealers and producers. Today... Wholesome, mostly white farmers do for legalization what the white experimenting teenager did for decriminalization, legitimize cannabis in opposition to other shadowy entities like Mexican cartels or Asian or Eastern European drug trafficking organizations. Accepting cannabis from the drug war enables the accepting of cannabis as legal. This chapter unearths the fallacies behind cannabis exceptionalism. When we focus further up the commodity chain from the blissed-out consumer and further afield from U.S. representations, we find that cannabis has been and remains part of a global drug war system. To see the ways cannabis is unexceptional, we must look beyond what we think we know of the soft drug and its harmless users and instead take account of, to riff off of Timothy Leary, the drug, set, and historical social setting or context within which that drug exists. This chapter explores the U.S.-led war on drugs as the setting that instituted common constraints on cannabis globally, and then analyzes how the particular setting of cannabis inside the U.S. is playing a unique role in undermining supply-side criminalization 
at least for U.S. cultivators. By accounting for this setting, the purpose of legalization might be thought of not just as establishing a legal market like any other, but rather as a mechanism to account for and replace a global system that has caused many harms and, as I will explore, supported many people. Cannabis cultivation looks different in Argentina than in Albania, yet the war on drugs establishes similar constraints across places, especially since the U.S., that imperial hegemon, steered the world into harmonizing with its prohibition regime. After tracing how cannabis became a central component of the international drug control system, I will argue that, since the 1970s, the drug war created a common economic architecture for cannabis cultivators worldwide through drug premiums, inflated prices generated by supply-side tactics and the risks they imposed. In doing so, I aim to counter the often exceptionalist, myopic focus in legalization debates on domestic matters by illuminating the latent, criminalized solidarities and common political lots of cultivators across borders. Then, drawing from fieldwork in Northern California, I explore what makes U.S. cannabis cultivators different from, even exceptional to, cannabis producers around the world. Supply chain differences, legal citizenship status, and medicalized politics set U.S. cultivators apart, affording them relative privileges as well as particular importance in challenging supply-side tactics and the war on drugs at home. This unique position holds transformative political potentials and unfortunate perils, at least in regard to a just transition to legalization. The question then returns. Will cannabis simply be accepted from the drug war, or can we imagine a different future, one that challenges the extant drug war, addresses the fundamental inequalities it created and managed, and does all this across borders? Colonialism, Bourgeois Nationalism, and the Rehearsals of U.S. Empire In a sign of things to come, the U.S. delegation to the 1912 International Opium Convention was among the first to raise the prospect of international cannabis prohibition during negotiations. The convention, called by the U.S., aimed to address opium and coca products, two addictive drugs that were often allowed, even propagated, by other colonial powers. With neither data nor authorization to discuss, the matter was nonetheless pushed by morally enterprising delegates who feared pollution of our whites and worried that fiends would hunt for cannabis once opium and coca were restricted. It would take another decade for cannabis to be revisited at the 1925 International Opium Convention, where the terms of cannabis debate were set for the next several decades. On one side were traditional colonial powers, Britain, the Netherlands, and France, along with India under British rule, where cannabis use was historically rooted, opposing universal prohibition, arguing it was an unwarranted incursion on internal affairs. Colonial powers already profited from organized sales of opium and coca, fought for the ability to market them freely, as in the opium wars between Britain and China, and placated colonialized populations by tolerating the plant's use. Cannabis was no different. In Morocco and Tunisia, France required cannabis products to be sold through a French capitalized company. Spain, concerned with winning over Berber tribes to their Moroccan protectorate, 1912 to 56, allowed cultivation too. Both colonial powers would later half-heartedly attempt to ban cannabis in their colonies, but the real politic of colonial rule won out. Despite nominal prohibition, Spain and France designated areas of Morocco's Rif for cultivation, and France allowed cannabis cultivation to persist in Lebanon's Beka Valley, where cannabis rents might subdue politically agitated chieftains. Colonial tolerance was not universal. While the colonial government of India, like British Guiana and Mauritius, saw cannabis regulation as key to maintaining order, British colonialized Jamaica implemented prohibition in 1913, fearing use among Indian laborers and disruptions to racializing systems of labor control and colonial extraction. Portuguese-occupied Angola implemented the world's first colonial prohibition in 1857, 
Despite Portugal's earlier tolerance of cannabis in Brazil, Angola was followed by other colonialized nations like Gabon, France, Mozambique, Portugal, and the French Congo. Colonial prohibitions emerged as moral civilizational reform projects and a means to increase labor control and productivity. With cannabis prohibited here, tolerated there, cannabis policy became a tool of colonial statecraft in pacifying and controlling populations through either tolerance or bans. If colonial nations dragged their feet, it was emergent bourgeois republics, Egypt, Greece, Turkey, Brazil, the Union of South Africa, that advanced prohibition at the 1925 convention. Whether emerging from colonization, Egypt, wartime conflict and territorial reordering, Greece, Turkey, or into race-based self-rule, Union of South Africa, each nation resonated with the Wilsonian post-First World War spirit of self-determination. Rising national bourgeoisies latched on to cannabis prohibition as a mechanism of modernization, nation-state building, and socio-political pacification, particularly of youth, urban workers, peasants, and the racialized poor. While some theorize that the ensuing history of cannabis prohibition was simply the international diffusion of a national policy, this theory elides the interstate competition emerging between European colonial powers and the U.S. over the form of drug control. The U.S., a latecomer to colonialism, laid the basis of post-colonial but still imperial statecraft in its colonies, especially the Philippines. Via internally administered programs of drug prohibition and policing, the U.S. could operate through and with moralizing national bourgeoisies, not over them, to discipline poorer ethnic and rebellious populations and establish what Alfred McCoy calls a non-territorial American imperium. Its imperial ambitions would be frustrated for some time, however. It walked out of the 1925 and 1936 conventions galled at not getting its preferred hardline policies and leaving the remaining nations to find compromise. It would take many years, a Second World War, and the establishment of a United Nations coordinating body for the U.S. to be in position to transform its imperial stylings into a global system. Harmonizing Prohibition, Globalizing Cannabis the U.S. failed in 1936 to institute an international prohibition on cannabis, a move that might have cleared the way for domestic cannabis prohibition. Undeterred, the U.S. delegate and head of the newly formed Federal Bureau of Narcotics, FBN, Harry Anslinger, furthered a racializing campaign against marijuana that has become a textbook, if overstated, case in moral entrepreneurialism. The result? The Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, which effectively prohibited cannabis through the levying of nominal taxes, astronomical violation fees, and draconian enforcement. In the ensuing years, the U.S. launched bilateral efforts to incrementally implement and enforce supply-side drug prohibition, thereby making an end run around colonial powers and compromise treaties. Through moralistic and often extra-legal practices, the FBN's efforts presaged the post-Nixon war on drugs by acting preemptively and blurring lines between military and police, official and covert state action, and foreign and domestic jurisdictional provenance. Anslinger fashioned the FBN as a cop at the crossroads of the world, and advocated for a new single convention to replace the multiple narcotics treaties signed since 1912. The UN resolved to do this in 1948, and the US flexed its post-war muscles by pushing total cannabis prohibition, discounting its medical and cultural value. The United Nations 1961 single convention on narcotic drugs established the world's first coordinated prohibition regime and the first unambiguous international prohibition of cannabis, as opposed to mere trade controls. As a signatory, the U.S. is still obliged to continue its criminalizing prohibitionist approach, which was domestically implemented through the Controlled Substances Act of 1970. The single convention was an achievement in post-war international cooperation. 
It went beyond previous treaties, which had largely established rules of international trade, and instead implemented a global system of drug control, mandating that signatories, which included 95% of all nations by 2018, prohibit listed drugs, with few exceptions. As overseen by the UN, it follows a two-pronged strategy, prohibit and develop alternatives. In its first report, released in 1968, the International Narcotics Control Board, INCB, the treaty's multilateral monitoring body, noted that drug producers depend on crops for their livelihoods, and production takes root in underdeveloped areas not under government control. It called for a long, drawn-out campaign of economic and infrastructural investments, as opposed to a singular focus on punishment, which led to crop substitution programs, such as the effort to replace cannabis production in Lebanon with sunflowers. By 1977, the INCB declared Lebanon a failed project, the first of many underfunded and ineffective crop substitution programs. Regardless, as late as 2014, the UN's Secretary General was still advocating crop substitution, despite evidence of their inefficacy in altering farmer decision-making and inability to achieve substantive, long-term economic development with ecological safeguards. In practice, prohibition contradicts the UN's developmentalist vision as well as its ethical mission of protecting sovereignty and promoting security, human rights, and peace. There is also a functional contradiction at work. Prohibition generates risk-induced market premiums that make drug production lucrative. Few, if any, substituted crops could outperform prohibition premiums, but aspirational and failing programs transform the UN into a perpetual development machine, forever striving to develop further and intervene deeper. For cannabis, the globally harmonized and instituted prohibition premium that emerges out of the single convention was transformative. By 1972, the INCB noted that cannabis commerce had jumped to a global scale, beyond its previous intra-regional character. Soon, global cannabis seizures hit a historic high. In 1977, seizures from Mexico, Colombia, and the U.S. alone exceeded the total amount that was seized globally in 1976. By 1979, cannabis had become, quantitatively, the most trafficked drug. Cannabis cultivation exploded not despite prohibition, but alongside of it and its risk-based incentives to produce. Expanding global production was also a response to an expanding consumer base. In industrialized nations, the INCB theorized, countercultural youth in revolt against the established order of things provided just that mass base. The single convention originally obliged signatories to criminalize that consumption. For instance, California, which led the push toward draconian punishment for cannabis pushers in the 1950s, saw a 20-fold increase in cannabis arrests from 1962 to 1972, of which 95% were felony charges, mostly for possession. With such high consumption and criminalization rates, cannabis had the potential to delegitimize drug prohibition broadly in developed nations, leading UN members to pass a 1972 amendment to the single convention that achieved two critical reforms. First, it allowed signatories to rehabilitate and treat rather than incarcerate and punish drug users. Thus, in the U.S., easing the threat that middle-class white consumption posed to prohibition. Second, it recommended nations to punishing suppliers. The INCB called for upstream economic activities, production, trafficking, financing, to be severely punished and a clear distinction to be drawn between users and supply-side actors. The U.S. worked within the developmentalist U.N. process but it also pushed its militaristic, interventionist supply-side strategies through bilateral agreements with nations from Turkey to Burma, Colombia to Thailand to Mexico. 
The agreements became a critical part of the U.S. foreign assistance apparatus and were codified in 1986 when President Reagan signed an order declaring drug trafficking and production a national security threat and requiring any foreign aid recipient to first be certified as cooperative or uncooperative with U.S. anti-drug policy. Drug policy harmonization was a requirement for receiving aid, while enforcement of drug policies facilitated the U.S. economic aims of extraction, privatization, and investment, and fiscally fortified and morally legitimated national bourgeoisies as they pursued inequitable market liberalization agendas. The cannabis trade only expanded, coming to be the quantitative anchor for the ever-expanding global drug war in ways opium and coca never did while the single convention created a unified global prohibition price premium for cannabis, thus inciting expanded production, U.S.-led militarization of the trade heightened consequences, risks, and thus prices for supply chains. This led to two developments. First, the globalized trade in cannabis returned to an expanded, deepened, intra-regional patterning as traffickers shortened risk-laden supply chains. Long supply chains were not only riskier and more expensive, they were increasingly unnecessary since cannabis could be grown in almost any environment. Second, and correlatively, U.S. militarization instigated a turn toward import substitution, or the global rise of domestic production, particularly in developed consumer nations. In short, by the mid-1980s, the war on drugs had fostered a global cannabis cultivation sector, a shadow economy into which developmentalist and militaristic imperial interventions could be made. Though hard drugs, opium, then coca products were the tip of the drug war spear, justifying its most intensely violent and invasive expressions, cannabis was the drug war's shaft. Its quantitative heft and geographical ubiquity made it a truly global object of state interventions. U.S. legalization debates often occlude this global setting and the U.S.'s role in creating it. Cannabis exceptionalism meets American exceptionalism as cannabis is parochially shorn of its global bearings. Is there a way to speak of what is common to cultivators globally? What, if anything, sets apart U.S. cultivators and cultivators in higher income nations from cultivators elsewhere? In the next two sections, I address these questions in turn. Rather than rely on state-generated statistics and data points, often seen as the only reliable data on illegalized realms, I turn instead to the ethnographic record, where the realities of cannabis cultivation are assembled from everyday lives. By centering lives lived under prohibition, something invaluable happens for the consideration of deprohibitionist paths. We see not only the harms caused by the drug war, but how illegalized peoples forged ways of worth and life in illegalized realms. Social Architectures, Prohibited Lives, and the Modern Peasantry The drug war lent a coordinating economic logic to global cannabis cultivation, chiefly through a mechanism I call the Prohibition Premium. Prohibition generates risks for cultivators, and these risks elevate the prices retrieved for product, which in turn draws more people into production. While cultivators may exhibit all kinds of motivations, ranging from poverty to thrill-seeking to political, ethical commitments, all cultivators are placed in a criminalized relationship with the state. Being outside the law, however, does not mean being ungoverned. Rather, as geographer Dominic Corva argues, criminalized realms are able to be governed differently. In terms set by liberal jurisprudence, criminals are regarded as free, choice-making individuals whose actions enable them to be governed illiberally, often through violent state interventions. The drug war projected this illiberal interventionism to the global level, justifying all kinds of interventions into varied places and populations. Yet extra-legality also allowed cultivators a certain kind of negative liberty, a freedom from liberal society and its norms to craft other ways of life. 
Prohibition premiums facilitated and amplified that creative capacity, even if they imported a marketizing logic of supply, demand, and risk around which people were compelled to conceptualize themselves and their worlds. Born of coercion, capitalism, and human creativity, the shadow economies generated by prohibition and its premiums were much more than abstractly criminal or tragically criminalized. They were instead lived spaces. If legalization proposes justice for drug war targets, it must account for these spaces. After all, Legalization is not just the advent of new legal markets and social realms, but the transformation and upheaval of prior ones. The cannabis market provided livelihoods for cannabis cultivators globally. The prices one could retrieve far exceeded the costs of physical inputs and what one might earn with other crops. Members of the Nasa tribe in Colombia consistently earned more from cannabis than from food and specialty crops like coffee as did Mayan farmers in southern Belize. Residents in Morocco's Rif turned to cannabis when the state took over the forestry industry, seasonal work in Algeria evaporated, and emigration and remittances became the only other viable income option. Declines in extractive industries in Lesotho and rural mountainous regions of Kentucky and California made cannabis a key livelihood strategy. Among farmers in post-socialist Kyrgyzstan and India's Himachal Pradesh state, cannabis was a way to stabilize an unstable transition to neoliberal capitalism. At times, too great a dependence on cannabis cultivation has led to declines in traditional agricultural practices and food security. But more often, cannabis has allowed cultivators to utilize lands otherwise unfit for food cultivation or cash crops, access cash to purchase supplemental food, and even use cannabis itself as currency. A weed, after all, cannabis can be grown in many environments and requires relatively little capital to begin. Low barriers to entry enable all kinds of people to participate, from marginalized youth in Papua New Guinea to women seeking alternatives to welfare in California. Though some invest heavily in facilities to shield cannabis from detection, particularly in higher-income consumer nations, growers often avoid fixed capital investments for fear they may be destroyed in unstable environments or seized and used as evidence in areas of intensive enforcement. Land is a key capital input necessary for cultivation as well as protection, whether through the anonymity of growing on public lands or the seclusion of private property. Knowledge of agronomy and access to land and markets can become axes along which cultivators are stratified, as, for example, in Sierra Leone, where those with land access, as well as knowledge of cultivation techniques, sat atop a system of labor tutelage, market access, and protection from police. Similar dynamics exist in Canada, where contact with mentors was key for advancement, or in the U.S. and South Africa, where indigenous farmers have suffered for lack of market access. High profits and low investments not only stabilized economic life, but scaffolded spaces for new formations of subjectivity, community, and politics. Cultivation could be disruptive, whether of traditional agricultural practices in Nepal, caste orders in the Indian Himalayas, or conservative and racialized notions of agriculture and rurality in the U.S. West. It fostered countercultural notions of ecological consciousness and conceptions of well-being among quasi-legal medical cultivators. Conspicuous consumption afforded by cannabis often signaled independence and modernity and enabled status and identity shifts, as in Colombia, where youthful cultivators acquired motorcycles and mobility, or in Kyrgyzstan, where profits bought nicer foods and clothes, or in Northern California, where new trucks indexed success, or in Papua New Guinea, where cannabis growing became a vehicle for young men to insert themselves into the commodity flows promised by unrealized development. Cultivators generated codes of professionalism, Canada, autonomous, safer spaces for cultivation, Spain, Belgium, communal systems of protection, Kentucky, ethical norms, Norway, leisure and passion, Florida, apprenticeship systems, Sierra Leone, and conflict resolution protocols, California, 
Though cultivation scenes could be riddled with sexism, and racial ethnic markers could pattern who one trusted and how networks formed, cannabis often took root amid war, economic transformations and crises, political unrest, or other conditions that inhibit the state's politico-territorial control. It figured centrally into radical political organization, whether of Kurdish separatists in Turkey, armed groups in Central Africa. Rastafarian resistance to colonial rule in Jamaica, tribal struggles for autonomy from colonial or national governments, and Maoist rebellion. These political assemblages might cultivate cannabis themselves or reap revenue through taxation and protection fees, thus giving them financial bases of operation. People in Lebanon's Bekaa Valley turned to cannabis to compensate for an absence of infrastructural development and as an income strategy during periods of conflict. This was also the case in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Nepal during the Maoist insurgency, and Afghanistan, particularly since the U.S. invasion in 2001, where periodic bouts of violence and political instability necessitated innovative livelihood strategies. In northeast Brazil, cannabis cultivation grew amid instability caused by market liberalization and commodity price declines. It grew in spaces of failed development, as in Colombia, extractive and agricultural decline in rural regions, and amid the decimation of social welfare systems. For developing nations, it became an alternative to development, while in industrialized nations, it became a shadow welfare state. And criminalizing successor to Keynesian policies of managing post-industrial poor and working classes, battling cultivators in unstable environments spawned state formation activities, state-run extortion and protection rackets, institution building funded by anti-drug foreign aid, federal transfers to local governments, or arrangements to ensure peace between national governments and unincorporated hinterlands. By stabilizing marginal populations and building state capacities, prohibited cultivation produced a kind of war system in which cultivators and state actors were invested, often antagonistically, in maintaining the status quo. In this whirlwind tour, I purposefully scrambled the geography of ethnographic citations with an aim to illuminate the social architecture generated by the drug war worldwide. As its coordinating mechanism, the prohibition premium lured people at the edge of market societies into production, structured semi-autonomous spaces of extra-legal life, and justified illiberal interventions that policed those spaces and peoples. Out of the drug war's architecture, a figure emerged in the shadows of market globalization. A ghost of developmentalism, welfareism, and industrialism haunting neoliberal society. This figure was an abject reminder of capitalism's failures, and at times a symbol of its core values: risk, unregulated markets, and the bending of law for profit. Cannabis cultivators were a distinctively modern global peasantry, produced from yet marking the frontiers of late capitalism. At a moment when legalization is reintegrating this modern peasantry into national agricultural orders. We might remember the common architecture constructed by the drug war, an architecture in which cultivators worldwide have lived, often adversely but always creatively. Legalization is much more than the lifting of prohibitive, punitive practices. It is the transformation of ways of life carved out in prohibition's shadows. Without forethought, legalization may simply take away economies that were largely imposed on cultivators and on which they have now become dependent, and in doing so, double down on the drug war's negative impacts for cultivating populations. The particular qualities of U.S. cultivation: supply chains, criminal citizens, and medicalization. Despite the commonalities generated by prohibition globally, the world is not flat. The globalization of cannabis cultivation has occurred across uneven geographies, particularly the unevenness between higher and lower income nations, or the global north and south, as geographer Chris Duval has framed it. 
This matter is particularly important for the U.S., which has played an outsized role in generating drug war geographies and is now positioned at the helm of a new uneven geography of legalization. What then is particular to U.S. cultivation? When Jerry moved to Northern California's Lost Coast in 1968 with some hippies who had turned her on to Bob Dylan, she came with an idea of self-reliance, self-sufficiency, with no intentions of coming up here to start a marijuana industry. Heeding Leary's call to tune in, turn on, drop out, Jerry's move was part of an urban to rural migration of disaffected youth, popularly dubbed the Back to the Land movement, an offshoot of the general countercultural protest against middle class orthodoxy and part of what the philosopher Herbert Marcuse would call the great refusal in industrialized nations. On the Lost Coast, a windswept, rugged, remote oceanfront at the edge of the world, as Jerry, a single African American mother from the Jim Crow South, has described it, people came with cows and chickens and goats. And marijuana was always our little side project, our hidden medicine. Jerry's medicine was just that for the first few years, a symbolic consciousness-altering plant around which she and her neighbors communed and relaxed in this retreat from regulated society. Growing her own also meant she could eliminate another expense from her household balance sheet. With the introduction of cannabis seeds, reportedly imported from Afghanistan and suited to the Lost Coast's latitude and environment, and Cincinnati growing techniques, that is, sorting males and females to produce more potent flowers, Jerry and her contemporaries soon realized they had a valuable crop on their hands. The green, freshly cured, seedless buds could not have looked or felt more different than the compressed bricks of Mexican brown weed often full of seeds and stems that dominated the U.S. market at the time. But the market for this crop did not exist. Jerry remembers, We drove it by the pounds to the city, and the cops didn't even know what it was. We had to introduce it to people so they would stop buying Mexican. We actually had to go to San Francisco and show people good herb and create the need for it. I remember going to a bar and hustling little buds to people, slowly getting numbers, introducing it like Campbell's Soup. While Mexican brown generally moved for $100 a pound, this new product eventually pulled $1,500 a pound, Jerry remembers. For Jim, a white marijuana broker from Marin County, north of San Francisco, this domestic product and the price it retrieved was transformative. As a kid, he would marvel at his friend's parents as they sorted imported buds at their kitchen table intrigued by this international market. When he became a cannabis broker as a college student in 1970s Humboldt County, he reveled in the increasingly cosmopolitan trade, the smells and varieties of plants from Colombia, Afghanistan, and Lebanon, the differences among African varietals and strains from Michoacan versus Zacatecas in Mexico, and his colorful suppliers often Vietnam vets and private sailors who smuggled cannabis by plane and boat from Mexico, Thailand, and Vietnam. He fondly remembers $400 Colombian brown, the splash that Hawaiian and Afghan strains made among connoisseurs. When the price of domestic pounds skyrocketed, his import business supplying students and locals turned to an export business. With packs of Humboldt cannabis streaming across the country, the county's reputation as a weed epicenter grew. The escalating price of cannabis helped back to the landers achieve their utopic dreams of communal living, disalienated labor, and renewed connection to the land. Stevie, a white UC Berkeley dropout, reminisced about restoring denuded timberlands, building yurts, and living off the grid with gardens for food and cannabis. Stevie came to the Lost Coast with five friends after having been fired from his substitute teaching job in Colorado for sporting an afro and a beard. Logged into ragged oblivion, his 20 acres of land were monetarily cheap but socially difficult to sustain in a rugged region averse to newcomers. With cannabis earnings, he and his neighbors built, volunteered for, and fiscally supported schools, fire departments, and community centers. 
They established watershed restoration programs, a radio station, and a community health center, and contributed funds to maintain roads. They invested in business ventures like solar panels, mountain bikes, and sustainable agriculture technologies that may not always have been profitable. Cannabis made profitability somewhat incidental, but tended to materialize utopic ideals. To Stevie, this was the golden era of marijuana, a several-year window of time in which the price of cannabis was increasing, making possible an efflorescence of community institutions and a rich cultural life. This golden era, however, was short-lived. Limited eradication efforts in the late 1970s grew into a full-grown eradication campaign in Northern California in 1983 under the tenure of President Ronald Reagan. As California's governor from 1967 to 1975, Reagan had squared off with the counterculture and struggles over UC Berkeley funding and leadership, culminating in the notorious battle over People's Park, among other episodes. It seemed to Hannah, a white woman, that cannabis gave President Reagan a justification for pursuing that counterculture into the hills of California. A surfer from Laguna Beach, Hannah's first political awakening occurred with the police raid of the New Age Christmas happening in 1970, thrown by the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, whose avatar, Timothy Leary, had successfully challenged the U.S. Marijuana Tax Act the year prior. This raid may have been unsurprising, given that the happening occurred mere miles from President Nixon's Western White House, just as his advisor, John Ehrlichman, was postulating cannabis as an efficient means to criminalize anti-war activists. In the early 1980s, Hannah fled Southern California for Humboldt when a Central American solidarity organization she was involved with crumbled under investigations and infiltration by the FBI's counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO, as court documents later revealed. Adept at recognizing the characteristic white Ford driven by the narcs and becoming increasingly paranoid in her Latin American solidarity activism, she packed up her car, held together by bumper stickers, and headed north. Humboldt, she thought, would be a reprieve and cannabis cultivation a way to keep off welfare. Nine months after her arrival, however, California, now governed through a bipartisan, anti-drug, tough-on-crime consensus, launched the federally supported Campaign Against Marijuana Planting, CAMP, to hunt and eradicate cannabis. Hannah regards these political pursuits as part of a war-making machine aimed at those who proposed to stop it. They undermined a whole culture, and when we all ran away, they chased us up here and keep trying to swat us down like ants. She maintains that the war on drugs is an arm of the war on culture, a counterculture to be precise, which in Humboldt County had developed robust, if criminalized, networks, institutions, and modes of communication. Though prohibitionist enforcement drove these off-grid communities deeper underground, they also drove cannabis prices to new heights. If $1,500 had once been an unheard-of amount for a pound of homegrown, soon prices of $5,000 to $6,000 per pound were commonplace. With this shift in prices, domestic cultivators became differentiated from and gained significant comparative advantages over international suppliers. Imported brown or red or gold bricks were often packaged to ship across borders. They were easier to smuggle than fluffy, smelly bags of bud, but consumer preferences increasingly favored those fragrant buds. Easier to smuggle were cocaine and heroin, which packed more value per unit with less pungency. As international eradication, particularly in Mexico, and interdiction, particularly in the Caribbean, intensified, new roots and substances took the place of cannabis. Meanwhile, U.S. cultivators continued to feed demand, driving that shift toward import substitution. The most significant comparative advantage held by intensifying domestic supply chains was that they could avoid the costs of international traffic and smuggling. Planes, boats, processing, packaging, personnel, bribes, and so on. While U.S. producers paid for transport to market, those costs were significantly lower than for cultivators outside high-income consumer markets. 
Put differently, U.S. cultivators were able to pocket a larger percentage of their earnings than their foreign cannabis-producing counterparts, who, if they took part in international trade, would generally pass it through the bottleneck of trafficking organizations. These intermediating organizations were necessitated, enriched, and empowered by supply-side interdiction strategies that made international movement especially risky, capital-intensive, and organized. Though foreign cultivators could turn to intra-regional or domestic consumer markets in their own locales, after all, cannabis consumption was increasing virtually everywhere, the U.S. and other industrialized nations were the highest paying consumers. Weirdly, then, global prohibition, as a system that intensively policed international borders, served as a protectionist policy for higher-income countries and their cultivators, while often consigning cultivators elsewhere to subordinated participation in trafficking networks or lower-value intra-regional trade. With the shift to an increasingly valuable domestic supply chain, local cultivation also shifted, widening from a utopic hobby of countercultural migrants to a common rural livelihood practice. Higher risks, bringing higher prices, had a transformative effect on the determination of who cultivated, in what ways, for what reasons. For many, these new conditions were a cue to leave. Stevie, the yurt-building Berkeley dropout, left the area when he began to worry it only offered his children a limited, precarious future. As a teacher, he noted, a lot of the boys weren't interested in studying because their attitude was, well, I'm going to be a millionaire when I'm 20 anyways. Once rich interactions with his neighbors increasingly focused on growing techniques, gates appeared where none existed before, semi-automatic gunfire echoed in the watersheds, Rottweilers and four-wheelers roamed property perimeters, and Stevie's roving hikes through the countryside became a thing of the past. Another cultivator who grew up in the life confirmed Stevie's fears, noting that he and his peers had grown up in run-down houses with unreliable cars, no electricity, cold water. It made those kids really yearn for the luxuries, for the amenities. You know, flip the switch and a light goes on. Hot water. All suburban amenities. That was what people wanted. Soon, another cultivator and environmentalist observed, the social solidarities hewed in the back-to-the-land migration suffered. Maybe only one person had a chainsaw and it would be loaned around. Two persons would have a working vehicle and they would drive us around. It was far more convenient. First, then, people got a little bit of money and bought a chainsaw. This began the process of closing themselves off. It really wasn't obvious. It was very gradual. The escalating price, for one local dealer, debased the ethics and values that had drawn him into cannabis commerce, the cosmopolitanism, the trust, the low-stakes intrigue. I knew the value of the experience people were getting from it, and it was not worth it, he told me. He left the market behind. Others, however, found new purpose in the transformed market. Cole, a white trafficker turned cultivator and back to the lander from the agricultural Central Valley, stayed, relishing the thrills of international trafficking, even as he watched his compatriots face jail sentences and lose properties to seizure. Vince, another trafficker turned cultivator, came to California via an East Coast crime family after being sent to juvenile corrections for drug dealing. For him, crime was not thrilling per se, but was a matter of mundane money-making and trust-building. While he missed the simpler cosmopolitan commerce of the 1970s, he adjusted to the higher stakes of the new cannabis economy by moving his life from an increasingly violent urban center, Oakland, to rural Humboldt, where he found a new vocation in cultivation. Jerry, who had been building cannabis markets since 1968, felt she had no place in mainstream U.S. society, a logical conclusion for someone who had directly experienced the terror of state-sanctioned racism and had now witnessed state-sanctioned violence against her neighbors in California and her other home, Jamaica, for growing cannabis. She acknowledged the dangers that the emerging high-stakes cannabis industry held, federal raids, robberies, and occasional murder, but she saw no less danger in living legally. For her, 
The answer was not to leave, but to weave the threads of community tighter, even as she prepared her children to cultivate talents beyond cannabis. Pot seeds, she observed, don't grow feed. While the golden era of back-to-the-land communalism was drastically affected by prohibition, intensified drug warfare was generative of new cultural forms. Carol, a white woman, had grown up on the Lost Coast. Born between two mid-century floods that devastated local communities and inaugurated the decline of the local timber industry, she regarded local life in seemingly timeless rhythms, where family names were everything. Your last name, that's who you are. They stuck not just in how people perceived you, but how you perceived yourself. Regardless of local differences in status, though, one's status as a local was just a shorthand for, I know all the stuff. She explains, people that weren't here before the 1970s don't know what it was like. You have a shorthand way of saying, if you're an old-timer, I know what it was like to think about the trees a certain way, going to church and cussing. As the timber industry slowly deflated, this local culture was thrust back into history. The scapegoats for the ensuing ruination were back to the landers, who found themselves as targets of discrimination, arson, vandalism, code enforcement actions, and law enforcement attentions. Carol remembered how locals united against the hippies. It was dramatic. Carol pantomimes her disgusted reactions as she recounts the patchouli oil smell at this market. Their smells, everything. The smell was foreign. They got in the river nude. The horror. It was beyond the pale. When Carol's boyfriend in high school first smoked marijuana, she says, I imagined his life was just destroyed. By the early 1980s, however, the timber industry was in free fall, with prices plummeting 48% between 1979 and 1982. Amidst mergers, layoffs, and offshoring, cannabis became the shadow core industry of a region that was increasingly known as the Emerald Triangle in honor of its new crop. In this new economic realm, Hippies, environmentalists, locals, loggers, and rednecks began to find common cause. Carol watched in high school as differences melted away and her redneck friends picked up tips from the kids of hippies and became successful pot growers, even if they didn't get into all that peace and love stuff. This all took on an intensely personal hue for Carol when she, the daughter of a church-going Republican Mormon family, married the son of former members of Students for a Democratic Society. You can see the divisions, she says, showing me a wedding picture, where she itemizes the stylistic differences between her father, the heavy equipment operator, and her husband's father, the college dropout. At their wedding, each set of parents poured a cup of water for their children to be, from which Carol and her husband drank, symbolizing not only the coming together of two families, but the union of two sides of a county long divided. By 2011, her husband was working highway construction, like Carol's father, and she tended the marijuana garden, just like her husband's parents. In cannabis, the spark of a new local society was born. Without marijuana, this community would be dead, says Jerry. As prices spiked, Cannabis employment absorbed unemployed timber workers, stabilized ranch incomes, continued supporting countercultural communities, cycled cash through ancillary community-based businesses, and provided complementary incomes to teenagers, single mothers, welfare recipients, veterans, felons, tribal members, and others whose relation to the formal market was already tenuous. Cannabis cultivation gave new, though covert, value to land, which was realized in shadowy transactions among a new array of industry actors into the cannabis industry. Real estate professionals, property speculators, latter-day timber operators, and ranchers. While cannabis premiums insinuated themselves throughout the region's social hierarchies, as any core industry might, its economic presence had political ramifications for the region, where opposition to clear-cutting and logging of ancient redwood had catapulted Humboldt to the forefront of a burgeoning, radical environmentalist movement. 
Hannah, the anti-nuke surfer, argues cannabis prohibition was an attack on that movement. They'd identified cannabis as a source of large financial support for anti-clear-cut, responsible harvesting, sustainable forestry movement. Pot was valuable, and it was going to fund the environmental movement. Criminalization had the insidious effect of curtailing the emergent solidarities between unemployed loggers and environmentalists, locals and newcomers, rednecks and hippies. This nascent solidarity, built not only around cannabis but care for community and land, was preempted in 1990 when the Redwood Summer Campaign, a grassroots effort to build unity among the rural white working class and environmentalists, was shattered. Judy Barry, the campaign organizer, was seriously injured by a mysterious car bomb, thus hobbling the campaign, and the U.S. government launched a coincident military campaign, Operation Green Sweep, against the region's cannabis cultivators. Facing criticism from Andean nations over the eagerness of U.S. forces to implement supply-side tactics abroad but not at home, the U.S. deployed the Army's 7th Infantry to Northern California to eradicate cannabis in the Emerald Triangle. This was a unique moment in drug war history, when U.S. military capabilities abroad were brought to bear on U.S. citizens using authorizations that loosened posse comitatus restrictions for domestic drug enforcement. Though environmentalists and many of the 15,000 reggae-on-the-river festival-goers protested the militaristic operations, Green Sweep had a chilling effect on cultivators. Domestic cultivators were momentarily branded not simply as criminals but as enemy combatants, a framing applied often to cultivators globally. Politically, Anti-cannabis enforcement actions pressured cultivators who chose to engage in overt activism, environmental and otherwise, as it might endanger their economic livelihoods. Socially, punitive enforcement encouraged more insularity and the breakdown of networks that structured community life. Environmentally, the breakdown of community networks and norms fostered spaces within which egregious abuse of the land could occur. Meanwhile, the timber industry clear-cut its way through remaining redwood stands, only slowing once the region's forests had been wrung of most of their value. In the end, however, the overt military enforcement against cannabis cultivation did not stick, even if domestic police forces became more militarized. Lawsuits were levied to contest the abrogation of civil rights, public outcry was vocal, Funding for state eradication efforts declined in the ensuing five years. Humboldt County Sheriff pronounced military involvement to be counterproductive and ill-advised, and even military strategists agreed, questioning the wisdom of military operations on domestic soil. U.S. cultivators were criminals, but also rights-bearing citizens whose status afforded them different treatment and a different degree of political voice than cultivators elsewhere. In addition to their relative power in the supply chain, cannabis cultivators were exceptional to the degree that they could claim U.S. citizenship, albeit a criminalized citizenship, which protected them from some of the most intensive activities of the U.S.-driven global war on drugs. It was a third kind of exception, the medicalization of cannabis in the U.S., that made it possible for cultivators to become legalized and proffer a domestic challenge to supply-side prohibitionism. The 1961 single convention left signatory nations some leeway to designate cannabis for medical scientific research provision and use. This led in the U.S. to a successful challenge in the late 1970s by a glaucoma patient who claimed cannabis as a medical necessity. The federal government subsequently cultivated and provided cannabis for this patient and others. But when the program faced being overwhelmed by HIV-slash-AIDS patient activists who had discovered the treatment potential of cannabis, the federal government closed cannabis access to patients. In San Francisco, Patient activists found a medical buyer's cooperative, won a citywide ballot approving medical cannabis, and laid the groundwork for a statewide ballot initiative in 1996, making California the first state to adopt cannabis medicalization. Patient activists had primarily organized around the right to consume and access medicine, but someone somewhere had to provision that medicine. 
Rights to cultivate were slower in the making, however. California legislators were especially nervous about regulating and thereby legitimating cannabis cultivation in light of the federal government's saber-rattling and fierce protection of supply-side controls. In 2004, eight years after voter passage of medical cannabis, the California legislature finally passed clarifying legislation allowing people to grow in legally undefined medical collectives, though even this was not unequivocally recognized judicially until a 2015 ruling. In the absence of state protection, cultivators acquired medical recommendations for themselves and often gathered recommendations of other patients in order to grow larger gardens. Cultivation, in other words, was medicalized, and it spread, becoming a ubiquitous, if controversial, activity even in the most conservative parts of the state. The medical exception, that Achilles heel of the single convention, was undermining prohibition not just for consumers but producers, those universal targets of supply-side strategies. By the late 2000s, amid an economic recession, initial signs of liberalization by the Obama administration, and a growing acceptance of cannabis, many new cultivators broke ground, contributing to a downward trend in wholesale prices and, incidentally, marking a motion toward a new economic logic of supply-demand pricing rather than risk-induced pricing, given that risks and risk perceptions were significantly declining. A 2010 legalization ballot initiative, which would be defeated that year, threw the cultivation sector deeper into disarray. Anticipating legalization, some cultivators went for broke by planting more, flooding the market, and crashing prices. Economic anxiety dovetailed with geopolitical worries when it became clear that the man bankrolling and organizing the ballot was angling to open at least one of four proposed 100,000 square foot indoor cultivation facilities in Oakland. Much closer to consumers and capable of pumping out massive quantities of high-grade cannabis all year, competition of this sort would devastate rural growers. This perception likely led nearly two-thirds of southern Humboldt County, the epicenter of California cannabis growing, to vote against legalization. A much-discussed bumper sticker exhorted voters to save Humboldt County, keep pot illegal. Though growing acceptance had decreased risks, criminal citizens depended on prohibition premiums and the benefits they gave to remote, consumer-distant cultivation locales. One might regard this as privilege and greed, or as the hard-earned caution of a rural population eager to avoid yet another bust in the boom-bust cycles that have defined the California hinterlands. Though the 2010 legalization ballot initiative failed, many sensed that the writing was on the wall, as one cultivator expressed it. Growers needed to claim a seat at the table if they didn't want to wind up on the menu. If underground growers wanted to survive in a legal market, they needed to position themselves early and well. At a microeconomic level, positioning meant intensifying competition among cultivators. Growers dropped prices to retain business with increasingly choosy brokers and cut the wages of trimmers or replaced them altogether with trimming machines. They chased the latest strains popular in dispensaries or the pages of High Times magazine, hoping they would still be popular at harvest time, implemented new horticultural methods like light deprivation techniques that sped up outdoor growing cycles and created derivative markets for otherwise wasted plant matter, like the plant trim that fueled concentrates. At a broader level, through the anticipatory machinations of cultivators in policy debates throughout the state, the discursive contours of a new ready-for-legality cultivation sector took shape. Emerald Triangle cultivators, in some of the first efforts by U.S. producers to build overt political organizations since the drug war began, auditioned new ways of conceptualizing cultivation for a legalizing era. One renowned environmentalist urged cultivators to recognize the legacy of pioneering back-to-the-land cultivators and the ethical values they cherished. Care for the land, community participation, and the struggle against big business and big government. In community meetings, legislative hearings, op-eds, and increasingly the speeches of politicians and even the comments of local law enforcement, 
people valorized mom and pop, homestead, and small farms, imbuing them with a righteousness that demanded protection in the transition out of illegality. These advocates generated a move towards sun-grown rather than indoor cannabis, an argument for boutique, Appalachian-protected cannabis, a demand for sustainable, green, local, and organic certifications, and a politics to insulate smaller farmers in California from the increasing pressure to increase farm size, even if people's definition of big and small farms was contentious. All of these demands have shaped the development of local and statewide political geographies of legalization in enduring yet still fragile ways. Seeking legitimacy and legibility as they were inducted into public and agricultural life, growers went through a cleansing process to shed negative associations, much like white youth and medical consumers were cleansed of criminal intent in decriminalization debates in the 1970s and medicalization in the 2000s, respectively. This cleansing, however, came at a price, namely the generation of new negative stigmas against which respectable cultivators would be defined. Discursive lines were drawn between environmentally sustainable, law-abiding citizen cultivators and those labeled as polluting, law-flouting criminal cultivators, who were perceived as dealing in harder drugs, acting violently, polluting public parks, and violating community norms. What sutured this new imaginary of criminal cultivators together was their supposed foreignness and potential relation to international organized crime. Whether it was Bulgarian human trafficking rings, violent Mexican cartels on public land, or deviant Hmong farmers flouting norms and laws. The reality underlying these accusations of organized crime is debatable, if not dubious, yet one effect is undeniable. Legal market involvement entails a moral sorting of domestic from foreign actors. This is yet another iteration of the historic work of the war on drugs in generating criminalized and stigmatized populations. As some cultivators are granted a conditional exception to the drug war and disciplinarily ushered into legal markets defined by citizenship, legibility, and respectability, legalization politics are evacuated of their radical demand for global justice for all those ensnared by the drug war. For those opposed to drug wars, U.S. cultivation was importantly positioned to challenge the supply-side logic of the war in the very belly of the beast. The unique position of U.S. cultivators in the supply chain and in relation to political claims-making capabilities made that challenge possible. Exceptionalism, however, hinders the promise of legalization. Cannabis is simply miscategorized, the line goes, and need only be rescheduled and removed from prohibited status. Meanwhile, the apparatus of the drug war continues apace, applied with equal fervor to other substances. Exceptions to the drug war are crafted along national borders, producing an uneven geography of legality and illegality as the otherwise relatively even geography of global prohibition crumbles. Legalization becomes yet another form of U.S. market capture. Political demands for legalization are shorn to a basic demand for integration into legal domestic markets. This market focus not only sidesteps demands for repairing harms done by a century of prohibition, but also sidesteps the inequities created by markets themselves. Simply removing cannabis from national prohibitions will not alter the structural purpose that prohibition served in managing inequality, and legal markets will not necessarily be more just. In fact, research I recently conducted with others demonstrates that current legalization may not even, as a baseline, consistently help the people who have labored under and been put at risk by prohibition. Globalizing Legality, Dismantling Prohibition whether in Colombia, Africa, Canada, or California, legalization is, despite all of its improvements, eliminating livelihoods from marginalized people who have depended on prohibition premiums. Without countervailing measures, legal profits will accumulate in more predictable ways to more predictable actors, presumably along the lines of larger-scale monocropping agribusinesses with devastating consequences for producers, workers, communities, and the environment. 
Generating those countervailing measures, however, will require a robust role for the state in mediating markets. Curiously, this is not an impossibility for cannabis, a plant that is no stranger to intensive state intervention. In California currently, stringent, thorough regulations have been explicitly designed for environmental protection. Yet these are having adverse, perhaps unintended consequences for smaller-scale farming and economic development in producer communities. The question in California and elsewhere, then, is not just whether robust state actions exist, but rather in whose interests and for which public good or goods will cannabis cultivation regulation be designed, and how will multiple interests and goods be balanced. A core issue requiring attention is how to distribute the common wealth created by criminalized people over the past century. Because it is unprotected by law, the properties, intellectual, social, biological, horticultural, epistemological, cultural, created by cannabis cultivators under the restraints of prohibition, are turned by legalization into unclaimed common property waiting to be appropriated by those with the access, capital, and wherewithal. These properties, developed by illegalized cultivators, are bearers of the immense labor invested in cannabis, building networks, creating markets, accumulating knowledge, sharing resources, protecting each other, refining techniques, breeding seeds, forming medical collectives, generating a culture, protesting, building political relationships, challenging laws, debating neighbors, and publicizing the plant's worth. Not to mention taking risks, getting arrested, having property seized, and paying enormous fines. It is only through these historic and political labors taken by cannabis growers and activists that the plant today is valuable and legal. Without forethought, legalization may just be a legal sleight of hand to expropriate this collective labor. So, is there a different path out of prohibition, not only in the U.S. but around the world? One that does not merely expropriate but lifts up producers, communities, and the environment. One that does not merely extract cannabis from a broken prohibition system and render it legal without any regard for what is being taken away from already marginalized peoples who took great risks to cultivate cannabis. Environmental scientists Liliana Davalos, Karina Sanchez, and Dolores Armenteras have surveyed the destruction left by drug prohibition and resource extraction across Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. They ask that we recommit society to substantive, thorough, and ecologically oriented development for rural communities. Duval points to the need to recognize and protect cannabis seeds and genetics in Africa and elsewhere that are being pilfered by multinational corporations. In the U.S., as legalization progresses, Advocates of equity policies focused on people impacted by the drug war attempt to ameliorate high costs and barriers to entry. Activists also advocate for protective policies like appellation designations that generate market rents for cultivators to protect places, ecologies, styles of growing, cultural heritage, labor practices, and the like. A broader protective policy would facilitate producer cooperatives, which allow cultivators to share material and intellectual resources, quell competition, and enable collective marketing efforts that make cultivation more affordable and economically sustainable. More systemic policies would rework how cannabis cultivation meets markets. Looking to U.S. tobacco leaf programs that have supported hundreds of thousands of small farmers for decades, Policymakers might explore the potential of market-adjustable allotments, minimum prices, product grading, and cultivator-funded auctions to ensure that a maximum number of productive farmers can afford production costs, environmental protections, and fair farm worker wages. These programs are possible specifically because of cannabis's prohibition-elevated prices, and they might be coupled with accountable distribution systems, like the not-for-profit collective systems that California had prior to 2019, which can guard against price gouging, ensure access for the indigent and ill, and are guided by public health principles, not commercial ones. These systemic policies go beyond ameliorative and protective programs by recognizing and replacing what was perversely beneficial about prohibition.
namely its provision of small farmer livelihoods and economic development. Designed well, they may also assure the health of workers and the environment, as well as indigent and ill consumers. These proposals, however, operate within domestic borders. No matter how just the proposals may be internally, they would still be haunted by an active global prohibitionism that prevents cultivators worldwide from participating in legal economies and sharing in the fruits of legalization. The result? Market capture by the global north and a new round of dispossession and marginalization of those in the global south, that historic object of supply-side interventions. Can we, however constituted, generate a just legalization and collaboratively support it across the globe with the same gusto as the U.S. did in the war on drugs? In this essay, I have illuminated the relationship of U.S. cannabis cultivation with the world. Yet cannabis exceptionalism severs the connection of the plant with the drug war and its global provenance, myopically refocusing U.S. Americans on domestic markets. It is here that cannabis exceptionalism lapses into American exceptionalism, tantalizing U.S. Americans with fantasies of market achievements and divorcing them from the debts owed to one another and the world. It may be that cannabis is now allowed in that city upon a hill, yet, as the war continues, one might be drawn to wonder who lies in the valleys below and what it is they may be growing next. Part 3. The Domestic Front 5. The Local War on Drugs Peter C. P. Hose. The Local War on Drugs examines how the Chicago Police Department and other law enforcement institutions and actors have managed illicit drug use since the Second World War. Until the late 1980s, drug-related arrests were only loosely connected to lengthy prison terms. Local institutions had to create punitive capacity and greater coordination in order to produce the mass incarceration of black Chicagoans for illicit drug-related crimes. Amid conditions in which the black poor and working class was excluded from the labor market and pushed into neighborhoods of concentrated poverty, white advocates of law and order and black liberals seeking nuanced solutions to serious violence produced a war on gangs and drugs in the 1980s that became a critical mode for governing the city. In 1950, the Chicago Police Department, CPD, made fewer than 500 arrests on illicit drug-related charges. In 2000, they made 58,000. As historian Kathleen Friedel reports, during the 1960s and 1970s, entire police departments had become vice squads with a primary interest in narcotics, and conversely, illicit drug enforcement emerged not just as something to police, but as a way to police. Yet until the 1980s, prosecutors and courts lacked the capacity and inclination to incarcerate large numbers of people. In 1980, judges in Cook County, the territory that contains most of Chicago, sentenced half of a percent of drug-related arrestees to prison, around 100 out of 17,000. Only thereafter did Chicago's mayors and police superintendents, as well as Cook County's state's attorneys, judges, and sheriffs develop new punitive capacities within their institutions and coordinate much more closely to target and punish black Chicagoans. Such institutional transformations were central to the war on drugs as it was waged in Chicago and other cities. This case study of Chicago highlights two underdeveloped aspects of scholarship on the domestic war on drugs. The first is temporal. In James Foreman Jr.'s words, mass incarceration wasn't created overnight. Its components were assembled piecemeal over a 40-year period. Chicago and Cook County institutions developed punitive capacity over time and in relationship to each other. Police tactics changed, producing different kinds of drug arrests in different locations. The actions of other law enforcement institutions changed the significance of those arrests. The second is jurisdictional. As criminologist Mona Lynch argues, although sentencing statutes have been toughened at the state and federal levels, thereby creating the capacity for mass incarceration, 
Mass incarceration has not been realized without local-level criminal justice actors transforming their daily practices to send more and more offenders away to state penal institutions. While both the federal and state governments acted to create the war on drugs, this chapter focuses on the role of local actors in transforming their institutions. These developments in Chicago are unique but not singular. There is a growing literature in the war on drugs in specific urban places, which highlights specific facets of local change, such as police militarization and the development of dragnet policing in poor and working-class black and Latino neighborhoods. What distinguishes this chapter's approach, however, is a focus on the relationship of local law enforcement institutions to the policing of illicit drugs in the period since the Second World War, and the development and coordination of punitive capacity among police, prosecutors, and judges. Over time, local action transformed the place of the policing of drugs in urban governance. By the 1980s, Chicago politicians embraced a state of war on gangs and drugs as a mode of managing inequality. Black, poor, and working-class people faced, as sociologist Louis Quacant has described it, joblessness and economic exclusion rising to extreme levels against the backdrop of rigid racial segregation and state abandonment. When the liberal black politician Harold Washington took power as mayor in 1983, he sought to address what political scientist Lisa Miller has called racialized state failure, government abandonment of its first-order political responsibility of providing safety from violence. The political failure of Washington's multifaceted approach to violence in the face of fiscal austerity and white resistance channeled the city's response toward more intensive policing. Black political demands for greater neighborhood safety thus came to align with the punitive law and order ideology advanced by working class white ethnics, led by Cook County State's Attorney Richard M. Daley. At the dawn of the crack crisis, Chicago's political leaders had already embraced governing through war on gangs and drugs, creating a local foundation for a regime to arrest, process, and imprison black Chicagoans. Nobody went to jail. Local law enforcement institutions created three different local drug regimes in Chicago since the Second World War. The first targeted a concentrated spike in heroin usage following the war. The second focused on a multi-drug crisis that stretched from the mid-1960s to the end of the 1970s, highlighted by the normalization of marijuana and the extension of heroin outside of historic copping areas, heroin distribution locations. The third focused on controlled substances, especially cocaine, and the rise of public drug markets in high-poverty black neighborhoods. In each crisis, the CPD seized the dominant role, one that would grow dramatically over time. Between 1950 and 1980, the CPD's policing of drugs went from being a specialized project of managing drug users on the margins of society to a widespread tactic for regulating urban order. In 1951, the CPD increased its narcotics section from four to sixty officers, and the county court opened a special narcotics branch. These institutions centralized the processing and tracking of individuals police registered as drug addicts, three-quarters of whom were black. Once an individual was on the CPD's addict registry, police would send them downtown for booking and interrogation for all arrests, regardless of the offense. The narcotics section used their arrest powers to regulate drug markets on Chicago's Skid Row and in the historic Black Belt that stretches between 22nd and 63rd Streets and between State Street and Cottage Grove. When black Chicagoans demanded that something be done about illicit drugs in the Black Belt, police responded with vicious treatment. One narcotics squad officer remembered, it was real easy just to go out on Madison or Maxwell Streets and pick them up and do whatever we wanted with them. Nobody cared what we did to them niggers. Police used overtly racist forms of street justice rather than long-term incarceration to maintain social control. Police collared most arrestees for non-drug crimes, and Narcotics Court creatively managed a massive docket. 6,518 cases were heard in its first six months of operation, 
largely through a high dismissal rate and convictions for minor offenses. Harsh mandatory penalties for drug possession passed by the state of Illinois in 1951 did lead to increases in incarceration for drug-related crimes and overcrowding in the Cook County Jail, where sentences of up to five years were served. Nonetheless, for the vast majority of people the police arrested, the punishment was a night in jail. With the aid of the county courts, the CPD used these minor arrests as a tool to manage addicts and copping areas. In the 1950s, the specialized narcotics section had engaged in spatially delimited and demographically concentrated policing. But the second drug crisis beginning in the 1960s led the CPD to vastly expand the people and places it policed for illicit drugs. In part, this was a response to real changes in drug use. Paul Hemphill, a Chicago corrections official, testified in 1971 to a sudden increase in drug use on every socioeconomic level by our young people. What had once been a problem confined to the poor, to the chronically ill, and to various underworld subcultures has within the past five years virtually exploded out of the control of our institutions. The use of drugs by white teenagers led many committed drug warriors, including the state's attorney and police superintendent, to argue in 1971 for tying penalties to their understanding of a drug's potential harmfulness. Law enforcement officials focused almost exclusively on heroin pushers, whom William Bauer, the local U.S. attorney, described as more dangerous to society than murderers and armed robbers. Ultimately, Legal reforms and their application on the street produced a broader and looser punitive net. For example, even as the number of arrests expanded, the Cook County State's Attorney created a pretrial diversion program to divert youthful offenders. Nonetheless, arrest and detention remained the principal tools of control. In the 1970s, the CPD expanded interdiction efforts targeting major traffickers within the city vastly expanding the amount and value of drugs seized over the course of the 1960s. While this would remain a key strategy, particularly for making major cases in coordination with the federal government, police leaders recognized early on that such efforts had little impact. As Deputy Superintendent Michael Spioto lamented in 1978, it is almost impossible to make a seizure which seriously diminishes the supply of heroin. In combination with these supply reduction strategies, the department vastly expanded everyday drug policing. In 1965, police made 2,500 arrests for drug-related crimes. By 1976, this had grown sevenfold to 17,500. As Figure 5.1 illustrates, until 1976, cannabis and controlled substance arrests grew in tandem after which controlled substances arrests declined, likely in relationship to declining heroin usage. In this everyday drug policing, the CPD followed black Chicagoans across the new residential geography that emerged during the 1950s and 1960s. Described by historian Arnold Hirsch as a second ghetto, it included many Chicago Housing Authority developments as well as formerly working and middle-class white neighborhoods on the south and west sides. By the 1970s, police arrested many more black Chicagoans for illicit drug-related offenses in a much wider variety of locations than during the 1950s. Moreover, more police were engaged in anti-drug activities. By 1970, the International Association of Chiefs of Police observed all beat officers and district vice officers are employed in the general suppression of illegal narcotic activities. These changes produced two new important patterns of arrest. First, police made more arrests of white people for drug-related offenses, doubling their rate of arrest between 1965 and 1970 from the first half of the decade. This did not mean the end of discrimination, Blacks were still arrested three times more frequently than whites per capita. Second, as historic vice districts broke down and new patterns of residential segregation emerged across the city, the geography of arrests also became racially segregated. During the 1940s and 1950s, police typically arrested white people within the same vice districts as blacks. By the 1960s, police made drug arrests in racially homogenous spaces. 
black Chicagoans were arrested in predominantly black neighborhoods, whereas whites were mostly arrested downtown or in white residential areas. Despite this vast expansion of drug policing, the law enforcement system, particularly courts and prosecutors, had little capacity to convict and sentence arrestees to prison sentences. As the Illinois Legislative Investigating Commission concluded before the reform of marijuana laws in 1971, since most arrests were for possession, well-intentioned judges, prosecutors, and arresting officers would rather issue a warning than to have to impose the severe mandatory penalties now required. Judges actively managed their dockets and inquired into police work, throwing out a third of the cases for improper seizures of evidence. Typically, these searches were the product of police aggressively confronting people or situations they found to be suspicious. The suspects were usually young, many of them had petty criminal records, and the searches usually took place at night, either on the street or during a car stop. Judges were most suspicious when officers tried to justify these searches with general rationales. The suspect was out late or apparently drunk, or the officer saw something including the defendant throwing or dropping drugs. As a result, drug policing remained only loosely connected to imprisonment. Mike Royko, Chicago's most popular newspaper columnist, pointed out to his Sun-Times readers in 1980, of about 3,700 arrests last year for heavy drug charges, heroin, angel dust, and other brain burners, about 100 led to somebody going to jail. Of about 4,000 arrests of adults in Chicago for peddling or possessing marijuana in felony quantities, not teenage nickel bag stuff, nobody went to jail. As in the 1950s, police continued to use drug arrests as a tool of control and harassment, albeit one that expanded beyond black addicts in known copping areas to being a more generalized way to manage suspicious people and spaces. In the 1980s, this would change. A drug dealer is more harmful than any other criminal. By the end of the 1970s, incarceration for drug use had hardly moved. Arrests for drug use fell over the second half of the 1970s, not eclipsing their 1976 level until 1984. By contrast, the number of prisoners in Illinois grew sharply, increasing from 6,000 to 17,000 between 1974 and 1984. Narratives explaining mass incarceration often miss the multi-dimensional nature of criminal justice politics during the 1970s, especially in Chicago, where black activists organized against crime and also against repression, seeking to end the under-protection and over-policing of their communities. Nonetheless, the passage of Governor James R. Thompson's Class X law in 1977 to eliminate parole, fix determinate sentences, and create a new class of felonies symbolized a widespread embrace of retribution as the leading rationale for punishment. In running for Cook County State's Attorney in 1980, Richard M. Daley sought to bring this retributive impulse to the handling of drugs, gangs, and youth crime. He criticized his Republican opponent because only a couple of hundred people were sent to jail on drug charges in Cook County. Daly framed his promises for more punitiveness explicitly as an appeal to black voters, accusing his opponent of ignoring gangs, drug abuse, and other crimes committed against black people. In doing so, Daly hoped to tap into long-standing black grievances about police under protection. For example, Despite the disproportionate rate at which African Americans were arrested for drug crimes, Renault Robinson, the leader of the militant Chicago African American Patrolmen's League, criticized the CPD's failure to stop drug traffic in black neighborhoods. In the average neighborhood, children know who sells dope, but the police can't seem to find them. Black voters and commentators remained suspicious of Daly's sincerity. He prevailed in the election by just 16,000 votes, two-tenths of a percent, on the strength of his support from white ethnics the Southwest side. While doing well in some middle-class black wards, he did not perform as well as previous Democratic candidates had among black voters. 
Daly justified his punitive approach to gangs, drugs, and youth crime as a necessary response to the long-term crisis of serious violence in Chicago. But he did so by targeting the groups most vulnerable to that violence, primarily poor and working-class black males. Blue-collar work declined steeply in the 1970s as Chicago lost almost a third of its manufacturing jobs. These losses hit black males particularly hard. Moreover, the losses were not distributed evenly across black Chicago. Class stratification was embedded in space, as the number of black neighborhoods of concentrated poverty dramatically multiplied from 1970 to 1980. Many Chicago Housing Authority properties were left worse off, and they became examples of the desperate conditions produced by the combination of hyper-segregation and concentrated poverty. In 1980, Chicago's most populous public housing project, the Robert Taylor Homes, which housed less than 1% of the city's population, was the site of 11% of all murders. Another major public housing project, Cabrini Green, had 30 murders between 1978 and 1981. A March 1981 killing there led Mayor Jane Byrne to take up residence in one of its high-rise apartment buildings, accompanied by a rush of services. Planted grass, garbage pickup, that only emphasized the city's routine failures. Byrne's more lasting response was a new policing program, which engaged in widespread harassment of black youth through mass arrests. In 1982, the Bureau arrested 145,000 people, more than one-third of all arrests made in Chicago that year. A lawsuit by the American Civil Liberties Union revealed that the Chicago police made some 800,000 harassment arrests overall from 1978 to 1983. As state's attorney, Daly doubled down on punitive approaches. He lauded the CPD's campaign of mass arrests as an example of what local police can do. He restructured his office so that his assistant district attorneys, ADAs, would turn those police arrests into prison sentences. Daly required the ADAs to take many more cases to trial and to request more prison time. He required his ADAs to provide regularly updated status reports for every case in their courtrooms, as well as to compile monthly reports documenting their success in sending people to prison. In his two terms as state's attorney, Daly took pride in seeking severe prison terms, even for minor offenses. Daly focused his office's attention on drug dealers. A drug dealer, he told reporters, is more harmful than any other criminal. He created two special prosecution teams focused on gang and drug enforcement. He selected aggressive prosecutors for these units, people one admiring journalist described as having the same them-or-us attitude that is common among the police. Kenneth Wattis, the attorney in charge, emblematized the approach. A dealer is a dog, Wattis asserted. We're dealing with dogs, scum. A creative administrator, Daly reorganized the district attorney's office to ensure that cases stayed on track and more accused offenders ended up in prison. He set up a system of vertical prosecution that allowed for closer tracking of cases, as the same attorney oversaw the case from the preliminary hearing through sentencing. Daly, who had been raised by his father, Mayor Richard J. Boss Daly, to understand Chicago's inner workings, created much greater coordination between police and prosecutors. He made sure that state's attorneys were on call to supervise warrant applications, for example, to ensure that evidence was always properly admitted in court. Using his insider knowledge and political savvy, Daly reorganized the district attorney's office to be a highly efficient incarceration machine. Daly also worked closely with the CPD on aggressive use of the 1982 Illinois Narcotics Forfeiture Act. The CPD loved the financial incentives the 1982 Act provided them. Sergeant James O'Neill, a department leader, noted that every dollar, every man-hour an agency invests will have a tenfold return. The extra cash the police received through the Forfeiture Act helped them improve their drug cases. 
They used some of the forfeited drug money, ironically, in buy and bust drug transactions, which were more likely than typical possession with intent cases to hold up in court. By 1983, the narcotics section had not only doubled in size; it had at least 20 teams engaged in undercover buy and bust operations. Daly collaborated with the CPD to ensure that forfeiture money led to more successful arrests and prosecutions. Daly sought to transform the courts as well, seeing them as obstacles to more punitive treatment of drugs, gangs, and youth crime. He used his bully pulpit as a prosecutor to challenge county court judges who oversaw gang and drug cases. Many of these judges had remained skeptical of drug prosecutions and had pushed back against the district attorney's zeal. Daly went after them in the court of public opinion, relentlessly bashing them in the media for their recalcitrance in the war on drugs. Professional norms, which expected judges to stay out of public political debates, made it difficult for the judges to fight back. Daly relentlessly pilloried judges who sought to avoid sending people to prison for minor drug charges and backed electoral challengers against sitting judges he thought were too protective of due process and the rights of defendants. Even more lasting was Daly's role as a lawmaker. Historians seldom focus on the role local officials play in shaping state government, but Daly demands attention for his assiduous cultivation of the state legislature and governors. As state's attorney, Daly's impact on the Illinois criminal code was remarkable. His office proposed and lobbied for a wide variety of changes to Illinois substantive and procedural law. Legislators in Springfield complied by passing statutes making evidence gathering easier, creating new crimes, and treating juveniles like adults. Just as important. Daly fought to restrict judges' authority by successfully lobbying the state legislature to pass laws that mandated harsher, mandatory sentences for drug felonies. Although he could not get the legislature to go as far as he wished, he was also the principal promoter of reducing the amount of cocaine necessary to qualify for a Class X felony charge to just 15 grams. A law that confirmed the near total punitive consensus on drugs by passing both houses unanimously. The selling of narcotics is a curbside operation. Political observers correctly assumed that Daly planned to challenge incumbent Jane Byrne for mayor in 1983, but liberal black congressman Harold Washington undercut Daly's plans. With the white ethnic vote split. Washington's Rainbow Coalition, black nationalists, liberals, and conservatives, a growing number of Latino voters, and white lakefront liberals prevailed with a plurality in the Democratic primary. Although Washington came up through the machine before breaking with it in 1978, he had a long record of criticizing the CPD as a political institution that overpoliced and underprotected black Chicagoans. In a speech to the Afro-American Patrolmen's League following his election, Washington called for total police reform, including civilian control, as well as an end to police brutality and poor service. At the same time, he stressed black officers' special obligation to confront crime and violence facing our poorest and most defenseless citizens. Particularly stressing the need to stop drug trafficking by every legal means at our disposal, and to disentangle young people from the violent gangs which blight too many of our neighborhoods. Nonetheless, while he had supported certain actions to criminalize gang activity, Washington broadly stood against punitiveness as the answer. In 1978, he had argued that the creation of Class X felonies isn't going to do a damn thing to reduce crime. Five years earlier, he advanced a proceduralist vision of justice, proposing that police officers treating people with respect and dignity, rather than the building of a dozen new state prisons, would be the best way to address crime. Washington understood the strategic importance of policing in urban politics. During the election, even the conservative Tribune asked whether Washington's opponents were attempting to whip up fears of a lawless rampage if Mr. Washington is elected. The newspaper highlighted the racism behind these fears. 
that a black mayor could and would fight black crime as well as a white mayor is beyond their comprehension. Despite the fact that Washington won the election as a Democrat, 28 white and one Latino Democratic machine regulars took control of the council and opposed his every move. Washington treaded carefully around policing. For example, he took a historic step in appointing Fred Rice as the CPD's first black superintendent. But Rice was also a safe choice as the department's highest ranking and most experienced administrator. The city council's majority block challenged even mild reforms undertaken by the superintendent, including his prerogative to appoint his own command staff. Rice's effort to address disparities in patrol strength and 911 call response times between black and white neighborhoods was also met with intransigence. Alderman Roman Puchinski demanded to know why the superintendent wanted to strip of us the police details and beats simply because we do not record a large number of crimes. In response, the city council's majority bloc sought to strip Rice's administrative power to assign police patrols to those areas most in need of protection. Washington confronted the dilemma of austerity that bedeviled the first generation of black mayors in the 1970s and 1980s. How could the city manage increased social needs in the face of declining revenue? Spending on the CPD accounted for nearly a quarter of the city budget. During lean budgetary years, previous mayors reduced the size of the uniformed ranks. Between 1976 and 1984, the number of police officers shrank from 13,510 to 11,952. During his campaign, Washington had promised to raise staffing levels, but when faced with deficits in the 1984 and 1985 budgets, he followed his predecessors in proposing cuts. Although the majority bloc on the city council had been quiescent in the face of attrition under previous mayors, its members now declared that Washington was soft on crime. According to the Tribune's editorial board, the bloc was implying that every new rape and mugging in the city resulted from Mr. Washington's trims in the police force, including the crimes that haven't occurred yet. The murder of Benji Wilson, the nation's top-rated high school basketball player, on November 20, 1984, the same day as the hearing on Washington's 1985 police budget, heightened the stakes of the debate. Wilson's killing was not gang-motivated. Nonetheless, once the media made a connection between the shooter, 16-year-old Billy Moore, and the black gangster disciples, a single crude narrative dominated the headlines. Gang violence killed Ben Wilson. Gang-motivated homicides had been on the rise since 1976, as figure 5.2 demonstrates. While turf rivalries between Latino gangs, the Latin Kings, and Two Sixes produced most of the killings in the late 1970s, between 1981 and 1984, conflict among black gangs produced at least 40 homicides each year. As the artist and activist Usini Perkins argued, framing Ben Wilson's death as a case of gang violence caused the city government, the police, and other public officials to finally listen to the community leaders, clergy, and social service representatives whose annual denunciation of black street gang violence routinely went unanswered. Washington demonstrated his preference for an all-of-the-above response to gang violence after Wilson's death. Nonetheless, the city council majority's resistance to social spending that would only benefit blacks and Latinos limited his options. As his aide Mike Holwinski explained, there were two choices, to deal with just the hardcore gang members or broaden the program so as to also deal with young people in general. Anti-violence professionals favored micro-social interventions targeted at actual gang beefs rather than youth delinquency programs. Given the limited funds available, however, such a program could provide money only in black and Latino wards, bypassing the constituents of the city council majority. Holwinski believed this would have been a very difficult thing to sell to the Chicago City Council. Unsurprisingly, the administration's program, called the Crisis Intervention Network, had goals that were far too diffuse for effective action. To attack gang crime, prevent juvenile crime, 
treat delinquent behavior, and nurture positive youth development. Irving Spurgle, a leading scholar and practitioner of gang intervention, concluded that the program could not succeed in reducing gang violence because the majority of its time was not spent dealing with conflict among gang members, threats by gangs, and pressure by gangs. The city council majority's willingness to fund more police but not the targeted interruption of violence brought black demands for greater neighborhood safety into alignment with the ideology of punitive law and order. Even before Wilson's funeral, the council flipped Washington's proposal to cut 500 officers, raising the number of uniformed personnel by that same number. In contrast to the constant wrangling that rendered the violence prevention program ineffective, Changes in the police department were almost immediately felt on the ground. As the CPD hired new officers, it put more police in black neighborhoods. Renewed attention was given to policing public spaces, such as housing, schools, trains, and streets. By the end of December 1984, the deputy chief of the patrol division had implemented periodic checks of Chicago Housing Authority buildings by uniformed personnel from public housing, gang crimes, and district tactical units. Increased attention brought increased arrests. By the mid-1980s, media, politicians, and ordinary people frequently linked a variety of distinct but interrelated phenomena. As Spurgle later noted, there was tendency to mix gangs, violence, and drug trafficking into one large ball of wax. Numerous Chicago gangs were selling drugs as early as the 1960s, according to gang scholar John Hagedorn. And for gangs such as El Rukens, the Latin Kings, and the Black Gangster Disciples, drug trafficking became increasingly common in the 1970s and early 1980s. For example, working from a remarkable set of ledgers for a Black Kings, probably Gangster Disciples set in the Robert Taylor homes during the early 1980s, Sudhir Venkatesh and Stephen Levitt found drug trafficking between 1982 and 1986 to be driven by independent entrepreneurs. Regional and city leaders only loosely governed their endeavors. As the cocaine trade grew, Many black males who could not secure blue-collar work found that selling drugs afforded them a form of masculine independence. By 1985, Congresswoman Cardis Collins asserted the widely held conclusion that the city had seen a resurgence of street gang activity. And much to my alarm, we see more street gangs getting into the drug scene, not necessarily from the point of usage, but from the distribution and marketing end. The specific dynamics at play were less important than the strong association between drugs and gangs that existed in the minds, not just of police and politicians, but also of residents in black neighborhoods. News editors reinforced the police strategy. Repetitive leads emphasized the same narrative over and over. Indictments were announced today against 25 reputed members of two street gangs accused of selling heroin and cocaine to undercover investigators. And Chicago police yesterday snapped the trap on 94 reputed street gang members from whom they allegedly bought drugs during the past year. While Chicago newspapers had run such leads in the past, they used them with much greater frequency after 1985. Though accurate, the leads were also misleading. They overstated the degree to which visible drug markets were highly organized and gang-controlled, creating greater fear and reinforcing the choice of a punitive policing strategy. They also misrepresented the work that police were doing on the street by overemphasizing the extent to which police were engaged in sophisticated identification, targeting, and dismantling of high-level drug operations. By the 1980s, most drug policing targeted small-time retail end sellers through buy-bust transactions rather than taking down large-scale trafficking organizations. Mayor Washington both touted and questioned police success in making arrests in retail drug markets. As he explained to New York Congressman Charles Rangel's Select Committee on Narcotics Abuse and Control, the selling of narcotics is a curb service operation. He recognized that arrests were a futile approach to addressing the presence of public sales. Police make arrests all year long at these curb service operations, he noted, yet they continue to exist and to flourish. Moreover, 
the mayor concluded that such activity was actually a distraction from meeting the needs of people in cities crying loudly for additional police protection, which is almost impossible to give them in light of the fact you need to use so many of them for drug prevention. While the mayor pleaded with the federal government for more money for prevention and rehabilitation, the CPD turned its attention toward making drug-related arrests in black neighborhoods where drug markets were concentrated. Not because of the residents' rates of drug use, because of the spatially concentrated poverty. Such arrests satisfied bureaucratic demands at police headquarters because they could be instrumentalized numerically, allowing the police department to tout its progress without actually having to show changes in conditions on the street, as in the claim that vice arrests for the quarter are up more than 10% due to increased emphasis on gang-related narcotics operations. Success in making more arrests itself justified further focus on policing drugs. As a result, police increasingly made drug arrests a central activity, as Figure 5.3 illustrates. In 1983, drug arrests were just 4% of all arrests. By 1985, 9%. By 1987, 13%. This ratio would continue to increase thereafter, reaching 23% in 1998. The unique nature of drug arrests in Chicago is highlighted by comparison with the rest of Illinois. Although there is scant evidence that people in the city used drugs at a higher rate than other Illinois residents, Chicagoans went from being 2.3 times more likely to be arrested for drug offenses in 1978 to 8.4 times more likely in 1990. The CPD's intensive focus on retail-level drug arrests resulted in dramatic changes in the demographics of drug arrestees. Between 1985 and 1987, police arrested black Chicagoans for drug-related crimes at a vastly higher rate, an increase of 40 percent. By contrast, police arrests of all other Chicagoans for drug-related crimes fell 11 percent. These changes were the beginning of a massive shift in the rate of drug arrests for black Chicagoans as compared with the rate of drug arrests for all other Chicagoans. As figure 5.4 shows, in 1985, the rate of drug-related arrests for black Chicagoans was 3.18 times the rate for all other city residents. Just two years later, this ratio had risen to 4.9. This ratio would increase until it stabilized around 7 to 1 in 1991. These growing disparities in arrest rates would be at the heart of the differential impact of mass incarceration and its attendant social consequences. The Toughest Gang in Town The arrival of crack cocaine in Chicago at the tail end of the 1980s exacerbated the punitive trends prevailing when Harold Washington died suddenly in November of 1987. The geography and structure of crack sales reinforced the conditions that led police to focus on drug arrests. Crack appeared in Chicago as early as 1986, an innovation in production, distribution, and marketing. Cooking crack was much safer than freebasing cocaine while delivering a similar high. Dealers could sell individual units, dramatically bringing down the cost and expanding the market. By reducing the amount for sale, crack also expanded turnover, leading to regular market activity. As street gangs like the Gangster Disciples entered the crack market, they had to significantly reconfigure their internal organization a feat that not all gangs could accomplish. Nonetheless, the popular understanding was, in social service provider Nancy Abate's words, that drugs are the lifeblood of gangs. Open drug sales and gang control became particularly pervasive throughout Chicago Housing Authority developments. In 1988, new police superintendent Leroy Martin launched the Street Narcotics Intervention Program. Martin, a straight-shooting, aggressive street cop, had been a surprise appointment. His term started off controversially. When you talk about gangs, he noted in his first public press conference, I've got the toughest gang in town, the Chicago Police Department. He lacked Fred Rice's administrative experience, but offered a more vigorous and demanding approach to street policing. His credo for fighting drug traffic was simple. 
I've got to make arrest after arrest after arrest until I break the backs of the street peddlers. Whereas CPD leaders had promised for years that they were targeting major dealers, Martin cut the bullshit. He admitted that his focus was on small-time dealers in various Chicago communities where drug dealing is particularly rampant. During Martin's first two years as superintendent, the CPD increased controlled substance arrests from 10,469 to 25,081, growth that outstripped any other period in its history. By the early 1990s, narcotics had become such a standard part of policing that even when one supervising gang crimes officer put pressure on his officers not to make drug arrests, he found the tactical officers just can't avoid it. Throughout the city, from 1997 to 1994, black street gang members were arrested more frequently for drug offenses than for all other offenses combined. As the police and the state's attorney converged around a punitive consensus in the mid-1980s, they created more pressure on other institutions. When Daly entered the state's attorney's office in 1980, approximately 10% of drug cases led to convictions. By 1985, 30% of the nearly 7,000 drug cases he filed resulted in convictions. Despite the increase, the Tribune's editorial board decried this as proof that the courts were too easy on drug dealers. It demanded not fewer arrests, but for the courts to develop ways to handle its huge volume of drug cases. The logjam in the court docket remained unresolved until the presiding judge, Thomas R. Fitzgerald, reorganized the criminal division of the Cook County Courts around a two-shift system with five dedicated nighttime narcotics courts added in October of 1989 and further expansion in 1991. While the courts did not process cases more efficiently, the increase in capacity meant that a much larger volume could be processed. Similarly, the punitive consensus put tremendous stress on the county jail, which was grossly overcrowded, so much so that the federal courts forced the sheriff to release prisoners on their own reconnaissance in order to meet population limits. The opening of a new 500-bed division in 1985 only temporarily relieved the situation. By 1988, the average stay tripled to 140 days. Reporters noted widespread agreement among legal professionals about the causes. An increased number of arrests, particularly in drug cases, more felony charges, resulting in a backlog in the courts, and tougher mandatory sentences that make suspects more reluctant to plead guilty. The response was not to re-examine these punitive policies, but to build more thousands of new beds in the early 1990s, culminating in the state-of-the-art 1600-bed Division 11 in 1995. This interlocking coordination between police, prosecutors, courts, and jails produced the devastating and disproportionate mass incarceration of black Chicagoans for drug crimes. In 1983, Illinois prisons held 534 people for drug-related offenses, 3% of the total prison population. By 2000, 11,468, or 26%. These statistics understate the punitive impact of the war on drugs because of the higher churn rate of prisoners sentenced in drug-related cases. For example, while people sentenced for drug offenses made up about 25% of prisoners by 1998, they were more than 40% of the 25,000-plus new prison admissions. Black people made up around 80% of people admitted to prison for drug crimes in Illinois during the 1990s despite being less than 15% of the population. As much as militarized policing or dragnet arrests, this interlocking punitive orientation among institutions that produced racially disproportionate mass incarceration was the essence of how the war on drugs became a mode of governance as it emerged in Chicago in the 1980s. This was true despite its failure to control gangs, drugs, or violence. Punitive action came to seem so indispensable to governing the city that regardless of whether it succeeded, politicians, police, prosecutors, and many ordinary Chicagoans continued to call for more punishment. This included black public housing residents, 
a majority of whom continued to support the Chicago Housing Authority's drug elimination program of comprehensive door-to-door -door anti drug inspections, regardless of whether they felt safer after the CPD had previously completed sweeps of their complex. More broadly, the thousands of arrests and prison terms did little to address the problems of gang-affiliated individuals dealing drugs in public spaces. By the end of the 1990s, after more than 15 years of intense street and anti-drug enforcement, police continued to estimate there were 300 open-air drug markets, 60 to 70 percent of which involved street gangs. Most devastatingly, the crackdown on gangs and drugs did little to prevent the problem that had motivated it in the first place, the city's serious levels of lethal violence. Gang-motivated homicide, drug-related homicide, and the killing of youth, ages 15 to 19, and young adults, ages 20 to 24, skyrocketed beginning in 1988. Rather than addressing the problem of violence, the intensive policing of drugs provided incentives for greater vertical organization and stronger coordination, for spreading risk from more high-level managers to inexperienced youth, and for the use of increasingly high-caliber guns as a means to manage rivalries over money and turf. Chicago's police and other local law enforcement institutions managed the inequality that emerged through the 1970s by excluding black Chicagoans from the most basic of rights of liberty and safety under the guise of affording them protection. Conclusion while a more complete history would incorporate federal and state institutions into the story of the expansion and coordination of punitive capacity, this article's granular focus on local institutions and their relationships helps to reframe the conditions under which the full-blown war on drugs emerged, with its racial disproportionality and its heavy reliance on prison. Mass incarceration was a product of the development and coordination of a range of punitive capacities by institutions at every jurisdictional level, including the local. Some of the changes in police behavior documented by other scholars, including militarization and the development of new techniques of dragnet policing, were essential to this process. But policing in the 1960s and 1970s in Chicago demonstrated that arrests alone did not produce high levels of felony incarceration in state prisons. Rather, harsh and racialized punishment occurred only when prosecutors, courts, and jails were able to hold, prosecute, and process large numbers of felony arrests. Because local government institutions in Chicago, as elsewhere, are loosely articulated, often coming under entirely separate municipal governments, efforts of drug warriors like Richard M. Daly to harmonize their activities were contested, cumbersome, and halting. Only by the end of the 1980s did they begin to incarcerate black Chicagoans on a wide scale. This process and its timing should give scholars some pause in considering the emerging consensus that seeks to push the history of mass incarceration back in time, linking its emergence to great society liberalism. Inasmuch as the war on drugs remains an important part of our understanding of mass incarceration, liberals' embrace of repression must be shown at work on the ground. In Chicago, such a case is difficult to make, as those most identified with civil rights liberalism in the local Democratic Party, such as Harold Washington, were among the staunchest opponents of punitive ideology. While historical continuities exist with the liberalism of the 1960s, the punitive and racialized war on drugs of the 1980s occurred on highly distinctive historical terrain. The history recounted here shows the limited capabilities of the local state's law enforcement institutions during the 1960s and 1970s. Only during the 1980s, as the simultaneous crises of economic exclusion, increasingly limited federal social provision, and local white intransigence intersected with the rise of gang violence and public drug markets, did the conditions that supported the war on drugs come together. In short, the vicious urban inequality of the 1980s, more than the liberalism of the 1960s, shaped the development of the war on drugs and its role in mass incarceration. 6. Cannabis Culture Wars 
Emily Dufton. Over the course of two decades, in the 1970s and 1980s, a new outgrowth of the cannabis culture wars was waged in the United States. These were battles over the role and accessibility of marijuana in America, fought not by state actors but by common citizens, concerned parents, magazine writers, and lawyers who used elements of public discourse like publications, conferences, and lobbying groups to convince lawmakers and voters of the safety or danger of cannabis use. Focusing explicitly on the threat increased access to cannabis posed to adolescents, the cannabis culture wars of late 20th century brought debates over marijuana safety and hazards back to the public stage for the first time since the reefer madness era of the 1930s. As the two sides wavered between earnest activism and mockery, the movement toward legalization we see today was paved by these important discussions which ultimately framed legalization as a protective measure for the public health and safety of some of the country's most innocent and dispossessed populations. In the United States in the 1970s and 1980s, a cannabis culture war erupted between two ideologically opposed groups, pro-cannabis advocates who wanted to increase access to marijuana and anti-drug parent activists who wanted to ensure that their children would grow up drug-free. Given the nature of their battles, which more often took place on the pages of magazines than in the halls of Congress, the cannabis culture wars of the late 20th century were unique in terms of America's larger war on drugs. Drug war scholars often rightly focus on the powerful roles that law enforcement and political officials play in drug users' lives. Politicians, police officers, customs and border patrol agents, judges, and lawyers determine the social structures that directly affect drug users, and their decisions can either deprive users of their freedom or, conversely, allow their use to be legalized. The cannabis culture wars that began in the 1970s were radically different, however. They weren't fought between lawmakers and lawbreakers. Instead, they were waged by citizen activists across the country who had no capacity to arrest, incarcerate, or punish each other. Their skirmishes weren't waged on city streets or in prisons or courtrooms. Instead, they were waged on the battlefields activists had available to them in the media, in social organizing, and in lobbying. Most importantly, the cultural battles over cannabis weren't fought exclusively over laws and policies that the belligerents could actively control. Instead, they were fought over how drug use, and specifically marijuana use, was understood and the role its users played in the public imagination. By seeking to control the public discourse surrounding marijuana, each group hoped it could ultimately influence either increased or decreased legal access to the drug. Controlling cannabis culture could control the cannabis war. To accomplish these aims, activists argued for two decades over how drug users appeared in the media, how the drug culture surrounding cannabis was marketed, and who had the right to partake in or be protected from marijuana use. These battles, waged as marijuana became one of the most prominent drugs in American life, mirrored the larger culture wars of the era that pitted liberal activists against conservative, pro-family organizations. But this war focused solely on one topic, the meaning of cannabis and the culture it created in an America that was renegotiating the impact of drug use nationwide. Like the culture wars that were waged over marijuana decades earlier during the reefer madness era of the 1930s, the battles of the 1970s and 1980s focused on the dangers the drug posed to children. But what made the cannabis culture wars of the late 20th century different was that this argument, that drug laws needed to protect children's safety, would ultimately be co-opted by legalization advocates as one of the most powerful arguments for, not against, legalization. In an unprecedented turn of events, the main argument of anti-marijuana advocates for nearly a hundred years that children needed to be shielded from marijuana's effects was convincingly used in the 21st century not to continue to criminalize cannabis, but to inspire some of the most liberal changes in drug laws in American history. 
an outcome that continues to resonate today and which opponents of marijuana surely did not expect. Children have been at the heart of debates over marijuana since the drug was introduced to the U.S. In the late 1800s, cannabis was widely available as a medicine, purchased freely from any pharmacist or storekeeper without prescription, found mostly in tincture form in products like Eli Lilly's Dr. Brown's sedative tablets and the one-day cough cure. Cannabis was not as popular as opiate-containing medicines, including those specifically marketed to children, like Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup, but was nonetheless used to treat children's maladies. Some cannabis medicines even specifically appealed to children. Cannabis-based painkillers were coated with sugar to sweeten the taste and to prevent pills from sticking together. When recreational marijuana smoking arrived in the U.S. at the turn of the century, however, debates shifted from the benefits the drug could provide for children's health to the threat the drug posed to their safety. Harry Anslinger, director of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics from 1930 to 1962, was marijuana's most forceful opponent. He launched a culture war against the drug writing articles like 1937's Assassin of Youth that specifically detailed the dangers marijuana posed to children, which, in Anslinger's view, were twofold. First, a marijuana user could harm a child, like the West Virginia man Anslinger noted in his article who raped a nine-year-old girl. More dangerously, however, marijuana could also turn otherwise peaceful children into violent criminals. Anslinger famously detailed the grisly acts committed by cannabis users, including the stories of a Florida youth who murdered his family with an axe and an Ohio juvenile gang that committed 38 armed robberies. Anslinger's view of marijuana as a menace to children and parents everywhere was at the heart of his powerful culture war against pot throughout the three decades he led the FBN. This view would hold sway until the mid-1960s, when a new version of marijuana emerged. As marijuana use spread nationwide in the 1960s alongside the growing counterculture, fears about the drug's effects shifted. Sociologist Jerome Himmelstein detailed the transition marijuana underwent from a drug purported to cause dangerous violence in the 1930s to a substance that caused users to retreat from public life in the 1960s. The social characteristics of the counterculture, as perceived by the dominant society, were projected onto marijuana and then said to be the psychological effects inherent in the drug. Because the counterculture was characterized as passive and escapist, marijuana became seen as a producer of passivity and escape on the individual level. Now the danger of cannabis use was not that it turned children into axe murderers, as Anslinger had warned, but rather that it turned them into youthful rebels who dropped out of organized social life and sought to escape from reality. But increased cannabis use by middle-class youth also transformed the characterization of the user. By the late 1960s and early 1970s, marijuana users were no longer potential axe murderers, they were someone's children, and as arrest rates for marijuana possession rose, clocking in at about 400,000 a year throughout the 1970s, activists sought to challenge drug laws to reflect the drug's growing embourgeoisement. A wave of decriminalization laws were passed in a dozen states between 1973 and 1978 to reflect America's growing social comfort with cannabis use and these laws transformed both marijuana's cultural locus as well as the nation's drug economy. State-based decriminalization laws were first inspired by the final report from the National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse, issued in 1972, which, after two years spent researching the breadth and scope of marijuana use in the U.S., argued that the drug was less harmful than legal intoxicants like alcohol and tobacco and that its use and possession should be decriminalized nationwide. The report was delivered to President Richard Nixon but found no traction in the federal government, which continued to consider cannabis a Schedule I drug. 
In the years following the report's release, however, states from Alaska to Oregon to Minnesota to North Carolina decriminalized marijuana possession between 1973 and 1978, ultimately allowing a third of the country's population to live in areas where possession of up to an ounce of marijuana was punishable by no more than a civil fine. In response to the widespread passage of decriminalization laws, a vibrant new cannabis economy flourished, not only in terms of sales of the drug itself, which generated $4 billion annually, but also in terms of goods that assisted in the enjoyment of the marijuana lifestyle. In the summer of 1974, Tom Forsad, an entrepreneurial writer and dope smuggler, launched the first edition of High Times magazine, an ode to cannabis that mocked straight America's uptight views of the drug. The magazine featured articles about everything from drug trafficking to politics and pop culture, alongside, in a nod to Playboy, centerfolds of lush marijuana. For Farsad, the purpose of high times was twofold, to have fun at the expense of the rich and to subvert President Richard Nixon's so-called war on drugs. The magazine's first run of 25,000 copies sold out within a week, and subsequent printing sold out quickly as well. According to Michael Kennedy, who served as its lawyer for 42 years, the magazine's irreverence and open enjoyment of drug use tapped a vein in the American public. It was a political farce that quickly became a political force. Like all magazines, High Times subsidized its publication with ad sales. But the ads in High Times were as remarkable as the rest of the magazine's content. Pipes, bongs, scales, rolling papers, stash cans, toys, and games were all for sale in the pages of High Times, as well as at a growing number of convenience stores and head shops nationwide. Paraphernalia, legal goods used to consume and enjoy a still illegal substance, was quickly becoming very big business. By 1977, paraphernalia sales grossed $250 million, more than the annual revenue generated by the original Star Wars film released that year. High Times also became the mouthpiece for a new organization, Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, a lobbying firm founded by lawyer Keith Stroop in Washington, D.C. in 1970. The nation's first marijuana rights lobbying group, Normal took a consumer rights approach to challenging marijuana laws, arguing that responsible cannabis users were customers, not criminals, who deserved protection and not punishment for a drug they used in the privacy of their own homes. Almost immediately after it began a regular publication schedule, High Times became Normal's most visible supporter, running Keith Stroop's monthly column alongside fundraising ads, which were published at no charge to the organization. As outsiders to polite society, High Times and the lobbying organization were a team. Both were dedicated to increasing the acceptability and economic potential of decriminalized cannabis, and each promoted the other's work. As Keith Stroop put it in his 2013 memoir, it's fair to say that during the 1970s, most people who knew about normal had read about our work in high times. By the mid-1970s, in the wake of the National Commission's report, the passage of decriminalization laws and the growing popularity of pot-related media and paraphernalia, national attitudes toward cannabis had shifted markedly from the era of Harry Anslinger and Assassin of Youth. Marijuana was by far the most widely used illicit drug in America, and its use seemed both cool and relatively benign. Cannabis's association with youth movements, including the counterculture and anti-war activism of the late 1960s, gave the drug a young, hip feeling, while the parallel epidemic of heroin use and overdose deaths, which peaked in 1971, painted opioids rather than marijuana as the drug menace of the era. Cannabis was also celebrated widely. In music, movies like Cheech and Chong's 1978 comedy Up in Smoke, and magazines, including countless spin-offs of high times, the drug was represented as fun, funny, and most importantly, safe, 
especially for users who saw its use as a way to defy conventional social standards. Ozzy Osbourne of Black Sabbath summed up the feeling in 1971 in the song Sweet Leaf when he sang, Straight people don't know what you're about. They put you down and shut you out. You gave me a new belief, and soon the world will love you, Sweet Leaf. There was one unanticipated effect of the era's embrace of cannabis, however. With decriminalization and paraphernalia spreading nationwide, rates of adolescent marijuana use began to substantially increase. Decriminalization is different from legalization, in that legalization imposes a set of public health regulations on the market, such as age restrictions on sales that decriminalization does not. When a third of the country lived in states where possession of up to an ounce of marijuana was decriminalized, reports showed it had negative effects for kids. By 1976, 56% of the nation's high schoolers reported that they had tried marijuana, with 26% reporting they smoked weekly and 6% reporting they smoked every day. 80% of high schoolers and 60% of junior high schoolers reported that the drug was easy to get. And as more adolescents smoked pot, sales of paraphernalia to minors were rising. In 1978, the New York Times reported that, like babes in Toyland, three boys from 11 to 14 and a 13-year-old girl went on a buying spree recently in head shops around the metropolitan area. They came back with $300 worth of drug culture paraphernalia that included a baby bottle fitted with both a nipple and a hashish pipe and a felt-tipped pen that allows a surreptitious snort of cocaine in the classroom. Children's use of marijuana and their ease in accessing cannabis and drug paraphernalia, alongside increasing political comfort with decriminalization nationwide, prompted a new army of anti-marijuana activists, the Parent Movement, to form in the summer of 1976. Forty years after the era of reefer madness, these parents would be the strongest opponents to marijuana since Harry Anslinger, and their tactics would be similar to the leader of the FBN. In magazines, newsletters, and speeches, they would highlight the dangerous effects that marijuana specifically posed to children and argue that adolescent safety had to be at the center of the nation's drug laws. Though they lacked the political power of Anslinger, who headed a federal agency for over three decades, they nonetheless went on to influence state and federal laws over the next decade, a powerful outcome for a movement that started during a backyard birthday party. In the summer of 1976 in Atlanta, Georgia, America's growing problems with cannabis literally followed a mother named Marcia Keith Manet Shuhard home. In August of that year, after what seemed like a harmless party, Shuhard first realized that her 13-year-old daughter Ashley and her friends were smoking pot. That night, after the other children returned home, Shuhard described what she and her husband found scattered on the family lawn. Marijuana butts, small plastic bags with dope remnants, homemade roach clips, cans of malt liquor, and pop wine bottles. She and her husband were shocked. Shuhard had tried marijuana once in the past, but it was when she was in grad school and a legal adult. She was frightened by the children's behavior, and she felt she suddenly understood her daughter's recent transformation from a formerly model child, cheerful, thoughtful, and responsible, into someone either irritable and restless or lethargic and withdrawn. After discovering her daughter's drug use, Shuhard, a talented researcher with a Ph.D. in British literature from the University of Texas, Austin, looked at all the information available about marijuana's effects on kids. What she found terrified her. Federal reports warned that cannabis was particularly harmful to adolescent bodies. It could make young boys grow breasts and render young girls infertile permanently damaging chromosomes so that generations of Americans could be harmed by the drug. A report from the American Medical Association argued that the group most vulnerable to the hazardous effects of marijuana are children and adolescents, noting that marijuana is potentially damaging to health in a variety of ways, 
but it can be especially harmful when used by a person who is immature, unstable, or already ill. She also found that cannabis damaged children's developing personalities, noting reports that argued that heavy marijuana users exhibited amotivational syndrome, where the user becomes apathetic, lethargic, passive, and withdrawn. Smokers suffering from amotivational syndrome were less likely to focus on immediate priorities like schoolwork or sports, and they also neglected to develop the resilience necessary to move from adolescence into adulthood, which could have even more damaging long-term effects. Youngsters who do not experience and grow out of adolescence because of regular drug use, Shuhart later warned, stand a good chance of becoming chemically dependent adults. Given the physical and psychological dangers cannabis posed to kids, Shuhard was distressed by America's embrace of the drug. Shuhard wrote a guidebook, Parents, Peers, and Pot, released by the National Institute on Drug Abuse in 1979, which laid out the dangers of marijuana and how to form an anti-drug parent group. In the book, she decried the drug culture, whose rituals, accessories, and effects formed what she called an alien world, a highly organized subculture that revolved around marijuana and which seemed bent on tearing children away from their families before they were ready for the change. In many ways, Schuhard wrote, the most disturbing aspect of the young people's drug culture was its apparent distance and independence from home. The rituals of drug supply and use had gradually become a lifestyle, with its own behavioral patterns and ethical values. For the kids, it had all the attractiveness of a complicated game and all the lure of adventure. But this adventure wasn't only reinforced by kids and their friends. The more she paid attention to popular culture, the more Shuhart warned that pro-drug messages were everywhere. Reinforced by rock music, popular magazines, TV, and movies. Regardless of what kind of parents or what kind of personality the child had, when she or he turned on the radio, went to a movie, left the house, she or he came into contact with the drug culture. As one teenager told his mother, a kid has a drug problem the minute that kid walks out the front door because the drugs are all around. When Shuhart visited convenience shops and record stores and saw paraphernalia for sale that seemed expressly designed to appeal to kids, things like the Busby, a frisbee-shaped pipe, or books called A Children's Garden of Grass, she realized that the ubiquity of drugs and drug accessories was both precisely the problem and precisely the point. The American economy struggled in the 1970s, battered by recessions, oil embargoes, and stagflation. Paraphernalia sales were one of the few bright spots in an otherwise depressed market, and a sale was a sale, regardless of the age of the purchaser. This, Shuhart realized, was the heart of the problem. The primary values of the drug culture were ignoble, she wrote. First, sheer commercial greed. Second, lack of concern for the younger and more vulnerable end of the drug market. Third, the ideal of intoxication as the highest social and experiential goal. The drug culture's emphasis on selling a drug that could harm generations of kids by promoting intoxication as fun and cool, that required a response. So, she launched one from her house. Shuhart's first reaction to the drug culture was hyper-localized and community-focused. In Parents, Peers, and Pot, she recommended that parents form activist groups to work within their own families, neighborhoods, and with their school's parent-teacher associations to recognize and prevent the symptoms of drug use. First, she encouraged parents to focus on their own families talking with their children about marijuana and warning them of the physical and mental dangers of the drug. Then she suggested that parents organize across friend groups and neighborhoods to offer alternative drug-free activities, set uniform rules, and ban access to drug paraphernalia and magazines like High Times. Finally, she encouraged schools to develop drug prevention programs, not only for kids, but also for parents and teachers so that adults across the spectrum of children's lives could help kids avoid cannabis use. 
Despite her firm stance against adolescent drug use, however, Shuhard was not a hardliner against all drug use. She didn't preach prohibition forever. She repeatedly says through parents, peers, and pot that people should be capable of making their own decisions about drug use when they are adults, and warned parents against coming across as overly partisan, sectarian, or puritanical, noting that children respond better to adults who seem genuinely interested in their health and well-being. Shuhart understood why children smoked pot, but the allure of the drug culture was precisely the problem, and she genuinely wanted parents to help their kids. Shuhart also recognized that she was asking a lot of parents, and closed her book with a distinct note of caution. Parents, remember, it is better to occasionally feel like the local crank than to often feel helpless, especially when the welfare of your children is at stake. You can make a difference, and if you don't, who will? Despite her emphasis on community engagement. Shuhar didn't retain her hyper-local focus for long. In 1978, she met Thomas Buddy Gleaton, a physical education professor at Georgia State University, and the two bonded over their mutual interest in preventing adolescent drug use. Together, they formed Pride, the Parents Resource Institute for Drug Education, housed in Gleaton's office at Georgia State, in order to expand Shuhar's concept of parent groups nationwide. Pride's philosophy, as outlined in the group's first newsletter from June 1979, argued that a child's parents are his best bulwark against drug involvement, and that the universal instinct of parents to protect their young is society's best bulwark against the expansion of the commercialized drug culture. Pride focused on two things: educating parents about the dangers of adolescent drug use. And bringing parents together to fight the drug culture, by providing information about the drug's effects on children and instructions on how to become a parent activist via Pride newsletters, pamphlets, reports, and Shuhard's book, Pride hoped not only to thwart the drug culture's negative effects on kids, but to transform the relationships between families and communities nationwide. A child's drug use can tear a family apart, Shuhard wrote. But a sincere parental effort to give a child a drug-free adolescence can strengthen and enrich the whole family relationship. An extended communal effort by groups of parents can strengthen and enrich the whole community relationship. Bolstered by the popularity of parents, peers, and pot, Pride quickly became one of the most notable anti-marijuana groups in the U.S. Sympathetic media coverage nationwide, along with Shuhard's positive relationship with Dr. Robert Dupont, director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, resulted in Pride-style groups forming in all 50 states. By 1982, parent groups were being celebrated in the New York Times. In the war against teenage abuse of alcohol and marijuana, one more weapon has been added to the arsenal. The newspaper reported, "It's called parent networking." The objective of which is to bring the sprawling, diverse, economic, and ethnic suburban neighborhoods a sense of mutual community values. Dr. Keith Shuhard, described as a national proponent of parent networking, was cited repeatedly, telling parents that communities with activist groups were much healthier for teenagers because mutual enforcement among families relieved the pressure to use drugs. But Pride wasn't the only parent activist group forming in America at the time. It wasn't even the only one in Atlanta. In autumn of 1977, just a year after Shuhard discovered her daughter's marijuana use, her neighbor Sue Ruche had her own disturbing experience with cannabis when she went to a store to purchase a Star Wars record for her two young sons. She was shocked by the sudden influx of drug paraphernalia for sale in neighborhood stores and shopping centers. Toys, gadgets, and magazines promoting the use of illicit drugs as teaching tools, which broadcast messages in sharp contrast to the teachings of most families. By November, she had formed her own parent group called the Calb County Families in Action (FIA), which, as she wrote in her 1979 guidebook, "How to Form a Families in Actions Group in Your Community." Was dedicated to exposing an industry that glamorizes and promotes illicit drugs to children through collecting information on the industry, 
teaching other parents what she had learned, and finding ways to exert control over the industry's impact on youngsters. By alerting parents to this insidious field, and most importantly, opening lines of communication between parents and those who, in governing us, make daily decisions that affect children's lives, Ruche hoped that groups like FIA could undermine the flourishing paraphernalia industry, ultimately ending drug use by children and teenagers. Whereas Schuhart and Gleaton were educators, Ruche was an activist with a laser-like focus on changing laws. Ruche realized that one way to attack the cannabis culture was to hit it where it would hurt most, its money. Lacking the narrative formalities of parents, peers, and pot, Ruche's text was a workbook focused exclusively on teaching parents how to form lobbying groups that would effectively hound state lawmakers to pass legislation that would regulate the sale of drug paraphernalia to the point that the practice would no longer be economically feasible. In step-by-step -step guidelines, she taught readers what to discuss at meetings, how to form a board of directors, and offered sample language for an anti-paraphernalia bill. Ruche's aim was to see FIA-style groups thwart the drug lobby nationwide, but she had higher goals as well. For her part, parent activism was akin to the civil rights movement, which Ruche had prominently supported in Atlanta. Many people despair that society is already so saturated with the acceptance of marijuana that we shall not be able to avoid legalization, she wrote. We reject this argument. We must not lose sight of the fact that the widespread use of marijuana is a phenomenon of the past ten years. Many people in the U.S. took the same position about racial segregation, which was rooted in our culture for 400 years. But the civil rights movement taught us that no barrier, economic, legal, or social, can stand in the way of change once enough people decide that change must take place. As the number of America's children and teenagers who use psychoactive drugs increases, the question for parents of the 1980s is, are we ready to work for change? By 1979, Atlanta had given birth to two prominent parent activist groups, Pride and FIA. The groups had differing approaches. Pride sought to educate parents and help them become active in their own communities, whereas FIA sought to transform parents into effective political lobbyists. But both were concerned with the effects of cannabis on adolescents, and both believed that increased parental involvement could help reduce the negative impact of marijuana in children's lives. Both also saw themselves in stark opposition to the drug culture they saw encroaching on children's health and well-being. The biggest challenge in thwarting the drug culture, for Schuhart and Ruche, wasn't only in educating parents or lobbying state governments, it was overthrowing a profitable capitalist enterprise. As Schuhart wrote in Parents, Peers, and Pot, drug businessmen today do not point accusing fingers at Wall Street capitalism or American imperialism as their moral rationale for dealing. Instead, they invoke the profit motive, free enterprise, and service to consumers to justify their trade. When glossy magazines advocating multi-drug use and slickly packaged drug paraphernalia appear on the shelves of neighborhood supermarkets, Schuhart lamented, many adults feel helpless to fight recreation and free enterprise. But parents didn't have to feel helpless for long. By May 1980, when parent groups had spread nationwide, the movement was powerful enough to form its own Washington-based lobbying group, the National Federation of Parents for Drug-Free Youth, NFP, which organized national protests and sent activists to Capitol Hill to testify in congressional hearings about the dangers pot posed to kids. In November, the movement got an enormous boost when Ronald Reagan was elected president. Reagan appreciated the group's volunteer identity and their willingness to take on drug prevention without needing federal financial support. When his wife Nancy, guided by parent activists with the NFP, took on the prevention of adolescent drug abuse as her platform as First Lady, the parent movement found an even more prominent patron as Reagan brought parent activism onto the international stage. In the late 1970s, when Schuhart and Ruscha were writing their guidebooks, they felt that the drug culture had the upper hand, 
and that mass activism was necessary to stop the wave of decriminalization and save the nation's kids. But the tables were already beginning to turn, and by 1980, when Reagan was elected and parent activists ascended to the national stage, the pro-cannabis lobby had been back on its heels for years. The late 1970s were an extremely difficult time for high times and normal, and the parent movement's successes were compounded by the pro-drug community's political and internal struggles. In 1978, Nebraska became the last state to decriminalize marijuana possession, and Normal lost its support in Washington. President Jimmy Carter, elected during decriminalization's heyday in 1976, had been urged by his chief drug advisor Peter Bourne to quietly support states in changing their marijuana laws. But in July 1978, Bourne was forced to resign when allegations of his cocaine use at a normal Christmas party the year prior were leaked to the press by Keith Stroop, who was angry at Bourne for allowing Mexico to use American equipment to spray Paraquat, a powerful herbicide on Mexican marijuana fields. In the aftermath of the scandal, Stroop, who once believed that decriminalization and perhaps even legalization would prevail nationwide by 1980, was ousted from the organization he founded, leaving Normal to spin through a rotating door of executive directors throughout the remainder of the 1970s and the 1980s. Then, in November 1978, High Times founder Tom Forsad committed suicide at age 33. He bequeathed trusts to benefit High Times and Normal, but by 1980, both groups were floundering economically, socially, and philosophically. Pro-cannabis activists grew angry that parent activism had damaged their finances. In July 1980, Michael Antonoff, editor of Accessories Digest magazine, formerly known as Paraphernalia Digest, wrote in an editorial in High Times that summarized the paraphernalia industry's feelings about parent activism, titled, Those Mothers Are Trampling Adult Rights. The parent movement's shift to targeting legal paraphernalia rather than illegal drugs was destroying an otherwise robust industry, Antonov complained, and the effect was the equivalent of creating a thought police. While penalties for pot possession have mainly been decriminalized, a whole new form of proscription is erupting around its accoutrements, Antonov wrote. The law is so lopsided that in places like Brookings, Oregon, if a person is carrying up to an ounce of marijuana and a packet of zigzags, rolling papers, he can be fined for the pot but jailed for the paper. Targeting paraphernalia for its potential use in illegal activity was frightening, Antonov concluded, because the problem with laws directed against intentions is that what is really being legislated against are thoughts. Drug laws, as always, are a potent political weapon. For Antonov, the parent movement's attack on paraphernalia was nothing short of a new kind of McCarthyism, where the word cocaine has been substituted for communism, and where the most basic of American institutions, free speech, has been swept away. The source of Antonov's problems were parent activists who were as motivated in 1980 as pro-decriminalization activists had been in the 1970s. It was Mothers for a Straight America who carry signs and harass politicians, circulate petitions, and commandeer the attention of the media, he warned, who were rolling back the rights pro-cannabis activists had fought for over the past decade. Antonov also associated parent activists, if incorrectly in the case of lifelong Democrats Shuhard and Ruscha, with resurging republicanism. The new right has in the last two years successfully shifted the public spotlight away from decriminalization to the plea of save our children, he wrote. No one wants children smoking pot, but to scapegoat by stigmatizing legitimate business makes as much sense as banning swizzle sticks to prevent alcoholism. Still, cannabis consumers' general lack of reaction to the parent movement's increasing power caused Antonov to worry. The vast majority of smokers don't seem to care that a right they have taken for granted is being taken away, he complained, and then closed his article with a dire warning. If the generation to whom pot was the symbol of causes shared does not wake up, 
it may soon discover that 1984 has arrived four years early. Antonov's editorial laid the foundations for the culture war that was to play out in the pages of High Times over the next few years. While parent activists painted cannabis activists as unscrupulous businessmen bent on selling drugs to kids regardless of the social cost, writers at High Times viewed parent activists as hysterical fanatics out to destroy a legitimate industry, as well as minions of the new right ushering in a new era of government control. The magazine also wasn't above name-calling. In October 1980, High Times published an article condemning Sue Ruscha, the Dragon Lady of DeKalb County Families in Action, and her role in the formation of the NFP. Anti-pot hysteria has gone nationwide with the formation of the National Federation of Parents for Drug-Free Youth, the anonymous article warned. Claiming to represent over 370 groups in 48 states, the NFP was a major accomplishment for DeKalb families, the pioneer hate group in the field. Literature from FIA made pot out to be somewhat more poisonous than strontium-90, a radioactive metal that causes cancer, and the article lamented how the NFP was bringing this view to the national level, with apparent federal support. The NFP was warmly supported by the Federal Drug Enforcement Administration, and the press conference announcing the group's formation was attended by a gaggle of U.S. senators, congressmen, and their wives, and White House drug advisor Lee Dogoloff. Dogoloff replaced Peter Bourne after Bourne's resignation in 1978. The group's war against heads and head shops, the article warned, was evidence of the anti-pot panic gripping the nation. The article, while hyperbolic, wasn't entirely wrong. Parent activists were effective lobbyists, urging states to overturn decriminalization laws and penalize the sale of paraphernalia to kids. They urged the election of local representatives who would enforce their claims, and soon, bills supporting the drug war and regulating paraphernalia were being considered before Congress. By the spring of 1981, High Times reported that the Senate was considering the Drug Paraphernalia Prohibitions Act, a bill that would have made possession with intent to distribute paraphernalia a misdemeanor and would have made delivery of paraphernalia to a minor a special offense, thus bringing FIA's chief concern to Capitol Hill. The act was referred to the Subcommittee on Security and Terrorism, where it languished. In the House of Representatives, Billy Lee Evans, a strong anti-drug advocate and parent movement-favored politician from Georgia, introduced a bill to repeal the 1978 prohibition against American funding of the spraying of Paraquat on foreign marijuana fields, overturning the very act Keith Stroop had spent his political capital to pass. Most worrisome, H.R. 3519, the Department of Defense Authorization Act, was being considered by the House Armed Services Committee which High Times warned could allow for the limited use of military equipment, including radar planes, reconnaissance aircraft, and helicopters, by federal, state, and local law enforcement officials in their battle against drug trafficking, if they were so assigned by the Defense Department. This is a license for a real war on drugs, High Times warned, one that was clearly designed to target growers and dealers. By the early 1980s, with the Reagans in the White House, anti-drug bills being considered in Congress, and decriminalization laws being repealed nationwide, it was clear that Washington was turning against drug use, and that groups like High Times and Normal no longer possessed the political influence they had wielded in the past. Rather than work to reinvigorate their base, however, High Times, counterproductively, responded with mockery. Throughout 1982, in a section called Seeds and Stems, High Times satirized everything from conservative politics to parent activism to the federal response to drug use. In a February article titled New Right Goes Pro-Dope, High Times mocked the idea that only the counterculture was interested in profiting off of drugs, citing Richard W. Vigorish, controller and guiding genius of the conservative political action conspiracy, a stand-in for Richard Vigory, the pioneer of political direct mail promotion and the conservative political action conference, High Times wrote that Vigorish has called for the complete opening of the narcotics industry to independent American businessmen. 
Laws against drugs do absolutely nothing except concentrate the drug trade into the hands of a few select syndicates, generally composed of tightly knit hereditary clans with non-American names ending in vowels, Figurish observed. This constitutes an outrageous state-sponsored monopoly of an industry that would otherwise distribute scores of billions of dollars among independent American entrepreneurs. In June 1982, High Times took direct aim at parent activists, publishing a satirical newsletter, "Stop Dopes at Their Source," from Zoo Rooch, executrix of the defunct county Parents Up in Arms. Combating drug abuse type and non-Christian influences from outside the community all across the nation. Rooch's article warned parents of the newest threat to their children: URA, unsupervised respiratory activity, also known as oxygen abuse, the intentional taking in of too much air into the body system by breathing in a too deep, too rapid way. The children are taught by older children or by people from outside the community how to breathe in special ways that give them an oxygen overdose. The article warned, "These outside the community people do not care if a child blows his lungs up by too much URA or falls victim to any of the other science documented hazards. It is up to parents themselves, as defunct county parents up in arms have always insisted, to both supervise their precious children's breath by breath behavior and to vigorously take action against disagreeable, strange, or upsetting people from outside the community. Finally, in November 1982, High Times published a three-page satirical version of the American Journal of Drug, Substance, and Alcohol Prevention, Recovery, and Aftercare, warning, alongside a picture of an infant, that drugs in nursery rears ugly head. In it, Dr. Robert Alcoa, a satirical version of Dr. Robert Dupont, who had retired from his position as head of the National Institute on Drug Abuse by that time. Responded to recent proof that substance use abuse type behavior appears among preschool kids, many as young as three or four years old. We're talking about babies and drugs here. Alcoa, currently head of the U.S. Council on Marijuana etc. (CMEC), told the American Journal, "Babies and drugs. Let no one miss the message. It's babies and drugs. Let's hear it one more time. Babies and drugs. Horrendous." At the bottom of the page, a box informed readers that the American Journal is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Drug Abuse Industrial Complex (DAIC). Throughout 1982, as Congress considered more anti-drug legislation and President Reagan ramped up his militarized drug war, High Times was focused primarily on mocking the parent movement and anti-marijuana attitudes among government officials. There wasn't much else for the magazine to do, and Normal, cycling through three executive directors—Larry Schott, James N. Hall, and George L. Farnham—between 1980 and 1983, was too disorganized to effectively lead cannabis activists' response. But in the spring and summer of 1983, High Times suddenly began presenting a very different view. In a change brought about by its aging readership, who needed the magazine to respond to their needs as parents when it came to addressing drug use and their kids, in a move that turned parent activists' message on its head, suddenly it was pot smoking parents who needed advice on kids and drug use, and they looked to High Times rather than Pride or FIA for advice. In a series of letters to the editor published in the spring and summer of 1983. Parents discussed marijuana use, their own and by their children, and the magazine published them in an ongoing conversation about the role adolescent drug use played in families where parents were cannabis consumers and High Times readers. An anonymous reader from New Haven, Connecticut, opened the conversation in a letter published in April. My husband and I have been avid readers of your magazine for the past five years, and we count on High Times for giving us the truth about a variety of subjects. It began. I have, however, yet to see an article directed to the many parents who read High Times and are confused as what to tell their children about drug use. I'm not into having hip kids, but they see us smoking all the time, and I really don't know how to handle the situation. 
I don't want my kids to smoke till they're old enough to handle it intelligently, but I'd rather see them smoke weed for the buzz of their choice than anything else. At the same time, I don't want them to think that all drugs are okay because mom and dad smoke pot. I'm sure that there are other parents in this same position, and we all would appreciate greatly an article that concerns itself with this problem. A far cry from their mocking attitude toward parental concerns a year earlier, the editors responded with a sense of humility and openness. Your point is well taken, and we are a little chagrined at not having addressed it on our own. We will try our best to get such a piece in the magazine as soon as possible. In the meantime, we'd like to encourage our readers who are parents to write and tell us how they're handling this situation. A number of people did. In July and August, High Times published responses from several readers, some using their own names, others choosing to remain anonymous, which ran the gamut from parents who were concerned about children's drug use and wanted their kids to stay sober to those who wanted to share cannabis with them, preferring to ensure that their child's drug use stayed safely within the family. A reader whose name and address were withheld responded that, It was comforting to read that High Times does not take lightly the serious issue concerning parental drug use and the worries of inevitable conflicts resultant in the children. I am a mother of two school-aged kids. I can attest personally to the enormous difficulties that do exist in trying to merge credibly those divergent views, approval of personal drug use by the parents at home versus the school legal media hype that proclaims the evil inherent in all drugs. Like Schuhard and Ruche before her, the writer then offered advice that regarded parental actions and responsibility as paramount to deflecting conflicts before they arose. You must try to maintain respect for your child's innate intelligence, maturity, and sound instincts for self-preservation, she wrote. When your child perceives you as a parent who has integrity, who behaves in a manner appropriate to the situation, who may indulge in drugs moderately and in control, and who is there when needed, then you can afford the luxury of feeling confident that your child is well-armed to face whatever drug-related question and or problem he or she may encounter. An anonymous father took a different tack. He wrote that he never tried to hide his smoking from his ten-year-old son. His child, he believed, views it in very much the same way I viewed my parents' cigarette smoking, as something quotidian and banal. Still, he continued, Parents have a responsibility to help their kids lead lives that don't require getting high. I feel a kid's life is supposed to be relatively easy and enjoyably straight, he wrote, and if you instill in your child a basic self-esteem and security, they won't need anything to put in their bodies to make their life more pleasant the way we adults do. Just don't give your kids a reason to want to get high, and it'll be okay. In a final letter published on the topic, an anonymous mother of two who had tried every drug available wrote that although she was fine with her 13-year-old son's periodic marijuana use, she was firmly opposed to adolescent use of other substances like mushrooms or cocaine, and she disapproved of kids constantly being high. Echoing Schuhard's concerns about amotivational syndrome, she wrote that as a teacher, she saw what can happen to children who take drugs all the time or use them to ease an intolerable life. They lose their interest in everything else. Nonetheless, she continued, she valued the honest relationship she had with her children about drugs. So far, she wrote, my kids trust me and believe that the information I give them is the truth. This relationship goes both ways, and they tell me when they think one of their friends is in deep water, and I try to talk to that kid. She also looked forward to sharing more drug experiences with her children when they are full grown, she continued, and I will make sure that they use the best and under ceremonial conditions. These letters published over the spring and summer of 1983 were evidence that the counterculture of the 1960s had aged and that the pro-decriminalization activists of the previous decades were parents now with their own concerns about adolescent drug use. Now, rather than viewing parent activists as enemies, High Times readers shared many of their concerns, which they voiced not at NFP rallies or in parent groups, 
but in the very magazine Shuhard and Ruche considered the voice of the drug culture. This was an enormous shift for a magazine that just a few years prior had mocked the concept of preventing adolescent drug use, and it marked the beginning of a period of detente in the cannabis culture wars, when pro-cannabis and anti-drug activists found a sense of camaraderie in their shared responsibilities as parents. Three years later, the cannabis movement's alignment with the parent movement's key priority, the protection of children from drug abuse, was being voiced by normal as well. In the spring of 1986, John Getman, a 29-year-old academic who specialized in drug policy, took normal's reins as executive director and ushered in a period of economic and philosophical stability for the organization refocusing normal on educational initiatives while promoting the full legalization rather than decriminalization of cannabis at the state and federal level. The mid-1980s were a period of surprising resurgence for normal. Despite the Reagan administration's increasingly punitive and militarized war on drugs, the country's new focus on the dangers of crack cocaine allowed cannabis activists to quietly reorganize. Kevin Zeiss, who served as Normal's executive director from 1983 to 1986 and began to stabilize the organization, told the Associated Press, Thank goodness for Ronald Reagan. He's making no dent in the marijuana business, but he's scaring people, and some are turning to us. Reagan has improved our ability to activate marijuana users. That wouldn't have happened if we'd had Carter for four more years. Zeiss focused on stabilizing Normal economically and maturing the group's lobbying tactics, and when he left to found the Drug Policy Foundation at American University in 1986, Normal's board of directors chose Getman to succeed him. Getman was the perfect candidate to continue Normal's evolution from a group known for its wild Christmas parties into a mature organization dedicated to the legalization of cannabis for health and economic reasons. Under Getman's leadership, Normal refocused itself, transitioning from a 501c4 lobbying group into a 501c3 educational institution. We realized we had to educate the public about the issue if we wanted anything to change, he recalled. Mobilizing people was much more effective than lobbying Congress. Getman's term as executive director served as an olive branch to concerned parents. Because he took his aging base's concerns seriously, Getman appealed to marijuana-smoking parents who had recently written to High Times, and, as a repentant former salesman who had spent eight years in the paraphernalia business, he was also helpful in bridging the divide between the legalization movement and potential parent activists, non-smoking parents of adolescents who were concerned about children's drug use. In 1987, a year into his tenure, Getman admitted in a High Times editorial something parent activists never expected to hear. He knew the paraphernalia market was free market capitalism at its best, and the looseness of the industry's practices had caused people, including children, harm. The problem with the freewheeling paraphernalia market was that we were pandering to an illegal interest in the marketing of our goods, he wrote. Much like sex is used to sell cars, we were, in retrospect, using drugs to sell knickknacks. This retrospect then prompted something unseen in any previous issue of the magazine, recognition that our exploitation of drugs was offensive to some, especially parents trying to keep their kids away from any drug use, illegal or otherwise. In order to secure Normal's recognition as a 501c4 organization, Getman also had to produce more educational materials. So, in 1986 and 87, he published the Common Sense series, with titles like Marijuana and Justice, Marijuana and the Economy, and Urine Testing for Marijuana and Other Drugs. These pamphlets focused on the dangers of prohibiting cannabis, framing them as a tax on liberty at their core. Most notably, he published a pamphlet titled Drugs and Children, which parroted the parent movement's major tenet by proclaiming that Normal is strongly committed to the concept that growing up should be drug-free. 
Normal believes that meaningful communication within the family based on honest information on the health and social consequences related to all drugs is the best way to prevent drug abuse. But he also turned parent activists' argument on its head. Prohibition wasn't the solution to prevent kids from using drugs, he wrote, because law enforcement efforts have failed to keep marijuana and other drugs away from America's adolescents. Instead, prohibition has only created a widely available, unregulated, forbidden fruit. If marijuana were legalized, Getman argued, it could eliminate the black market, reduce crime, and most importantly reduce adolescents' access to drugs. A marijuana tax could raise up to $15 billion annually, which could be used for credible education and discouragement programs. Programs that, like parent activists promoted a decade prior, would offer children alternatives to drug use. To prevent marijuana abuse, Getman concluded, we shouldn't keep the drug illegal. Instead, we should legalize cannabis and use the proceeds from taxation to devote more resources to recreation programs to interest children in life and to help parents, schools, and communities provide a better environment for our children, precisely what Schuhart had advocated a decade earlier. Getman's argument was powerful and poignant. By basically agreeing with the parent movement's core argument that children shouldn't use drugs, he ended the war between parent activists and normal. But he also made a key distinction by arguing that it was prohibition and not the simple existence of the drug itself that allowed children to access cannabis in the first place. And if parents really wanted to protect their children from the drug culture, the country should bring marijuana above ground. Similar to the alcohol and tobacco industries, Getman argued, legal weed would decrease adolescent access by implementing oversights like age restrictions and would tame the capitalist beast behind paraphernalia sales, reducing the market for products that blatantly appealed to kids. By choosing to work with rather than against the parent movement, Getman helped transform Normal into an organization that worked to achieve both groups' aims, a system that encouraged a drug-free childhood while also increasing legal access to cannabis for adults. Getman's adaptation and reversal of the parrot movement's primary argument brought the cannabis culture wars to a standstill. With Getman's concession, there was no way for parrot activists to argue against him. He agreed that it was necessary for children to be prevented from accessing pot, though he disagreed on how to achieve those ends. More importantly, by the end of the 1980s, agreeing with normal wasn't the parrot movement's only problem. The parents' own arguments were losing steam as the media's demonization of crack cocaine swept parental fears about cannabis from the headlines, and as marijuana re-emerged as a useful medicine for those struggling with diseases like cancer, glaucoma, and the effect of HIV slash AIDS. As fears about POTS effects on kids were replaced by cannabis's utility as a medicine, and as advocates like Getman argued that legalization was the most effective way to prevent adolescent marijuana use, parent activism faded as a national concern. Families no longer had to prevent children from using a drug that systems of medicalization and legalization could just as readily keep out of their hands. In 1996, California passed the country's first medical marijuana initiative, setting off almost 30 years of increasingly liberalized cannabis laws. As of November 2020, medical marijuana is now legal in 35 states, Guam, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the District of Columbia, and 15 states and Washington, D.C. have fully legalized recreational use. This marks a century of significant shifts in the country's cannabis culture wars. From Anslinger's concerns in the 1930s that marijuana would either turn users against children or make adolescents perpetuate violent crimes, to growing social acceptance in the 1960s and 1970s that resulted in the parent movement's forceful backlash against decriminalization, to a second period of growing acceptance from the mid-1990s to outright legalization today, Debates over cannabis in the public discourse have repeatedly changed minds and changed laws. 
but the concept of childhood in relation to drug use, the idea that children need to be kept safe from the drug's harmful effects and shielded from any negative outcomes of its wider availability, has remained at the core of all arguments for and against changing drug laws. As marijuana has shifted from a cultural menace to a useful medicine, and now, as a recreational intoxicant, a means by which states can significantly increase tax revenue, the protection of childhood safety and sobriety has consistently stayed at the center of these debates. What differentiates the cannabis culture wars of the 1970s and 1980s from the reefer madness era of the 1930s, however, is the lasting power of the argument that legalization protects children far better than prohibition does. In Washington state, which with Oregon was one of the first states to legalize recreational marijuana use in 2012, an editorial in the Seattle Times encouraged voters to approve ballot measure I-502 using language similar to normals 20 years prior, while mocking the concerns of people like Anslinger. The question for voters is not whether marijuana is good, it is whether prohibition is good. If marijuana killed people, or if smoking it made people commit violence and mayhem, prohibition might be worth all its bad effects. But marijuana does not kill people. There is no lethal dose. Parents may ask whether I-502 will make marijuana more available to their teenage children, the editorial continued. The answer is to compare marijuana with beer. For teenagers, both are illegal and available. But which is more easily available? the one that is banned or the one that is regulated. For more than 40 years, the one more easily available to teenagers has been the one that is banned. A far cry from Harry Anslinger's warnings that marijuana would transform children into violent maniacs or Schuhart's fears that decriminalization would result in generations of children harmed. In the 30 years since the most recent skirmish in the cannabis culture wars came to a close, Legalization is now presented as the safer alternative to ensure the public health of America's most innocent citizens. The drug's popularity is also increasing. Two-thirds, 67% of Americans now support some form of marijuana legalization, many because they believe it will have beneficial health and social justice-related effects. This result would not have been possible without decades of debate over cannabis's role in America especially in terms of the drug's safety and marketability. The core argument of the cannabis culture wars that both parties finally agreed on, that legal cannabis cannot be made available to children, nor can the market pander to them in any way, has consistently resulted in public health and safety concerns being put at the center of the legalization debate, with controls over who can access the drug and why and has now resulted in outright recreational legalization for millions of Americans over the age of 21. While it surely wasn't what Harry Anslinger argued in 1937 or Keith Schuhart envisioned in 1976, it is legalization, not prohibition, that has engendered these fiercely sought-after effects, bringing a surprising and potentially permanent detente to over a century of cannabis culture wars. 7. Psychedelic Wars, LSD as Mental Medicine in a Battle for Hearts and Minds. Lucas Rickert, Erica Dick, and Alexis Turner. Psychedelic drugs, particularly LSD, D-lysergic acid dithalidomide, have an awkward place in the war on drugs. Through a focus on distinct psychedelic wars in the historical literature, in the clinic, with one's self, and on the home front, this chapter showcases how substances were concurrently depicted as legitimate and illegitimate, as medicines or dangerous drugs. It will also illustrate how the historical actors involved, whether doctors, patients, policymakers, or users, fought their personal psychedelic wars in the field of mental medicine and beyond. Finally, in reflecting on psychedelics as part of the war on drugs, this chapter addresses underexplored elements related to diversity and equity, criminalization, commercialization, and the messy relationship among those factors. In 1965, 
David Solomon tried to shape a wider public understanding of psychedelics and drugs in the United States. Straddling laboratory and literary realms and based in New York City, Solomon was well positioned to interact with countercultural figures at Timothy Leary's Castalia Retreat in Millbrook, New York, as well as with scientists at Spring Grove State Hospital in Maryland, a home of significant government-funded psychedelic research. The editor of LSD, The Consciousness Expanding Drug, 1964, and The Marijuana Papers, 1966, and co-editor of Drugs and Sexuality, 1973, and The Coca Leaf and Cocaine Papers, 1975, Solomon did not have any biomedical training. Instead, he communicated knowledge drawn from his experiences in the jazz community, drug subcultures, and relationships with figures such as beat writer William Burroughs and jazz giant Dizzy Gillespie, in addition to well-respected psychedelic psychiatrists. As an editor at Esquire and Playboy, Solomon oversaw the publication of articles by countercultural luminaries Ram Das, Timothy Leary, and Alan Watts. Solomon also noted how the Princeton-based Humphrey Osmond, a wonderful cat, and the coiner of the term psychedelic, had offered complete cooperation in the making of a documentary for the National Broadcasting Corporation, NBC. Well-connected, a user, and bon vivant, Solomon believed psychedelics had value in medicine and wider society. Solomon, in short, embodied various psychedelic ideas, cultures, and agendas that operated independently or at other times intersected. In 1965, prior to the federal scheduling and absolute criminalization of LSD in 1968 and then 1970, he bridged the divide between recreational and medical worlds of psychedelics, as well as the wide-ranging narratives that others have told about psychedelics. Solomon was far from alone in trying to shape how people in the United States understood psychedelics as interlocutors between medicine and cultural enhancers. Various stakeholders, doctors and day-trippers, psychiatrists and psychonauts, cops and career politicians sought to design and publicly promote psychedelic narratives. These narratives, when compared, reveal an inherent tension in the characterization of psychedelics, and particularly LSD. One set of people claimed that psychedelics might enable a more harmonious vision, and they claimed that psychedelics represented a societal antidote that could open hearts and minds. Yet others described psychedelic substances as having terrible destructive power, in terms of both personal risk to mental health and the social danger of infecting minds with uncivil attitudes. These characterizations competed with other perspectives, specifically that LSD allowed for mind control and was a potent Cold War weapon. Psychedelic psychiatrists and others in the biomedical realm, meanwhile, suggested that insights gained from psychedelic experiences had therapeutic value. These drugs were considered a breakthrough therapy for curing alcoholism and other health problems. Solomon was a historical actor who represented a point of convergence among these disparate LSD narratives. Battles over LSD's meaning continue to resonate. Drugs never fully shed their past, according to science and technology studies scholar Nancy D. Campbell. At any given time, there are many discourses circulating that have overlapping historical resonance. Some 50 years after the passage of the Controlled Substances Act, CSA, and the scheduling of LSD in Schedule 1, meaning it had no medical purpose and possessed a serious potential for abuse, people continue to wrestle with the safety, utility, and accessibility of psychedelics. A growing number challenged the complete criminalization of LSD, calling on new scientific findings showing its therapeutic value while others still debate the past to reveal a more complicated way of understanding what was at stake decades ago in the war on psychedelics. In this chapter, we reconsider psychedelics during the war on drugs by examining some of the historical discourse surrounding their contested place within psychiatric medicine and countercultural drug-induced recreation, self-exploration, or liberty of consciousness. 
concepts that themselves challenge the distinctions made between medicine and pleasure. We identify the struggles over who claimed to have authority when it came to attempts to legitimate the use of psychedelics either as a medicine or as a recreational substance. And we suggest that internal debates within the psychedelic community bear witness to and reveal deeper contests about identity politics and evaluations of drugs as beneficial medicines or simply as recreational forms of escape. Ultimately, the lack of consensus in the medico-scientific community over the benefits and risks associated with psychedelic drug use coupled with a rising tide of interest in psychedelics for recreational purposes alone, proved instrumental. Scales tipped in favor of a characterization of psychedelics as recreational, or at the very least non-medical, and therefore subject to an assault on drugs that included a war on psychedelics and what they represented. The subsequent criminalization of psychedelics, we argue, was a byproduct both of a lack of evidence about LSD's therapeutic benefits and of the nature of the figures who championed its use as a recreational, spiritual, or hedonistic technology. Based on archival records, surveys of biomedical literature, and a deep reading of the secondary sources, this chapter examines dominant psychedelic narratives while also seeking to address underexplored elements related to diversity and equity, criminalization, commercialization, and the messy relationship among those factors. Going forward, there will be a focus on distinct psychedelic wars in the historical literature, in the clinic, in the self, and on the home front, we provide certain insights. On the one hand, we present a view of how substances are concurrently depicted as legitimate and illegitimate. On the other hand, we illustrate how the historical actors involved, be they doctors, patients, policymakers, or users, fought their personal wars in the field of mental medicine and beyond. The result is a more complicated but also more holistic assessment of psychedelic history in the U.S. against the backdrop of the war on drugs. In this chapter, we chronicle competing narratives within the biomedical community. But we also reflect on whose voices have been heard in psychedelic history and those that have been ignored or silenced, and at what cost. Historiographical Wars, or the Troubled History of Psychedelic History the history of psychedelic history has varied widely, and in the American context at least, has rarely been as expansive as it could be. Psychedelics have been, are currently, and should be understood amid a swirling set of controversies about their utility, purpose, potential for abuse, and the state of our knowledge about them. The first generation of psychedelic scholarship found itself preoccupied with contemporary political debates and so examined psychedelics as weapons, antidotes for society, cures for individual pathologies, and through standard rise and fall and rise lenses. And while these diverging categories were very much products of their time, they still matter in the contemporary climate when psychedelics, once considered medicines in the mental health marketplace prior to the CSA 50 years ago, have returned as objects of scientific study and public fascination. Just as swaths of scientific papers were published on psychedelic subjects between the 1950s and 1970s, the recent return of psychedelics into mainstream culture has prompted the growth of new studies and sparked tensions over interpretation and theoretical approaches. However, contemporary attempts to debate psychedelic legitimacy based on utility, purpose, abuse potential, and scientific knowledge frequently mirror the dynamics of historical debates. And while different contexts may mean that approaches that failed in the past could succeed in the present, failing to understand the nuances of such a context risks replicating the failures. Problematically, such studies will not sufficiently explain the scope of psychedelic history if they fall prey to the narrow disciplinary silos that some critics describe as distinctively Western. If the first generation of psychedelic scholarship that occurred in the 1970s was deep but not necessarily broad, 
the proliferation of scholarship on the history of drugs and alcohol laid the foundation for a second wave of psychedelic history in both biomedicine and society that has begun expanding the domains it addresses, including dealing with an international context, questions of gender and sexuality, race, and the problem of criminalization. At times, this new scholarship has an uneasy relationship with other areas of contemporary discourse, particularly insider accounts. Psychedelic knowledge, and critically its legitimacy, is frequently framed by active participants with first-hand experiences. But as in the case of David Solomon's writing and editing in the mid-1960s, Public discourse on and the historiography about psychedelics has long been furnished by white male insider accounts. Belinda Aracho, an indigenous scholar and healer, argues that ignoring insider accounts can also undermine certain forms of evidence, including indigenous knowledge. Aracho reminds us of the tremendous value of personal experience as a form of argumentation. She also shows that many of the enthusiastic claims about the benefits of psychedelic drug use rely on severing the current culture of psychedelics from the past, from archivally based interpretations, and from theories that rely on a more holistic understanding of healing that moves beyond Western models. Often the assertion is made that the current psychedelic renaissance is superior because the science and the researchers are more sophisticated. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, the desire to distance the current discourse from the past has put some historians at odds with a mounting literature on psychedelics that emphasizes personal testimonies claiming that today's approaches are inherently better, or that the activities of the past were inherently less sophisticated or ethical. But both tensions... These historiographical wars between progressivist testimonials and archivally grounded critical analysis, as well as good science and bad science, have roots in the past, and also tap into economic motivations that have guided interpretations of good and bad, or of the medical and the criminal. In the 1950s and the first half of the 1960s, these tensions were less clear. Many researchers were relatively comfortable publicizing their budding work on psychedelics to popular audiences in a variety of formats, including personal testimonies. They believed they had a strong case to make about their psychedelic discoveries and applications, and they felt that the public would be both interested and excited by their findings. Indeed, their work was championed by a broad selection of periodicals that published stories about psychedelics, which ultimately attracted a popular audience. One of the U.S. public's first introductions to psychedelics was in a 1957 article published in Life, America's biggest circulating magazine. Gordon Wasson, a vice president at J.P. Morgan Bank, gave a long and fascinating account of his adventures seeking out the divine mushroom. The article coincided nicely with the release of Mushrooms, Russia, and History a massive two-volume study he had written with his wife Valentina. Other psychedelic accounts appeared in pulp magazines with breathless article titles like I Went Insane for Science, in the equally virile Man's Magazine, no less. In 1964, Sidney Cohen, a prominent research psychiatrist, published LSD, The Beyond Within, a fairly serious but general audience book on the science of LSD where he discussed his self-experimentation. By the mid-1960s, though, openly championing psychedelics in popular media became far more contested. Access to LSD and other psychedelics had become increasingly difficult following passage of the kefauver harris Amendments of 1962. The legislation increased strictures on using investigational new drugs, IND, making access difficult for scientists and enthusiasts alike. An underground market developed in response, and scientists responded in different ways to what many interpreted as an impending threat to their research. In doing so, they widened existing fissures within the research community about what psychedelics were good for, as well as how to legitimate their use. Some investigators promoted their findings through the scientific community exclusively. 
Others broke ranks with their colleagues and continued to popularize the use of psychedelics for recreational purposes, without detailing the commercial aspect of psychedelic sales. Some of the scientists argued in favor of maintaining it strictly for research purposes, categorizing it as a medicine, subject to sales as a pharmaceutically regulated product. And some simply argued for both, psychedelics as a mainstream commercial product not restricted to medicinal use nor left to the vagaries of a black market. War in the Clinic Even prior to the formal declaration of a war on drugs and passage of the CSA of 1970, psychedelic researchers in hospitals and laboratories struggled with public perceptions of their work. Scientists working in this area had to confront an increasingly fearful public and powerful interests, as other chapters in this collection have shown, who viewed mind-altering drugs as dangerous and lacking any redeeming qualities beyond their possible use in government-sponsored covert psi warfare. And in the absence of incontrovertible findings, Biomedical actors in labs and clinics struggled to craft accounts of their research that might legitimate their interest in LSD and other psychedelics. Some researchers certainly tried to meet this challenge. Researchers at the Spring Grove State Hospital in Maryland, for example, embraced it. Home to influential psychedelic luminaries, including Stanislav Grof, Charles Savage, Sanford Unger, and others, Spring Grove staff developed a policy statement covering conduct of psychedelic research within the Department of Medical Research at Spring Grove State Hospital. They circulated their statement within the psychedelic science community and beyond. It generated considerable debate, not least because it held that LSD therapists ought to have tried the drug themselves. Johns Hopkins Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry Dr. John Whitehorn blasted the statement. In my judgment, this represents a very bad mixture of public relations aims and research aims. He continued, I do not believe that it is necessary that the doctors should take the drug, any more than it was necessary when studying the therapeutic value of electroshock to have the doctors given electroshock. Whitehorn also discouraged the temptation to exploit the public interest and any desire to gain favorable publicity. Working to these ends, in his opinion, constituted dangerous diversions that might undermine the scientific competence and integrity of the research. The idea that scientists and researchers have to take psychedelic medicines did not gain traction, and it further divided the research community as well as wider society. Whitehorn felt that it was not important to win over the public or convince them of the drug's safety. Scientists, he insisted, should not be in the public relations business. Scientists and clinicians, such as Whitehorn and others, sometimes clashed over the question of the appropriate and valid use of psychedelics, thus further weakening the broader case for the continued use of the psychedelics in either a therapeutic or clinical setting. Some particularly controversial approaches to psychedelic therapy further weakened the legitimacy of the enterprise. Mexican-based Salvador Roquette was a lightning rod for criticism. He combined psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, and psychedelics in an effort to induce negative feelings in patients that he felt would help to confront past trauma and ultimately bring about a therapeutic breakthrough. The idea that therapy could induce terror or that patients were overly vulnerable to the suggestions of therapists in a state of altered consciousness ran counter to the contemporary social and political discourse of civil rights, patient rights, and the changing power dynamics of the therapeutic relationship. A great many therapists believed his approach was simply unethical and demonstrative of the abuses psychedelic therapy could produce. Some therapists also used LSD to treat the pathology of homosexuality in hopes of transforming the patient's same-sex desires. This approach, too, raised a good deal of controversy, especially among more politically progressive therapists. Some therapists also pushed back against colleagues who advocated for psychedelic use beyond the confines of the clinic. Psychiatrist R.D. Lang, for instance, drew criticism for his extravagant public persona and expansive views. 
at once therapist and scientist, guru, mystic, and cultural critic, Lang was an easy target. According to Abraham Hoffer, who along with Humphrey Osmond was a pioneer of LSD testing in Saskatchewan, Lang represented scientific regression on the one hand and overreach on the other. This unfortunate combination, Hoffer believed, gravely threatened psychedelic research in mental medicine and might lead to criminalization. Physicians are qualified to treat diseases, Hoffer wrote Ralph Metzner, another psychedelic pioneer, and society expects us to use a medical model and to act as physicians. We have no special training, nor competence, nor license to deal with all of man's problems. He added that Lang ought to give up his medical license and admit he was a spiritual counselor like a priest, and not a doctor or scientist. I object to a masquerade game in which my colleagues take every advantage of their M.D. and comport themselves like non-doctors. Even among psychiatrists who saw value in psychedelic therapy, questions of legitimacy loomed large, divided colleagues along disciplinary or training lines, and ultimately exacerbated the professional turf wars. Such internal wars, even among credentialed psychedelic therapists, over questions of whether psychedelics best nurtured a philosophical desire for meaning or a pathological need for treatment, deepened the public and scientific debates over the legitimacy of psychedelic research and treatment. These often angry debates pitted researchers against one another, further radicalizing and marginalizing the psychedelic science of the 1960s. War with the Self The variety of fears about and hopes for psychedelics in the 1960s were linked as much to scientific understandings of human nature and selfhood as they were to broader political decisions and commitments. Contrary to the assertions of many anti-drug crusaders and pro-LSD researchers anxious about its freewheeling use in the public sphere, most users did not take psychedelics for hedonic purposes. Instead, most users of psychedelics, as well as researchers and their patients, treated them as a technology of the self. Notably, even as psychedelic use entered new and sometimes illicit domains, how and why users took psychedelics tended to hew closely to existing medical knowledge. The following section of this chapter will explore patient and practitioner perspectives to illustrate that psychedelic narratives were often far more personal. By the time the FDA began confiscating researchers' supplies of LSD in 1962, which was many years prior to the formal declaration of a war on drugs, scientists had already explored it as a possible adjunct to psychotherapy, a truth serum, a brainwashing drug, a creativity booster, a consciousness expander, a cure for alcohol addiction, and a drug that mimicked schizophrenia and psychosis. Even before 1953, the year that CIA Director Alan Dulles advocated for a new era of brain warfare, researchers had already identified psychedelics as a promising aid for people in the throes of addiction. Word of this promise got out to the public through friends who had tried it and through news articles and interviews. In 1969, a young woman named Alice Smith wrote the Spring Grove State Hospital in Maryland to ask about psychedelic treatment. She explained, I don't really understand too much about alcoholism, but I have been in trouble several times, plus each time I have been dead drunk. Not wanting to commit herself to a mental hospital, she added, I want to do something to help myself with this problem, nor am I trying to use you to get myself out of anything. So, too, James Sinclair of Berkeley, California, who also wrote to Spring Grove to ask about enrolling himself in psychedelic therapy to help deal with personal problems. Having read up on LSD psychotherapy, he was intrigued by the possibility that a mix of psychoanalysis and existentialism might help him battle alcohol. Elsewhere, Bill Wilson, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, tried LSD under the watchful eyes of Gerald Hurd, who frequently functioned as a trip sitter and research assistant to Sidney Cohen. Wilson was so convinced of his LSD trip's similarity to the born-again experience that had originally led him to stop drinking that he considered introducing LSD to AA. 
although it never came to pass. Numerous mental health professionals, patients, and members of the public saw psychedelics as a useful adjunct to therapy more generally. By 1962, Dr. Oscar Janiger alone had administered LSD to upwards of a thousand patients for reasons as varied as a desire to lose weight, sexual frigidity, spiritual enlightenment, or because their therapist had recommended it. One patient wrote on his intake form that he wanted LSD so that he could learn how to cry, something he'd never been able to do. The majority of Janiger's patients after 1958 indicated that they had previously heard about LSD through friends, the writings of Aldous Huxley, or through public lectures and magazine articles, suggesting that public knowledge of LSD was already fairly robust. Actor Cary Grant gave an interview to the writer in early 1959 and declared that, For the first time in my life, I am truly, deeply, and honestly happy. Soon, Hyams' phone started ringing off the hook with friends wanting to know where to get LSD and doctors complaining to him about their own deluge of subsequent patient requests. Every actor in town under analysis wanted it, Hyams told Bob Gaines, bemused. In all, he noted, I got close to 800 letters. Janiger's approach is described at length in Thelma Moss's pseudonymous memoir, Myself and I in which she describes her time in LSD therapy with him. While his therapeutic sessions took place in a naturalistic setting where the patient took the lead, his was certainly not the only method used by psychiatrists who prescribed LSD, any more than we have a singular approach to therapy today. Despite broad agreements within the psychiatric community by the early 1960s that LSD was a useful therapeutic tool, Doctors disagreed about precisely how to use it with their patients. Their debates were largely rooted in professional disagreements about the nature of the self, approaches to therapy, and the purpose of therapy more broadly. The divergences between Oscar Janiger and Sidney Cohen were instructive of the ways that scientific theories of mind, biology, and self had become hopelessly entangled with both the therapeutic relationship and political commitments. Both Janiger and Cohen worked in Los Angeles and knew one another. They were on friendly terms. Janiger even occasionally enlisted the aid of Cohen's graduate students in collecting data for his LSD research. Still, people who were part of the relatively small LSD community of the time understand how differently the two men approach the use of the drug. For example, the eminent writer Aldous Huxley considered collaborating with Janiger on a book project on psychedelics, but believed that Janiger used the stuff badly and told Sidney Cohen that he disapproved of the doctor. Huxley, unlike Janiger, believed that LSD was really only appropriately used by those he considered intellectual elites. He hoped intellectuals could use LSD not only to enhance their own gifts, but also to envision a more spiritual, cooperative, and unified social order. Huxley laid out such a psychedelic utopia in his last novel, Island. While Sidney Cohen did not direct his research toward the utopian, he did think, like Huxley, that Oscar Janiger was much too cavalier in the way he prescribed LSD. Both Cohen and Huxley wanted only a chosen few to take psychedelics. Janiger prescribed LSD to a multitude of subjects. By enlisting the help of several local psychologists who were not themselves able to prescribe psychedelics, Janiger administered LSD to both his own psychologist patients and to their patients as part of his massive research program. But while Cohen and Janiger occasionally swapped research subjects, Cohen was much less convinced of the average patient's ability to handle the psychedelic experience meaningfully or even safely. After Cohen's initial enthusiasm for psychedelic therapy wore off in 1959, he spent the next decade trying to make the case that psychedelics had little significant use value, good or bad, for normals, as he put it, that couldn't be attributed to the skillful abilities of their therapist. Even worse, the experience could endanger particularly troubled patients or patients without adequate therapeutic oversight. More to Huxley's taste, Cohen believed that patients he considered intellectually exceptional, painters, artists, politicians, writers, doctors, and scholars, did tend to make good candidates for the treatment. 
This fundamental difference informed how the two psychiatrists approached therapy with patients more generally and in terms of their LSD research specifically. LSD experiments that Cohen performed with normals were done in the Veterans Administration Hospital where he worked. He had a nurse or graduate student assistant ask the subjects a predefined list of questions during the LSD experience. For his special patients, though, he would trip sit personally, often with his friends and unofficial lab assistants, Gerald Hurd and Michael Barry. These trips were self-directed by the patient. His favorite patient was the famous playwright, conservative journalist, and former ambassador Claire Booth Luce. Her LSD therapy usually took place where she was available, whether in her homes in Hawaii, New York, or Arizona, or at her California friends' estates. Janiger, in contrast, treated all his patients to a naturalistic setting and largely allowed them to lead the course of their treatment, including allowing them to bring their own trip sitter if desired. Despite Janiger's belief in the average person's ability to solve their own problems with only modest intervention from a therapist, he was not a radical egalitarian. Like Cohen, he also had a special place for exceptional patients, many of whom he would take to his cottage in the mountains near Lake Arrowhead, California, when it was time for their experiments. And like Cohen, these patients were often artists, writers, doctors, philosophers, scholars, and the like. The key for both Cohen and Janiger, and for that matter Huxley, was that they believed exceptional people had a gift for creativity, and this gift could be enhanced by LSD. In this respect, they fit squarely within contemporary scholarly debates about selfhood, particularly about what type of self was necessary to be a full-fledged, productive, democratic citizen. American Studies scholar Jamie Cohen Cole has written at length about how left-leaning scholars sought during Cold War to identify the communist and fascist-accepting totalitarian personality. In doing so, they posited an idealized Western democratic citizen as its opposite and began work on pinpointing what was distinctive about this classic liberal subject. Creativity quickly became seen as the fundamental faculty that underpinned both the open-mindedness that was permissive of difference while also allowing for intellectual independence and the ability to self-fashion as an individual. Although post-Second World War intellectuals in the U.S. shared a belief that creativity and individuality were vital to the future of the democratic citizen, they disagreed on what creativity even was much less how to operationalize it for research purposes or how to foster it. Cohen, Huxley, and Janiger were no different. Having outwardly similar interests in LSD as a possible creativity booster wasn't the same as being able to prove that it could deliver such a result. Nor did it weigh in on the questions of who was capable of being creative, whether LSD might be good for other types of therapy, and what kind of therapist could get the most out of their patient. Herman Denver captured some of these technical difficulties in an early letter to Cohen as they organized a conference together in 1959. He asked, Is LSD therapy, or mescaline, or any similar drug, really of value? Many of us say yes, but somehow we lack specific analytic data to show that the result was not due to the therapist, chance, state of the moon, etc. He continued, how does the drug even produce its results? Can we control the studies? Do we need a special therapeutic procedure or just any of them? Do we even have follow-up studies at this point? Such technical debates among LSD practitioners were haunted not only by the question of what kind of person psychedelics could make you, but also how that making was achieved. Alone? With a scientist? A friend? They were also haunted by the question of who could achieve it. And so, while some researchers studying creativity, such as the eminent University of California psychology professor Frank Barron, decided to pursue their research programs into using LSD as a technology of self-improvement openly at personal growth centers like the Esalen Institute, others like Cohen decided to work within the system to legitimize LSD scientifically. 
Their carefully prescriptive and limited approach could put them publicly at odds with less conservative colleagues who believed psychedelic selfhood could and should be attainable by anyone. But even the sense that scientists' legitimacy was tied to their ability to be discreet or dispassionate, or, as Arako has noted, that understanding demands isolating entities rather than treating them holistically, are normative claims with political ramifications. Science, it turns out, is never value-free. Wars. Cold, hot, and the home front. The U.S. witnessed several wars on the home front in the mid-1960s. One of those, which of course operated in tandem with the Vietnam War, centered on the interpretation of recreational LSD. What were the effects? Who were the users? What did they believe? As a result of biomedical researchers' failure to make a compelling case for the legitimate use of psychedelics, in 1970, powerful anti-drug advocates lumped psychedelics in with other controversial and non-medical substances and made them Schedule I drugs. One of these advocates, among many, was the leading Republican senator from Kansas, Robert J. Dole. His constituents fostered his enmity toward drug use, as his office mail reveals. On December 3, 1969, Jonathan Reed of Manhattan, Kansas, wrote Senator Dole about America's growing drug problems. Drugs, LSD, marijuana, are becoming more common each day, he began. I recently heard of a high school student very near to my hometown who ran into a nearby cemetery and slit his wrists. He was under the influence of a drug, possibly LSD. Reed added that the American drug problem was developing to such proportions that an agency should be set up to mitigate the hazards to the country and its citizens. Appealing young people were needed to communicate the dangers of LSD, marijuana, and other substances. Reed generously volunteered himself. Senator Dole responded eight days later, writing on December 11th that there was little doubt that if we do not take prompt and appropriate action to halt the traffic of dangerous drugs, our health and crime problems will continue to grow. Such sentiments were a winning political move in Kansas and throughout most of the U.S. Senator Dole held particularly strong opinions about psychedelics, which were for him a broad category. In late November 1969, he wrote to Miss Barbara Nesmith, a high school newspaper reporter looking for quotes. Smoking pot had become the in thing, according to Dole, and most young people who tried cannabis were really not criminals. Still, he continued, marijuana was a hallucinogen like LSD, since any substance which produces distortions of time or space must be considered somewhat dangerous. Altering one's consciousness, he insisted, was to be avoided. He added that it was important to impose lighter penalties for less serious crimes, whereas the penalties for using LSD ought be stiffer than those for marijuana use. Bob Dole's letter to Miss Nesmith reflected his strong anti-drug sentiments and widespread notions about the growing ubiquity and harmful nature of various drugs. Psychedelics, by this time, were generating broad public fears about birth defects, brain damage, and psychotic episodes not to mention being linked to chromosomal damage and blindness caused by staring too long into the sun. For a politician such as Dole, being against LSD was a no-brainer. To this political end, Senator Dole participated in the crafting of the CSA, which in 1970 placed LSD in Schedule One. A core feature of the subsequent American War on Drugs, the CSA institutionalized for many the perceived dangers of mind-altering substances. In contrast to Senator Dole's poorly informed views on psychedelics, users themselves were often pragmatic about determining safety and risk. A 1967 university dissertation by Carol Chertko, a graduate student in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia, aptly captured users' underground knowledge about psychedelics, including their concerns about the drug's inherent dangers. She conducted a psychological and ethnographic study of drug use in Vancouver, Canada, a top psychedelic destination in North America and one of the top Canadian destinations for American draft dodgers. 
An estimated 35,000 Americans entered Canada between 1965 and 1975, which in part represented a reaction to the military draft, but also tapped into a broader rejection of American values. In a master's thesis conducted by Aisling Murphy, who interviewed people who were part of this migration, their decisions to leave the United States were in fact expressions of a deep dissatisfaction with American society, more broadly informed by their participation in the democratic struggles for change, such as the civil rights movement, the new left, and the counterculture that defined this period in American history. Murphy's study shows that while many such resistors came north from California into British Columbia, their assumptions about Canada providing a more liberal culture were often naive. Despite the realities of geopolitical cultures in the Pacific Northwest, authorities continued to blame this rejection of values on psychedelic drugs. Carol Chertko confronted the claim made by political figures such as Senator Dole that psychedelics caused users to reject mainstream authority or incited anti-authoritarian attitudes altogether. Chertko thus serves as a useful counterpoint to mainstream political views. Chertko found that a recurrent theme among subjects in both groups, control and experimental, was the characterization of the student user as a person who is dissatisfied with society and or himself, and as one who is searching for something to believe in. Of the students interviewed, a majority reported that the LSD experience had changed them in some way. She concluded that, These people are responding in a particular way to the dissatisfaction and aimlessness which young people in general are feeling. They are not unique, nor are they as different as they might think in asserting their independence as individuals. Their way of acting out in frustration is to turn inwards, if only for a time. The personal value or danger of this essentially introverted response to problems remains to be seen. Here, Chertko seemed to suggest that the global pressures of the Cold War, the war in Vietnam, and civil rights struggles necessitated an uneasy response by informed people. Or, at the very least, she was sympathetic to these perspectives. Chertko's work indicated that she thought it was appropriate to question mainstream values, and LSD was not merely a recreational form of escape, even as it was also not the cause of such questioning. Her claims at the time also suggest that the war on psychedelics was as much a denial by political authorities and other establishment elites of the deeper underlying reasons behind many young people's dissident attitudes. Blaming LSD for young people's cultural and political rebellion fit neatly into these elites' claims that society's biggest challenge was irresponsible youth and their chemically altered brains, and not an expensive and unending war in Vietnam or endemic sexism, racism, and colonialism. In addition to confronting the implications of altered values, Chertko also addressed the concern that illicit drug use led to more illicit drug use, riskier behavior, crime, and general deviancy. Combining ethnographic research by living with hippies and interviewing 48 people aged 24 to 48 about their drug use, Chertko tackled this issue head-on. She found that contrary to assumptions, most LSD users demonstrated caution when it came to experimenting with other drugs, especially heroin, speed, methamphetamines, and most participants did not consider LSD to be dangerous, except for freaking out, which they believed they could control. Overall, Chertko's work challenged the idea that psychedelic drug users were irresponsible risk-takers, or that they took drugs that inspired them to question conventional values. Most users, including those in the control group, agreed that there were many reasons to question political values and that taking drugs did not inspire these critical views in the first place. Despite her findings, this knowledge base was discounted by authorities, including her supervisor, James Tyhurst, who was directly involved in helping to craft the Canadian response to psychedelic drug regulation. Chertko was not alone, however. Other investigators, including those tapped by government officials who paid closer attention to users themselves, were also ignored. She had no more success in shifting the public debate than did those researchers who made scientific claims in support of psychedelic drug use.
Politicians like Senator Bob Dole, informed by sensationalist accounts from their constituents and their own gut feelings, were confident that drug users were too foolish to understand their own experiences. They needed protection from themselves. Empirical studies of users' attitudes were not decisive in shaping political beliefs in the 1960s. Beginning, not the end. In 1985, as crack cocaine was exploding into the public's consciousness, the noted LSD researcher Sidney Cohen wrote a short article directed to his fellow drug researchers. He contended that history repeats itself, but nowadays it repeats incessantly. He was not actually referring to either crack or LSD. Instead, he was discussing MDMA, known also as ecstasy or molly. He wrote, one does not have to wait a century to witness a mindless repetition of what should have been learned from past events. It seems we are so present-oriented that the errors of the past are ignored and must be reduplicated every decade or so. The struggle over the legitimate use of mind-altering drugs such as MDMA, he felt, would continue, often without the benefits of serious research. As he sought to tamp down speculation and enthusiasm over MDMA in therapeutic settings, he cautioned his readers that LSD trips marked the beginning, not the end, of a search for sustaining change. The hard work of restructuring psychedelic research still had to be done, he concluded. Cohen may have been correct that it was not so much the drugs that changed, but the structures and narrators who gave meaning and value to public discourse about drugs. In September 2019, the first U.S. Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research was established at Johns Hopkins University. The center was made possible by a $17 million donation from author and entrepreneur Tim Ferriss and others. Its establishment represented a major inflection point in the debate over the social legitimacy of psychedelic research. And the center was a powerful institutional reminder that in the 21st century, a psychedelic renaissance is in full swing, endorsed by a range of influential figures and wealthy benefactors. Along with the slow decriminalization of psilocybin mushrooms at the state level, the influx of interest and resources into psychedelic research is one more indicator of a growing society-wide change in perspective on the war on drugs. Psychedelics, like many of the substances examined here, have a complicated past and a fraught relationship with criminalization and punitive regulation. But we suggest that no other substance in the war on drugs has been loaded with as many meanings as LSD. Psychedelic advocates today include those who hold libertarian views, suggesting that all drugs should be legalized. Others are evangelists, Essentially, psychedelic proselytizers who argue, as many did in the 1960s, that LSD and psilocybin could change minds and the world. Others still have more pragmatic perspectives, holding that such drugs should only be prescribed in medically sanctioned therapy sessions or for end-of-life use, post-traumatic stress syndrome, PTSD, or a host of other medical issues. A final group hoped to capitalize, make money, on a new group of medicines. Together, these advocates are helping reorient perceptions and spark acceptance of psychedelics, which may pave the way for the legal reintroduction of psychedelics into American society. The history of psychedelic science and its drug regulation constitutes an important chapter in the war on drugs. Unlike cocaine or marijuana, Psychedelics have acted as visible and viable therapeutic tools in the immediate run-up to the CSA in 1970 and were even studied closely in the years immediately after its passage. The psychedelic experience itself became an object of study, imbued with ideological significance and therapeutic meaning, though the objects of that study have more consistently focused on determining the right kind of subjects or consumers, rather than incorporating a more diverse set of experiences in order to diversify psychedelic science itself. Contests, psychedelic wars over how best to interpret this meaning or who best to articulate it and who still should benefit from it have long animated debates over who best embodies psychedelic authority. It is the same as we write this. The present moment is witnessing a new set of testimonials, 
attempting to recalibrate the social capital of psychedelic experience in a continuing war over psychedelic authority. Just as in the past, Americans are seeking to unpack how LSD may function as a product of medicine, a recreational substance, a tool of religion, and a commodity. The field of mental medicine and the Food and Drug Administration seem more receptive to the potential efficacy of psychedelic medicines. And like David Solomon in the mid-1960s and after, we are seeing various interpreters of psychedelics in the present. In 2018, journalist and best-selling author Michael Pollan entered the conversation when he published How to Change Your Mind and introduced readers to his own psychedelic trips. This testimonial-style intervention has shaped contemporary discourse on psychedelics and found its place among an increasing trend of high-profile confessions or explorations, including those from Tim Ferriss, Gwyneth Paltrow, among others, and a host of Silicon Valley-based innovators who opened discussions about psychedelic microdosing as a precursor to innovation. Just as in the past, when psychedelic stories featured in major periodicals, so it is that The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and other magazines are closely reporting the revival of psychedelics. That these testimonials often come with repudiations of the past and its failures is particularly ironic, given that Silicon Valley is a direct heir of the counterculture being disowned. As in the past, the face of the psychedelic renaissance is typically white and privileged. Top-tier institutions are getting involved, from Johns Hopkins to Berkeley. And despite concerns about psychedelic tourism outside of the United States that has caused environmental and cultural destruction disproportionately affecting people of color, the psychedelic character in mainstream discourse remains white. In the current wave of psychedelic literature, and as the basic legal architecture of the war on drugs remains in place, the narratives about the psychedelic past have often been designed to distance the contemporary neuroscientific pursuit of psychedelics from its troubled past. Yet these narratives have sometimes continued to reinforce a desire to separate psychedelics from a longer tradition of plant-based healing, indigenous ways of knowing, and relatedly, colonial trauma. Historical interpretation and the complexity of psychedelic wars is in some cases tokenized to demonstrate that today's researchers have a better grasp of the ethical or methodological landscape or connect with a noble or sacred set of traditions rather than taking seriously the claims of the past or working directly with scholars to interpret and contextualize historical cultures. Much of the non-historical and often non-academic literature is being generated within the field of biomedicine and neuroscience, but there are also a growing number of popular accounts or first-hand narratives that are also shaping the discourse on 21st century psychedelics. Whether or not historians agree that the contemporary resurrection of psychedelics is better informed by science or not, or whether it has genuinely become a more diverse intellectual space, the commercial potential for psychedelics has new champions who have sought out alliances with clinical researchers who once more are confronting the value of psychedelics in modern society. Part 4. The International Front 8. The War on Drugs in Mexico Eileen Teague Mexico quickly came into the crosshairs of external interdiction efforts during the U.S. war on drugs beginning in the 1960s. Though scholars have often focused on U.S. actions and resources in Mexican drug control, particularly the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, this essay examines how this aspect of the U.S. drug war was shaped by Mexico's internal politics. This transnational and international analysis of America's war on drugs helps to explain the limits of U.S. anti-drug interventions in production countries such as Mexico. For decades, the fiercest proponents of the war on drugs in the United States have insisted that stopping the flow of drugs into the U.S. is the only way to truly win the war. As a result, U.S. drug warriors have placed Latin American supply countries in the crosshairs of their grand drug war strategy. 
One Reagan-era study cited seven Latin American or Caribbean countries as producing the bulk of marijuana, cocaine, and heroin illegally smuggled into the U.S. each year. U.S. leaders so focused their drug enforcement efforts in Latin America that by the 1980s the war on drugs had been Hispanicized, at least in the American popular imagination. The bloodshed produced by Latin American drug mobs, wrote one astute observer in a 1985 New York Times editorial, makes the gangs of Al Capone's era seem by comparison like gentlemen of the old school. But while this U.S.-centered perspective is useful in explaining how the war looked from Washington, D.C., it tells us little about how and why targeted nation-states cooperated in the war. From the perspective of government leaders in nations targeted by the U.S. for drug suppression measures, the history of the war on drugs provided both opportunities and challenges. These leaders saw the U.S. war on drugs less as the imposition of a greater power's anti-drug measures onto weaker nations and more as a dialectic between partners with their own varying interests. Governments of production and trafficking societies singularly experienced and interpreted, and even exploited, Washington's increasingly militarized policies against the drug trade. Securitization around drugs gave not only Americans but their counterparts in other countries an advantage both in their internal affairs and in their relations with Washington. Washington's partners in the war on drugs may have waged war, but it was not always on drugs. Mexico is case in point, though similar dynamics occurred in Washington's relations with other countries. As a producer of both cannabis and the opium poppy, Mexico has fit neatly into the U.S.-centered interpretation of the drug war, even as its nearly 2,000-mile-long shared border with the U.S. makes it an exceptional case study. Official discourse on the Mexican drug trade colored by violence, failures in policy execution, and the pervasiveness of corrupt and irrational figures, has produced a distorted image of drug control south of the border. At the same time, it has served a policy purpose of providing American agents with the rationales for continuing their work there. We are perhaps all too familiar with these push factors of intensified drug control, but less familiar with the pull factors, including how local actors played an equally important, if not greater, role in the militarized execution of drug enforcement in Mexico over the past six decades. The U.S. designed the more intensive anti-drug policies, but Mexican leaders welcomed and at times even spearheaded the militarization of its drug enforcement. During the late 1960s and 1970s, the Mexican government used U.S. anti-drug aid for internal security measures. Initially motivated by a desire to protect its sovereignty from the U.S., the Mexican government escalated its drug control program during the 1970s, discovering in the process its utility for tightening the grip on power held by the country's authoritarian ruling party, the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, PRI. Drug enforcement intensified as a result of the PRI's concurrent campaign of political repression and counterinsurgency a period that scholars and activists have begun calling La Guerra Sucia, the Dirty War, which lasted from the late 1950s to the early 1980s. Mexico appears to have successfully kept U.S. anti-drug actors at bay during the 1970s. The PRI prevailed over the Mexican left by decade's end, and Mexico's ruling party co-opted many of the demands made by leftist radicals in previous years. However, during the 1980s, the emergence of the cocaine industry and intensified U.S. anti-drug policies in Latin America made drug control even more violent. That Mexico developed into an important trafficking route for South American cocaine brought with it new security imperatives for both Mexico and the U.S., as well as additional threats to Mexico's sovereignty. With leftist insurgencies largely defeated, enforcement in Mexico became more complicated, and the question of how the Mexican government used the increasing American anti-drug dollars flowing south under the administration of Ronald Reagan is fair game for speculation. While sources are less abundant for the 1980s, evidence suggests that the Mexican state continued to wage a drug war to maintain control over dissent and public safety. 
Scholars have examined the relationship between American state power and the emerging function of drug control. Less work has been done, however, on the developing Mexican anti-drug program and its own relationship to state power. In particular, Mexican state actors took advantage of American resources and knowledge to modernize their enforcement capabilities. The increased importance of drug control was unique because it was not a grand strategic objective of the Mexican state in a traditional sense, but a social responsibility that would keep low- and mid-level policing actors in an almost constant state of low-intensity conflict. During the 1960s, when this story begins, drug enforcement was less significant to Mexican government agencies than it would become. Yet, Mexican drug control and its relationship to state power underwent a transformation in the ensuing three decades and became fundamentally shaped by the concept of war. By 1985, to give a stark example, anti-drug campaigns counted toward a soldier's combat experience. This work is concerned with parsing out the factors that caused U.S. drug war partner states in general, and Mexico in particular, to rationalize the use of force in drug enforcement. First of all, for some major Mexican state actors, drug control was not always primarily aimed at eliminating illegal drugs. They used a drug war instead as a convenient rationale for a host of other state functions. Violence, a tool that actors on both sides of the border were all too ready to employ, was not the only nor the best means for reducing drug consumption. Yet Mexican officials rationalized, even encouraged violence in their efforts to eliminate the Mexican drug supply as a product of the distinct political, social, and cultural factors that Mexico faced in the late 20th century. Secondly, a focus on Mexican motives demonstrates how limited, even improvised, America's earliest anti-drug efforts in Mexico actually were. For its part, the U.S. wanted to eliminate drugs outside its borders, and it was willing to encroach on Mexican sovereignty in the process. However, U.S. actors often lacked the conceptual tools and local knowledge to rationalize fighting narcotics in Mexico, given the very different situation on the ground there. As a result, complicated alliance politics developed between U.S. and Mexican agencies that at times worked against the ostensible mission of drug control. Tracing this relationship between drug enforcement and security imperatives offers one way to understand how governments, certainly in Mexico but elsewhere too, used violence against domestic rivals and internal threats with and without the threat of drugs present. Origins of the U.S. Presence in Mexico's Drug War The U.S. established its first organized anti-drug presence in Mexico during the 1960s, a period when American travelers would acquire negligible amounts of Mexican marijuana. In 1963, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, grandfather organization to the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, established a small office in Mexico City to monitor operations of the Turkish-French heroin smuggling ring, which used Mexico as a transit country. Stereotypes of drug-seeking beatniks or hippies traveling to Mexico to get high had permeated American popular culture in the works of figures such as Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac. The Kennedy and Johnson administrations portrayed U.S.-Mexico anti-drug relations as a cooperative effort, embraced by the upper echelons of Mexican policymakers, containing criticism of Mexican efforts in specific agencies and regions. Actually, the Mexican anti-drug program was drastically underdeveloped, and it remained low on Mexican policymakers' list of priorities, because the U.S. government at the time was focused on interdicting European heroin, it provided little in the way of financial incentives to encourage more robust Mexican anti-drug efforts. It was not until the presidency of Richard Nixon, 1969 to 1974, when brown heroin derived from Mexican poppies, began appearing in large quantities on U.S. city streets that the U.S. government focused more attention on its southern neighbor as a major drug supplier. However, the earliest bilateral anti-drug efforts were more political theater than a response to increasing Mexican drugs in the U.S. Mexico did not surpass the Turkish-French smuggling ring as the primary heroin supplier to the U.S. until 1975. Yet in September 1969, with little warning, 
Nixon all but closed the border with Mexico in a bid to search every vehicle transiting into the U.S. for illegal drugs, an action known as Operation Intercept. The exercise debilitated Mexican border commerce. The Nixon administration hoped that this draconian measure would pressure Mexico to enact its own drug crop destruction program in remote producing areas using herbicides some of whose infrastructure can be traced to the American herbicidal spraying operations in Vietnam. It worked, at least to a degree. Mexican leaders had little choice but to cooperate with U.S. drug control policies following the border shutdown. But the prospect of spraying Mexican communities with herbicides was highly unpalatable to Mexican leaders. U.S. involvement in Vietnam played a role in Mexico's conceptions of counterinsurgency and in the Mexican government's willingness to use herbicides. Mexican leaders paid sufficient lip service to the U.S. so that the border was reopened after three weeks while they delayed implementing the herbicidal program for years. While Mexico held fast on the program in the years following Intercept, it did sign on to establish a more intensive anti-drug program using other forms of U.S. aid, aircraft, weaponry, etc., furnished to them under the War on Drugs campaign proclaimed by Nixon in 1971. Translated into policy, the ubiquitous metaphor in the history of U.S. anti-drug issues provided Nixon with the political capital as well as the legal and fiscal resources for carrying out more extensive drug control domestically and beyond its borders, especially in Mexico. In the years following Intercept, U.S. pressure, resources, and conceptions of drug control profoundly changed Mexico's anti-drug program. But Mexican actors were already predisposed to militarized enforcement, especially in rural drug-producing areas already prone to anti-government sentiment and violence against federal government agents. Although the PRI's repressive efforts against the left emerged in the post-war era, the seeds of the conflict were planted decades earlier. A popular spirit of revolutionary nationalism inspired the Mexican Revolution, 1910-1920, and the Constitution of 1917 that emerged from the conflict declared Mexico's government to be democratic and representative. But the PRI, the proclaimed party of the revolution, ruled Mexico as a one-party state from 1929 to 2000. The modernization of Mexican cities and economic growth established under PRI rule gave the country the image of a stable partner in Cold War Latin America. By mid-century, however, citizens began to contest the lack of democracy through peaceful protest. Obsessed with threats to its power, the party of the revolution began constructing its own security state, at times with American assistance. Though 1968 is often cited as a landmark year in countercultural protest in Mexico with the Tlatelolco massacre, myriad popular protests against the government, demonstrations of workers, teachers, and peasants had already emerged in the decade prior. In silencing opposition and consolidating political power, the administration of Miguel Aleman 1946 to 1952, embraced a strategy of using government agencies to repress cycles of peaceful demonstration. The strategy was continued by many of his successors, including Adolfo López Mateos, 1958 to 1964, Gustavo Díaz Ordaz, 1964 to 1970s, Luis Echeverria, 1970 to 1976, and José López Portillo. 1976 to 1982. Aleman also increased the military's role in domestic policing, combining military and police functions for internal security measures, measures defined by the president and those in his inner circle. Despite these authoritarian characteristics, the Mexican state did not rule by complete force alone and has been described as a hybrid regime that combined democratic and authoritarian elements. In some ways, this description made Mexico the ideal candidate to display force in its drug enforcement measures while cloaked under the facade of being a democratic partner. The government also needed support, both within and outside the country, which it attained through economic growth, distribution of resources, and by continuing to pay symbolic homage to the revolution, even as it ruled with an iron fist. 
Mexican government agencies dedicated to squashing political instability were drawn into the expanding national security apparatus and the U.S.'s broader internationalization of crime control. Still, this developing partnership was a rocky one. The U.S. and Mexico had long clashed in the area of policy. With Customs and the Border Patrol operating at the border, U.S. agents sometimes worked with Mexican policing agencies to apprehend criminals or drug smugglers. Often, however, U.S. agents did not follow the formal rules of international diplomacy and crossed the southern border with impunity, reflecting an inclination toward jurisdictional overreach that would be seen in agencies such as the DEA in later years. Mexican officials, as well as the Mexican public, resented this kind of imperial arrogance, which had long characterized U.S.-Mexico relations. Still, in the post-war era, as the Mexican government embraced anti-communism and created its own security state, the U.S. delivered resources to aid in policing dissent, and PRI officials welcomed this kind of support. As dissent mounted, the Mexican government employed anti-communist rhetoric against the internal left. But whereas the Mexican left was a remnant of the unfulfilled promises of the Mexican Revolution, those who criticized an enduring dictatorship, the PRI successfully cast the left as a segment of international communism, which led U.S. actors to enable, even support, the PRI's repression. Moreover, in the U.S., the reach of agencies such as the CIA and the FBI depended on their ability to gather intelligence overseas and work productively with foreign counterparts. American security and law enforcement agencies' need for this kind of cooperation strengthened state-to-state -state ties, especially as partner nations, very much including Mexico, began assembling their own intelligence capabilities during the period. In the late 1940s, President Aleman modeled Mexico's political and criminal surveillance state apparatus on U.S. intelligence agencies, which had the double aim of appeasing American Cold War aims and, in exchange, receiving aid and training in the years to come, as well as achieving the domestic policing needs of the PRI. The Federal Security Directorate, DFS, Mexico's most powerful intelligence agency, was formed in 1947. While U.S. officials tended to view Mexican intelligence as uncoordinated and disorganized, the Mexican Interior Ministry, which housed intelligence functions, found that mundane intelligence could be useful as a bellwether for potential political unrest. Unlike authorities in urban areas, intelligence agents had extensive knowledge of the inherent violence existing in areas disconnected from the capital. Eventually, Mexican intelligence agencies and the military became entrenched in the dirty work of social control, which included the use of violence to intimidate. Later, the same organizations which would play an important role in drug control. Moreover, following the revolution, Mexican leaders conceptualized the army's role such that it supported the PRI's vision for the country. This civil-military arrangement, where the military was subordinate to civilian leadership, was starkly different from that of other Latin American countries. The largest sector of the military, the army, carried out a number of the government's reform-minded civic action responsibilities, especially in places disconnected from that capital, which included public health initiatives like vaccination as well as drug crop destruction. Divided between posts in provincial towns and the countryside, the Army's infantry and cavalry sometimes participated in dangerous policing tasks in the countryside. U.S. security policies, of which drug control would become a part, stoked an already precarious political situation on the ground in Mexico. By the late 1960s, vocal radical left activists challenged the legitimacy of the PRI-led Mexican state. While many of the disparate leftist groups in Mexico represented different political stances, they were united in their belief that the government had betrayed the promises of the Constitution. Demonstrations climaxed at the country's largest and best-known counter-hegemonic movement at the Plaza de las Tres Culturas at Tlatelolco in Mexico City on October 2, 1968. With snipers posted in the modernist buildings surrounding the plaza, the Mexican army fired on student protesters as they tried frantically to escape. 
resulting in as many as 300 casualties. No single event did more to color the military's role in the government's domestic policing initiatives. Nor did any single event do more to galvanize the left and the various armed guerrilla groups, many of whom flocked to rural, drug-producing areas to organize. Alternate, many whom flocked to rural, drug-producing areas to organize. A similarly intensive demonstration occurred on June 10, 1971, when a U.S.-trained covert operations group called Los Halcones, the Falcons, attacked a group of more than 10,000 students in Mexico City on the day of the Corpus Christi Festival. Although the U.S. officially downplayed or perhaps underestimated the threat leftist insurgencies posed to the Mexican government, some U.S. officials were supporting their Mexican counterparts' suppression of leftist dissidents. In his oral histories, U.S. Ambassador to Mexico Joseph Jova has repeatedly referenced President Luis Echevarria's working relationship with the CIA, both during the Tlatelolco massacre when he served as the interior minister and then more discreetly during his presidency. When the Nixon administration began practicing more intensive drug control measures in the late 1960s, enforcement capabilities of the Mexican state were based more on party loyalty and the repressive state apparatus than they were on eliminating drugs. As such, the intensified enforcement then advocated by the U.S. reinforced the level of infiltration the Mexican government desired in spaces remote from the capital. The U.S.-sponsored War on Drugs allowed the Mexican Armed Forces to further extend its presence into hundreds of Mexican cities and towns as intelligence agents spied on its population in the name of national security. According to one account, military officers retained a considerable amount of power to lobby, graft, and politic in the provinces through a combination of informal pacts and bold assertions of power. Prior to the late 1960s, the Mexican government's drug control efforts had been minimal. The Attorney General's office facilitated drug control agreements at the higher echelons of policy, and the drug crop destruction was a part of the PRI's reform-minded duties carried out by the Army and at times by underdeveloped municipal and state police forces. Tactically, the Army was better equipped for these tasks than other government agencies, but the Army also played a critical role in protecting the PRI's one-party rule in areas disconnected from the capital. Even so, lack of organization, lack of resources, and a decided lack of political will made drug enforcement a difficult task. In previous decades, Mexican Army and police forces had destroyed poppy and marijuana crops using machetes or by burning fields, especially in Mexico's Golden Triangle the mountainous drug-producing region located in the country's northwest, comprised of the states of Sinaloa, Chihuahua, and Durango. These were also largely rural states with long histories of resistance to federal control. But enforcement efforts were complicated by officials who condoned drug production as part of the local economy. This relative indifference changed following 1969's Operation Intercept. The Mexican government took ownership of its anti-drug program largely to prevent more intensive U.S. anti-drug interference inside Mexico. The government's decision to escalate Mexico's anti-drug efforts on its own terms and not those of the U.S. reflected the decades-long distaste held by Mexicans across political lines for Yankee imperialism. Not only did President Gustavo Díaz Ordaz want to prevent American interference inside Mexico, he also wanted to control and manipulate how American power and resources would be used for his own purposes. In the execution of enforcement, the government retained much leeway in how it used the aid and policies inside Mexico. Diaz Ordaz authorized the use of U.S. material in Mexico's anti-drug program, but he was adamant that U.S. personnel could not be involved in Mexican enforcement operations. If a Mexican soldier killed a Mexican peasant, it was unfortunate, he said, but if an American agent did so, it would cause a national uproar. Mexican leadership was initially wary of using certain forms of aid, such as remote sensor technology, even as it agreed to accept aircraft assistance. By late 1970, however, USAID to Mexico was ramped up. 
One of the first estimates of U.S. aid to Mexico included Cessna 185 aircrafts, multiple platforms of helicopters, and Department of Defense DOD trained pilots and mechanics on hand to administer initial sorties and training. The aid included defoliants such as Torton 101, also known as Agent White, and 2,4-D, one of the ingredients in the notorious Agent Orange that had been used to ill effect in Vietnam. Despite an initial reluctance to accept U.S. aid, it did not take the Mexican government long to realize the utility of drug control resources for increasing the Mexican Army's overall capabilities. By late 1971, Mexico requested the following items in support of its anti-drug program. 300 Uzi submachine guns, 20 gas grenade launchers for use with 12-gauge riot shotguns, and 2,000 gas grenades. At the same time, Mexican records indicate a mobilization of military resources directed toward the country's Golden Triangle, as well as the states of Sonora, Michoacan, and Guerrero. Mexican leaders used Nixon's war on drugs in much the same way they used the Cold War, as a means for acquiring the material support necessary to bolster Mexico's internal security apparatus and U.S. acquiescence around intensified enforcement in order to utilize violent tactics against the left and assert control in peripheral areas. Framing drug control around the concept of war allowed local and mid-level Mexican enforcement actors to expand the definition of who was considered the enemy. It also gave guerrillas access to resources that could be used to bolster their power. In essence, then, Mexico's war on drugs was more about securing the Mexican state from political tumult of the previous two decades than about Mexican interest in eradicating drugs. The Mexican government feared that as drug production and trafficking increased in rural guerrilla hotbeds, such as the state of Guerrero, anti-government actors would gain the resources they needed to escalate their challenge to state power. They were right in the state of Guerrero, for example, where guerrillas did use drug profits to acquire U.S. arms. With more than 20,000 weapons, including grenades and explosives smuggled into Mexico annually, some by drug traffickers who were closely linked to anti-PRI activists, the government faced a formidable foe. Mexican army and police forces were hesitant or ill-equipped to enter these violent anti-PRI drug-producing spaces. Even before drug profits shifted the balance of power, they had suffered high casualties in Guerrero. While outsiders believed that Mexican guerrillas were little more than a nuisance to the Mexican government, PRI leaders saw the matter differently. They believed that the guerrillas exposed the precarious state of the PRI's grip on Mexico. As a result, PRI leaders used American resources to station increasing numbers of DFS agents on the border to monitor the drugs and arms being smuggled between Mexico and the U.S. The Mexican government was significantly more concerned with the weapons than it was the narcotics. In 1975, the U.S. Domestic Council Drug Abuse Task Force's White Paper on Drug Abuse called for a more comprehensive strategy for overseas drug control. With studies showing that U.S. heroin use had increased and that Mexico was the primary heroin supplier, the White Paper shifted the U.S. focus to more intensive supply-controlled measures against hard drugs. American Drug Control Administrators insisted that Mexico begin a massive drug crop destruction campaign. A similar, though less developed, U.S. program known as Operation Buccaneer had been developed in Jamaica in 1974 to eradicate marijuana. With Mexico's Operation Condor, which commenced in early 1976, newly elected President José López Portillo, 1976-1982, finally relented to U.S. pressure for the full-scale use of defoliants. U.S. drug officials closely observed this aerial herbicide campaign. Peter Bensinger, DEA administrator at the time, recalled that his agents would send up single-engine aircraft to observe the spray operations and to make sure that the actual fields were getting sprayed and that the herbicides didn't end up in the Pacific Ocean. American officials paid considerably less attention to the Mexican Army's massive 10,000-man effort to police the countryside for both drugs and dissent. 
For PRI officials, Operation Condor provided an excellent opportunity to use American resources to serve its dual interest in stopping some drug production while repressing anti-government guerrillas. Many of those targeted as drug producers tended to be part of groups historically opposed to PRI rule. The Mexican state, justified by Operation Condor, committed multiple human rights violations and abuses of power against suspected drug producers who just so happened to be suspected anti-government activists. In Sinaloa, soldiers seized homes in search for drugs, often stealing food and cash and committing other unlawful abuses in the process. The governor reported unlawfully seized campesino livestock located near the drug plants they found as payment for their drug enforcement efforts. Mexican government officials, as well as local and federal police forces and prison officials, as well as U.S. agents, were accused of participating in physical and mental torture to coerce confessions, colluding with corrupt law enforcement, extortion, and other such violations of the law. The PRI's social control efforts were in the hands of the same military forces charged with policing drugs in rural spaces disconnected from the capital. This full-scale militarization of Mexican drug control served the capital's broader political interests. U.S. agents, aware of the claims of human rights violations, largely distanced themselves from future iterations of Condor, even as the Mexican government conducted multiple similar operations in the years that followed. One 1979 report suggested that the U.S. International Narcotics Assistance Program subsidized a program of the Mexican Federal Judicial Police, with DEA acquiescence and occasional involvement that used systematic torture on narcotics suspects. It suggested that 90% of the traffickers apprehended during Operation Condor were peasants and juveniles forced by authorities to sign confessions. With the initial influx of U.S. anti-drug involvement in Mexico during a turbulent period in the country's history, there seemed to be a developing consensus inside Mexico of the use of force around enforcement issues. The particulars of who or what the force was directed at seemed to grow less significant, while larger drug trafficking organizations were left largely unaffected. One such group was the Herrera Organization, which ran a heroin operation connecting a village in the state of Durango to the streets of Chicago, dating back as early as 1957. During the 1970s, the DEA estimates that the Herrera family controlled as much as 90% of the heroin in Chicago, as Elaine Carey explains in her essay. The heroin was then distributed to other U.S. cities. On the Mexican side... Mid- and low-level government actors, from mayors and governors to military, police, and intelligence agents, repurposed social control energies into Mexico's drug enforcement. One December 1983 report from the CIA cheerfully acknowledged that the Mexican army took advantage of the eradication campaign to uncover arms trafficking and guerrilla activities. The report continued, Army eradication may devote as much effort to internal security as to eradication. Sometimes drugs were planted on activists or leftist propaganda was planted on rural people who were detained. While the American DEA might not have found this use of anti-drug resources in Mexico to be ideal, the CIA saw no problem with it. The war continues, but for what purpose? Mexican officials appear to have successfully kept control over the implementation of U.S. anti-drug policy in Mexican hands during the 1970s. By the end of that decade, with the assistance of U.S. drug eradication policies and resources, the PRI had prevailed over the Mexican left. The Attorney General's office at this point had more than 500 anti-drug agents stationed throughout the country, making as many as 36,000 arrests between 1950 and 1979. But the PRI-led Mexican government had far less success prevailing over the illegal drug business. Mexico continued to be a major producer and exporter of heroin and marijuana. It also became a major cocaine trafficking country. By 1980, Mexican heroin confiscated in the U.S. had purportedly decreased by 40 percent thanks to Operation Condor. The Mexican government, which prioritized destroying marijuana over poppy due to a long-standing cultural stigma against the weed, 
reported a 90% decline in marijuana production. At the same time, American enforcement personnel confiscated nearly 10 times as much cocaine, approximately a third of it trafficked through Mexico. Despite the relative levels of cooperation reached between the U.S. and Mexico in stemming the flow of heroin and marijuana via herbicidal programs, the surging popularity of illegal cocaine in the U.S. made moot any progress in the joint U.S.-Mexico war on drugs. The American government responded to the rise of cocaine trafficking in Mexico by demanding that the PRI escalate its war on drugs. The perceived threat of cocaine in the U.S. and President Ronald Reagan's campaign promise to wage a more aggressive war on drugs put new pressure on the Mexican government's drug eradication efforts. Frustrated over Mexican inaction, Reagan's drug warriors called out Mexican corruption in the PRI's war on drugs and insisted that U.S. personnel were needed in-country to police Mexican efforts since Mexican officials seemed incapable or unwilling to do it themselves. The coercive demands by Reagan officials were part of a larger U.S. strategy in Latin America that hinged on an ambiguous link between developmentalism and a desire to police. This heavy-handed approach emerged even as the CIA was linked to the drug trade and its operations with the Contras in Nicaragua. In Mexico, the sovereignty issue was still important both to the Mexican government and to the way subsequent bilateral anti-drug efforts were sold to the Mexican public but in a different way from the past. U.S. agents increasingly implicated their Mexican counterparts in corruption and official complicity in the drug trade, but they did so in direct relation to the escalation of the U.S. anti-drug presence in Mexico. Mexico's insistence on protecting its right to prosecute its own drug traffickers deepened distrust between the two countries. That Mexico developed into an important trafficking route for South American cocaine brought with it new security imperatives for both Mexico and the U.S. The South Florida Task Force, initiated in 1982 and directed by Vice President George H.W. Bush, had been relatively successful in shutting down Caribbean cocaine smuggling routes. But this had only increased the power and profits of Mexican drug trafficking organizations. By 1985, according to the DEA, Mexico trafficked more than one-third of the cocaine consumed in the U.S. The Guadalajara cartel, grandfather to many of today's cartels, oversaw the traffic of 15,000 to 30,000 kilograms of cocaine into the U.S. yearly. The cartel's profits, and thus their power, soared. High-level traffickers began to pose a threat to the Mexican government's authority, and in some cases enjoyed considerable political influence at the state and national levels. One example is Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, who co-founded the Guadalajara cartel that was predominant in the 1980s. Felix Gallardo had originally worked as a federal police officer, and during the 1960s as a bodyguard for Sinaloa's governor, Leopoldo Sanchez Celis, whose connections helped his trafficking organization flourish. Drug traffickers and their expansive organizations were increasingly entangled in the Mexican state. These traffickers did not merely corrupt government officials. They played a role in controlling how the government implemented drug policy at all levels of governance, from the local to the national. On the one hand, Mexican political leaders aligned government policy publicly with America's war on drugs. On the other, in practice, at all levels of the Mexican government, some officials used their authority to safeguard the massive economic power and opportunities created by the traffickers. In other words, myriad state actors supported the drug trade and undermined proclaimed state interests. Bluntly stated, the drug trade often supported the livelihoods of the same municipal and state police officers who were charged with enforcing drug laws. The increase in violence and crime resulting from the expansion of the Mexican drug trade, as well as the obvious rampant government corruption it produced, resulted in a legitimacy crisis for the PRI-led state. According to Mexican sociologist Luis Astorga, Mexican drug traffickers' infiltration and influence over the PRI-led government in the 1980s exposed the deterioration of the old political structures. Mexican officials who sought to bring order to Mexican society, whether corrupt or not, understood that they had a problem. 
drug enforcement and security were dependent on a delicate balance between respecting the power of the drug trade and maintaining a certain degree of control over it. This balance was increasingly set off kilter. Two well-publicized incidents in the 1980s highlighted the Mexican government's inability to manage drug trafficking organizations' increasing power and disregard for any semblance of social order. On May 30, 1984, unknown assailants murdered Mexican investigative reporter Manuel Buendía outside of his office in Mexico City. Buendía had spent a career exposing political corruption, organized crime, and the drug trade, as well as CIA operations in Mexico. Buendía had allegedly acquired a videotape showing high-level government officials meeting with drug traffickers. Drug traffickers and the local police were the primary suspects in the murder, which was left unsolved for nearly five years, affirming how criminal networks protected by the government silenced those threatening to expose them. Top DFS officials were eventually implicated in 1989, but it is doubtful that they were Buendia's actual killers. The second incident, the murder of DEA agent Enrique Kiki Camarena in 1985, illustrates the complications of U.S. interference in already delicate anti-drug efforts by the Mexican state. In order to preserve PRI rule, Mexican drug enforcement agents sometimes condoned aspects of the drug trade. In November 1984, as a result of intelligence provided by Camarena, which had come from an extensive period of undercover work with the Guadalajara cartel, Mexican forces seized the massive El Buffalo marijuana plantation. The two-square-mile plantation, located in the northern border state of Chihuahua, was a highly sophisticated operation, complete with mechanized farming techniques, commercial fertilizers, a state-of-the-art drip irrigation system, drying sheds, an airstrip, and armed guards. The plantation employed 10,000 workers. At the time, it was the largest marijuana seizure anywhere, ever. With drugs there valued at more than $150 million, the Mexican daily newspaper El Nacional called it the most important marijuana interdiction in Mexico's history. And U.S. Assistant Secretary for International Narcotics Matters John R. Thomas called it the bust of the century. According to multiple accounts, El Buffalo had flourished with the protection of federal and local police, as well as the complicity of Mexican Secretary of Defense Juan Arevalo Gardoqui. Rafael Caro Quintero, a major drug trafficker and co-founder of the Guadalajara cartel, owned El Buffalo, and he was furious. He wanted Camarena dead. Camarena was abducted in February 1985 three months after the El Buffalo bust. The Mexican government told the American government that they had no idea what had happened to Camarena. U.S. officials blamed their Mexican counterparts both for Camarena's abduction and for their failure to control the narco-traffickers who were behind it. To leverage Mexican government action, the U.S. partially closed the border and instigated Operation Intercept II. This U.S.-led and mandated operation reflected a public, official repudiation of the Mexican government's prosecution of the war on drugs. In addition, the DEA launched Operation Leyenda, its own investigation into Camarena's disappearance. This investigation exposed close links between the Mexican government and the Guadalajara cartel. The Mexican government responded to this immense U.S. pressure by convicting low- and mid-level officials and traffickers involved in the Camarena murder. They did not, however, do much to prosecute higher-level traffickers and refused to extradite those they did arrest. By the end of March, arrest warrants were finally issued for Caro Quintero, whom the DEA, not Mexican investigators, found hiding in Costa Rica. Mexican forces then did arrest Caro Quintero and Guadalajara cartel leader Ernesta Fonseca Corillo. Miguel Ángel Félix Gallardo, the cartel's most prominent cocaine trafficker, would not be arrested for another four years. His arrest signaled the end of Leyenda. Camarena's murder and Operation Leyenda intensified U.S. efforts to investigate ties between Mexican drug traffickers and authorities. These efforts deepened following the detention and torture of DEA agent Victor Cortez in Guadalajara by state police officers. Under American pressure, President Miguel de la Madrid, 
1982 to 1988, conducted major shakeups of the Mexican government's intelligence and police forces, which resulted in the 1985 disbanding of the DFS, the semi-secret PRI-run agency that had a long history of productive relations with the CIA. A number of DFS agents, including its former director, Jose Antonio Zoria Perez, were linked to the drug trade and were either arrested or fled the country. While these actions indicate that the Mexican government had stepped up its drug war, the actions were only undertaken under immense American pressure. Mexico was still wrestling with the delicate balance between its own interests in using the war on drugs to maintain social order and the economic power and violent reach of the traffickers. By the mid-1980s, the Mexican government's attention had been diverted from leftist insurgencies to the drug trade. The influence of the drug traffickers revealed the weakness of Mexican leadership and the state far more than small bands of guerrillas. The profitability of the cocaine trade fueled a substantial growth in crime in Mexico. Although many crimes go unreported in the country, yearly homicide rates rose by almost 35% between the early 1980s and early 1990s. In producing states, the illicit drug industry fueled reports of narco-terrorism. Reports cite violence growing from competition between rival traffickers or peasant farmers quarreling over cultivation rights. Meanwhile, the Mexican government's enforcement efforts were hindered by high foreign debt, inflation, unemployment, and rebuilding necessitated by the 1986 earthquake. The government's inability to address domestic economic problems also drove poor farmers to the financial rewards of cultivating illicit drug crops. For those in poverty, traffickers served as an economic buffer and even provided credit to peasant growers, who paid in full after the harvest. As a result of both the increasing drug trafficking violence and the Mexican government's limited resources, Mexican officials were increasingly vulnerable to U.S. pressure for a more militarized, American-backed war on drugs. And by the mid-1980s, the U.S. was pushing hard for such a war. The Camarena murder and Operation Leyenda had paved the way for U.S. policies that intensified the war on drugs in Mexico. The Reagan administration's April 1986 Drug War Declaration, National Security Decision Directive, NSDD-221, was one of these policies. NSDD-221 stated that the international drug trade constituted a legitimate threat to U.S. national security and so sanctioned the use of force in the fight against drugs internationally. It also increased the U.S. anti-drug presence abroad. The directive further declaimed that third world governments could not squash the illegal drug trade on their own. They needed U.S. direct support. NSDD-221 was a critical marker in the Americanization of drug policing on an international scale. This American-led war on drugs was hardly welcomed by all in Mexico. A history of local, state, and national government's use of the police as a measure of social control fostered citizen resentment against militarized anti-drug law enforcement measures. Mexican government officials were particularly incensed by the increased surveillance at the border. In October 1986, Reagan approved the Anti-Drug Abuse Act. In the U.S., this law was best known for establishing draconian mandatory minimum drug sentences. Mexicans were far more focused on the massive military resources the act provided for U.S. agents to police their border. The law directed nearly $1.7 billion to arm the border with modern radar equipment, aircraft, and other types of surveillance intended to interdict narcotics coming into the U.S. The Mexican government, caught between the power of the drug cartels and the need to curtail the violence and corruption the cartels and their allies were unleashing on Mexican society, generally accepted U.S.-led militarization. This acceptance, however, was mired in political, economic, and cultural conflict. Direct U.S. agencies' active involvement in policing drugs in Mexico created bureaucratic infighting within the Mexican state. In addition, many Mexicans rightfully complained about the lack of transparency U.S. activities produced in Mexico's internal affairs. American bureaucratic infighting added an additional layer of complexity to Mexico's war on drugs. While the DEA tended to be more aligned with the federal police and the Mexican Attorney General's office, 
Other agencies, such as the CIA, cultivated their own alliances with the DFS. Although the DEA and State Department led enforcement efforts in Mexico, the CIA also played a covert role in intelligence gathering. The CIA, not surprisingly, operated in secret and often refused to coordinate its work, even with other U.S. agencies, let alone the Mexican government. An inherent mistrust between the DEA and the CIA in particular resulted in a lack of intelligence sharing. The two agencies also struggled to resolve differences over the use of CIA evidence, often obtained through informants or wiretaps of Mexican officials. If CIA information was not admissible in court, what purpose did it serve the Justice Department? Other U.S. agencies also often felt stymied by each other. Customs Commissioner William Von Robb said his organization had all but been pushed out of the drug business by the DEA. Camarena's murder demonstrated that making strides in drug control involved extensive undercover work and cultivating relationships with counterparts willing to flirt to a certain degree with the criminal underworld. FBI Director William H. Webster admitted that corrupt public officials were absolutely necessary to the success of those drug enforcement enterprises where such individuals serve as facilitators or provide an early warning system. In his study, based on hundreds of interviews with DEA agents who worked in Latin America, political scientist Ethan Nadelman found that the most seemingly corrupt counterparts were also the ones with whom DEA agents could work most productively. They were the better, more knowledgeable law enforcement officials. Such positive personal linkages in drug enforcement did not always align with the realities of Mexican government policy at the upper echelons. The location of Reagan's final meeting with President Miguel de la Madrid in February 1988, held at Mazatlan in the drug production state of Sinaloa, was significant because it signaled at least some American approval of the Mexican government's anti-drug efforts. But even alliances cultivated at the highest levels were caught in the contradictions produced by many Mexican government officials' complicity in the drug trade. For example, despite Sinaloa's governor Francisco Labastida's well-publicized links to the drug trade, U.S. officials continued to work closely with him, recognizing his utility in the broader fight against traffickers. Despite these complications, both the U.S. and the Mexican government, for overlapping but not identical reasons, embraced militarized drug enforcement. Entering the presidency in 1988, Carlos Salinas de Gortari, 1988-1994, made defeating narco-trafficking a national priority. He restructured the deputy attorney general's office that oversaw drug trafficking, created specialized units devoted to fighting drug traffickers, and doubled anti-drug personnel and resources. The Attorney General's office increased the size of its eradication air fleet and sought to improve the efficiency of its narcotics operations, growing the agency's budget from $18 million in 1987 to $23 million in 1988. While this is not an insignificant figure, it bears emphasizing that this was less than the $26 million in aid Mexico received from the U.S. Moreover, while Mexico's willingness to wage war against drugs aligned with the state's broader interest in maintaining control over traffickers, taking this stance also necessitated additional U.S. security assistance. The Mexican Attorney General's office enjoyed a budget of nearly $2 million a year to maintain Mexico's 212 aircraft, which the U.S. believed incorrectly were being used solely for fumigation. Mexican enforcement agents also received fully subsidized training opportunities in the U.S. Mexican military forces also increased their direct participation in the country's anti-drug effort. As had always been the case, under-resourced state and municipal police forces at the peripheries were more likely to be influenced by criminal networks. With the dismantling of the DFS, the Army took on even more responsibility in drug enforcement. By the mid-1980s, the country's anti-drug program was marshalling up to 50,000 troops, nearly half of the country's military. The Mexican Navy also increased its role in drug control. In a television interview with Mexico City's Red Nacional, Navy Secretary Miguel Angel Gomez Ortega stressed that, using Mexican technology and manpower, the Navy had modernized and increased its surveillance capabilities along Mexico's coasts by 70%. 
Moreover, with NSDD-221 clearing the path for American military involvement in the global fight against narcotics, joint training ventures in drug control between the U.S. military and Coast Guard and Mexican military forces increased in the late 1980s. These military efforts were all subsidized by the U.S. Such incentives provided the U.S. with a drug war ally while enhancing Mexico's national security capacity. The notion that internal factors in supply countries such as Mexico play an equal if not greater role in bilateral drug policy execution is crucial for understanding Mexico's war on drugs. It also highlights some of the fundamental flaws of U.S. supply control policies. The Mexican government had its own interests at stake when the U.S. began pressuring Mexico to cooperate in the war on drugs. With the ostensible mutual goal of eliminating illegal drugs, the U.S. helped Mexico create enforcement machinery that rationalized state-sponsored violence, ostensibly directed at drug growers and traffickers. During the 1970s, Mexico's PRI-led state controlled that machinery and used it not only against the illegal drug industry, but also against its political enemies. The threat of leftist insurgencies was short-lived, although one could argue that some of those energies were reflected in the Zapatista movement of 1994, but the Mexican government's drug enforcement arrangements, supported by the U.S., endured as drug control replaced anti-communism as the primary enforcement paradigm in Latin America during the 1980s. These arrangements employed a broad definition of who could be targeted by a selective enforcement system based on corrupt economic alliances and other political factors. The contestation of drug policy implementation in Mexico, a developing country confronted with a lucrative, illicit industry, is also significant to the story. On one level, Mexico benefited from showing the U.S. it could effectively control drugs so that it could protect its sovereignty, a long-running theme in U.S.-Mexican relations. But Mexican officials' ties to the drug trade often undermined the state's anti-drug efforts, even as the Mexican government reaffirmed its desire to wage war on drugs so that it could maintain control amid the growing power of traffickers and criminal groups. Yet contrary to some U.S. discourse, Mexico has not been an irrational actor, incapacitated or overrun by drug cartels and criminal organizations, Segments of the state made conscious, rational choices based on internal threats and external pressures. At times, Mexico tailored, even exploited, American drug policies. Alliance politics made bilateral exchanges that much more opaque. Over the course of nearly 50 years, these factors produced a number of unintended consequences that have sometimes run counter to the very objective of controlling the flow of drugs. As the drug trade in Mexico continues to expand in new and innovative ways to meet American demand, scholars and informed citizens must understand the complicated, sometimes misguided trajectory of drug policy execution in Mexico if there is any hope of creating more thoughtful, less violent policies in the future. 9. The War on Drugs in Afghanistan James Bradford for much of the first half of the 20th century, opium and hashish from Afghanistan were used by consumers throughout South and Central Asia. But in the 1960s and 1970s, the demand for Afghan drugs grew beyond regional markets, and the Afghan government, under pressure from the United States and the international community, implemented a series of drug control policies attempting to curb the illicit drug trade and its globalization. This chapter explores why Afghanistan emerged as a global drug hotspot, what the Afghan government did to try to stop it, and ultimately, why attempts to stop the drug trade failed. Little has been written about the history of drugs in Afghanistan, nor about how it fits into the broader histories of the global drug trade or of international drug control policies. Unearthing the history of drugs and drug control in Afghanistan reveals how, in the 1970s, more stringent anti-drug policies were implemented largely as a vehicle for the expansion of state power, which parallels what happened in other countries' drug wars. This chapter also calls into question the notion that drugs thrive in undeveloped economies. 
Indeed, it explores the ways economic development, rather than serving as a deterrent, proved critical in helping to build and shape the illicit drug trade. In October of 1971, Terry Burke, a decorated Marine and former CIA officer, flew to Kabul, Afghanistan with his family to fulfill the mandate of then-President Richard Nixon to expand the war against the supply and distribution of illicit drugs. As the first agent for the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs to be stationed exclusively in Afghanistan, Burke's mandate to stem the tide of drugs that flowed increasingly from Kabul to destinations west was both ambitious and daunting. Burke was not there to bust the travelers who flocked to Afghanistan to find cheap drugs, but rather to stop the growing threat of the brotherhood of eternal love. Unlike the usual ragtag, drug-using American sojourners, members of the Brotherhood were a different breed of Westerner. They went to Afghanistan to buy large quantities of Afghan hashish, some of the best in the world, to smuggle back to the United States and Canada. Over the course of the two years he was stationed in Kabul, however, Burke's fears that the Brotherhood would create a sophisticated smuggling operation bringing hashish from the isolated mountain kingdom of Afghanistan to the shores of sunny California would be subsumed by a larger and more pressing problem. He watched as Afghanistan transformed from a major supplier of hash to one of the world's major suppliers of opium. Like the many other U.S. drug agents stationed in drug hotspots around the world, Burke did not foresee the changes that would occur to the international illicit drug trade. At the time, many governments where drug production and distribution thrived were quite content to operate with the U.S. to expand drug control measures. For these governments, co-opting the war on drugs meant a major infusion of money, resources, and manpower to bolster such drug suppression efforts as crop eradications, alternative development programs, and overall, a greater exertion of political pressures to reduce supply and limit distribution. And yet, despite such cooperative efforts, a tragic game of cat and mouse ensued over the course of the following decades a game that disrupted much of the flow of the illicit drug trade. Under pressure from the Nixon administration, drug laws in numerous nations increasingly emphasized the criminalization of use and users. In addition, users adapted to shortages in long-standing drug supplies by shifting to new methods of consumption or even new drugs, often more dangerous ones than what they had been using before. Producers and distributors, meanwhile, adapted to the seemingly endless demand for drugs by finding new sources of supplies and new routes and methods of distribution. Unbeknownst to Burke or the countless others like him, in the first year of the war on drugs, those agents were coming face to face with a global illicit drug trade that was proving to be far more dynamic than anticipated. It is this organizational and entrepreneurial dynamism that has come to define the illicit drug trade over the past 50 years. The drug trade in Afghanistan exemplifies this dynamic historical process. It has changed significantly since Burke first arrived in Kabul. Afghanistan is now the world's largest producer of illicit opium and still a major producer of hashish in Asia. This despite massive amounts of money, resources, and people sent to stop it. But it wasn't always the case. How and why Afghanistan came to be such a massive producer of illicit drugs is a history that is often overshadowed by the overwhelming attention paid to the current drug trade in Afghanistan. Contrary to more popular depictions of Afghanistan's drug trade in recent decades, Afghanistan emerged as a major supplier not simply a result of the past four decades of war, marked by the Taliban insurgency, or decades of domestic corruption, political chaos, and instability. There is far more to this story. Through the examination of recently declassified and unexplored U.S. and Afghan documents, I will demonstrate how, beginning in the early 1970s, Afghanistan increased efforts to curb the production and trafficking of illicit drugs, largely under pressure from the U.S. 
Looking at the history of the U.S. war on drugs and its impact on Afghanistan society and economy necessitates an analysis of the role the Afghan government played in that process. Afghanistan has a long, complicated, and sometimes divisive history of state formation and growth, and this history directly affected how effective the Afghan government was and chose to be in partnering with the U.S. in drug control. The U.S.-led war on drugs marked a significant change in how the Afghan government approached the issue of drug production, use, and trade. The Afghan government had tried to implement more stringent forms of drug control before American pressures were applied, including a ban of opium in 1944-1945 and the eradication of opium in Badakhshan, a mountainous province in the north of the country, in 1958. But by the 1970s, the contours of drug control and the drug trade in Afghanistan were increasingly shaped by American anti-drug efforts. In the late 1960s, Afghanistan was already a source for hashish and opium. But as Afghan suppliers of illegal drugs, hashish especially, became more and more critical to the U.S. market, American counter-narcotics agents began to pay greater attention to Afghanistan. Burke's arrival in 1971 marked Afghanistan's entry into the newly minted U.S. war on drugs. Burke worked closely with Afghan officials to ramp up suppression efforts, as the Afghan government created new police units with expanded interdiction capabilities, and also authorized increased crop eradication programs. As Kathleen Friedel has convincingly shown for the U.S., the drug war served as a modality for the expansion of muscular state power in the U.S. Similarly, the war on drugs was exported to Afghanistan, where it likewise produced the fragile Afghan government with greater resources to expand its reach and power. While the efforts to stop drugs were significant, they were largely unsuccessful. Anti-drug crusaders were also contending with historical features that primed Afghanistan's emergence into the global illicit drug trade. Afghanistan's transformation from a regional to a global epicenter for drugs was felt most acutely in the shifts in agricultural production in the Helmand Valley. From 1946 to the 1970s, Helmand, an arid region in the southwest of the country, was the site of a massive U.S.-sponsored agro-industrial project. The U.S. intended to teach Afghan farmers to use new techniques and technology toward the production of crops in hopes of improving agricultural exports. The project worked, but in unexpected ways. As Helmand farmers adjusted their crops to respond to changes in global pricing, they were also exposed to the growing demand for opium, and in turn started to grow larger and larger quantities of opium throughout the 1970s. The timing of the war on drugs in Afghanistan proved critical. Successful, or at least relatively successful, American-led drug interdiction efforts in several long-standing drug-supplying nations, such as Thailand, Turkey, and Mexico, had opened up channels for Afghan drugs to fill the void. This profitable opportunity had a tremendous impact on certain regions of Afghanistan, such as Helmand, transforming it from a small producer and user of opium and cannabis to the world's largest source of illicit opium. Maybe more important was the fact that the globalizing dimensions of the drug trade in Afghanistan coincided with increasing political and social tumult in Afghanistan. The Afghan war on drugs, the success of which hinged on the cooperation of the state, would eventually be dependent on a state with a decreasing willingness and capacity to fight this war. By the end of the 1970s, Afghanistan would be producing more drugs than it ever had in its history, just as the Afghan government and society was descending into chaos and eventually war. Terry Burke could not, of course, foresee the unfolding of such events when he was stationed in Afghanistan, but as Burke's tenure in Afghanistan drew to a close in 1973, he became increasingly pessimistic about the ability to stop the emerging drug trade in Afghanistan. What had once started as a mission to catch hashish traffickers was evolving into something far more dynamic, dangerous, and potentially more intractable to the Afghan situation. The Production and Trafficking of Heroin The World and the War on Drugs 
Although the U.S. had been battling illegal drug use and trafficking for much of the 20th century, when President Richard Nixon officially launched the war on drugs in June 1971, it symbolized the growing nexus between domestic drug issues in the U.S. and the supply and traffic in drugs from abroad. Countries whose drug supply affected the American population in some manner were now under greater scrutiny from the U.S. government. As Friedel has noted, the global expanse of the war on drugs transformed drug policy from a discreet foreign policy objective into a valued collection of tools to manage relations with the developing world. The timing of Nixon's war on drugs reflected an attempt to transform American political power in the waning days of the war in Vietnam a conflict that had revealed the limits of American military might and had severely damaged the U.S.'s international legitimacy. In addition, the presence of heroin addiction among G.I.s in Vietnam shocked the American public as to the extent and reach of the drug trade in that embattled region. Few Americans were aware of how deeply entangled the drug trade was in the conflict in Southeast Asia. Over the course of the 20th century, the rough, mountainous terrain connecting Burma, now Myanmar, Thailand, and Laos had developed into one of the world's major sources of heroin. In 1971, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Marshall Green dubbed the region the Golden Triangle. To stop the looming threat of the drug trade in both Southeast Asia and the U.S., the Nixon administration required the cooperation of states to successfully curb drug supplies. Some countries proved more willing, if not able, than others. Thailand, under the direction of King Bhumipan Adhyade, had already started programs in the 1960s to curb opium production among the hill tribes in the north of the country by increasing economic development and political engagement. When Nixon declared the war in 1971, Americans found a ready and able partner in the king. In 1972, the Burmese, too, emerged as a recipient of counter-narcotics resources from the U.S. The impact of Nixon's war on drugs abroad was even more acute just south of the American border. In 1969, in an effort to curb the heavy flow of marijuana and increasingly brown heroin from Mexico, Nixon launched Operation Intercept and closed the Mexican-American border. Although the border closing lasted only three weeks, it ultimately forced the leaders of the Mexican government to comply with American demands for more stringent efforts to curb the drug trade. By 1971, the U.S. had increased aid to Mexico, and by the end of the decade, Mexico was a willing partner in the war on drugs, with the ruling PRI co-opting much of the drug war to further entrench its political control over the country. Turkey, much like Mexico, also faced the wrath of the Americans. It was a popular assumption during the 1960s that much of the heroin that flooded the streets of New York came via the infamous French Connection and was sourced from Turkey. In 1971, the U.S. offered $35 million in aid to convince the Turkish government to ban the production of opium. Although the ban was relatively unpopular among farmers and drug traffickers, obviously, some involved in the illicit drug trade in Turkey anticipated the backlash to their business. They had already sought out new sources of supply and safer trafficking routes prior to the ban in 1971. Whether through pressure or due to sincere efforts to stop drugs in their own countries, many drug-producing states cooperated to some degree with the American war on drugs. The access to resources, money, and training were an attractive incentive for states looking to expand their own political power within their borders. The question of whether those programs actually curbed the illicit drug trade was another matter. As countries like Thailand and Mexico achieved temporary success in reducing the production of drugs in their own country, the global dimensions of the drug trade largely evolved. Consequently, the pressures of the war on drugs merely shifted the contours by which the drug trade operated. These seismic shifts in suppliers would ultimately ensnare Afghanistan as a primary source of opium for the global illicit drug trade. Afghanistan Afghanistan has a long history of cultivation, trade, and use of both opium and cannabis. Cannabis in particular has been widely used by Afghans for centuries. 
generating a unique cannabis culture that continues to this day. Opium, on the other hand, has not been as widespread, but thrives in certain regions of the country ideally suited for opium production and trade. In Badakhshan, farmers have grown opium for centuries, and in the past century it has become the primary cash crop for farmers in the region. Opium in Badakhshan is also considered some of the very best in the world. Similarly, both opium and cannabis have been grown around Herat in the west and in Nangahar, southeast of Kabul and bordering Pakistan. Nonetheless, despite a long history of drug production and trade, Afghanistan was never a significant player in the global drug trade until the 20th century. In 1924, the colonial government of British India announced the prohibition of all opium and cannabis products that made their way into British India from countries along the frontier. Although the prohibition did not mention Afghanistan specifically, it was enacted largely in response to the growing threat of opium and hashish smuggled from Afghanistan. The law in many ways marked one of the earliest indications that the drug trade in Afghanistan was expanding beyond domestic markets. This 1924 law was the culmination of a decades-long development that began under the rule of Abdur Rahman Khan, whereby the state expanded opium and hashish exports into British India as part of a broader effort to grow the Afghan economy and the power of the state through the export trade. In the following decades, various Afghan rulers tread a delicate balance between encouraging drug production for export and trying to deter drug use and addiction among the local Afghan population. Amanullah Khan, who ruled Afghanistan from 1919 to 1928, and is considered by most historians to be the most aggressive modernizer of early 20th century Afghan society, launched a series of new laws, also in 1924, intended to discourage domestic drug use, all the while encouraging and expanding drug exports. Amanullah reduced excise duties on opium and hashish exports, but imposed strict taxes, many with steep and draconian penalties, on those drugs destined for use within Afghanistan. Although there is little evidence of the impact and success of Amanullah's drug policies, especially domestically, his foray into drug control signified the growing influence of the drug trade in shaping the future of Afghanistan. But it also presented a paradox, as opium and hashish provided new opportunities for both the growth of markets, legal and or illicit, and the growth of the Afghan state through drug control and capital from trade. Afghan rulers would never fully resolve this paradox. Bans on opium in 1944 and 1957 signaled that opium exports were increasingly important to the state, but so too were diplomatic relationships that could accelerate Afghanistan's economic growth and the state's political power. In 1944, Afghanistan announced a total ban on government-run opium production and sale. The decision to launch the ban was largely a result of the Afghan government's failed attempts to become a legal producer and exporter of opium for the global pharmaceutical market, but it proved fruitful in other ways. On condition of banning opium, the U.S. government agreed to formalize its diplomatic relationship with the Afghan government, paving the way for increased economic development, including the start of a major development project in the Helmand Valley. Ultimately, the 1944 ban did very little to alter the drug trade, as many Afghan companies simply stopped selling to the U.S., and not more than a few years later, the Afghan government began pressing the United Nations for recognition as an internationally sanctioned producer of opium. As a result, the ban of opium in 1957 was largely a continuation of the unresolved issues brought about by the previous prohibition. The difference between 1957 and 1944, however, was that the ruler of Afghanistan in 1957, Mohammad Daud Khan, actually enforced a prohibition of opium albeit only in the opium-dependent province of Badakhshan. These bans reflected how both the drug trade and drug control were increasingly shaped by international forces. On the one hand, Afghan opium was increasingly in demand in Europe and elsewhere as both a legal and illicit good, one on which farmers and traders were growing more reliant, especially in lieu of shrinking exports for legal goods. On the other hand, 
The need for international recognition required Afghan rulers to implement policies to curb the drug trade, despite the fact that such policies were at odds with the economic realities on the ground. In this way, the opium bans were launched largely to appease the international community, especially the U.S., even as opium consumers outside Afghanistan provided a lucrative market for domestic producers. More importantly, the deeper conflicts over banning opium exhibited an enduring issue that would shape Afghanistan's future drug trade. The government's anti-drug approach, while good for diplomacy, was hard to enforce on the ground, as political issues between the state and rural tribal authorities often went unresolved. In addition, cultural norms, in which opium and hashish were integral parts of rural livelihoods, endured. Finally, the recognition that drugs, even if illegal, were potentially lucrative goods for Afghans, ultimately made imposing drug restrictions difficult for any state, let alone one with such unstable footing as Afghanistan. Afghanistan Delivers During the 60s era, drug historians Mike Ritter and Peter McGuire recount, Afghanistan lived up to the wildest fantasies of the hippies. As the counterculture movement gripped the West, thousands of young Americans and Europeans hit the road to Asia in search of spiritual truth, love, and, most importantly, cheap drugs. But Afghanistan was different from other stops along the infamous hippie trail. Not only did it have an ancient culture and some of the most beautiful and stark landscapes in Asia, it also produced some of the world's best hashish. Hashish was to Afghanistan, Ritter and McGuire explain, what wine was to France. Many young travelers in the 1960s and early 1970s acted as if Afghanistan existed to cater to their demands for drugs. In Kabul, Chicken Street, in the shahar e district, was famous for easily accessible hashish, opium, and even beer. Alcoholic beverages were harder to come by in the predominantly Islamic nation than were the drugs. The Noor and Mustafa hotels were popular hangouts for drug-seeking travelers. The political and cultural climate was ideal for Afghanistan's role as a source for hashish. Although opium and hashish were technically illegal, drug laws were rarely enforced. Throughout the country, travelers would find special tea houses, Saki Khanna, dedicated to hashish use. Moreover, Afghan hashish was among the best in the world. One could purchase up to 25 variations, much of which contained extraordinarily high percentages of THC. Not only was the quality top-notch, but both opium and hashish were cheap. Opium could be purchased in Kabul for $45 per kilogram. High-quality hash would go for less than $20 per kilogram. The ease of access to cheap and powerful drugs made Afghanistan one of the most important stops on the hippie trail. In 1971 alone, almost 60,000 hippie tourists from Europe and North America flocked to Kabul, many to take advantage of the drug trade. Similar to the manner in which cannabis helped prime Colombia's emergence as the global epicenter for the cocaine trade, hashish proved a critical commodity in bridging the gaps between Western demand and Afghan producers. As the 1960s progressed, a noticeable change occurred in the hashish trade, which indicated that Afghan hashish was being produced for export illicitly. The British writer Peter Levy, in his travels to Afghanistan in the late 1960s, noted that in Kandahar it was a big industry, and even small children tried to sell us hash in its various forms. Every kind of smuggling device was for sale. Strings of hash beads, hash belts, hash-heeled shoes, and for all I know, hash cod pieces. Producers began altering their methods to ensure they could supply larger volumes of hashish, often at the expense of quality. Traffickers also began mixing lower-quality resins with those of higher quality, reducing the potency of the hashish. Oils, too, were added to mimic the texture and consistency of higher-quality hashish, mainly to make it feel sticky, thereby masking the deficiencies in the product. The growing demand for cannabis products was too large to ignore, even for the Afghan government. Although the production and sale of drugs were illegal under Afghan law, the government saw economic opportunity in the trade, particularly in light of the largely stagnant national economy. 
As a result, in 1969 and 1970, King Zahir Shah issued an official edict to encourage farmers to use fertilizers to increase cannabis cultivation. Not surprisingly, cannabis cultivation flourished around Herat, Kandahar, and Mazari Sharif, and cannabis plants were seen lining many of the major roadways around the country. For Afghan farmers, the growing demand for hashish provided more than just much-needed income. It provided the capital they needed to modernize. They used their hashish money to purchase agricultural equipment, such as tractors and the like, that normally would have been unattainable. As the 1960s came to a close, Afghan hashish was emerging as a global commodity. It would also prove critical in shaping Afghanistan's future opium trade and the coming U.S. war on drugs. The war on drugs comes to Afghanistan. As Afghan hashish flowed to markets west, opium production was increasingly also making its way into Iran. The fact that hashish and opium were both growing more prevalent in Southwest Asian countries was ringing alarm bells for those nations that sought to stamp out the illicit drug trade, especially the U.S. For Terry Burke, the Bureau of Dangerous Drugs and Narcotics agent who arrived in 1971, policing this growing trade would be a monumental task. For the past century, drugs had served as a lucrative, albeit small, source of trade for Afghan farmers and traders. The government, too, largely tolerated opium in hashish markets. The brief forays into stricter drug control policies were either limited by the reach of the state or enacted to manipulate diplomatic relationships in their favor. But as the war on drugs expanded globally in the 1970s, Afghanistan, too, would be influenced by the growing pressure to crack down on illicit drugs, marking a significant change in the relationship between the government and the drug trade. For some figures in the Afghan government, especially Mohammad Daud Khan, the increased access to resources to curb drug production would be advantageous for the expansion of state power. But even then, the limitations of state power in rural Afghanistan would do little more than change the dimensions by which the government could control or influence the drug trade. When Burke arrived in 1971, the hippies buying small amounts of hash on Chicken Street were largely irrelevant to his mandate. He was there to track and bust the American drug traffickers who were importing cheap Afghan hashish to the U.S. Burke noted in 1972, While of somewhat secondary significance relative to opium, hashish has been important in our enforcement efforts because of the smuggling systems that have spawned. The drug-seeking hippie who came to Afghanistan a few years ago and spent his last few traveler's check to take home a kilo or so of Afghan hashish has been replaced by the well-heeled young entrepreneur from the U.S. Burke was particularly focused on the brotherhood of eternal love. As David Farber recounts in his chapter, the Brotherhood emerged amid the counterculture movement in the 1960s in Southern California, and its members were at first true believers in the sacramental and spiritual use of hallucinogens. The Brotherhood rose to prominence by distributing massive amounts of LSD, most famously, Orange Sunshine. Under the leadership of John Griggs, himself an acolyte of the infamous Timothy Leary, the Brotherhood evolved into some of the largest distributors of the LSD and hashish in the U.S. The presence of the Brotherhood in Afghanistan was seen by Burke as a key link in the emerging connection between Afghan sources and Western markets. In particular, the Brotherhood specialized in buying hash oil in Afghanistan. Hash oil was much easier for them to smuggle than bricks of hashish. The oil was also far more potent and thus more profitable. Despite their preference for hashish oil, hashish itself was lucrative enough. According to Terry Burke, the Brotherhood could net $80,000 for every 50 kilos of Afghan hashish sold in Montreal or New York. The Afghan government was entirely unprepared to deal with the globalizing dimensions of the drug trade. Afghan police especially appeared to be either indifferent to or corrupted by the Western traffickers. As early as 1958, a cotter of West German police officers were sent to Kabul to train Afghan police in a wide array of enforcement techniques and strategies. Success was minimal. 
The failure of policing was due in part to the fact that police officers were often the least qualified public servants, being drawn from the bottom 10% of army conscripts. Moreover, they were woefully underpaid and overwhelmingly illiterate to boot. When police officers did show effort in trying to crack down on drug traffickers, they were often placed on leave. As one German police officer noted, the West German police trainers were essentially turning the Afghan police into the most highly organized criminal element in Afghanistan. The gendarmerie was no better. Structured as a paramilitary force under the Ministry of Interior Affairs, the mission was primarily to maintain internal security and to supplement the police. Although a large force, most gendarmes were located in key provinces just outside of Kabul, with only a few border posts on the Afghan-Pakistan and Afghan-Iranian borders. As a result, the majority of seizures from the police and gendarmerie were near Kabul, while the majority of drug smuggling continued unabated on Afghan's southern and western borders. Prior to Nixon's war on drugs, the U.S. had applied pressure to curb the growing threat of drug smuggling. In 1969, the U.S. and its allies in the region, Iran and Pakistan, pressured the Afghan government to pass an anti-smuggling law. The law centralized police and judicial efforts against drugs, placing greater power in an expanded Kabul police force. While the centralization of Afghanistan's police force to wage a war against drugs was ideal in theory, it was flawed in practice. State authority in Kabul was vastly different than in rural Afghanistan. One of the major reasons why state authority was limited was because of the role of Kawam in shaping state-society relations. Kawam in Afghanistan, according to historian Olivier Waugh, describes a fluctuating sense of identity, which places communal, tribal, or ethnic identity over national identity. For police and gendarmes, decisions were often dictated by their Kawam, as they would put the needs of their tribe or community over national drug control policies. In this way, Kawam undermined the ability of the government to impose nationwide policies on drug control. More simply put, would lower-level state officials in border regions arrest smugglers, many of whom they had more in common with than people in Kabul for the sake of the state, whose legitimacy was always in question, particularly the further one got from Kabul? American officials became increasingly aware that the size and influence of the drug trade in Afghanistan was so large and widespread that narcotics matters could not be handled under the traditional legal and police constructs. In 1971, when the war on drugs commenced and American pressure increased, it seemed the Afghan government took a more concerted approach to fighting the drug trade. Prime Minister Abdul Zahir created a separate narcotics commission tasked with expanding customs police and border patrols. The commission increased funding and technical assistance as a means of expanding the crackdown on the production of opium and hash. By 1972, Zahir's successor Musa Shafiq consolidated narcotics matters under two ministries. The Ministry of Interior Affairs was tasked with countering smuggling including the creation of new anti-smuggling units, ASUs, while the Ministry of Agriculture dealt with issues related to drug cultivation. Between 1971 and 1972, there was a noticeable increase in drug seizures from the ASUs and police. According to official Afghan statistics, the number of arrests of smugglers increased from 72 in 1971, the year 1350 according to the Afghan calendar, to 221 in 1972, 1351, before skyrocketing to 584 in 1973, 1352. The consolidation of the police and ASUs was starting to pay dividends for the U.S., especially in regard to the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, as a joint raid by the Bureau of Dangerous Drugs and Narcotics and Kabul Police in 1972 confiscated almost 25 gallons of liquid hashish, estimated to be worth $6 million in the U.S. Despite such increased efforts by the Afghan government, Afghan officials readily admitted they could not stop the drug trade on their own. They appealed to the international community for help. The success of drug control programs, they insisted, ultimately rested on the willingness of the international community to fund such development. 
international organizations agreed, but they insisted that Afghanistan would also have to undergo greater institutional transformations to fulfill international expectations for drug control. The UN Food and Agricultural Organization advocated a sweeping reform to Afghanistan's anti-smuggling and anti-opium laws to help it comply with the 1961 UN Single Convention. If the Afghan government complied, the UN proposed a three-year support program valued at around $2.5 million. Of that grant, $790,000 of UN Fund for Drug Abuse Control funds would be used for agricultural development, while $255,000 would be used for enforcement. Burke, of the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, with the help of U.S. Ambassador Alfred Newman, piggybacked on that international effort by creating an Afghan Narcotics Control Action Plan, with a heavy emphasis on enforcement. By 1972, the money started pouring into Afghanistan. Despite money and resources from both the UN and the US, little changed. In 1973, however, when Mohammad Daud Khan ended the Musahiban dynasty of King Zaire Shah and established the Republic of Afghanistan, the implementation of a new, more effective drug policy seemed possible. Although Daud was apparently leaning toward the Soviet Union, he embraced stricter drug control as a way to increase foreign aid for economic development and also to bolster the strength of the police and paramilitary units. Dowd made significant moves to curb the production and smuggling of opium and hash. The head of the Ministry of Interior Affairs, Faiz Mohammed, was put in charge of a new ASU. Unlike previous units, which were part of local police jurisdiction, the new ASUs were given national jurisdiction and charged primarily with stopping the drug trade. Mohammed's ASU was made up of 12 eager men, trained by UN Fund for Drug Abuse Control and U.S. experts, and would collect information and intelligence and launch covert sting operations against high-level traffickers. In many ways, the ASUs were an ideal manifestation of the U.S.'s war on drugs in Afghanistan. Even then, however, Dowd, in an effort to maintain Cold War neutrality, seemed to push back against outright cooperation with the U.S., and mainly carried out drug control through the U.N. By 1975, the ASUs seemed to be producing dividends, as evidenced by several large drug busts, including a seizure of one ton of opium. But there were other developments that hinted at the evolving nature of the drug trade in Afghanistan and the limits of the state's ability to stop it. First, heroin was increasingly prevalent in domestic drug seizures, indicating that demand for Afghan opium was moving beyond its regional market in Iran, as Iran was not a major consumer of heroin. Terry Burke had noted in 1973 that while Afghanistan did not possess the capability then to process opium to morphine base, various Afghan drug traffickers were endeavoring to do so. Furthermore, Kurdish groups were buying Afghan opium and processing it into morphine base in eastern Turkey. Moreover, the state still remained limited in its overall impact on the drug trade. Most seizures happened closer to Kabul, and trafficking continued virtually unabated in border regions. To make matters worse, cultivation seemed to be spreading as well. The growing demand for Afghan opium, in large part a consequence of the dwindling supply in Southeast Asia and Turkey, was fundamentally changing rural Afghanistan. In the Helmand Valley, where the U.S. had poured hundreds of millions of dollars into transforming the agricultural economy, opium was emerging as farmers' preferred cash crop. The consequences of this agricultural transformation would profoundly shape Afghanistan's history. The Changing Landscape of the Afghan Drug Trade The growth of the opium trade in Helmand is indicative of the multidimensional manner in which the war on drugs converged with market forces, as well as other policy objectives in Afghanistan. As efforts to curb the drug trade increased in the 1970s, so too did demand for Afghan opium, not just hashish. But Afghanistan, and Helmand especially, were undergoing a dramatic transformation in other ways that amplify this convergence of forces, for Helmand was the site of the largest American development project in the country, a project which sought to make Afghanistan a contributor to the global economy 
but also to make it a bulwark against the Soviet Union to the north. Helmand is the largest province in Afghanistan. Between the foothills to the north and the dry, arid desert to the south runs the most important geographic feature of the Helmand Valley, the Helmand River. For centuries, Afghans had tried to harness the power of the river for economic development, but it wasn't until the Americans arrived that Helmand province began to change significantly. In 1945, after the U.S. and Afghan governments formalized their diplomatic relationship, the Afghan government negotiated with the famed Morris Knutson Company, builders of the Hoover Dam and Golden Gate Bridge, to build a dam in Helmand. A few years later, $63.7 million would be spent to expand the project, including the building of the Kajakai and Argandab dams, a highway, canals, a power facility with trained technicians. By the 1950s, the project reached unprecedented proportions, even as poor management, corruption, and a wide array of political issues plagued it. For Afghans, the Helmand Project was symbolic of the future of Afghanistan. For the nation to succeed, the Helmand Project needed to succeed. Mohammad Daud Khan, who governed from 1953 to 1963 and would eventually overthrow the king in 1973, kept the Helmand Project afloat by playing the Americans and Soviets against each other. Nonetheless, even when the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, took over many of the agricultural projects in Helmand in the early 60s, problems with the program persisted. However, both the U.S. and Afghan governments had too much at stake to let the Helmand project fail. As the scholars Antonio Giustosi and Artemi Kalinovsky have noted, the political significance of it was too great for the Afghan modernizers and for the U.S. Cold Warriors to abandon Helmand. By the late 1960s and early 1970s, political issues aside, the project started to show promise. In the past, farmers in Helmand grew crops mainly for subsistence, but varieties of high-yield wheat and cotton were introduced that incentivized farmers to utilize American technology and resources to grow surplus crops in turn creating a market-based agricultural economy. Both cotton and wheat were the primary cash crops and proved to fetch a high market price for both farmers and the government. The overarching impact of introducing varieties of high-yield wheat and the expansion of cash cropping and double cropping was a profound shift in the agricultural practices of the valley, as farmers became more astute at understanding the global market and adapting their land to grow crops to maximize their profits. More important, this new profit-minded approach also meant that market-savvy farmers were increasingly aware of the value of all crops, including opium. Historically, Afghan farmers grew opium for individual needs or as a minor source of income, but it was rarely a major cash crop. In the 1960s, poppy prices were low, ranging anywhere from 1,400 to 3,600 Afghanis per kilogram, depending on the quality. Low prices were largely explained by the fact that there was a limited demand for Helmand opium, as most went not to more lucrative Western markets but to neighboring Iran, which had its own competing domestic opium supply. Even by 1970, Helmand opium, and Afghan opium in general, faced stiff competition in the regional market. Furthermore, many poppy farmers sold their opium short, essentially accepting payments before harvest, and selling for a much lower but guaranteed price. Furthermore, decent profits for farmers were rare because they had to pay out labor costs as well as bribes to government officials. Bribes often constituted the largest cost for poppy farmers and in many cases were the biggest impediment to growing more poppies. However, by the early 1970s, opium was transforming into a viable cash crop for farmers and traders in Helmand. To farmers involved in the USAID project or those who resided in close proximity, opium poppies were well suited for double cropping schemes that were a foundation of the USAID Helmand project. Farmers planted poppy seeds in the fall to harvest in the spring and then would plant cotton or vegetables and harvest them in the fall. Despite these changes, even up to 1972, for many farmers, the cost of growing opium was too high to make it a profitable business. Things changed in 1973, 
as opium began emerging as an important cash crop in the valley. In May, Bernard Weinraub of the New York Times reported that Afghan farmers are harvesting a bumper crop of opium poppies on newly irrigated land that has been developed with foreign aid. American officials are furious and embarrassed because the land was developed by the aid mission here to spur food production. Instead, farmers have grown opium because of the fast and easy profits. Weinraub's article shook the DEA, the State Department, and USAID to their core. The political optics were potentially devastating. In essence, the USAID was providing Afghan farmers with the knowledge and resources they needed to grow opium. That opium in turn would be manufactured into heroin, and that heroin would find its way into the arms of young Americans. America was not supposed to be helping drug producers, it was supposed to be destroying drug producers. Despite the fact that most opium being grown in the valley was grown outside of the USAID zone, the impact of the American aid project was undeniable. Knowledge and resources did not sit idly within the USAID project zone. Afghan farmers shared tech, knowledge, and know-how. Overall, the timing of the U.S. war on drugs could not have been more opportune for the drug trade in Afghanistan. By 1973, the global dimensions of the drug trade were changing, and the U.S. and European demand for sources of opium outside Southeast Asia, Turkey, and Mexico from drug trafficking groups was drawing the attention of Afghan farmers. Supplies from Turkey were already dwindling, even prior to the ban of opium in 1971, and many Kurdish-Turkish groups had transitioned to refining morphine base into heroin. The opium for their heroin operations was largely coming from Afghanistan. In Thailand, police efforts to stop production and trafficking pushed opium production into the Shan and Kachin regions of Myanmar, and much of the Southeast Asian opium supply was diverted into European and Australian markets. The disruption in the global supply of opium as a consequence of crop displacement, often referred to as the balloon effect, were instrumental in catalyzing the growing demand for Afghan opium. As a result, opium production increased dramatically in 1973. Some U.S. Afghan officials, after conducting aerial surveillance of the region, estimated that there was a seven-fold increase in land devoted to opium in Afghanistan to the point that they could easily identify poppy fields from an elevation of 800 feet. As opium production surged in Helmand, both U.S. drug agents and Afghan officials made new efforts to stop the province's escalating drug trade. In 1973, fearing a cessation of U.S. aid, Mohammad Daud Khan banned opium in the helmand argandab Valley Authority, Hava area, as well as in the rest of the country. Although Dowd was preparing to mobilize the ASUs to crack down on opium producers, he was reluctant to curb the trade too forcefully. The situation was complex for Dowd. A successful drug control intervention was ultimately dependent on the willingness and capability of local officials and community leaders to comply with national drug control policy. But for local officials, enforcing a national ban could cause significant economic hardship for local farmers in turn straining the already tenuous political relationship between the Afghan government and local peoples. Nonetheless, by July, Afghan officials proclaimed that opium cultivation had declined dramatically in the Haba area and in the rest of Helmand. It is important to note that evidence for this claimed crop eradication is relatively scarce. In fact, the ban seemed to play into the hands of farmers and traders eyeing even greater payouts in the future. USAID researchers noted that opium traders believed that the opium shortage caused by the ban would lead to an increase of 200 to 300 Afghanis per seer, equivalent to about 7 kilos, once government attention moved away from the region. In essence, opium farmers and traders hedged their bets, taking a loss in 1974 in hopes of a greater payout in 1975. In 1975, opium cultivation once again sprouted up in the Helmand Valley. UN narcotics advisors noted a significant increase in opium that year, with roughly 106 fields identified near Lashkargah and surrounding areas, although not in the USAID area. Dowd scrambled to get ministers and provincial governors to reimpose the ban, 
even taking U.S. money to fund a propaganda campaign against the growing of opium. By 1976, however, it seemed that the Afghan government's ability or willingness to stop drug trafficking was on the decline as well, as the country descended into political tumult. In fact, with bigger political conflicts embroiling much of the country, counter-narcotics efforts decreased rapidly, as border patrol agents and anti-drug police were no longer on the state payroll. Trying to impose a ban on opium was relatively meaningless as well, largely because local officials, whose cooperation and compliance would be necessary to ban opium, simply lacked the capacity to implement policies that challenged powerful local interests. In other words, the illicit drug trade was flourishing and the state was largely losing any ability to stop it. In 1977, the CIA estimated that the Helmand Valley produced nearly 51 tons of opium, a significant portion of the estimated total 200 to 250 tons produced throughout Afghanistan. The following year, the CIA estimated that Afghanistan and Pakistan together produced roughly 1,000 tons of opium, double the 500 tons UN officials had predicted. The war on drugs, for all of its global ambitions, could not stop Afghan opium from entering the global illicit drug market, and the consequences continue to reverberate today. Conclusion Since the late 1970s, Afghanistan has become the largest source of illicit drugs in the world. Even so, the war on Afghan drugs is still unfolding. Between 2002 and March 2018, the U.S. provided a total of $8.78 billion to combat drug production and trafficking throughout the country. Yet many questions remain unanswered. Given the early history of the war on drugs in Afghanistan, how do we understand this critical period in Afghanistan, and how does it fit into our broader understanding of the history of the drug trade and the war on drugs? Understanding this period requires a better understanding of the multiplicity of ways in which the war on drugs shaped Afghanistan, of the ways in which Afghanistan shaped it, and even the limitations of the war on drugs amid broader historical processes in Afghanistan. First, and most visibly, when Nixon launched the drug war, American efforts to suppress drugs globally were internalized in Afghanistan, largely as a means to bolster the power of the Afghan state. Throughout the 20th century, Afghan rulers created a political culture that recognized that aggressive expansion of state power would result in political upheaval from powerful rural tribal leaders, and thus opted to grow the state gradually. In turn, the Afghan government became dependent on foreign aid and international investment to grow the state. This dependence on foreign aid and investment led Afghanistan to adopt drug control laws, which were often in contradiction with local customs or realities as a vehicle of maintaining access to foreign money and resources, and most important, to maintain the culture by which the Afghan state formed. In this way, the success of the American-led war on drugs hinged on a state confined by its own political design. As the Afghan central government tried to enforce prohibitions and anti-smuggling laws to maintain access to American aid, the lack of that government's integration into its own society and the increasing resistance to centralized governance by the mid-1970s prevented any meaningful or effective form of drug control. This analysis also reveals the limitations of the war on drugs, given issues inherent in Afghan society, in particular, the impact of Kaum in perpetuating the conflict between state and local governance, which often dictated the effectiveness of drug control policies. The design of Afghan political culture reinforced the government's lack of integration into society, often elevating the importance of Kawam in determining outcomes. In effect, it was Kawam, not adherence to national policy directives, that determined outcomes. As Afghan historian Olivier Waugh notes, the state was no more than a stake in a larger game, and the strategy of a Kawam consisted in establishing an advantageous relationship with the institutions of the state. As a result, to invoke political theorist James Scott, false compliance, smuggling, aversion, and corruption were forms of both peasant and police resistance and support for local and individual concerns and interests. Lastly, 
This analysis elucidates the ways in which internationally funded economic development served not as a means of preventing the illicit drug trade, but rather of catalyzing it. Underlying much of our understanding of illicit drugs, especially that of the global south, is the notion that drugs thrive in places where development is lacking. But in Afghanistan, especially in the Helmand, development projects helped shape the future of the illicit drug trade. There are parallels here to another drug producer state, Peru. In the 1960s, massive development projects were implemented throughout Peru. But by the late 1970s, as was true in Afghanistan, the state largely failed, and in the following decades, cocaine production thrived. The convergence of these different policy objectives highlights the messy and convoluted ways in which drugs, development, and the war on drugs became increasingly interwoven. Certainly in Afghanistan, two hallmarks of the modern American international development machine, free market capitalism and drug suppression, collided to produce a multifaceted catastrophe. When Terry Burke left Afghanistan in 1973, he had little to show for his time there. But no one should blame Mr. Burke. The forces at play were far too big for the generally misguided and often counterproductive efforts of the entire U.S. government, let alone a lone drug agent, to stop. Part 5. The Alternative to War 10. Between the Free Market and the Drug War David Hertzberg this chapter explores a little-noticed aspect of American drug policy during the 1970s, a push for consumer protection in an era remembered primarily for its war on drugs. The Controlled Substances Act of 1970 was not just a drug war law, it was also designed to give regulators the power to rein in the overpromotion of sedatives and stimulants by the pharmaceutical industry and to reform medical practices warped by that overpromotion. Its passage was driven in part by consumer advocates who used anti-drug rhetoric to build the political coalitions needed to pass and then to enforce new controls on economically and politically powerful industries and professions. It was not a prohibition law. Instead, its robust regulation reduced risks in markets for pharmaceutical sedatives and stimulants that remained large. A remarkable success when compared to the catastrophic failure of the 20th century's punitive prohibition policies. The racism built into anti-drug rhetoric limited and ultimately doomed this experiment in drug policy pragmatism. But it is still worth studying as a rare and largely forgotten example of an effort to govern addictive drugs that was separated at least partially from the racialized moral crusades to which such efforts have so consistently and destructively been harnessed. Introduction In 1973, the most commonly used drug in America was not heroin or marijuana, but Valium. It was prescribed over 100 million times that year alone. Valium made a fortune for its manufacturer, Roche Pharmaceuticals. Its impact on consumers was more mixed. It undoubtedly eased a great deal of anxiety and related suffering, but it was also associated with more emergency room visits and overdoses than any other drug. Thanks to Roche's lobbying, Valium was prescription only, but faced few other sales restrictions. And thanks to Roach's marketing, prescriptions were relatively easy to come by. The boom times did not last forever, though. New restrictions were imposed in 1975, and by the end of the decade, Valium sales had declined by 50%. Emergency room visits and overdoses plummeted as well. Valium's fall was far from unique. A host of other pharmaceutical sedatives and stimulants that had dominated bestseller and overdose rankings for decades also faced new restrictions in the 1970s, accompanied by declines in drug-related harms. For some drugs, like the sedative methaquilone, best known as the love drug Quaalude, the declines were particularly steep. It was ultimately withdrawn from the market altogether. Valium's decline and Quaalude's disappearance highlight a little-noticed aspect of American drug policy during the 1970s war against drugs. As a number of historians have noticed, 
For all its warlike rhetoric, the set of policies launched by the Nixon administration at least initially included more funding for treatment than for policing and punishment. Few observers, however, have paid attention to a second complicating element of Nixon's drug war. It was waged, at least in part, against an out-of-control drug industry whose overpromotion of sedatives and stimulants had been producing a slow-motion public health crisis in the nation's legal pharmaceutical white markets for more than 30 years. It also took unprecedented aim at an asleep-at-the-wheel medical profession whose careless prescribing was central to the long-running psychoactive bull market. The Nixon administration's centerpiece drug law, the 1970s Controlled Substances Act, CSA, gave federal regulators a raft of new powers over one of America's most powerful industries and most powerful professions, curbing the party and creating, in effect, a command economy for some of the nation's most profitable products. Importantly, in this context, the CSA was not a prohibition law. White markets remained very widely accessible to consumers. They were just smaller and safer. This remarkable accomplishment makes little sense when considered only in the context of America's punitive drug wars, which, as many observers have noted, have had little positive impact on patterns of drug use or drug harms. Instead, this aspect of the CSA is best understood as belonging to the history of consumer advocacy, inheritor of a tradition of pioneering food and drug safety laws that began with the 1906 Food and Drug Act and emerging along with other third-wave consumer legislation in the 1970s, such as the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act and the Truth in Lending Act. The CSA thus highlights the way anti-drug rhetoric has been deployed for more purposes than racist prohibition. Consumer advocates have also used it to build the political coalitions needed to pass and then to enforce new controls on economically and politically powerful industries and professions. The period of regulated white markets ushered in by the CSA had serious flaws, but considered against the backdrop of drug policy failures, they may well represent the closest approximation of effective drug policy America has seen for the circulation of potentially addictive substances. Yet the racism built into anti-drug rhetoric left an indelible mark on the contours of consumer protection in the 1970s. The safer drug markets reformers built were envisioned as serving the predominantly white consumers known as patients and actually strengthened the barriers preventing other consumers from accessing white market drugs. This racialized regulatory regime was nothing new. Since the late 19th century, consumer protections for psychoactive drugs in America had been consistently predicated on their status as medicines. Good, or at least better, drug policy is one of the many racial privileges white drug consumers have enjoyed, at least occasionally, in a history dominated by prohibition and two free markets. This chapter surveys this mostly forgotten, limited, yet effective side of 1970s drug policy. It explores battles between Big Pharma and a range of federal and state agencies tasked with restraining it. These battles took place everywhere from the intensely local, where physicians and pharmacists navigated between drug marketers and suddenly zealous medical and pharmacy boards, to the national level, where the new DEA confronted industry resistance as it upscheduled what it considered to be the most dangerous drugs. Such efforts provide an important historical example of a path not taken for drug policy more generally, regulation and safer markets rather than prohibition. Exploring them requires bringing questions of race into pharmaceutical history, an area of scholarship where, unlike drug history, it has not traditionally been a central area of focus. We know more about how drug policy has been used to police racialized, marginalized populations than we do about how pharmaceutical policy has sometimes been used to protect privileged populations. Examining the drug policies possible within white markets provides a real-world, practical model to aspire to as we attempt to disentangle the urgent need to regulate highly desirable, highly profitable, and highly dangerous products from the multifarious social hierarchies to which that need has been unnecessarily and destructively harnessed.
consumer advocacy and the passage of the CSA, pharmaceuticals and third wave consumer advocacy. As they had been in the progressive era and the New Deal, pharmaceuticals were an important area of focus during the third wave of consumer advocacy in the 1960s and 1970s. Big Pharma made a tempting target. Despite the introduction of miracle drugs like antibiotics, the pharmaceutical industry found itself on the defensive by the mid-1950s as a series of scandals revealed astonishing profits, price-fixing, hidden drug risks, and questionable marketing tactics. Hoping to capitalize on the situation, anti-monopolist crusader Tennessee Senator Estes Kefauver convened high-profile hearings on pharmaceuticals that produced a new wave of media exposés of high prices and dubious benefits. Kefauver's success did not go unnoticed by newly elected President John F. Kennedy, eager for ways to deliver on his campaign promises of dynamic and muscular government. His consumer's bill of rights included prescription drugs among the poorly regulated products needing new protections. Soon enough, the Kefauver-Harris amendments, passed in 1962 in the wake of the thalidomide crisis, gave consumer advocates one of their first federal victories. The new law gave the FDA authority to require proof of effectiveness before drugs could be marketed, and for the first time, authority to regulate the content of advertising to physicians. These consumerist victories breathed new life into a long-standing, largely fruitless federal quest to rein in barbiturate goofballs and amphetamine thrill pills. Potentially addictive drugs had long been among the best-selling and most profitable products of a mighty pharmaceutical industry. In the late 19th century, sellers of so-called patent medicines had competed with ethical pharmaceutical companies in their eagerness to sell opioids and cocaine. As sales of that first generation of addictive blockbuster drugs receded in the early 20th century, reputable pharmaceutical houses fueled a boom in barbiturate sedatives starting in the 1920s and amphetamine in the 1940s and 1950s. Even as the sedative and stimulant craze crested in the 1950s, New minor tranquilizers like Milltown and eventually Librium and Valium pushed sales even higher, well into the 1960s. The incredible popularity of sedatives and stimulants, and of opioids before them, was no pharmaceutical industry conspiracy. Humans across cultures and times have sought and used psychoactive drugs to relieve suffering and pursue pleasure. But like other potentially harmful products, Drugs can be sold in ways that increase or decrease risk to consumers. By 1970, drug companies had been over-promoting benefits while downplaying risks, including addiction, for a solid 50 years, delivering colossal profits but making it difficult for physicians and patients to make informed choices. Despite the many public health consequences of that 50-year boondoggle, efforts to rein in white markets for sedatives and stimulants had largely failed. By the 1950s, pharmaceuticals were one of America's most powerful industries. Its lobbyists rarely lost battles in Washington, D.C. or in most state houses. It was often difficult to persuade legislators to impose new restraints on profitable industries, and never more so than during the pro-business 1950s. Increased controls over narcotics, including medical opioids as well as illegal dope, were an exception to this rule. In that case, the reform agenda had been supported by moral crusaders' simultaneous campaign against dope fiends. But such racialized drug panics, with their dark criminals terrorizing or worse enslaving white women, were a poor fit with white markets. Reformers' more nuanced stories of badly needed medicines that could, in some circumstances, be misused by respectable, innocent consumers were not enough on their own to overcome the pharmaceutical lobby. The emergence of third-wave consumer advocacy, however, gave new power to stories of innocence wronged by ruthless, profit-mad corporations. Drug companies, it turned out, made an excellent boogeyman in the eyes of the public and their political representatives. Drug reformers hammered home drug companies' amoral avarice in the testimony they gave before Congress. As one testified, 
There is no limit to the efforts they, drug companies, will expend to suppress information concerning the addiction liability or misuse of dangerous drugs. Thanks to liberal victories in the 1964 elections, this consumerist argument was quite effective, even without much help from anti-drug moral crusaders. In 1965, Congress passed a Drug Abuse Control Act designed primarily to protect consumers by regulating major commercial actors, rather than to punish dope fiends. Sellers were now required to keep records of all transactions. Pharmacists could not refill a prescription without a physician's written permission, and refills were limited to a maximum of five. The FDA was empowered to add new drugs to the law without congressional approval. Companies could protest and force formal hearings on such a determination, but the final decision lay with the FDA and its chosen pharmacological experts, not with Congress. One should not oversell the Drug Abuse Control Act. The new market regulations were relatively weak. Perhaps more importantly, the act was the product of a political coalition that also included traditional anti-drug crusaders. Not in the driver's seat, as they traditionally had been when it came to psychoactive substances, but still a crucial ally needed to overcome pharmaceutical industry lobbying. This coalition was possible because consumer advocates were perfectly willing to criminalize informal, i.e. non-medical markets, whose customers they did not recognize as consumers. As a result, one of the law's main provisions created a new agency within the FDA, the Bureau of Drug Abuse Control, which could field armed agents to investigate and shut down illicit traffic. The Controlled Substances Act The consumer advocacy movement was still building momentum in the later 1960s and early 1970s, and pharmaceutical companies continued to be an important area of focus. A new generation of investigative reporters published a steady stream of damning reports on pharmaceutical industry misconduct. New advocacy groups like the Ralph Nader-affiliated Health Research Group and, more specifically, the Task Force on Prescription Drugs provided research data and expert witnesses. Grassroots activist groups, especially among second-wave feminists, grabbed headlines with investigations like Barbara Seaman's birth control pill expose, The Doctor's Case Against the Pill, 1970. This drug reform work was taken up at the federal level by politicians eager to burnish their consumer advocate bona fides. Senators Birch Bayh, Gaylord Nelson, and Edward Kennedy, for example, convened a series of congressional hearings into pharmaceutical company behavior throughout the 1970s. Sedatives and stimulants featured prominently in these hearings, in part because they were one place where liberal consumer advocates could garner support from conservative drug warriors. Amphetamines were on the docket in 1971 and again in 1972 and 1976, Barbiturates in 1971, 1972, and 1973, Quaalude sedatives in 1973, Psychotropics in 1978, Valium and Darvon in 1979. All were interspersed with a range of more targeted congressional investigations of pharmaceutical advertising, pricing, and other issues. Drug reformers depended on the CSA to implement their agenda. Congress passed this law in 1970 using the 1965 Drug Abuse Control Act in part as a template. While the CSA is best known as the centerpiece of America's drug wars, it actually served two major purposes by repealing America's welter of existing drug laws and rewriting them into a single unified law that controlled both narcotics, previously covered by the 1914 Harrison Narcotics Tax Act, and dangerous drugs, previously covered by the Drug Abuse Control Act. The law also unified enforcement by moving it into a single location in the Justice Department. Congress passed the unification bill at a moment of unprecedented turmoil in American drug policy. Traditionally, moral crusaders had dominated drug policy in the United States. They supported laws to contain threats they perceived as emanating from racialized or immigrant urban communities. Other reformers, such as public health professionals, actively pursued drug regulation, but they were passengers on the train, not the engineers.
In the 1970s, however, the politics of drug reform and drug regulation had grown more complex. Moralistic drug warriors had certainly not gone away, but they were no longer in complete control of the train. A relatively new group, linked to health professionals who specialized in the treatment of drug addiction, had joined the drug debate. This group, which I call addiction medicalizers, overwhelmingly rejected criminal justice approaches to addiction. Addiction medicalizers found an unexpected ally in pharmaceutical industry lobbyists who discovered their own sudden opposition to warlike prohibitionist drug policy. The pharmaceutical industry's sudden alliance with addiction medicalizers was motivated by outspoken consumer advocates whose influence and anti-corporate posture had only grown stronger since the 1965 Drug Abuse Control Act. These consumer advocates had ripped into the pharmaceutical industry at the congressional hearings on the bill that ultimately became the CSA. They pinpointed instance after instance of corporate greed, putting the pharmaceutical industry witnesses on the defensive. They made a clear and compelling call for more robust regulation of the industry. A majority of Congress was moved by their testimony. It seems to me, mused Connecticut Senator Thomas Dodd, Every once in a while I am reading in the paper about some drug that has been peddled to the public, and a year or two later somebody comes along and says it is a very bad thing. Sedatives and stimulants were obviously dangerous drugs, he continued. Why in the world can we allow producers to make them by the millions and peddle them wherever they want to? Frankly, joined in one representative, I'm weary of watching good kids suspended from high schools and even junior high schools in my district because government cannot or will not crack down on the big drug houses. Legislators were asked by the consumer advocates to consider such aggressive reforms as eliminating all advertising for addictive drugs and placing restrictions on physicians' therapeutic decision-making. If doctors will not control their colleagues' misuse of prescribing powers, Dodd argued, Someone else should. Even industry allies warned that the writing was on the wall. This is the year of the consumer legislation, one corporate-friendly legislator warned a reluctant witness from Eli Lilly, one of a parade of industry figures hauled before the committees during the hearings. I am a great believer in private enterprise, and I want to keep it that way, but public demand works its nefarious way sometimes, so I suggest that you cooperate with the committee. When the dust settled and Congress passed the CSA in 1970, American drug policy moved in a new and unprecedented direction. Thanks to addiction medicalizers, and in part their pharmaceutical industry backers, the new law weakened criminal punishments and expanded treatment options for informal market consumers. Thanks to consumer advocates, and in part their drug warrior allies, it introduced robust oversight of all addictive white market pharmaceuticals. Much has been written about the former, the all-too-brief easing of the punitive drug war. The remainder of this chapter examines the latter, a remarkable if flawed and limited experiment in regulating addictive drugs to allow safe consumption. Federal Story Reigning in Big Pharma Profits the 1970 CSA imposed unparalleled control over psychoactive pharmaceuticals. It created a closed system, offering manufacturers, distributors, prescribers, and pharmacists access to a highly profitable market in return for their adherence to a strict set of rules based on the public good that would place real limits on that profitability. Traditionally, drug companies had circumvented restrictions by discovering new products that, they claimed, did not suffer from older problems of addiction and overdose. But the new CSA shut down this option, requiring that new sedatives and stimulants be screened for addiction potential by a committee of the National Research Council before, not after, they went on the market. Anyone involved in the newly regulated white markets had to register with federal authorities, first the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, then the DEA, and keep records of all transactions. They also had to ensure that their sales were intended to benefit consumers, that is, according to the logic of the day, that they were for legitimate medical purposes. Importantly, 
company's self-policing was supplemented by federal surveillance, as the DEA, taking a page from the drug industry's own increasingly sophisticated market analysis tools, began to make effective use of the vast troves of data produced by its record-keeping requirements. The central innovation was a new program called ARCOS, Automation of Reports and Consolidated Order Systems. Sales records from manufacturers, distributors, pharmacies, hospitals, and dispensing physicians, including information about the purchaser and the amount purchased, were fed into computers, which then cross-referenced them to provide overall snapshots of the market. These snapshots could identify potential new drug fads as they developed, drawing attention to a product earlier in its life cycle. They also identified physicians and pharmacists who purchased in unusually high volumes, allowing authorities to investigate the situation at an earlier stage. Participating in this closed, highly surveilled market meant accepting a range of profit-dampening constraints. Pharmaceutical companies and distributors had to implement a variety of costly safeguards measures to protect their supply chains. Restricting sales to legitimate medical purposes meant more than selling only to other properly registered parties. It also meant a legal obligation to be skeptical of, report, and perhaps even refuse what, in other kinds of commerce, would be cause for celebration, unusually large or frequent sales. This was a particularly bitter pill, since it is a rule of thumb that holds particularly true for addictive substances that 80% of sales come from 20% of the customers. Meanwhile, the FDA pushed against advertising of both stimulants and sedatives for everyday or minor life stresses, diminishing access to one of the most profitable strategies pharmaceutical companies used to grow their customer base. Pharmaceutical companies also suffered from the simple fact that physicians had to register for a special DEA license. This registration requirement might not seem like much of a problem. The DEA had no power to refuse any licensed physician. Pharmaceutical marketing departments were acutely aware, however, that even relatively minor obstacles meant steep declines in sales because of the inconvenience, because they signaled the need for extra caution, and because they reminded prescribers that authorities were watching over their behavior. The limits imposed on drugs in stricter schedules were even more stringent. Prescriptions for Schedule II drugs, which included all the stronger opioids, could not be refilled at all. Every new sale required a new prescription. Even more importantly, the CSA modernized and expanded a practice that had previously been applied only to opioids and cocaine limiting the overall volume of production to the nation's legitimate medical need, as determined by a federal control board. This federally determined limit placed a powerful break on sales growth while also giving federal authorities important leverage. They decided how much of the total market each company would be allotted, based, among other things, on their track record of good behavior. The government-mandated production quota system had a real impact on sales. Federal authorities reduced the annual quota for amphetamine by 80% from 1969 to 1971, for example. Three of the most dangerous barbiturates in methoquilone, a non-barbiturate sedative whose brand name Quaaludes had gained a passionate following and a reputation as the love drug among counterculture youth, went into Schedule II in 1973. As manufacturing quotas dropped for these upscheduled sedatives, sales fell by nearly half for the three barbiturates and by 80% for methoquilone. Because of the CSA's hybrid status as both regulatory and criminal law, pharmaceutical companies faced real punishments for transgressions, including jail time for willful and knowing avoidance of record-keeping responsibilities or failure to take steps to prevent diversion. This criminal culpability was particularly notable because, due to the influence of addiction medicalizers, the CSA actually decreased criminal penalties for most informal market drug infractions. Here was a different kind of drug war. The CSA trained more of its firepower on regulating industry than it did on policing dope fiends. State Story 
regulating the health professions. In addition to new rules hemming in pharmaceutical industry practices, the CSA also served as the centerpiece for a new system regulating physicians and pharmacists, the retail level of psychoactive white markets. This regulatory regime was particularly remarkable for the restrictions it placed on physicians, who had long enjoyed unparalleled professional self-governance and therapeutic autonomy. The federal government had, it is true, long regulated opioid prescribing, but these restrictions were only spottily enforced, and other psychoactive medicines were governed only by prescription-only rules, established in the late 1930s, which placed no limits on physicians' decision-making. Moreover, the rules were primarily enforced by state medical and pharmacy boards, who tended to see little benefit in overzealous policing of their members. Thus, physicians were left with few alternative sources of guidance other than pharmaceutical company marketing campaigns. It was a wonderfully efficient setup for pharmaceutical companies who could reach a consumer base of millions by concentrating their attention on the much smaller number of physician prescribers who made the real decisions. The result was a seemingly never-ending rise in sedative and stimulant prescriptions. The CSA ushered in new constraints on this marketing-driven medical bonanza. For one thing, it imposed limits on the purposes for which Schedule II drugs could be legitimately prescribed. Opioids had long faced such limits. For example, they were mostly not allowed to treat chronic pain. Starting in the 1970s, amphetamines faced similar restrictions. In 1970, the FDA announced that amphetamines could only be properly labeled for use to treat narcolepsy, hyperkinesis, minimal brain dysfunction, and obesity, short-term only. These limits became more robust after 1971, when the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs upscheduled amphetamine and amphetamine-like stimulants from Schedule III to Schedule II. In 1973, the FDA held hearings to consider eliminating obesity as a legitimate use, and in 1979, they actually did so. Of course, these new restraints would mean little if they were not enforced. But in the wake of the CSA, and driven by the new political passion for consumer advocacy, state authorities finally began to regulate physicians and pharmacists. Forty-two states passed Uniform Controlled Substances Acts, which, among other things, required dedicated agencies for drug control. Many states created their own Interagency Controlled Substances Board, CSB, or a Diversion Investigation Unit. Often funded by federal grants from the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, state diversion investigation units were designed to consolidate what had been scattered and uncoordinated, and in some instances non-existent oversight of addictive pharmaceuticals. The first units were established in 1972 in Texas, Michigan, and Alabama. Ten more states had followed their lead by 1977. Wisconsin's state authorities kept unusually good records, allowing us to take a closer look at how these new tactics worked in practice. This state passed its Uniform Controlled Substances Act in 1972 and appointed a new agency, a CSB, to administer it. This CSB included representatives from the pharmacy and medical boards, as well the Department of Justice, the Bureau of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse, a range of other state agencies, as well as area DEA agents. A good example of the CSB in action came in the spring of 1976, when, after consulting with the state medical and pharmacy boards, the board requested ARCOS data on purchases of Wisconsin's most popular amphetamine, Penwalt's Bifetamine 20. The result more than justified the inquiry. Arcos statistics revealed that just 26 of the state's 9,500 licensed physicians had bought 71% of all Bifetamine 20 in 1975, and just four individual practitioners were responsible for the vast majority of that 71%. The numbers were similar for pharmacies. Less than 5% of the state's pharmacies bought nearly one-half of all bifetamine. When pharmacy sales were traced back to the prescribing physicians, it revealed the same pattern. In Milwaukee County, for example, just eight physicians had prescribed 82% of all bifetamine doses sold. 
Based on these and other data, the CSB convened all relevant state agencies for a symposium on drug diversion, setting the stage for a dramatic change in policy by the state medical board. The most common use of amphetamines or other stimulants, weight loss, was banned. The drug could only be prescribed for narcolepsy, hyperkinesis, drug-induced brain dysfunction, epilepsy, or, in rare cases, depression. The changes were immediately followed by a dragnet operation to investigate physicians who dispensed or prescribed unusually large volumes of stimulants. Within three years, the CSB had opened over 30 investigations, each of which began with a form letter asking for detailed information about and justification for unusual orders of scheduled substances. The most common type of investigation involved older physicians whose prescribing practices had been forged during white market boom decades and who, for a variety of reasons, resisted new constraints. Some insisted on their professional autonomy, like the small-town doctor who, claiming to have ladies who need these pills for pep, raged that, I'll go underground, or you'll see a big jump in the narcolepsy cases around here, and even threatened to stymie authorities by burning his own office to destroy his records. Others were simply naive and had a difficult time saying no when the patients request drugs. What these old-fashioned prescribers had in common was that they sold without safeguards to protect consumers from the risks associated with sedatives and stimulants. The would-be arsonist doctor, for example, defended prescribing dexedrine, amphetamine, for a case of tinnitus, ringing in the ears. I can't see any danger, he said. I doubt that anybody can get addicted to it. They get addicted to aspirin much more than they do that. He was quite open about prescribing stimulants for tired housewife syndrome or for women who are slightly tired in the morning. You would be surprised how this works with some of the housewives with four kids, and it also keeps them from eating between meals, and they get mad at their kids. I think they used them as a crutch once in a while, too. They get their weight down to level, but they got to like the drug, and they will probably use it to keep the weight down but they also do feel better, and they get their work done. He also prescribed and dispensed a range of sedatives and opioids with similar lack of concern or even awareness of their potential risks. Such sales transformed the CSA's flawed system of consumer protection into a monopolistic free market. Physicians had a monopoly on legal sales, but faced no requirement to inform their patients of risks or advise them on how to use safely. Another physician, distraught after a chronic pain patient he had weaned off narcotics committed suicide, decided to treat patients with chemical dependency, even though he had no training to do so. With no training and having become a soft touch, in practice this meant prescribing whatever sedatives, stimulants, and opioids were requested by a rapidly growing group of addicted patients. He wrote five prescriptions for stimulants and quaalude to an undercover agent, including one for her boyfriend, a bartender who, she admitted, sold pills, dispensed them over the bar, and took them. The doctor responded by advising them that, I wouldn't take the Ritalin and the quaalude to the same pharmacy. They are like uppers and downers. Now, don't get reckless and sell it to some of the wrong persons, he continued. I'd be upset if you sold to someone you didn't know. Needless to say, no medical examination or medical advice was involved in the transaction. In another case, he prescribed both Percodan and Valium, probably 50 or 60 at a time every two or three weeks, for a patient with heroin addiction. That drug combination is particularly dangerous, but there is little sign that the physician warned the patient or was even aware of the danger. However unhappy these physicians may have been to be subjected to medical board discipline, neither of them faced the kind of punishment endemic to American drug wars. Alternate, however unhappy these physicians may have been to be subjected to medical board discipline, neither of them faced the kind of punishment endemic to American drug wars. The board initially let off the self-proclaimed housewife's friend with a warning, for example, 
and when, as he promised, he refused to change his practice, the board revoked his controlled substances license, to be returned if he stayed out of trouble for five years. He continued to practice medicine. The soft touch came out worse. At first, his controlled substances license was revoked, but after he continued to prescribe, using a false DEA registration number, he was convicted in federal court, served 90 days in county jail, was put on probation for two years, and had his medical license revoked by the board. Such punishments were an outlier. Most cases were dropped, either when the physician provided an adequate explanation for their unusual prescribing patterns or agreed to change their habits. Undergirding these free prescribers and the relatively rational response they could expect from state authorities was a racial logic that interpreted patients' whiteness as a proxy for safety. White physicians, in other words, tended to assume that addiction was primarily a problem of racial minorities and thus gave the benefit of a doubt to their white patients. One physician, deemed a naive, easy touch by the board, for example, refused to prescribe amphetamines for dieters on welfare, a highly recognizable racist stereotype at the time. For them, he said, I recommend cutting their welfare benefits to force them to reduce weight. The housewife's friend reassured the board that there was no black market for pills in his tiny town. There are some drugs, but nothing like the city. State authorities tended to sympathize with these doctors' racist rhetoric and prescribing patterns. They gave the same race-bound benefit of a doubt to these white physicians as the physicians gave to their white patients. This racial logic can be seen most directly in a case that is an exception that proves the rule. In this case, a white physician had moved from a small town to set up a practice in a predominantly black neighborhood in Milwaukee. When his too free prescribing attracted the attention of the medical board and the local media, he was frank in laying the blame. God bless the Democratic Party, the addict's friend, he said, before proceeding to explain that he was too scared to refuse to prescribe for his black patients because he might get hit with some kind of thing about not treating all people equally, etc., etc., etc. You know, civil rights and all that business. But not all people are equal. You know, some of them are really out to con you. As if trying to make sure his questioner recognized the racial logic, he became even more explicit. I've never seen anything like I've seen in Milwaukee, this used to be a nice, quiet German-Polish town. You had your beer and your kraut and everything went smoothly. Well, walk down Walnut Street with that idea in your mind and blow it. This town has really gone wild. You know, the amount of drug addiction is just incredible. In his view, physicians were the victim in the situation. All he had done was acknowledge racial reality and act accordingly. The board was relatively sympathetic to his complaints, eventually imposing a limited license suspension for six months. He could still see existing patients, but could prescribe only for inpatient care and could not prescribe Schedule II substances at all. While these light punishments of physicians might seem outrageous in comparison to the heavy sentences meted out to informal market pushers, it is important to recognize that it was the drug war, not the medical board, that was out of line. A license to sell psychoactive drugs is a valuable commodity, and the medical board was not wrong to see it as leverage to force sellers to be responsible. With few exceptions, the new policies had the intended effect, not ruining misprescribers' lives, but guiding them towards safer prescribing. For amphetamine, this meant drastic declines in overall sales, a 97% drop in just two years. Only those tiny few physicians who repeatedly refused to accept guidance faced criminal penalties. Meanwhile, consumers themselves faced no new penalties, and those with addiction had expanded options for treatment. Other States Many other states took steps similar to Wisconsin's, Illinois, for example, took action after the State Medical Society warned in 1973 that a what's-the-use attitude among regulatory agencies had led to a plague of quasi-legitimate drug markets for weight control, 
the nervous housewife, the insomniac businessman. In 1975, Illinois legislators amended the State Medical Practice Act to create a new medical coordinator, supported by six full-time investigators and adequate funding. A diversion investigation unit was established two years later. State agencies began to computerize triplicate prescription records so that they could identify and contact high-volume prescribers. In 1975 alone, this led to 13 high-profile disciplinary actions. As one official noted proudly, the state boards were no longer just a conduit for licenses, but a true consumer-oriented regulatory agency. The state also implemented new safeguards, such as requiring triplicate prescriptions for Schedule II barbiturates. Many other states set up similar regulatory safeguards. Utah's state medical board acted against amphetamine in 1970. Maryland ended amphetamine use for obesity in 1972. Ten other states joined them by the end of the decade. Many state medical boards began to comply for the first time with American Medical Association requests for information about disciplinary actions. In 1970, 35 state pharmacy boards had formal arrangements to share information with federal drug surveillance networks. California, long among the most cooperative of states when it came to drug enforcement, set up its own diversion investigation teams and computerized prescription and sales surveillance in 1971. New Jersey formed a diversion investigation unit in 1974 and sharply increased its oversight of physician prescribing. Doctors are recognizing that the board is not here to protect them, Medical Economics reported. Its responsibility is to protect the consumers, and it is showing that it takes that responsibility seriously. Virginia was proud enough of its own stepped-up enforcement actions that it began to circulate a newsletter, Board Briefs, which devoted most of its front page to disciplinary actions and investigations. Many other states circulated notices of their recent actions, as did the Federation of State Medical Boards in its monthly Board Action Report. Evaluating the CSA Regime CSA worked for white markets. Why? Stepped-up federal restrictions and state enforcement led to real changes in white markets for sedatives and stimulants. For the first time since the late 19th century, the overall volume of white market sedative and stimulant sales declined. Amphetamines plummeted by a factor of 10, from 4 billion pills in 1969 to 400 million in 1972, and then fell even further when new restrictions were imposed later in the decade. Sedative sales dropped by half between 1973 and 1983. Notably, this white market contraction was accompanied by a decline in fatal overdoses and other drug-related harms. In the decade after 1976, for example, emergency room visits involving sedatives fell by a remarkable two-thirds. Stimulant-related ER visits, already low by 1976, dropped an additional 20%. Even pharmaceutical opioids were affected, with ER visits dropping by half, or in some cases two-thirds. Given the long and almost entirely discouraging history of supply-side drug policies, these data are a marvelous mystery. When legal supplies are cut off, people who want to use drugs, especially people with addiction, turn to more dangerous, illegal, unregulated supplies. Why did this not happen when authorities restricted white market supplies in the 1970s? The answer is that not all supply-side policies are created equal. The best-known supply-side policy is punitive prohibition the criminalization of a substance, its sellers, and its consumers. This approach has given supply-side policies their bad name. It is ineffective for any imaginable goal of drug policy, but all too brutally effective in policing racialized and marginalized groups. The CSA's pharmaceutical controls, however, featured a different sort of supply-side policy, one based at least partly on principles of consumer protection quite different from prohibition. The first and most important feature of the consumer protection approach was that it did not prohibit sales and use. Sedatives and stimulants remained available to a much greater extent than, say, morphine had in the aftermath of the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act. 
So-called pill mills and dope doctors were part of this continued availability, providing consumers with quality-assured, brand-named products, if few other consumer protections. But such pharmaceutical gray markets were a last resort that most white market consumers found unnecessary. All sedatives, for example, remained medically available in the 1970s, and despite new regulatory pressures, no legal limit existed on how long a physician could prescribe for a patient. Unlike under the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act, in other words, it was not illegal for physicians to maintain a person addicted to sedatives. Instead, 1970s reforms made sedative white markets safer in two other ways. First, new red tape and new professional norms helped reduce casual prescribing that unnecessarily exposed patients to the risk of addiction. Refill limits, for example, meant that deliberate decisions had to be made before allowing long-term use. They did not make such use illegal. Second, federal and state controls shifted markets toward the safest sedatives by imposing stricter controls over more dangerous drugs. Thus, for example, short-acting barbiturates and quaaludes were placed in Schedule II in the early 1970s, helping to shift markets towards safer benzodiazepines such as Valium that remained in Schedule IV. Valium was not free of risk, of course, and as it came to dominate sedative markets, it had its turn atop lists of ER visits and fatal overdoses. Nonetheless, Benzodiazepines were the safest of the sedatives, and their dominance could be considered a real, if imperfect, public health success. Intriguing but speculative evidence that drug availability was an important part of policy successes in the 1970s can be found in the counterexample of amphetamine. At first, amphetamine's story was similar to that of sedatives. New controls restricted but did not prohibit sales and use. By the mid-1970s, however, when authorities became both dissatisfied with the rate of decline in prescribing and concerned about growing informal use among counterculture youth, stricter federal and state controls were imposed that came much closer to outright prohibition. As it happens, that moment coincided almost precisely with the return of a fully criminalized drug that had long been marginal in American society, cocaine. Granted, First-time cocaine users tended to be fairly young, the average age being in the early 20s, but otherwise their demographics matched those of pharmaceutical white markets. It is important not to overstate this link. The return of transnational cocaine commodity chains to U.S. informal markets occurred for many reasons and can be more than adequately explained without reference to amphetamine restrictions. It nonetheless remains a suggestive development worth further exploration. Finally, in evaluating the success of 1970s reforms, it is important not to forget one central aspect of the era's broader drug policy, a massive investment in addiction treatment that dramatically expanded its availability. The work of addiction medicalizers succeeded in the late 1960s and early 1970s in prompting the federal government and many states to shift emphasis and funding from punishing drug consumers to providing them with addiction treatment programs. True, treatment during these years was problematic in any number of ways, from the predominance of ineffective or even punitive abstinence-only approaches to unequal accessibility along lines of class and race. Even so, it is significant that the absolute scale of increased treatment capacity, especially for relatively privileged white market consumers, was probably larger than the total contraction of white market drug availability. And in at least one way, the treatment surge actually expanded white markets. Methadone maintenance became accessible to at least some poorer, non-white and addicted consumers who had never had access to legal opioids before. The CSA also reinforced the harmful architecture of the drug war. However well it worked for white markets, the CSA regime remained a sharply limited and deeply flawed policy. These limits and flaws stemmed from a common source, the continued importance of drug warriors in the political coalition that developed and helped lobby for the CSA. Their influence had diminished from earlier decades, but they were still useful allies, and consumer advocates were glad for their help in facing down the pharmaceutical industry. 
For their part, drug warriors were happy to find at least one place where their policing and punishment approach had not fallen out of favor. Beyond this tactical alliance, however, lay a deeper affinity. Consumer advocates, and addiction medicalizers for that matter, still shared moral crusaders' complete opposition to non-medical drug use. Other than the relatively meager and punitively regulated expansion of white market methadone, the CSA regime was designed to shrink access to safe drug markets for all consumers other than patients, an exclusion fraught with race and class implications. Rational and compassionate drug policy was something imagined relevant only for the presumptively white consumers who supposedly desired health, not pleasure. The impact of this restricted imagination can be seen in two nearly unanimous compromises built into the CSA. The continued criminalization of even small-scale drug pushers and the premise that all non-medical drug use was drug abuse. President Nixon set the anti-pusher tone when he introduced the bill. However far the addict himself may fall, Nixon told Congress, his offenses against himself and society do not compare with the inhumanity of these who make a living exploiting the weakness and desperation of their fellow men. For them, Nixon continued, society has few judgments too severe, few penalties too harsh. Here, Unlike in other areas, Nixon met with no opposition. Pushers had no defenders in Congress. As a result, the federal law's penalties were built around a simple divide between sellers and consumers. As noted earlier, consumers fared relatively well under the CSA. Simple possession was illegal if knowing or intentional, but penalties had been reduced from their 1950s-era peak a maximum of one year imprisonment and a $5,000 fine for a first offense, which courts could replace with probation. Youths under 21 could then have their records expunged. For pushers, however, penalties were much more severe. Even a first offense could bring up to 15 years imprisonment and a fine of $25,000. The distinction between sellers and consumers, however, made practical sense only in white markets where sellers were easily identifiable corporations, physicians, and pharmacists. In informal markets, the line was far harder to draw because people with addiction so often also sold drugs to support their habits. Moreover, a white market consumer could legitimately keep a month's supply of a drug, while possession of even a relatively small amount of illicit drugs was evidence of intent to sell. Finally, even simple possession did not mean the same thing in both markets. To be illegal, simple possession had to be knowing and intentional. As we have seen, white market consumers had long been able to claim ignorance and argue that they were just following physicians' orders. Informal market consumers could make no such claims. Possession itself was evidence of a crime. In multiple ways, then, this key compromise, protecting consumers but punishing pushers, undermined the Controlled Substances Act's challenge to the bad drug, good medicine divide. Congress's second key decision to define all non-medical use of controlled substances as abuse had similar consequences. This definition was no minor element of the law. Indeed, the schedule was almost entirely structured around the assumed desirability of medical use and the assumed undesirability of non-medical use. The criteria for determining where to schedule a drug included the potential for dependence and abuse, but also whether the drug had a currently accepted medical use in treatment in the United States. The public health catastrophe in white markets had seriously weakened the case for such criteria. Conclusion The CSA was a complex achievement that contained the tools to pursue contradictory agendas. We are familiar with one of those agendas, a punitive campaign to police and control urban racial minorities carried out under the aegis of a war against drugs and addiction. This chapter has highlighted a lesser-known agenda a regulatory campaign to make psychoactive drugs more safely available to white market consumers by limiting corporate profit. 
Historically, in the 1970s, these two agendas were different sides of the same coin. Racialized fears of addiction were an important political tool in achieving sensible white market safeguards. Creating safer white markets so that patients could enjoy access meant further penalizing non-medical sales to junkies. Initially, the dominance of consumer advocacy and addiction medicalization kept the two agendas in some sort of uneasy balance. Moral crusaders, however, had the greater victory, continually building up the law's punitive elements and chipping away at corporate regulations, until by the early 2000s, both medical and informal markets were in the midst of their deepest crises yet, a prescription drug-driven opioid crisis and a racialized mass incarceration driven in part by drug arrests. This crisis does not invalidate the original 1970s reforms, quite the opposite. It was a terrible consequence of having slowly abandoned them. That the two agendas were inextricable in the 1970s does not mean that we can never disentangle them. If we reject the racial logic that separated largely white patients, seen as health-seeking innocents, from other, less socially favored consumers, seen as thrill-seeking junkies, we can catch a glimpse of a different kind of drug policy. The CSA of 1970 accepted widespread use of potentially addictive drugs, but robustly regulated sales to limit the malign influence of corporate profit and to protect and fully inform consumers. Consumers who developed addiction despite protections faced not punishment but expanded treatment options, including, for many, the option to continue using the drug to which they had become addicted. Distracted by culturally loaded terms like patients and addicts, we have been slow to recognize that this approach worked and reluctant to even imagine applying it broadly for all drug consumers. Given the disastrous failure of the alternatives, it is time to start imagining. 11. The Pharma Cartel Kathleen Friedel even as the United States government waged a fierce and punitive war on drugs, a catastrophic epidemic of opioid addiction ravaged the nation. This epidemic resulted from a systemic failure in U.S. government regulation of the pharmaceutical industry, particularly by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Under both Democratic and Republican administrations, a failed neoliberal approach to drug regulation oversight produced a national tragedy. Neoliberalism has undermined democracy for 40 years. Joseph Stiglitz, 2019 most Americans blame Purdue Pharma, makers of the oxycodone painkiller OxyContin, for the opioid crisis in the United States. They have good reason. Since 2012, illegal drugs like heroin have driven the rate of increase in opioid overdose deaths. But this surge in illegal drug use was the successor to, and in many ways dependent on, the initial phase of the opioid crisis the oversupply and overprescribing of legal opioids. In 2019, researchers conducting statistical analysis found that those states more exposed to OxyContin when it was first released suffered higher rates of drug overdose deaths than those with less exposure, effects that persisted for many years. Meanwhile, thousands of Americans still fatally overdose on legal opioids, and do so at five times the rate they did in 1999, before what is typically regarded as the opioid crisis began in earnest. Whether considered from the perspective of initiating illegal opioid use, or from one of driving the oversupply and overprescribing of legal ones, OxyContin is the most compelling point of origin for the worst drug crisis in U.S. history. This is in part because the drug's original formulation presented an attractive target for misuse. As a single-entity drug, unadulterated with other active components that make snorting or injection less attractive, OxyContin offered illicit users a superior option, resulting in heavy diversion to underground markets. Purdue Pharma primed the pump for this illicit channel with an unprecedented marketing campaign for OxyContin, 
targeting physicians and other prescribers with well-calibrated and often misleading pitches regarding the drug's safety, including the ability of the drug's extended-release technology to work on anyone, and for the advertised length of time. In fact, officials at Purdue Pharma did more and much worse than that. When submitting OxyContin for Food and Drug Administration FDA approval, the company minimized or withheld data that cast doubt on its extended release technology. Before and after the drug's release, Purdue ignored reports of abuse of OxyContin, discarding its legal obligation to report adverse effects to the FDA. As officials from Purdue hid damaging information necessary to safeguard public health, they simultaneously worked to influence public opinion through unbranded advocacy, channeling payments via several nonprofit groups in order to retain ostensibly disinterested experts to speak on the company's behalf or in its interest. Purdue is also a recidivist offender. Facing the threat of criminal charges from the federal government, corporate executives and the company paid a modest amount in damages, then reverted to their characteristic posture of pushing sales while disregarding danger. Purdue's corporate board, and especially its owners, the Sackler family, purchased powerful defenders from Washington, D.C.'s political establishment. People like Rudolph Giuliani, former mayor of New York City and personal lawyer to Donald Trump, former New York City Police Chief Bernard Carrick, former U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder, and former Chair of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission Mary Jo White. Though well-connected insiders have so far managed to shield the Sacklers from criminal charges, the damaging information released in civil suits have coalesced into a de facto public indictment, with a verdict already certain. Purdue Pharma is guilty. And the only remaining question is the scope of crime and how to count the bodies. But there is a great deal more that should figure into an account of who is responsible for the opioid crisis. To our detriment, the vilification of Purdue Pharma substitutes for an analysis and understanding of the opioid crisis itself, much in the same way that law enforcement officials invite Americans to view traffic in illegal drugs as the result of a powerful cotter of criminal cartels, as opposed to the cold calculations made by all manner of people, supplying all sorts of demand. This is not to suggest that any given perpetrator is innocent or unfairly maligned. Rather, it is to point out that others could be found equally culpable and, more importantly, that concentrating blame on one group or person often entails a behind-the-scenes absolution of several others, perhaps even an entire policy regime or political approach. Convicting the notorious gangster El Chapo Guzman on drug trafficking charges, for example, means figuratively acquitting drug prohibition, the cornerstone of the war on drugs, of the perverse incentives that made his business possible, his profits rewarding, and his succession inevitable. Likewise, condemning the Sackler family to disgrace means characterizing them as aberrational, possessed of some peculiar malevolence. This neglects the precursors to their conduct. It obscures their many enablers and fellow travelers, and it exonerates the context and choices that facilitated OxyContin's approval and subsequent misuse. These distortions do more than oversimplify. They undermine our understanding and risk perpetuating the mechanisms driving overdose deaths in the first place. So far, public awareness of the opioid crisis has been shaped by our adversarial legal process, which puts people on trial, not policies. But any serious review of the origins of the opioid crisis draws attention to policies, specifically to neoliberal policies. Neoliberalism is the conservative philosophy of governance that provided the impetus toward the deregulation and privatization that proved critical in expanding the supply and prescribing of opioids. This point bears special emphasis since to speak in terms of a pharma cartel or a nexus of business enterprises that sometimes work together to advance industry-wide goals raises the same set of concerns as exist on the illicit side, namely, what policies enabled the cartel's business model? 
Moving from the question of culpability to an examination of power, we can see that the American opioid crisis is a drug epidemic made and made catastrophically worse by neoliberalism. What follows is a narrative of the origins of the opioid crisis that minimizes the role played by a company named Purdue Pharma marketing a drug called OxyContin, a deliberate move made in order to cast light on a larger story. First and foremost, the drug's approval should be placed within the changing institutional culture of the FDA, one drug approved among many in an atmosphere of lighter regulation. Second, the fixation on OxyContin leaves an impression that its approval by the FDA was tantamount to an endorsement of opioid use for chronic pain treatment. In reality, the cultivation and legal sanction of that new market for opioid prescribing predates that decision by several years and features a diverse cast of powerful sponsors, particularly a small activist community of nonprofits funded by several opioid manufacturers, Purdue Pharma among them. A government agency might properly recognize and expose this kind of orchestrated campaign of influence. Instead, in the case of opioids, the FDA and Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, not only turned a blind eye, it saw high-ranking officials leave their ranks to take positions in the very industries they once regulated, a so-called revolving door, a recurring theme of the opioid crisis and a neglected feature of neoliberalism in general. Most noteworthy, the raw materials necessary to the scale of expanded opioid prescribing were secured by a concerted campaign by the two largest narcotic importers, Johnson & Johnson and Malincrote. Taking cognizance of these other corporations and developments brings some overlooked features of the early years of the opioid crisis to the fore, the other partners to OxyContin's production and prescribing, and the damage wrought by opioids other than OxyContin, including immediate release formulations and generic drugs. In connecting these threads, we deepen our understanding of neoliberalism, moving beyond its veneer and rhetoric to its actual operation. Contrary to its professed disdain for government bureaucracy, neoliberalism actually depends on it, capitalizing on the impression of adherence to regulation while relying on insiders who know its process intimately in order to circumvent its substance. In practice, deregulation is less of a critique of liberalism and more of a free rider on it. To miss this story in favor of jeering the Sacklers on their public gibbet is to substitute a vendetta for justice. The Adoption and Influence of Neoliberalism When New Deal liberalism reached a high watermark in the early 1970s, its core building blocks of union power, the black freedom movement, and women's rights faced entrenched adversaries and daunting prospects. Still, opponents smarted from their gains. Liberalism's statecraft, progressive social policy and institution building, particularly the rise of a regulatory state, built resentment throughout corporate America, despite broadly distributed benefits. Yet, though unimpressive in its grasp of power, liberalism was without serious rival as a governing paradigm. Few questioned its foundational bedrock a merger of those who wanted more from government, the counter-cyclical economic spending of Keynesian economics, especially deficit spending, and social democracy, or the recognition of citizenship in new ways and in more people. But some did. Collecting liberalism's critics, conservatives launched an era of infrastructural investment, funding new institutions like the Heritage Foundation and reinvigorating old ones like the American Enterprise Institute. The task that fell to them was essentially the mirror opposite of liberalism, forge an alliance between economic conservatives who wanted the government to do less and the forces of cultural backlash who wanted the same, but in different respects. Their shared impulse to constrain government coalesced into a new governing paradigm of neoliberalism, so-called because its proponents positioned themselves as followers of the classic liberal tradition of economics, particularly that of Alfred Marshall, 
who placed private property rights above public obligations. Neoliberalism consisted of discrete but overlapping objectives, removing government-imposed impediments to the free flow of capital and labor, curbs on deficit spending, often including the sale of entities or privatization of functions previously belonging to government, and a substantial overall limit on government debt. In general, neoliberals sought to return businesses to their former position as the preeminent clients and beneficiaries of government action. And if corporate America had never really been dislodged from this position of privilege, then neoliberalism's advocates supported the elimination of political commitments that interfered with a more straightforward form of patronage. In the U.S., neoliberals shaped the presidency of Ronald Reagan, lending intellectual stature and organizational support to calls to privatize executive operations and core components of social policy. But their influence hardly stopped there. Elsewhere in the developed world, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher of the United Kingdom privatized government entities on a scale unthinkable since before the Second World War, when the Beveridge Report delineated the architecture of the modern social welfare state. Following Thatcher, the European Union replicated many neoliberal policy objectives, especially in the Maastricht criteria used to determine eligibility for the Eurozone, or shared currency, which limited the debt obligations of member states. Arguably, neoliberal thinking reached an apex at global institutions of finance like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, where its policy prescriptions, unalloyed by the opposition of organized labor, exerted force throughout the developing world. According to one contemporary appraisal, by the end of the 1980s, sales of state enterprises worldwide had reached a total of over $185 billion, with no signs of a slowdown. In 1990 alone, the world's governments sold off $25 billion in state-owned enterprises, with continents vying to see who could claim the privatization title. A report from the World Bank in 1992 boasted of knowing virtually no limits on what can be privatized. Though we live in a world dramatically altered by neoliberalism, we have yet to reckon adequately with its legacy including identifying precisely what was neo in approaches long advocated by segregationists, right-wing ideologues, and businessmen of various sorts, or why the synergistic connection between and among them gained traction when it did. Much of its significance rests on the breadth of its influence, gaining unlikely support from across mainstream politics. President Bill Clinton, like his Republican predecessors, championed neoliberal policies, despite relying on an electoral coalition traditionally regarded as liberalism's stronghold. Clinton joined conservatives in attacks on New Deal social policy, most notably in curtailing aid to families with dependent children. He also finalized negotiations and secured passage of the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, Establishing a trade corridor stretching from Mexico to Canada defined by progressively lower tariffs and the removal of many quantitative quotas. In addition to these widely discussed trade and social policy policies, President Clinton embarked on a comparatively less contentious and far less noted neoliberal initiative to privatize government executive functions under the guise of reinventing government. Few post-Second World War executive reorganization efforts rival its scale. None match its success in transforming the executive branch. If Ronald Reagan established privatization of government as an aspirational goal, then Bill Clinton's reinventing government secured it as operational reality, a rarely questioned objective against which agency performance would be judged. That being said, deregulation and privatization did not spring fully formed from executive orders issued during the Clinton presidency, nor did it derive from manifestos issued by well-funded nonprofits poised to look earnest while professing no limits to what could be privatized. At least in regard to the FDA's handling of opioid regulation, several of the agency's fateful moves echoed decisions made before the agency matured in power. 
For this reason, a review of the agency's history helps to pinpoint what marks neoliberalism as distinct from other similar approaches to governance and how the opioid crisis became an inextricable part of its modern legacy. The FDA and the Opioid Crisis The origin of the Food and Drug Administration dates back to the Bureau of Chemistry of the Department of Agriculture, and in particular to the post-Civil War leadership of Harvey Wiley, whose advocacy for an uncontaminated supply of food and medicine led to the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. Although Wiley's success in securing groundbreaking legislation to establish a role for new forms of federal regulation lent the impression of vigorous government power, the Bureau of Chemistry struggled for resources and relevance throughout the Progressive Era. Surprisingly, the Bureau, renamed the Food and Drug Administration in 1930, also did not enjoy favor in the early days of the New Deal, despite repeated and well-publicized problems of danger lurking in the food and drugs sold to Americans. That changed years later, following a particularly dramatic episode of medicinal poisoning that killed over 100 people. In response, Congress passed the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938, granting the FDA the power to review drugs prior to market release in order to ensure safety, and the regulatory authority to ensure that such drugs advertised only the claims supported by evidence. Though these regulatory powers sound natural to us now, their original appointment was remarkable, and for many years following, an innovation emulated elsewhere. The FDA earned more than just admirers and imitators, however, they made enemies as well. Set against a long and eclectic tradition of self-medication, many Americans, including many pharmacists, felt the FDA impinged on prerogatives properly belonging to an individual, an unjust preemption in their eyes, and possibly an injurious one as well. The budding American pharmaceutical industry gradually adopted a different view, however, as the most powerful among them realized that the agency's regime of pre-market approval enhanced the prestige of the drugs they marketed, setting them apart from formulations never subjected to scientific review. Drug makers also benefited by placing many products behind an access wall of prescription only since marketing for those drugs needed only to target prescribers as opposed to the general public. Always there was some pharmaceutical company or drug classification that proved thorny or vexatious. But in the main, throughout the 1950s, the industry partnered with the FDA to stunning effect. In the decade following the 1938 Act, Americans shifted away from older, clinically unevaluated tinctures or tablets in favor of medicine engineered in a laboratory, tested by a parent pharmaceutical conglomerate, and placed before the FDA for review and approval. More new and truly effective drugs were invented between 1935 and 1955 than in all of previous human history, observes Philip Hiltz, author of A Comprehensive History of the FDA. As the U.S. pharmaceutical industry developed into an undisputed global leader, the FDA's long-serving commissioner, George Larrick, known for a congenial approach, avoided potential points of confrontation, including those raised by widespread, over-prescribing, lethal misuse and possible mislabeling of amphetamines and barbiturates. Perhaps Larrick dismissed concerns by noting that such medicines came to any user only by way of a doctor's prescription pad, and an attending physician was in the best position to judge what medicine, in what amount, suited any given patient. If so, then Larrick did not much understand the evolution in the industry over which he presided. Once, a family doctor would consult entries in the long-running Seal of Acceptance program of the American Medical Association, AMA, to inform his or her professional judgment. By the 1950s, the FDA rendered the AMA's program obsolete. In fact, it fell into disuse. In the place of the AMA's imprimatur, the FDA emerged as a de facto advisor to physicians, a role that took on greater importance as advertising targeting them grew exponentially.
In 1930, about 95% of drug company advertising was aimed at the public, Philip Hiltz observes. But by 1972, perhaps as much as 90% was aimed at doctors. As the opioid and other drug crises reveal, to rely on a physician's judgment to make sense of an exploding market in prescription drugs was, in effect, to delegate medical decision making to Madison Avenue advertising budgets. Even when the FDA had evaluated the drug's basic safety profile in a reliable fashion, this still left more fine grained judgment without guidance. For example, a drug might not be lethal in any given dose. But it might prove dangerous when taken for an extended period or in combination with other commonly used substances. Not surprisingly, insiders identified such problems in oversupply and overprescribing as potential pitfalls of the FDA's laissez faire posture. Even in the face of congressional investigation of barbiturate and amphetamine abuse, Commissioner Larrick chased down small time traffic but sought no accountability from manufacturers. One medical examiner working at the FDA in the 1950s recounted that, after expressing reservations regarding the safe use of a tranquilizer, her superior walked into her meeting with the company's representatives and announced approval of the drug, without any proof of safety over long time use. In spite of warnings and risks, Larix FDA maintained a restrained approach to regulation, preferring good relations with pharmaceutical companies. Grievances with the agency grew after his departure, and especially after the Kefauver Harris Amendments of 1962, which required drug manufacturers to satisfy a more stringent criterion of drug efficacy, established by well controlled studies, construed as randomized clinical trials, as a condition for drug approval. Before long, corporate executives echoed many of the complaints voiced by proponents of self medication. Accusing the FDA of spurning valuable drugs in favor of complying with onerous bureaucratic procedures. After the Kefauver Harris Amendments became law, the arch conservative John Birch Society openly advocated the repeal of its efficacy provisions. Though far from ascendant, deregulation of the FDA was given a dress rehearsal of sorts when Richard Nixon was elected president, albeit with a bizarre personal twist. Characteristic of Nixon's vindictive temperament. In the main, Nixon administration officials resorted to hectoring civil servants with proposed relocations or some other form of nuisance to thin the ranks at the FDA. Only with the election of Ronald Reagan, the crowning achievement of a coalition of anti government conservatives, did officials pursue deregulation of the FDA on a more systematic basis. Including regular editorializing against the agency's authority in the pages of the Wall Street Journal, the platforming of those affiliated with the new Tufts Center for the Study of Drug Development, an institute dedicated to deregulation, and a broke on purpose approach to the FDA budget that, by depriving the agency of medical examiners, added evidentiary weight to accusations of slow approval times. Although new drug applications grew substantially, climbing from 4,200 in 1970 to 12,800 in 1989, the FDA workforce actually contracted over the same period, from 7,960 employees in the mid 70s to 6,960 by the mid 80s. Reagan era budgets proved so crippling for the FDA that the need for new personnel grew urgent. With the help of allies in Congress like conservative Utah Senator Orrin Hatch, a key ally of the pharmaceutical industry, the administration of George H.W. Bush supported legislation called the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, which was presented to the public as a way to supply a beleaguered agency with a new source of funds. For any new drug application, a sponsor paid a fee. The collection of all such revenue went toward hiring new medical examiners. And with this new workforce came a promise to bring down the time it took for the FDA to review a new drug application. While some voiced concern about turning a portion of the budget of the federal agency over to the industry it regulates, today the User Fee Act accounts for roughly half of the FDA budget, a decade of prominent deregulation advocacy allowed supporters to position user fees as a reasonable approach. 
designed to stave off further encroachment. Conservatives depicted the Fee Act as modest reform, while many liberals declared it an urgent matter of necessity. Activists dedicated to expedited approval for experimental drugs to test against HIV virus focused attention on the dangerous cost of a drug approval system that lumbered along, indifferent to patients dying by the thousands. In reality, the poor incentives provided by commercial drug research slowed progress. When it came to HIV treatment trials, in cases like that of the drug azithromycine (AZT), FDA officials acted expeditiously. In others, their caution proved circumspect. Though some AIDS activists later recanted their criticism of the FDA, there was little question that in the early 1990s the agency was in political crisis. The Prescription Drug User Fee Act passed the House by unanimous consent. And subsequently passed in the Senate by voice vote. During this time, David Kessler, a young medical professional who served on Orrin Hatch's staff, assumed leadership of the FDA. Best known to the public for his campaign to classify cigarettes as drugs, Kessler will also be remembered to history for his support and implementation of the User Fee Act. The new FDA director received support from the newly elected president, Bill Clinton, who vowed to. Get rid of yesterday's government, and urge the FDA to regard the pharmaceutical industry as partners, not adversaries. An approach familiar to the agency via Larrick's leadership, and one that presaged overprescribing and oversupply. At first, the User Fee Act was judged an unqualified success in that approval times for drugs went down demonstrably, meeting the timetables stipulated in the legislation. One congressional staff lawyer noted that such targets could be met by either approving the drug or denying the approval. But over time, he acknowledged that what Congress really wanted was not just decisions but approvals. That is what really gets dangerous, he added. Some dangers manifested quickly. Shortly after Kessler announced his departure in late 1996, the Los Angeles Times reported on dangerous drugs recently approved by the FDA. Eventually, culminating in a Pulitzer Prize being awarded to the reporter David Willman for a series collected under a title that alluded to the User Fee Act, the new FDA, how a new policy led to seven deadly drugs. Either you play games or you're going to be put off limits, a medical review officer told Willman. The people in charge don't say, "Should we approve this drug?" They say, "Hey, how can we get this drug approved?" Meta-analyses spanning decades of approval decisions since the User Fee Act was implemented confirm that the FDA now approves new drugs based on less and less rigorous evidence. Yet, regardless of early warning signs, the User Fee Act was reauthorized in the FDA Modernization Act of 1997, a key component of Clinton's Reinventing Government initiative, and has been reauthorized ever since. Understanding the institutional history of the FDA supplies context to its decision to approve Purdue Pharma's application for OxyContin in 1995. In documents submitted to the FDA reviewers, Purdue claimed that its slow-release technology worked for at least half of the patients prescribed the medication for experimental purposes. Several of the studies furnished to the FDA showed nothing of the kind. In one trial of 87 cancer patients. Rescue medication, or a pain reliever administered in between doses, was used frequently in most of the patients, and 95% resorted to it at some point in the study. On the other hand, one clinical trial that Purdue furnished in its application did show a 12-hour effect for at least half of the patients. Purdue relied on that experiment to support its claims for innovation, key to its pending patent. The FDA approved the slow-release technology on the strength of that lone citation. This approval then provided the basis for Purdue's marketing claim that OxyContin presented less of a risk of cultivating opioid dependence, as the drug was theoretically released on a steady basis over a longer period, meeting out its narcotic payload over time. As part of its aggressive marketing campaign launched in 1996. Purdue claimed OxyContin spares patients from anxious clock watching. In fact, 
Many patients found themselves in agony awaiting their next dose. As the Los Angeles Times subsequently reported, Dr. Curtis Wright, who led the FDA's medical review of the drug, left the FDA shortly after OxyContin was approved and, within two years, was working for Purdue in new product development. On the basis of very little, Purdue won quite a lot from the FDA. Journalist Sam Quinones pointed out that Purdue's first-in-class warning label enabled the company to claim that OxyContin had a lower potential for abuse than other oxycodone products because its timed-release formula allowed for a delay in absorbing the drug. New York Times reporter Barry Meyer was among the first to expose how little scientific evidence actually backed this claim in his 2003 book, Painkiller, a wonder drug's tale of addiction and death. Yet, in spite of faulty evidence, the FDA granted approval for a claim that enabled a marketing plan of staggering ambition. OxyContin soon became America's best-selling painkiller, earning $31 billion in revenue for Purdue Pharma and vaulting its owners, the Sackler family, to the upper reaches of the Forbes list of America's wealthiest families. The review of OxyContin on the basis of drug extension rather than new drug approval is especially noteworthy because it spared Purdue Pharma of the obligation to demonstrate the efficacy of opioids when used to treat chronic pain. Based on prior FDA approvals of oxycodone formulations, the drug was presumed to be safe and effective. The only question was whether the slow-release technology presented and could be marketed as a competitive advantage over other similar drugs. Lost in the discussion of extended release was the larger issue of whether opioids could treat chronic pain effectively at all, a proposition that science has yet to vindicate. Previously, prescription opioids for patient use were confined to two different situations, palliative care, especially cancer-related pain, and acute pain care, typically lasting 7 to 10 days, most often for post-operative recovery. Prescribers of various sorts look to expand that ambit of prescribing to include more ordinary circumstances, like back pain or tooth extraction. OxyContin's particular promise of safety, anchored in extended release, fit remarkably well into this campaign to enlarge the market of opioid prescribing. Naturally, the FDA could have asked how well opioids work over an extended period of use. Instead, just as was the case in the FDA of the 1950s, when regulators friendly to business approved a tranquilizer without requiring any assessment of risks versus benefits for long-term use, the FDA chose to say yes to OxyContin when the application before them ought to have prompted them to say, show us more. A provocative historical parallel these two regulatory encounters, separated by four decades, raise the question of whether neoliberal deregulation simply marks a return to the business clientelism of 1950s America, when it could be said openly, what was good for our country was good for General Motors, and vice versa. Yet this comparison, premised on similarity, also brings out some key differences. Following the emergence of a rigorous regulatory state, in the FDA's case, following the kefauver harris amendments, pharmaceutical companies were obliged to remain in compliance with fairly elaborate procedures, including furnishing specialized data to public agencies. Detecting diligence or its absence in these data is a job for the regulators themselves, although others may eventually gain awareness of problems with particular drugs, and this may in turn expose vulnerabilities in the original submission to the FDA. A bustling, revolving door between industry and government suggests not only that agency regulators may not execute their public function with the public foremost in mind, but that their specialized insider knowledge is highly prized by industry. In the days of Larrick, only Larrick was needed to perform favors for industry. Following the User Fee Act, a cotter of medical examiners could steer regulatory decisions in favor of drug companies using their inside knowledge of bureaucracy rather than their personal political capital to pursue their goal. This made regulatory lapses harder to detect or even name. It is a distinguishing feature of neoliberalism that, in contrast to previous agency failures, there is no learning curve. 
Following one tragic episode of drug poisoning, Congress passed the 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The FDA collaborated with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine to review every drug on the market. Likewise, following the revelation that birth defects caused by one particular drug, Congress augmented FDA regulatory power with the Kefauver-Harris Amendments. A review of the FDA's clearance process for experimental drugs followed. In the case of the opioid crisis, there has been no comparable infusion of regulatory power in the FDA. If anything, Obama's 21st Century Cures Act stripped the agency of power. In similar fashion, FDA officials refused to account for previous mistakes, a willful blindness that points to something more. Thus far, the agency has refused to implement the public health approach to opioid approval, including retroactive review recommended by a consensus panel of experts convened by the National Academies, a startling rejection that prompted a prominent activist to call for the replacement of the FDA's Director of Drug Evaluation. Instead of resigning, she has responded to congressional inquiries by claiming the agency properly enforced its regulations. As Dr. Andrew Kolodny points out, though faced with mounting criticism, FDA policies for approving and labeling opioids remain largely unchanged, while the institution remains defensive. Though clearly a factor, the User Fee Act does not by itself account for the fate of Purdue Pharma's OxyContin application before the FDA, or its subsequent marketing coup. In fact, some additional circumstances that facilitated approval and the ready adoption of OxyContin have nothing whatsoever to do with reigning political philosophies. For example, the long-running problem of a medical profession poorly prepared to receive the onslaught of well-financed public relations campaigns gave Purdue's marketing an outsized influence. Regardless of era, the FDA's approval processes do not seem adequate for consideration of a drug proposed for long-term habitual use, which may require a substantially different safety review than if the same drug were used only occasionally or for a short period of time. Finally, in his stellar book on the origin of the opioid crisis, Sam Quinones highlights pressures within the business of medicine that asked physicians to become more profitable by spending less time with each patient, and consequently to find it much simpler to prescribe a pill than take an exhaustive case history and seek an integrated approach to pain management. Bearing those concerns in mind, it is still remarkable how little the FDA has done to respond to the opioid crisis. Based on their own internal reviews, agency officials know that post-release labeling changes amount to little. They also know that a hasty drug approval process ought to go hand-in-hand -hand with strengthening the FDA's post-market power to review and, if necessary, to recall a drug. Yet, to date... Labeling changes and a voluntary training program on safe opioid prescribing, funded by manufacturers, is all that the FDA has managed to offer to help ameliorate the opioid crisis. Creating the Market, Expanding Demand Another hallmark of neoliberal advocacy is the proliferation of both industry and corporate-specific messaging through ostensibly independent agents usually non-profit groups and professional associations, but often esteemed professionals as well. So-called unbranded advocates appear not as mere accessories, but as necessary mechanisms for a neoliberal agenda, since their funders, forced to comply with elaborate regulation, require the appearance of a public consensus among stakeholders, both real and invented. Whereas a company sponsoring a tranquilizer in the 1950s need only rely on a pliant director of the FDA, the more ambitious goal of expanded opioid prescribing, launched in earnest in the late 1980s, required a chorus of approval from trusted sources. This point raises what is by far the most remarkable aspect of the first stage of the opioid crisis. No pharmaceutical company has ever been asked by any government regulator to subject opioids to a clinical trial for the treatment of chronic pain. Instead of demonstrating efficacy, opioid manufacturers gained access to that sizable market by aggressive use of unbranded advocacy. 
targeting individual state medical boards, lawmakers, and outlets of influence within the medical profession, like professional conferences and medical schools. Other accounts regarding the early stages of the opioid crisis date the campaign to expand prescribing to a 1995 address to the American Pain Association, declaring pain the fifth vital sign that must be attended to by primary care physicians in everyday medical settings. In reality, the address marked a new stage of assertiveness for a movement that had already attracted momentum and resources. Its origin can be traced to the palliative care research conducted in the 1980s by doctors Kathleen Foley and Russell Portnoy, who gained a following when they decried the lack of adequate prescribing of opioids to treat cancer pain. Though uncaring and often cruel, the undertreatment in palliative care persisted, and persists to this day in part because doctors feared addicting patients when prescribing opioids. From this rally point emerged an understanding that pain was, in general, undertreated by the medical profession, not just in end-of-life settings, but in all ways. Both Sam Quinones and Barry Meyer trace how these concerns coalesced into a movement to prescribe opioids for chronic pain, much of which hinged on a critical citation, often referred to in shorthand as Porter and Jick, that proponents advanced in order to argue that, when prescribed to treat pain, opioids presented a remarkably low risk of addiction in users. For example, Russell Portnoy cited Porter and Jick in this way, and his work became a standard citation in itself. But, as Quinones and Meyer also note, Porter and Jick actually refers to a letter published in the New England Journal of Medicine describing an impressively small percentage of cases of addiction in an analysis of opioids administered to patients in a hospital setting for a short period of time. Though the drug companies used this citation to promote their new opioids as non-addictive, Dr. Herschel Jick adamantly stated, That's not in any shape or form what we suggested in our letter. Despite its lack of direct bearing, Porter and Jick became a frequently invoked source of authority for an emerging community of opioid prescribing activists, many of whom intersected with nonprofits funded by opioid manufacturers. Since many of these nonprofits benefit from a tax status that allows them to keep funders private, it is likely that even after several investigations, our knowledge of the pharmaceutical corporation funded apparatus is only partial. What is known about the links between unbranded advocates and their corporate funders derives from seminal work by the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel MedPage Today. A 2012 U.S. Senate Finance Committee investigation led by Chair Max Baucus and Ranking Member Charles Grassley, some portions of which were publicly released in late 2020, an important 2018 inquiry conducted by then-ranking member Senator Claire McCaskill and the 2019 investigation of the global campaign to expand opioid prescribing led by Congresswoman Catherine Clark. From these various sources, we learn that important actors in unbranded advocacy for opioid prescribing include the American Pain Foundation, which ceased operations after receiving the funding inquiry letter from Baucus and Grassley, the Soros Foundation's Open Society Project on Death in America, where Kathleen Foley worked, the American Academy of Pain Medicine, the American Pain Society, the U.S. Pain Foundation, the American Chronic Pain Association, the Washington Legal Foundation, the May Day Fund, and the University of Wisconsin Pain and Policy Studies Group. The Milwaukee Journal Sentinel MedPage investigation also named an advisory committee of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for failing to disclose ties to opioid manufacturers, essentially operating as a front to fund projects without raising any conflict of interest questions. Early investigations identified the drug makers Johnson & Johnson, Endo Pharmaceuticals, and Purdue Pharma as funders of these organizations. Later, McCaskill added Insys and Mylan to the list and the 2020 release of material by Senators Grassley and Ron Wyden includes several other major pharmaceutical companies, like AstraZeneca, GlaxoSmithKline, and Malincrote Pharmaceuticals. One relatively neglected aspect of the hive of activity generated by the early efforts of unbranded advocacy is their push to pass state laws, or push for the adoption of rules to explicitly sanction the use of opioids to treat chronic pain. 
In 1998, one supporter remarked on the number of states that had enacted laws, adopted administrative rules, and or established guidelines for the use of narcotic analgesics for the treatment of chronic pain. As she noted, many of those guidelines seemed to have no real target, as few administrative proceedings were directed against chronic pain prescribing. But clearly, opioid prescription activists wanted to send an affirmative message to doctors, some resorted to filing professional complaints against doctors who did not prescribe opioids to treat chronic pain. Still, doctors proved reluctant to prescribe opioids to the degree envisioned by activists. Soon, advocates extended their approach to include the formation of state pain commissions. Writing in the American Pain Society Bulletin in 1996, David E. Joranson, a researcher affiliated with the University of Wisconsin Pain and Policy Studies Group, lauded the example of such boards at work in Florida, Michigan, Ohio, and Massachusetts. In fact, the Pain and Policy Studies Group conducted workshops for state medical boards between 1994 and 1997 to survey the prevailing views on opioid prescribing among members of state medical boards. In 1998, the Federation of State Medical Boards of the United States, FSMB, in collaboration with the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics, working through the support of the May Day Fund, published a model guideline for chronic pain prescribing. Another study funded by the May Day Foundation found that three years later, 12 states had adopted the FSMB's model guidelines in full, and nine in part, and that... The attitudes and practices of medical boards toward physicians prescribing of opioids have changed for the better, by which the authors meant that there was greater recognition of the value of opioid prescribing for chronic pain. In systematic fashion, tucked away in mostly quiet corners of government, a tightly woven nexus of non-profit and other interest groups worked to overhaul the disposition of the medical profession toward prescribing opioids for chronic pain. By such methods, they accomplished in concert what drug manufacturers would never have been able to manage on their own, working under their corporate banners. Although researchers and advocacy groups did not disclose their financial ties to opioid manufacturers, their work appeared in public with no alarming or sinister cast. To the contrary, their campaigns carried the blessings of the establishment and the imprimatur of scientific authority. In 1998, the same year the Federation published its model guidelines, former FDA Commissioner David Kessler agreed to serve as Honorary Chair of the May Day Fund's National Advisory Committee. We know from various surveys that Americans are sometimes reluctant to take over-the-counter and prescription pain medications because they fear becoming addicted to them, Kessler said in a press release, even though addiction is, in fact, extraordinarily rare. Years later, Kessler would again be quoted on the subject of opioid prescribing, this time in the Los Angeles Times groundbreaking series on Purdue Pharma. The failure to recognize the addictive potential of opioid painkillers is one of the greatest mistakes of modern medicine, Kessler offered, adding that the pharmaceutical ambition to export opioids globally after its domestic market came under scrutiny was right out of the playbook of Big Tobacco, his old nemesis. The article omitted any mention of the May Day Fund as a pivotal player in that project, or that Kessler was serving as FDA commissioner when OxyContin received approval, and as a key advisor to the May Day Fund shortly thereafter. Bearing endorsements from respected authorities, the orchestrated campaign of unbranded advocacy required a closer look into the data in order to detect a false note. The Porter and Jick fiasco stands out as a failure to do just that but others deserve mention. In the mid-1990s, opioid prescribing advocates seized on certain administrative decisions penalizing physicians for prescribing opioids to treat chronic pain in order to perpetuate a sense of grievance and justify their fixation on state medical boards. One typical example is the citation of Hoover v. Agency for Healthcare Administration in the Hoffman and Tarzian article published in the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. The text reads... Some state boards have disciplined physicians for over-prescribing opioids, including physicians who were treating pain patients. The case in question involved Dr. Catherine Ann Hoover, who soon found herself before the medical board again for soliciting a 17-year-old patient to have sex with her son. 
She has since earned infamy in West Virginia. Prescribing more pain pills than any other doctor in that state, she ultimately fled for the Bahamas after her offices were raided by federal officials. The other citation offered by Hoffman and Tarzian is a Louisiana case. In Re DeLeo 661 Southern 2nd 162, Louisiana Court of Appeals 1995, involving Dr. Lucas DeLeo, a doctor in St. Bernard Parish who was once interviewed by the House Select Committee on Assassinations in connection with the murder of Martin Luther King Jr. The committee declined to make much of DeLeo's reported connection to the New Orleans mob or a rumored meeting between DeLeo and James Earl Ray, but did seem to voice a general skepticism by noting his record for such minor offenses as disturbing the peace, resisting arrest, and assault. DeLeo's interview remains sealed. The 1993 case against his prescribing practices stipulates that in 1990, DeLeo voluntarily surrendered his license to prescribe Schedule II and Schedule III drugs to the DEA, for reasons which are not altogether clear. Later proceedings revealed this move came after two federal agents appeared in his office, presumably as the result of suspicious prescribing. What's most puzzling about the citation of both of these cases is that in each instance, the state board's initial decision to penalize the prescribing physician was later reversed, in part or in full, in such a way as to affirm precisely the principle which the articles present as under threat, opioid prescribing for chronic pain. To calamitous misfortune, Dr. Catherine Hoover went on to prescribe many, many more pills. Louisiana ultimately sustained the deprivation of DeLeo's medical license, but only on the grounds that he prescribed controlled substances without a license. With no one digging into footnotes, advocates successfully perpetuated an atmosphere of persecution, perhaps most of all because of one notorious case, Dr. Frank Fisher, arrested by California state officials in 1999. His story was no footnote buried in an academic journal, but a cause celeb, and little wonder, given that the initial filing against Dr. Fisher included murder charges for three of Fisher's patients found with high levels of oxycodone in their system when they died. Other charges included improper prescribing of controlled substances and, filed the previous year, fraud charges involving a pharmacy kickback scheme based on alleged overcharging of the state Medicaid system. But in the eyes of prosecutors, the true crime, the reason Fisher came to the attention of authorities in the first place, must have been the fact that Fisher, a Harvard-trained physician, was the largest prescriber of OxyContin in the state. Throughout his ordeal, a defiant Dr. Fisher maintained that he prescribed according to a standard of care that increased the dose in patients accustomed to opioids to levels that would be lethal for the uninitiated but tolerated in pain patients. When Fisher could not make bail, he was sent to jail for five months. A group of patients rallied to his defense. At a preliminary hearing, the judge reduced the charges to manslaughter, including those filed against his alleged co-conspirator Stephen Miller, owner of the only pharmacy in Reading that would fill Fisher's prescriptions. Over time, the criminal case against Fisher faltered, then fell apart. Even civil suits filed by relatives of patients who overdosed were dismissed. In the end, it was the state medical board that imposed the only official penalty on Fisher, a period of probation, meaning subject to professional monitoring, and a requirement to keep a list of controlled substances he prescribed. After enduring a public and humiliating ordeal, the damage to his life and reputation hardly seemed proportionate or justified. The criminal complaint against Fisher would seem to be a classic case of overreach, a blunt and chilling effect on opioid prescribing for chronic pain. Fisher's subsequent speaking engagements and public testimony suggest that his story was certainly understood and received in this way, yet investigators' 1999 filing before the state medical board, the one that served as the basis for the penalties ultimately imposed on Fisher, alters the conventional impression of the state's action against Fisher, including how Fisher and others went on to present his story. Dr. Fisher came before the board as a result of an investigation that cited numerous infractions, failing to prescribe long-acting extended-release opioids for chronic pain, 
instead relying on short-acting ones. Failing to explain to patients that short-acting opioids used in conjunction with extended release formulations were to be used for breakthrough pain. Prescribing dangerous levels of acetaminophen to patients, rendering them vulnerable to liver damage. Failing to document functional improvement with opioids before increasing the dose. Prescribing potentially dangerous combinations of drugs, including benzodiazepines, without performing any psychiatric evaluation or referring a patient to another medical provider to perform one. Failing to take previous substance abuse disorders into account when prescribing potentially addictive drugs and failing to follow up on any such patient's recovery efforts while under his care. The violations were numerous depicting a pattern of extreme carelessness. Contrary to Fisher's claim that he became a target of state attention because he prescribed opioids at too high a dose, the actual complaint discloses that he increased dose without ascertaining whether opioids worked for a particular patient in the first place. A number of the charges cited by the board violate responsible care guidelines set forth by opioid manufacturers in their own promotional literature. Rather than a poster child for chronic pain opioid prescribing, Dr. Fisher's documented infractions ought to have been regarded by his many defenders as an example of what not to do. All told, a reasonable person reading the document might well conclude that Fisher ran a pill mill by any other name and was spared criminal sanction by a combination of aggressive and misguided handling by the state attorney general the incredible protection offered by professional status, and the usefulness of his story, including its inarguably excessive components in presenting a picture of a medical profession as under siege. Such a sweeping effort derived support from more than just Purdue Pharma and worked to the benefit of more than just OxyContin. Certainly Purdue's new drug experienced a boon, according to the Department of Justice Inspector General, OxyContin prescriptions for non-cancer-related pain increased from about 670,000 in 1997 to about 6.2 million in 2002. It is also very likely that the timing of Purdue's massive public relations campaign for OxyContin lent authority to the opioid prescribing movement, and vice versa, forging a new consensus in symbiotic fashion. For example, Purdue disseminated the Federation's revised prescribing guidelines at its own cost. Be that as it may, according to researchers, most people prescribed an opioid analgesic, whether for short or for long-term use, take immediate release, not extended release formulations. In 2017, the National Academies confirmed this in their report. Recent data from the FDA also make clear that even after generic versions of oxycodone extended release formulations came to market, the number of prescriptions for all such pills, including OxyContin, did not compare to other opioids. Definitely OxyContin sparked heavy diversion to illicit markets. It also clearly established the viability of opioid prescribing for chronic pain with adoption rates in white working-class communities on a scale that would one day usher in new heroin markets. But on the other hand, given the amount of other opioid drugs circulating, it is not surprising that a New York Times expose on illicit pharmaceutical use on college campuses, published in 2000, does not mention OxyContin, but does discuss Vicodin, hydrocodone with acetaminophen, and Percocet, oxycodone with acetaminophen. This is not to diminish in any way the spectacular effect of OxyContin. It is rather to suggest, as a different New York Times article disclosed in 2001, that other drugs laid the groundwork for its ascendance in illicit markets. There were plenty of oxycodone users in Appalachia before OxyContin came along. Paul Tuff has written, Many of the OxyContin addicts I spoke to in Kentucky and West Virginia used to snort or chew a mild oxycodone-based painkiller called Tylox. Expanding Supply, Privatizing Poppy Fields Unbeknownst to most, the narcotic raw material needed to make legal opioids appears in the U.S. only as an import, never as a domestic commodity. These imports arrive according to another set of regulations promulgated by the DEA, presenting another target for neoliberal-minded deregulation. 
performative compliance, accompanied by an insider's understanding of how to negotiate the desired result, or in this case, change the rules entirely. Without supply, drug companies would be unable to serve the expanded market they worked to create. In this particular case, the deregulation came about as a quiet exception to an arcane rule familiar only to drug importers and devoted readers of the Federal Register. In fact, it was an audacious stroke, spearheaded by Johnson & Johnson, one of two certified importers of narcotic raw material whose officials came to view this particular regulatory obstacle as a business advantage, that is, a unique opportunity to privatize their production chain from seed to sale. Probably nothing enhanced Johnson & Johnson's chances for success more than the obscurity of the regulation they sought to change. Its history belongs to the struggle many governments face when confronting the global traffic in pharmaceutical drugs. First, the League of Nations, then the United Nations, grappled with the illegal diversion of licit drug supply by adopting protocols designed to monitor the production and importation of raw or refined materials. The final version of this global system of bookkeeping, the 1961 Single Convention Treaty, was implemented in the U.S. as one component of the Controlled Substances Act of 1970. One condition of participation in the treaty required the designation of a single government agency to determine a country's medical needs for certain drugs and set importation and production quotas accordingly. The U.S. assigned the DEA to this task, an odd delegation that raised some small questions at the time, but one that rested on the institutional legacy of the DEA comprised in part by the former Bureau of Narcotics, once located in the Department of Treasury, with drug imports as a major focus of its work. The settled intricacies of the legal drug trade left a lot to be desired. Given that morphine is an essential conversion stage on the path to producing heroin, signatories to the treaty hoped that limiting the legal morphine supply would in turn limit, now contraband, heroin. In reality, Legal producers of narcotic raw materials, mainly Turkey and India, had not supplied the bulk of the illegal market for years. Instead, heroin derived from an illegal underground supply chain, all the way from poppy to powder. Still, the diplomatic corps of the U.S. reasoned that awarding legal supply to Turkey for concentrated poppy straw and India for opium gum kept both countries invested in treaty compliance. It also served as an acknowledgment of the difficulty in inducing poppy farmers to convert to another crop. Soon after the U.S. passed the Controlled Substances Act, trouble between the Nixon administration and the government of Turkey interrupted the supply of Turkish opium imports, resulting in a medical shortage of critical drugs. While the U.S. eventually restored good relations with Turkey, the countries that had supplied the raw material for America's needs in the interval asked to continue their opioid trade with the U.S. To broker a sensitive compromise, U.S. policymakers devised the so-called 80-20 rule, published in the Federal Register in 1981, stipulating that at least 80% of the narcotic raw material imported into the U.S. shall have as its original source Turkey and India, and the remaining 20% would be divided among Yugoslavia, France, Poland, Hungary, and Australia. The rule was not a quantitative quota, but for the 20% countries, it operated as a qualitative one, compelling them to march at quite a distance behind what India and Turkey could produce in any given year. For this reason, had this rule remained intact, the U.S. never would have received the raw materials necessary to launch OxyContin from Australia. Consequently, the effort to undermine it kicked off by an undiscussed amendment to the 1988 Anti-Drug Abuse Act calling for an executive review of the 80-20 provision tells us a lot about the forces at work to expand the opioid supply. When the report commissioned by Congress recommended preserving the rule for three more years, Democratic Congressman William Hughes of New Jersey, chair of the House Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on Crime, convened a hearing on the licit importation of opium the only public forum to feature a lengthy discussion of the 80-20 rule. 
Testimony provided at the 1990 hearing clearly established Johnson & Johnson's intent to rework narcotic raw material importation rules in favor of greater amounts sourced in Australia. They initially did so by underscoring or inflating concerns of diversion in the Indian supply over the objections of the State Department, which sent delegates to Congress to attest to the success and importance of 8020 and minimize concerns regarding illicit diversion from Indian stockpiles. Interestingly, the other major importer of narcotic raw material, Malink wrote, did not join Johnson & Johnson corporate executives in their depictions of an unruly Indian supply of opium gum. Undoubtedly, this was because at the time, Malink wrote valued the Indian supply for its rich alkaloid content, including the presence of thebane, the base for synthesizing oxycodone the active ingredient in drugs like OxyContin and Percocet. In contrast, representatives from Johnson & Johnson, specifically its international office of Naramco, pledged that Australian poppy straw promised a more professional approach, with a product easier to process, subject to high productivity per hectare, and therefore less diversion, and isolated on the island of Tasmania to boot. No one raised a concern regarding diversion of concentrated poppy straw, CPS, from Turkey, which was not surprising given that the method of producing straw was engineered in order to avoid lancing the poppy flower for opium gum, the easiest path to heroin. DEA official Gene Hazlip noted that diversion of narcotic materials in Turkey for the production of heroin virtually disappeared as a result of the CPS method. The Naramco president agreed, adding that Turkey has not been the source of illicit narcotics since, at U.S. urging, it banned opium production, by which he meant the extraction of opium gum. But he disputed the stability of the Turkish supply, arguing that fluctuations resulted in higher prices. The DEA disagreed, noting that the price for narcotic raw material has decreased over the past decade, has not increased although the price for virtually every other commodity has increased in the world. Adding weight to the DEA's testimony was Malincroat's insistence that the company had relied on the countries, traditional countries, for over 100 years, and we have never been unhappy with price or availability. In the main, those at the hearing avoided discussion of the obvious market dynamics in play. That is, both Turkey and India supplied narcotic raw material using state-owned enterprises, while Australian poppy fields were owned and operated by Glaxo, a French company, and Tasmanian Alkaloids, a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. But the Malincroat representative alluded to this when he offered a parting and prophetic shot, warning that, Placing the U.S. supply of this regulated specialty in the hands of a very few foreign corporations will invite abuse and trouble. Years later, when Oklahoma sued Johnson & Johnson for its role in fomenting the opioid crisis, the role of Tasmanian alkaloids became a focus of the prosecution's case. Internal documents obtained in discovery and revealed during the trial disclosed the boasts of Johnson & Johnson executives when, in 1998, they'd brought Norman to market, a poppy variety bred to be particularly high in Thebane. But gains in the poppy field would mean little unless the company found a way to import the CPS Thebane into the American market, where 8020 effectively capped their imports based on what Turkey and India produced. Recognizing this, since 1990, if not before, Johnson & Johnson dedicated itself to circumventing the rule. Yet, despite support from allies in Congress, the State Department held firm in defending 8020. The crucial turning point came when, at some point, Malincroat became convinced that it too would benefit from the proliferation of CPS the Bain sources. According to the Wall Street Journal, in April of 2000, Months before a buyout from corporate giant Tyco, Malincro joined Naramco in lobbying for the DEA to change the 80-20 rule to 60-40 over three years, or, alternatively, exempting Thebane altogether. Remarkably, the DEA chose the latter option. Frank Sapienza, in charge of the DEA office tasked with raw material import and production quotas, and therefore responsible for this decision, later founded the private consulting firm, the Drug and Chemical Advisory Group, LLC. 
His name is cited in an email released as part of the multi-jurisdiction opioid lawsuit as someone on retainer who would work with the now defunct American Pain Foundation, APF, to get people who know the DEA, how they work, who they answer to, their vulnerabilities, etc., in a room to help APF devise a plan to successfully change DEA policy slash actions regarding prescription pain medicines. In a different document in this same case, he is identified as an outside contractor who works for Malincrote, one of the main beneficiaries of the 80-20 exception. Officials from the DEA would later hint to journalists that CPA Thebane had always been exempt from 80-20. As a result, it is sometimes reported as such, on the basis that 80-20 targeted only morphine, a necessary conversion stage to heroin. But this is not the case. CPS of any sort, including that which came from Turkey, was extraordinarily difficult to convert to heroin, as the president of Noramco acknowledged himself in testimony before Congress in 1990, and so too did the DEA. Nor do any of these ex post facto rationalizations account for Johnson & Johnson's decade-long fight to end 80-20. Most importantly, the entire logic of 80-20 rested on the 80 portion, that is, preserving the bulk of market access for Turkey and India in order to preempt any temptation for diversion of their product. Following the logic behind the rule, the appropriate question was whether any Indian opium gum would be displaced by CPS the Bane, not whether the Tasmanian product itself was likely to be diverted. But international statecraft was the least of the concerns of corporate executives at Naramco. Instead, as internal documents provided at trial reveal, Johnson & Johnson was interested in a vertically integrated supply chain for oxycodone, one in which they could reap benefits from seed to sale. The real inducement to Tasmanian product was that it was privately held. In fact, in many ways, the Thebane exception is an unheralded privatization scheme. In both India and Turkey, pharmaceutical corporations contended with state-operated enterprises for narcotic raw material, entities that they could not control or purchase. Accordingly, led by Johnson & Johnson, they opted to obviate the necessity of dealing with them at all, first by disparaging Indian supply, and later by lobbying the DEA directly to change the 80-20 rule. From this seemingly small concession involving an obscure portion of an opaque system of drug regulation, Noramco grew into a giant, supplanting Turkish and Indian supply. By 2015, according to the Washington Post, Noramco supplied 65% of the oxycodone, 54% of the hydrocodone, and 60% of the morphine and codeine used by drug makers in the U.S. market. The same report also notes that as the opioid crisis came to the attention of lawmakers in 2016, Johnson & Johnson sold off both Noramco and Tasmanian alkaloids. From this one regulatory encounter, different threads of the neoliberal project are laid bare. A revolving door, this time at the DEA, unbranded advocacy of the American Pain Foundation, a technical, insider-based ploy designed to convey adherence to an important regulatory rule, but in reality undertaken in order to vitiate it, and the privatization of the opioid supply chain. The 80-20 exception, essential to launching the opioid crisis, is also a quintessential distillation of the forces that drove it. When Malincrode and Johnson & Johnson successfully joined forces to target 80-20, they removed a de facto qualitative quota, but did nothing to overturn the power of the DEA to set a quantitative one. Though they no longer needed to trail behind India and Turkey, they still had to comply with whatever quota on CPS the Bane the DEA imposed. But this never worried them. As a recent Inspector General's report from the Department of Justice details, the DEA allowed import and production quotas to skyrocket for the years spanning the opioid crisis, a decision abetted by the arbitrary process involved in setting the quotas in the first place. The DEA's procedure, essentially a solicitation of manufacturers regarding how much narcotic raw material they would like to acquire and refine, involved publishing proposed numbers in the Federal Register, then incorporating feedback however they deemed appropriate. 
As one observer remarked, the joke was that they called it a quota. To be more accurate, the DEA should have simply called it demand. Surprisingly, the quota-setting process still does not rest on any sort of formal scientific footing, a fact that raises a number of questions, including whether quotas might be revised downward in a way that jeopardizes the health of legacy chronic pain patients still treated with opioids. The Opioid Crisis in History it does little to redeem the reputation of Purdue Pharma to observe that the opioid crisis in the U.S. has its roots in more than one company and more than one drug. Purdue compiled a scandalous record, but it is not clear that its decisions were more brazen or profitable than others. Generic versions of OxyContin vied for market share once the basis of Purdue's patent, extended release, was found wanting. Activist sales of oxycodone products went from 559 million in 2006 to more than 1.1 billion in 2012, according to Washington Post analysis of DEA data obtained via court order. More telling, its hydrocodone sales went from 2.2 billion to nearly 3 billion, a figure that dwarfed the peak of oxycodone sales. Vicodin was always more widely prescribed than Percocet and Percocet was always more widely prescribed than OxyContin. Malincrote, makers of a generic version of Vicodin, sold the most of all. The post-analysis quotes one former DEA official who, after analyzing the agency's own data, professed to be shocked. I couldn't believe it, he told the reporter. Malincrote was the biggest, and then there was Activis. Everyone had been talking about Purdue, but they weren't even close. What relation does legal prescribing bear to the illicit market for legally produced opioids, or opioid overdose deaths more generally? For many experts, the question is not a simple one. Physicians could prescribe OxyContin less, but dealers might traffic in it more. Likewise, if doctors prefer Vicodin but illicit users don't, then what would the prescribing of Vicodin really tell us about the early stage of the opioid crisis? These finer distinctions, not without merit or interest, kept the engine of the opioid crisis churning long after the correlation between total opioid sales and steep rise in opioid deaths, apparent in the now famous Center for Disease Control graph of 2011, could no longer be denied. One former official from the DEA, hired by the nation's most powerful drug distributors as an expert witness, carried an intellectual intransigence to linking licit prescribing with the illicit market into America's courtrooms, as state and local prosecutors searched for answers in the midst of communities inundated with opioids. Independent drug trafficking organizations accounted for the most significant volumes of painkillers diverted across West Virginia, she told the West Virginia court, an out-of-state supply operation that led to the state's tragic opioid overdose death total. The prosecutor responded by quoting the staggering number of hydrocodone and oxycodone pills that one drug distributor, Amerisource Bergen, drove to the state's pharmacies, 119 million doses from 2007 to 2012, and then asked the witness if she believed drug dealers transacted in comparable amounts. They don't. Reporter Eric Iyer of the Charleston Gazette Mail of West Virginia spent many years trying to dig deeper into the relationship between counties with the most opioid prescribing and those with the most opioid deaths. The result, a Pulitzer Prize-winning series, opened with an unequivocal assertion intended to shatter a decade of denial. Follow the pills and you'll find the overdose deaths, he wrote in 2016. At long last... The blunt and bigger fact of oversupply and overprescribing trumped the caveats distracting from this structuring truth. That no tidy division exists between the illicit market and legal prescribing implicates an array of interests and actors, and a chronology. The peak of opioid prescribing came in 2012, five years after Purdue Pharma's corporate executives paid a fine for misbranding OxyContin. The opioid crisis points to a record of government agencies incentivized to look the other way when making decisions. But, in a related and equally important fashion, it also shows those same agencies incapable of introspection and hostile to change, 
long after mounting death tolls should have prompted review and revision. In its origin, as well as the ongoing refusal to reckon with it, the opioid crisis is fundamentally a failure of our political system, a regulatory system for hire. The ability of motivated interests to exploit poorly supervised processes tucked away in little-known regions of government, and the corporate leverage made possible by austerity policies and politics. If liberalism bequeathed a fragile administrative state, then it proved no match for neoliberalism, its revolving door. Such would be obvious to many on the ground in opioid-ravaged communities who find little solace in the niceties typical of mainstream political discourse. Take the observations of Sergeant Mike Smith of the West Virginia State Police, according to Eric Iyer, one of the foremost authorities on opioid traffic in the state. Questioned under oath by a lawyer representing the drug distributors who ferried legal prescriptions to pharmacies throughout West Virginia, Smith recounted a conversation in which he likened pharmaceutical companies to Mexican drug cartels. Many people do. The provocative analogy underscores the greed driving the oversupply and overprescribing of opioids. But Smith actually drew the comparison for a slightly more elaborate reason. When I'm talking about a cartel, I'm referring to the ones, say, the Medellin with Pablo Escobar, where you have multiple people involved in the same conspiracy. And the ultimate goal is to sell drugs and produce as much money as you can. And then you branch out into corruption. And then eventually the cartel becomes so strong that it actually starts to rival the state and the federal government. And then the cartel actually becomes part of the government. For Smith, the pharmaceutical industry resembled the most notorious networks of illegal drug traffickers, not just for the money its most powerful members made, but for the control they wielded over the political decisions that most affected them, their infiltration of the state itself. Surveying the origins of the opioid crisis in the U.S. with the equally unsparing eyes of history, who can dispute that view? It is a crude perspective for a cruel story, one that casts light on the extraordinary power the pharma cartel holds over the regulatory state and the ways in which the adoption of neoliberalism facilitates access to government authorities who, though tasked with the protection of ordinary Americans, choose instead to serve corporate masters indifferent to catastrophic loss. In the past, corporate interference on this scale though not unheard of, would prompt some sort of reckoning for the public agencies involved, and ultimately some sort of course correction. Nothing similar, certainly nothing commensurate to its scale, has happened in the case of the opioid crisis. Instead, opioid importers and manufacturers followed regulatory procedures, creating an impression of compliance, while quietly supplanting its rigor with self-serving calculations. This insidious erosion or subtle sabotage of important rules and procedures designed to safeguard public health creates a dangerous disconnect between injurious action and provable malfeasance. What does wrong mean in the context of a legally approved, legally prescribed drug? Some grapple with this difficult question by personifying wrongdoing in the Sacklers or concentrating blame on Purdue Pharma. But, as Sergeant Smith knows, a government under such heavy influence from industry must answer for itself. When it comes to opioid crisis, neoliberal governance stands guilty, and the only question remaining is how to count the bodies. This concludes The War on Drugs, edited by David Farber.